All right, let's get your calls right now for a few at 866-315-2663. Toll-free nationwide telephone number. We'll get a few guys on the air for a little bit. We'll go back to some music, and then, of course, we will mix it up, music and talk and calls and requests, and then talk to Priest when they get here a little bit later on. Let's see, where should we begin? How about with line number one? Seems like a good good spot. Uh, this is Mark in San Antonio. Hi, Mark. Hey, Eddie. How you doing? Good, man. Good. Hey, listen, thanks for uh, keeping all of us 40-plus-year-olds uh, up to speed with <laughs> all of our favorite bands from the 70s and 80s. Really appreciate it. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Hey, we went out to see Black Star Riders uh, Thursday night, and let me tell you something. They were tight. They were so, so good. Where'd they play, Mark? They played at some small theater I'd never been to in San Antonio, downtown San Antonio, called the Aztec Theater. Um, they sounded so good. I mean, and they, they did about 60-40, uh, 70-30, actually, Black Star Riders and 30% and Lizzie stuff. Um, but I got to tell you, you know, it goes back to everything you say almost on every show you do. You got to get out and support these bands and the new music that they're putting together. By my count, Eddie, there was probably about 150 people there. It was it was borderline embarrassing. It's now was that show with Skid Row or just them? No, it was just them. Because they are also doing shows that they're out with Skid Row too. I know, and it's rough. I mean, you, the thing about it, Mark, and and not a lot of people will talk about it because no no band is ever going to come on the radio and say, "Yeah, we're having a hard time selling tickets." I mean, nobody's ever going to do that. They all want to be positive and put the right spin on it. But the reality is that more and more bands are struggling mightily to sell tickets out there, and. I get calls all the time on this show. Hey, how come this band isn't touring? You can't do it. If people aren't turning up economically, there's no way to do it. It's just way too expensive to be on the road. So it does. It, there, there's two problems. I mean, it falls on fans not doing their homework and not right. finding out that these bands are playing. But honestly, the other side of that is it falls on some of the bands, and certainly Black Star Riders is not. The, the instance with this, but the whole touring business is so amazingly oversaturated right now at every level, level clubs, theaters, arenas, amphitheaters. There's so many bands on the road that even if you do know about it as a fan, it's not cheap to go to these shows no matter what. And you're going to start to get more particular about what you spend your money on. Yeah, and, you know, we noticed that there are a lot of guys at the show, a lot of people at the show that when they were playing the BSR stuff, which is really good, I mean, that's a really awesome album, they were going, you know, that was a bathroom break song, they were going to the bar to get a drink, and I'm like, man, you guys are missing out on some good stuff, this is good music. Well, that's so. there's another that's another part of it, too, and thank you, Mark, for the call, I appreciate it. Uh, I mean, you could you could dissect what's wrong with the touring business in so many ways right now, I think number one is oversaturation and overplaying. And then even if the band itself isn't overplaying, sometimes members of those bands have two or three other bands they play in. So that takes away from the uniqueness of whatever the main band is of seeing it. And then you have fans who every week I get people calling on this show saying, hey, whatever happened to fill in the blank? And the answer is nothing. They're out there playing right now. They're out there making records. But because people want it to fall right in their face, they don't know it. And as a result, they can't support it, and it, these bands struggle. And as I said 10 million times, there's nothing easier in the world to find out if your band is still active that you like. It's by just going to the Internet and finding their official site. I say it all the time. Even for me, I get people that ask me all the time on Twitter, hey, what did you think of... I don't know. Paul Stanley's book. Well, I wrote a review of it on my website. The Trunk Report is my blog. If you go there and you look in the archives, I wrote what I thought of it. You can't do that on Twitter in 140 characters. So you have to be a little more resourceful. People, people will say to me, I'm going to Detroit this Saturday with Don and Jim. People will say, hey, man, I guarantee you next week somebody will say, hey, man, how come you never come to Detroit? I mean, you can't, so you just, if you're a fan of anything, a band, a TV show, a personality, a comedian, there's so much out there that you have to be able to just be on it, bookmark it, check it a couple times a week, the official sites or what have you, and find out what's going on. 
Uh, so there's that. And the third tier problem with bands, as our caller alluded to, when these bands play new music, it's a tune out to a lot of people. And that's really unfortunate because there's a lot of great new music out there like Black Star Riders. But for whatever reason, people don't want to take the time to listen to it or discover it. And that also falls largely on radio. And especially terrestrial radio, where in a lot of markets, there's no outlet at all for hard rock. And if there is, it's you shook me all night long into Welcome to the Jungle for the nine billionth time. And very little of it is new. And that's a problem as well. I was just in South Florida hosting the show. I was telling you guys about at the top of the show. Avenged Sevenfold, major band. Band has had, whether you like them or not, irrelevant. The band has had two consecutive number one albums. I mean number one across the board on the charts. There is no outlet for their music to be played in South Florida at all. So that hurts, too. Because it's not it's another way fans don't know what's going on and don't get turned on to new music. That's why, if you notice, uh, new music is so important, and I always play two to three songs an hour in this show when I can, when I'm playing music. But, you know, this is satellite radio, four hours a week, what can I do? There's only so much you can do. But radio across the board, especially on the terrestrial side, very limited when it comes to new music outlets for these guys. And then people say, hey, how come that band doesn't make new music? Nobody plays it. Nobody buys it. So it's all a big catch-22 that unfortunately eats itself alive. Grady in Houston. Go ahead, Grady. Hey, Eddie. How's it going? Thanks for taking my call. Sure, man. Uh, two things. I uh, enjoyed meeting you and chatting with you. You came through Houston on your book signing at Concert Pub. Uh, I was one of, my band was one of the bands that played that night. But, uh, you weren't in the, were you in the UFO yeah. tribute? Were you in Lights Out? No, I was in the band that headlined, Sid 17. It was uh, all original metal. We threw in uh, three three covers everyone dug, uh, a priest song, a quiet ride song, and a Nazareth tune. So you went up after but, me? Uh, yes. Okay, that's when I was in the corner doing my signing, so I didn't get to really watch you guys. But I know, I know beforehand, I think there was a, a UFO tribute that played too. All the bands were killer that night at Concert Pub North. So thank you, man. That was a oh, lot of fun. We had a blast, and it was a great venue. Uh, it, it's not too big, not too small. But I just want to let you know if uh, if you have a chance, please carve time out to catch the Allison Chain summer tour. Uh, they came through Houston, and the guys were unbelievable. The vocal harmonies were spot on. Uh, Jerry's guitar was great. Uh, they they kept the atmosphere very light. I had the, they brought the drum tech out for his birthday. Um, all of a sudden, Jerry breaks into singing Mexican Blackbird by himself by ZZ Top. Two songs later, there's, like, there's about 10 seconds of dead air. I thought of you. Jerry breaks into uh, Rock Bottom by UFO, and the drummer comes in with him. The singer's like, guys. You're killing me. What are y'all doing here? We're here to play some Alice in Chains music. Nice, nice, nice. But, uh, they, they were great. Lane Stanley, Michael Starr. Mike Starr. Yep, yep. I saw them play Grady in at Rock, Oklahoma last year, and I was really, really impressed. It was my first time seeing them with Will Duvall singing, and I thought the band sounded great. And it was really cool to hear Alice in Chains with two guitar players because Duvall plays guitar on most of the songs with Jerry, and I thought it sounded really, really good. So uh, if they come if they come through my area or if I'm in an area where they're playing, I would always go see them because it's a great band and some great material. And, and we get asked constantly about Alice in Chains coming on that metal show, and all I can tell you is that we asked every season that the show has existed, uh, whether it be scheduling or just timing or what have you, it hasn't worked out. I've talked to Jerry about it personally. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. We're not going to be doing shows again, most likely, uh, until the fall. But we'll keep you posted. Taking your calls for a little bit, then going back to music. Eddie Trunk Live, Trunk Nation, music and talk that rocks, 866-315-2663, toll-free nationwide telephone number. Rob Halford, Glenn Tipton, Richie Faulkner of Judas Priest, live in the studio with me tonight, coming up around 8 o'clock Eastern. You do not want to miss that. Let's continue to grab some more calls here. Let's go to Long Island. Say hi to Louie. Hi, Louie. How you doing? How you doing, Eddie? Good. I got a uh, question. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, two, I've been doing heavy metal for 
a uh, long time. I actually seen uh, Iron Maiden open up a Judas Priest at the Calderon Concert Hall. Um, I had, I'm legally blind. Okay, Lou, you got to turn your radio down because it's feeding back. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I tried shutting it off. Okay, it's off. Um, I'm legally blind, and I've been trying to get on the metal show or trying to get in touch with you. How come you haven't released your books on the on the digital? There are digital versions of both of my books uh, through iTunes or Kindle. Oh, I get them. I get them from the, uh, the place in the city. That, you know, they send them to me free, and I call up all the time. And you know, they said that yours weren't available. I don't know what uh, Louis. I don't know what system that is, or what you how you're doing it. But I do know that you can get. I personally own both of my books on on um, on iTunes digitally. As a, I own it physically, but just because I wanted to see what it looked like as a as on my iPad, I per I personally purchased them that way. So you yeah. can get them that way. And I do know that uh, there are a lot of people, Louis, and this is something that would come into play with you, is. Uh, being as you said being legally blind people have asked me about audio versions of the book and that doesn't make a whole lot of sense with my books because my books are only about 50 percent text the other 50 percent is like playlists and a lot of photos so uh, you could do a I, and I'd be open to doing an audio version if my publisher wanted me to, but it's not a hundred percent. It's not like ninety-five percent text like a normal book would be. It's uh, it's a mix of a lot of different things, and a lot of that wouldn't translate to an audio book. But thank you for the call, Louis, and I uh, appreciate you listening. And you can certainly, uh, if you if you want to purchase the books digitally, you can do so on any of the digital platforms as well as both books physically as well. Let's go to Texas once again. Say hello to George. Hi, George. Hey, hey, Tom. How you doing, sir? Good, man. Where are you in Texas? Right now, I'm in Catalina, uh, South Texas. That's probably close to Laredo, Texas. I'm working. All right. And, uh, and uh, no, I just called. I said I took my wife for her birthday to Allison Chains in Austin, and she said, and it was a great show. Well, you have the second call from Texas that saw Alice in Chains and, and loved it, so that's good to hear. Yeah, and it's just, uh, and I like that place, at the Moody Theater there in Austin, and no matter what seat you buy, it's just, I mean, you have a good view all over the place, and the best thing about it, Jerry Contrell and Mike Inez recognized me, and I saw I sat next to Jerry Contrell's mom, so that was a good deal. Well, why did they recognize you, George? Do you know those guys from back in the day or something? <laughs> no, it's a, I just got crazy and was rocking so bad that they put the light on me and pointed at me and gave me the thumbs up because I just remember all the old songs. Uh, so you were going crazy, and then you stood out in the crowd, yeah. is what you're saying. I got, got you. stood out in the crowd. Yeah, right. it, was, it was a hell of a show. Good I for you, George. It. I'm glad you had a good time, man. Thank you for the call and the uh, and the review. Let's go to Ohio. Say hello to Dan. Hi, Dan. Hi, Eddie. Big fan of what you're doing, my wife and I both. Thank you. And uh, we're huge ACDC fans, and uh just want to chime in about Malcolm. First of all, just, you know, get well. We, we love you, and that power cord is just always going to be with us. Um, I really feel like after the Bob Scott tragedy, he was a huge proponent of them, you know, moving on with it and getting on, getting on with it. And I, I feel like probably he's feeling the same way now. I'm, I want to get your thoughts on that. Well, I don't think that ACDC would move on without his blessings. I mean, he's a founding member of the band, him and his brother. So I don't think that they would be doing this if he didn't say, yeah, go ahead and do it. Um, sure. I, you know, I've, I've heard, I was at a gig, a, a show that I did with Don and Jim this past weekend in Philadelphia, and a few people were saying in the crowd that they had heard that, uh, that Malcolm was uh, dealing with, uh, cancer of some sort, which obviously I hope that's not the case. But if it is, as you said, uh, Dan, I hope hopefully he does get well and, and is able to beat it. But th the thing you have to think about is no matter what, I don't know how much how much can a band like ACDC really have left years wise. I would have to think that this has got to be among their last tours if they do indeed tour. And we don't know that's going to happen. We do know that as of now, they plan to make a record. Brendan O'Brien uh, was was announced as a producer. 
who is a guy who did the Stone Temple Pilots records. He's done some Pearl Jam stuff. It's also been reported that Stevie Young, who is Malcolm's nephew and who did fill in for Malcolm before on the live stage, has been seen in Canada where they're making the record and is expected to be a part of the album. That's really unfortunate because you would think that if Malcolm was well enough, he could at least do the record. You don't even have to be in the same studio to do records anymore. Tons of bands aren't. Tons of bands just use, you know, mail the tracks in digitally. They work over Skype, whatever they do. So for him to not be involved even in the studio end of it, you got to imagine that he's pretty seriously ill. So, again, let's hope for the best. And there's people that have mixed feelings about ACDC without Malcolm Young. Malcolm is certainly not the star of the band, from the press angle, that would always be Angus and then Brian or back in the day, Bon. But Malcolm Young, so important, so many ways to ACDC and their sound and their writing and everything that it's kind of hard to comprehend the band without him. But that seems to be where they're going and that would have to be with his blessings and we'll see what it ends up being. But regardless, I mean... Brian Johnson, as great as he still is, is, I think, in his mid-60s now. Angus is, what, late 50s? And, again, he's a guy that's the energy's got to be there. You don't want to see Angus Young mailing it in. you got to see Angus Young banging his head for two hours in the schoolboy outfit. So I talk about that all the time. With certain bands, you can't. Certain bands can easily change gears into older age and they can dial it back and they can sit and they can chill and they can they can alter their, their performance a little bit. Certain bands can't get away with that because the performance and the high energy is what they're known for. I remember talking to guys in Scorpions about that, making the human pyramid and all that stuff. And even though Rudolph Schenker's in incredible shape, he can't do it anymore. So you just hope bands know when to say when. You don't want them staying too long at the party. As, ba as much as it sucks to see your favorite band go away, I am much more on the side of things saying I'd rather see a band end respectfully and still good than to have them up there just mailing it in and saying, man, why are they still doing it? Tons of calls here. We'll grab a few more, and then we will get back into uh, some music. And again, Judas Priest joining us in the studio. Glenn, Rob, and Richie live in studio with me a little over an hour from now. A lot of calls from Texas. Dean is another one. Hi, Dean. Hey, Eddie. How are you? Good. Thank you. Hey, just uh, just wanted to encourage you to keep it up. You're the voice of metal, and I appreciate what you're doing out there. Thank I just you. got a question for you. I noticed that Maiden is not coming to the U.S. this year, and I wonder what you're hearing out of their camp. Uh, I'm hoping that they're going to be back next year, but I wonder what you, I know uh, you just talked about the longevity of fans, and I, I'm wondering if they're going to make another U.S. run. Well, Maiden is a global band. I mean, Maiden Dean is so big all around the world. In a lot of instances, they're bigger outside of America than they are here. Uh, and they are they are a band that actually does not over tour. So they've made it very special that when you see them, it's an exciting thing. And they're going to fill an arena because people don't see them every single year. So they have been doing this kind of every other year thing with the U.S. And when they do play the U.S., they usually don't do a ton of shows. They'll do anywhere from like 10 to 30 shows. Uh, so and, and I think a year or two ago, they actually only played one U.S. show in Florida because they were on their way back from, I don't know, Brazil or something. And they stopped off in Florida and played. So you have to really follow their touring schedule and keep an eye on, on their online stuff. At this point, if there haven't been shows announced in America, I doubt you'd get them. Uh, but I do know they're doing a few things in Europe, uh, some of the festival stuff. It's always possible they could drop in and do a show anywhere in the U.S., but I would say that if they didn't announce anything for the U.S. this year, uh, that it'll probably be next year, but, and, and I would think on the back of a record as well. Well, great, man. Hey, I just caught uh, down in Corpus Christi, Texas, the recent Queensryche show with, uh, with uh, Tate, and it, and it was a great show, man, a small gig. 
probably three, four hundred people there, man, and uh, right up against the stage, and uh, it sounded great. Well, thank you, Dean, for the call. That's another thing that we didn't touch on that has happened since I was on with you last, last Monday. And that's other big news that, that broke, and that is that, and it's it's really not, it was kind of expected, but the winners of the Queensryche name sweepstakes is the Queensryche without Jeff Tate. So the band with Todd LaTorre, original members Scott Rock and Field, Eddie Jackson, Michael Wilton, and Parker Lundgren has the name Queensryche. That will be Queensryche. And Jeff Tate will not be Queensryche. Now, just to make this a little more clear, that's the settlement that was arranged. Jeff, however, had a month's worth of shows booked under the name Queensryche, which he'll continue to do using that name. If they were already booked, he'll use that name. For two years, Jeff Tate can say the original singer in Queensryche. In other words, it'll say Jeff Tate, and then underneath the original voice of Queensryche, the former voice of Queensryche, something like that. He can do that for two years. Then after two years in his billing, there can be no mention of Queensryche at all. He cannot use that tri Reich logo. And he is the only one, however, that can perform Operation Mind Crime 1 and 2 in their entirety. So can you follow all that? Now you know why this was in the legal courts for over a year. All this stuff had to be negotiated out. But in a nutshell... The Todd LaTorre band, that with the three members of Queensryche, gets the name Queensryche. And after two years from now, that will be the only band that can even reference Queensryche. They will just be Queensryche, and that's it. And after two years, Tate can only say Jeff Tate or whatever he decides if he comes up with another name. But for the next two years, he can reference Queensryche in the billing for his ads, but I'm sure it'll be billed as Jeff Tate or something along those lines. So... There's a little insight, and I'll tell you, we talk all the time about the business of music and the music business and how incredibly complex and in-depth it can be. And the Queensryche one is something that played out completely transparently through all the legal filings and all that sort of stuff. So now we have an answer, and we will only have one Queensryche two years from now. We only have one Queensryche pretty much now, but again, Jeff can still reference the name for the next two years as part of the settlement. And no matter what version of the band you like, or maybe you like both versions of what's out there, the one thing that's good about this is you won't have confusion as to who you're going to see. There was a show by me a couple months ago that it was Jeff's Queensryche but the photo in the ad had the other Queensryche. So even the promoters were confused. More Texas calls. San Antonio, this is Art. Hi, Art. How are you? How are you doing, Eddie? Good. Love hearing you. Uh, keep, keep it up. I must get to uh, San Antonio quarter. one of these days. Everybody tells me to, and I have never been there or haven't been in ages, so i got to get there one of these days. Yeah, I was, I was hoping you would... Uh, come by for your book signing well i can but, only uh, go where there's opportunities and where they'll have me and where i get offers so hopefully that will work itself out sometime down the line i'd love to come there i hear it's a great town for awesome. for our kind of music yeah it is it is yeah um but well, my question was um I've, I've been a huge fan of george lynch ever since i was younger and i i see a lot of good things happening with this kxm stuff uh you know she's shooting a video he's shooting another video um, my question is, anything new that you've heard of uh, from George Lynch or from Doug Pinnick on, on uh, KXM? Well, the problem is all these guys have like five different bands. Uh, uh, Doug <laughs> yeah. Pinnick is playing with King's X right now. George has two or three different things he's doing at the same time. And Ray Luzier is the drummer in Korn which is honestly bigger than all the other stuff, and that's going to be his priority. So that's that's the downside art of all this multitasking stuff. Um, 
you got these so many musicians. I mean, it, it's more rare to find a musician that's not in at least two or three bands than a musician that's just in one band. And the problem is, is that it's hard to commit to making a record successful and getting behind it and touring and for, for your fans to know that's the one place they can see you where you're hanging your hat. It's interesting because a good friend of mine, as everybody knows, is Mike Portnoy. And Mike is a guy that caught a lot of flack about this when he first started doing it from some people because he was doing two, three, four bands at the same time, and he still does to some degree, even though the winery dogs is kind of like where he's hanging his hat right now. But, man, I got to tell you, a lot of other people following in his footsteps because you've got tons of people now doing more than one band. And I had George on this show because I love the KXM record. And I asked George, are you guys going to be able to tour? And he said, we don't know. So you hope that these bands get an opportunity and to, to support these records that they make. But you can't. That's one instance where you can't blame fans if you don't sell records. If you don't get out there and you can't even support them and put the band together. So we'll see what happens. And I thought what was really interesting in my interview with George Lynch, and by the way, the interviews that I do on this show, you can hear them on demand on the Sirius XM app, including the craziness last week on this show, if you missed it, with Stephen Piercy and Bobby Blotzer on separately talking about the Piercy leaving rat. But if you just go search my name or Trunk Nation on the Sirius XM app, you'll, you'll find the interviews archived. And... One of the things when I had George Lynch on here a few weeks ago was he said that they were doing a new TNN record, which is another band that he has, and that's three-quarters of the original Dokken with Jeff Pilsen and Mick Brown, and they were making music, and that he was going to Don and saying, Don, why don't you sing on this, and we'll make it a Dokken reunion record. And George was saying, really, time's running out to get one last swing at trying to do that. So all of these guys, not just George, but so many of them are, are multitasking, and I understand why they're doing it, because everyone's looking for that one nibble that really gets some traction. But it's hard when you jump around so much, people can't keep track of where you actually are. And it's unfortunate if this band KXM doesn't do live shows, because you listen to that record, it just lends itself to being played live. But all these guys are going to have other priorities before they'll break off and try to do that. A couple more quick ones, and we're going to get right back to music. I appreciate all the calls, everybody. Lines are jammed. Uh, we'll do a couple more, then we'll go back to music for a bit. Darren on Rhode Island. Go ahead, Darren. Hey, Eddie. How are you today? Good, thanks. Uh, I just want to revisit you know, something you were talking about a little earlier about the tendons to the concerts. I, you know, I'll be brief. I just find that a lot of it has to do with some of the bands that are touring now. Um, the age of the, the audience, uh, they're busy with careers and families, and it's just tough to get out. I know myself. I like to go see a show once a month. Finding someone to go with me is very difficult. My wife and I have empty nests. Our kids have moved out. We're older. But, uh, you know, finding some, you know, contemporaries to go to a show is very difficult. And I find it's a lot of it is family and careers. Um, when I go to a show, you know, uh, I find it's either older people or younger people. You know, well, well if, you don't mind me, if you don't mind me asking, Darren, how old are you? 48. 48. So you're right around my age. So so when you uh see so is it that you don't you don't have friends that are still into it like you are? Is that the case? No, I find that they're very into it. It's just that they're busy with family and career. So, you know, I've got the kids, I got soccer, no, we can't be out, we gotta be up in the morning. You know, so I see it, it's uh, that is an element of what I see of uh, poor attendance. Because again, when I go to a show, I find people who are usually older than us or younger than us. Uh, I don't see people of, you know, uh, in their 30s and 40s going to a lot of the shows. Again, that may be the shows that I'm choosing to go to, but I, I feel a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, with that element. Well, that's a, it's a great point, Darren, and, and you're probably right as another component. I think there's that can tie into it as well. And, y you know, it's interesting, and that's why I asked you how old you were, because I do this for a living and have my whole life. So I go to shows a lot of times by myself, um, 
But when I'm looking for somebody to take a ride with me when it's a local show in my area, New Jersey, New York, you're right. It's harder and harder to find people to go with me. And guess what? If they're going with me, they're not paying either. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's free for them. So, yeah. and it's still, they still hem and haw about going out. So it's a good point. I get what you're well, saying. Thank you very much. Thanks, Darren. Oh. Appreciate the call. Yeah, I mean, see, this is all I know. My, I'm lucky. My life, my career, my world for my entire life has been nothing but music and the music industry. Uh, it's been my passion, but it's also what I do for a living. So, and that's a two edged sword as well, because sometimes it's hard to separate the two. And sometimes I, I'm on the opposite side of the fence where honestly, I see so many shows. I could be, I could go to, I could literally go to two shows a night every night of the week if I wanted to. And a lot of that too is because of where I live. I live in the num just outside of the number one market in the world. So between New York City and New Jersey, every night there's something going on. And even me, I I've got to say, you know, I I'm just not doing it tonight. I'm burnt out. I've had it. I don't want to go to another show. But I, I I'll tell you, and the reason why I asked Darren how old he is is because it's interesting. I mean, it's true. There, I live in my own little bubble of this being my world, and I'll go by myself to a show no problem because I, 99% of the time I'm friends with the band or know someone in the band or are going to know most of the people at the venue or backstage or whatever because I've just been doing this forever. But if you're not in that situation, and most people aren't, like Darren, I could imagine that being difficult because you call up your buddies and like, hey, man, you want to go to a club tonight and see whoever? Yeah, they go on at 1030. It's Tuesday night. <laughs> that person's going to look at you like you're out of your mind. And I know and I sense that myself because I have very, very, very few people that I can call when I'm home that'll go to a show with me. I got one friend who just moved back to the area and he doesn't have any kids. He's not married and he's even old, he's older than me and he'll go. And I got another friend who did all the photos in my first book and half of the ones in my second book and same deal. He's not married. He doesn't have any kids. And if he's available, he'll go. But even these guys like, nah, I don't want to see that. I don't want to go. I'm not going out to that. I'm just going to get something to eat and get a beer. I'm going to go home. It's just so much volume. But if I didn't have those two guys just to take a ride with me, there's really not a lot of people going to shows. With you. So Darren brings up a good point. Because Darren and most people aren't in my situation. You got to buy a ticket. You got to get there and find somebody who wants to go with you. And at that point, maybe it's not so easy. It's interesting. But it is a part of being in that demographic. And I I do have two young kids and a wife, but they get what I do. That's where the, the work end of it comes in for me because it is my business as well. So some I've seen some people say to me, my God, you're on the road so much, you're away so much. How do you get away with that? It's not about getting away with that. That's what I do for a living. Most of the time, there's work attached to that and I'm being paid and that's how I support my family I'll be honest with you there's some there's a lot of times I don't want to leave the house this weekend there was a great fight on Saturday night Mayweather I'm a big boxing fan oh the love to kick back ordered up the Mayweather fight opened up a couple beverages and a bag of pretzels and not left the house but I went out, I did a gig in Philly, and had a great time. Of course I want to do that, too, but you know what I'm saying. Everybody has that. So Darren brings up a very valid point about demographics and age playing into it. Uh, we, in case you just joined us, we, we covered a lot of ground in this first hour, but one of the themes that I opened the show with talking about was the next great rock bands that are going to emerge. We hear all the time 
from people about you know what's the band that's going to do it what's the band that's really going to give rock a kick in the pants really bring it back and right now from my vantage point and again it's irrelevant whether you like these bands or not but to me the three that i feel are the ones that are right there are the struts Greta Van Fleet, and Ghost. It feels like imminently any or all three of those bands could really take a huge, huge step and become major acts. And from a draw standpoint, from a pure audience draw standpoint, the leader of those three might and is probably Ghost. From a radio airplay standpoint, I don't know. That would be a tough call. They all get airplay. From an originality standpoint, probably Ghost, although all Ghost obviously are far from the first band to do anything theatrical, and their music, to me, sounds like Blue Oyster Cult. Greta Van Fleet would be accused of being the least original, although a lot of people... Make the comparison to Queen when it comes to the struts. So it's really fascinating. As far as output of music, Ghost far and away leading in that category with four albums to date. The other two bands with a couple EPs or one album and some singles. But all three kind of come from different worlds, but all three doing really, really well. And as I said before, my personal feeling and personal favorite is the Struts. There are other bands outside of these three that I certainly like and are rooting for. But these are the three to me that are the closest to popping through. And the other thing all three of them share is that they have been embraced and had opening slots with major, major tours and major artists around the world. So no matter how you spin it, Unless I'm missing something, those are the three bands right now that as rock fans, we kind of have to put our stock in as being one or hopefully all that will really, really give the scene a big kick and and help bring rock totally back into the mainstream as far as airplay and what have you. And as I've said consistently, it's not going to be a band that's been around 20, 30 years releasing a new record. It's just not how it works. It's going to be a newer, younger band. None none of these three bands, by the way, are totally new. None of them are baby bands by any stretch. They all have seven to ten years behind them at this point. But they are newer and still viewed as emerging bands about to break. So it's going to be fascinating to watch the trajectory of all three of them. And now I want to hear from you about not only these bands and how you feel, but if there's bands I'm missing here that you feel should be sort of the ones. Let's uh, let's talk to Jay, who's in Dallas, as our first caller on this Wednesday. Welcome, Jay. Hey, Eddie. It's great to have you back live in the studio. I missed you last week. Thank you, man. I saw I saw all three of these bands, and I actually saw Rival Sons the most. So I saw all four of these bands that you talked about. I saw Rival Sons three separate times when I went to go see Sabbath, twice in Vegas and once in Dallas, and and then they got a good sound to them. Um, good I job you by you, three. Jay. Jay, good job by you, by the way, getting in there early enough to see them because it blows my mind how many people people went to see Sabbath and don't know who Rival Sons are because they were probably out in the parking lot still drinking. <laughs> well, I usually try to go check out the opener, especially if I've never heard of the band. And I didn't hear of Rival Sons at all the first time I saw them, but I was a fan immediately because they just got a great sound. And I think they're good in those arena settings. I think their sound's good for 10,000 plus. The um, the other three guys I saw in different settings, I saw Ghost open up for Iron Maiden in the basketball and hockey arena. I- I'm with you. I think that their look attracts a lot of folks, but... Um, I like their music, don't get me wrong, but I think these other ones that you talked about, I'd, I'd place a little bit higher on the uh, on the pecking order. I saw the Struts open for Foo Fighters recently at a shed, and I saw Greta as a headliner at House of Blues. And uh, I'm hoping that you get a chance to see Greta live because they are very good, and they've got themselves a diverse audience, I felt, too. I saw a lot of 
a lot of older women that probably had big crushes on Robert Plant just swooning, <laughs> swooning at the show. And it was a really good, diverse crowd age-wise. They're attracting the millennials that like this guitar-driven music. And the women love Greta Van Fleet. So uh, if I had to rank them, uh, I'm going to go Greta 1, Stretch 2, and Ghost 3. But, man, that's like picking picking hairs, man. I mean, they're, they're all very good, and I hope they all make it and break it. Great points, Jay. I mean, I agree with you. I agree with you for the most part, I and thank you for calling. I can't comment on Greta Van Fleet Live because I haven't seen him live yet, but I have talked to people who have and have said very good things about him. I, but I've also talked to people who say the same, I don't quite get it. You know, I don't know what all the excitement is about. So you're going to get that. I mean, I think what's really interesting when you look at the Struts and Greta is that both of them are are are, are basically young or younger bands with a throwback sound. The Struts are channeling a lot of British 70s glam, being a British band, and the Struts are uh, the Struts are channeling that. Greta is channeling Zeppelin and early 70s guitar-driven rock, clearly. So what's what's really fascinating here is if the Struts or Greta really blow up, we're going to have the the new mass appeal major rock band being a band that is really just channeling what came 30 40 years ago the old you know what's what's old is new again thing that's what i think is really interesting about that we're not these bubbling rock bands with all this buzz right now are doing it by completely mining stuff from their past stuff that in Certainly Greta Van Fleet's instance, they weren't even alive when that stuff was going on. And the, probably with the Struts, too. I, mean, I don't know how old those guys are in the Struts. I think they're probably in their 20s. They're not kids, but they're probably mid to late 20s. I mean, they weren't alive when Queen first came out in the 70s. Pretty fascinating. Let's say hello to Donnie, who's in uh, Kentucky. Hey, Donnie. Yes. Hey, Eddie, I want to bring up a band that's that's already been out beyond that 10-year period, and they're playing arenas in Europe, American band that should amaze us be they don't get more attention here in the United States. Um, a very diverse audience. You see the kids and the parents. I'm 48 years old. You see people older than me at their shows. You see the Pantera and Slayer T-shirts at their shows, people singing along to every word of their songs. They have one of the best vocalists and one of the best guitar players right now. And that's Ultra Bridge. I mean, I'm just amazed those guys aren't bigger than they are right now. Well, Donnie, you are talking to a guy who is a massive Alter Bridge fan. I, Alter Bridge is one of my favorite current bands, period, right now. But I don't put, and, and I agree with you, and they're an amazing band, amazingly powerful, way heavier than people would think if you've never seen them live. I mean, Miles and Mark, and I mean, Alter Bridge does ex what is my favorite thing in the world, which is heavy, big riffs, massive sound with unbelievably great vocals from Miles over the top. And, of course, they have other sides to them, too. But Alter Bridge is a way heavier riff-driven band than I think a lot of people realize. And I love that band. They are one of my favorite bands, period. But the reason why I'm not putting them sort of in this grouping is because, and you're right, they're an arena act in England and most of Europe. Here in America, they do quite well, but they're not even close to what they are in England. But the reason why I'm not putting them in this conversation is because they are not young guys. They're not old, but they're not young. They're not, they're a, they're a bunch of guys that have all had success already in the past. We, for people that don't know, and I'm sure some do, thank you, Donnie, for the call, but Alter Bridge is... The, all three members of Creed without Scott Stapp, with Miles Kennedy singing. Now, they don't do any Creed songs. They're a completely different band. But my point is, the other all, all of those guys have had major success in their own right already. Whether it be with Creed or Miles with his work with Slash and now as a solo artist. So it's a little different because they've all had a big bite of the apple already. 
especially uh, Brian, Mark, and, and Scott with Creed. I mean, Creed was a massive band, so they've had they've had their 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 big success. And although Alter Bridge is a different band, they're having massive success already, as you said, in England and here in the U.S., certainly making great strides as well. So it's a little different because even though it's a new band, they're not new guys. They're not that young. They've been around. They've, they've, they've had multi-platinum success in other things. It's a little different. It just feels a little different for me. That's all. But as a band among one of my favorite bands in the world right now, and one of my favorites to go see live. Alter Bridge are unbelievable. John in North Carolina. Hi, John. Hey, thanks for, thanks for taking the call, Eddie. I agree with you. I mean, as far as I've seen two of the three bands you're talking about, and the Struts, I saw them open for Food Fighters in Greensboro, North Carolina, and they had the crowd up. And, you know, and most opening bands really struggle with that. And that lead singer, you know, he's channeling Freddie Mercury, but he really worked it great. And it's, it's, you know, this whole conversation is just great to hear the talk about some newer bands that, you know, people don't hear about. And then you hear about them on your show because we're all music nerds and listen to this channel. But right. uh, um, I wanted to throw out one just because they, they have three albums. And I stumbled upon this band because of my sons. Uh, they do a little festival in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I was sitting waiting for television to come on because the band Television never tours. I never thought I'd ever see them. I kind of, I'm all over the place with music, but I'm sitting in an auditorium with no one in there, literally. So I text message them, and I go, where are you? Because there's bands playing all over the town, and it was a band called Mutoid Man. So I'm like, what genre of music? They said metal. And I'm like, well, why didn't you tell me anyway? So I peeled to this club where Mutoid Man was playing, and they blew me away. They're from New Jersey. Are you familiar with Mutoid Man? I've heard the name, but that's the best I can tell you. I have not heard any of their music, but I have heard the name of the band. I think that you would like them. I mean, it's it's metal, but they're so much fun live. They're having a blast live. And the one common strand that I find with all these bands we're talking about, you know, the Strut Studio to me didn't do anything, but live they were great. I think a lot of these bands are so much better live. Than well, well, we're hearing well, the studio work by Ghost. I don't. I mean, I don't get it either. The thing, the thing so. is, th thanks, John. Mutoid man, I've heard of. Well, I'll look him up. I'll, I'll, I appreciate you sharing that with us, and I'll check him out. Um, the thing, the thing, talking about live, I've seen Ghost a couple times live. And to me, for as much airplay as they get and as big as their show is, I still see a lot of people in the audience that aren't quite sure what to make of them. <laughs> you know, it's like I don't see people fully engaged singing along. Now, it could have just been the shows I was at. One was a festival. One was Rocklahoma, you know. But I don't see, like, people, like, they're, they're kind of looking. They're trying to figure it out. Everybody's wearing masks. So, you know, they're... Uh, I have not, again, I've not seen Greta Van Fleet live. I hear they're fantastic live, though. So I can't speak on that. I don't know. I hear that that can be the game changer in how you feel about them, though. But the struts, to me, the struts, and again, speak, haven't seen Greta live, but the struts, to me, have an intangible there in Luke Spiller, who is a star, Uh and I don't mean that in a negative sense. He is he has a he's a personality. He is flamboyant. He sings great. He controls the crowd unlike a lot of these other bands we're talking about. That is a huge X factor. That is a huge thing. Here's the other thing I'll say about the struts. When I I talk to some of my audience who and a lot of people I've turned this band on to ever since I've been on their bandwagon. The people who have come to me in my audience who have not liked them have said to me it's because they are a little too polished and poppy sounding on their records. Fair criticism. They are pretty polished and poppy sounding. I like that. I'm a huge fan of a genre of music known as power pop, which there are elements that I hear in the struts that are power pop, which is why one of the reasons why I probably like them so much as well. But I understand if you're a little into a little bit more guitar 
driven, a little more guitar meaty stuff versus just big chorus sing along hook songs. Maybe that's a little bit of a disconnect for you when it comes to listening to the struts on record. Here's what I'll say though, and I mentioned this to Adam, who's their guitar player last night. When you go see him live, there's a little more chug in that guitar. He takes a few more guitar solos. He, they, they beef up the guitar end of things a little bit more on the live front. They jam a little bit, too. And I hope that eventually that finds their way into their recordings because there there is times where I would prefer a little less slick and maybe a little more grit in terms of, like, you know, rock and guitar stuff. And there's certainly guitar on the record, and the records sound amazing. Uh, the, the the record sounds to me amazing production wise, but I, I'm with I'm with the, the the I'm in that group that would love to see, hear a little bit more guitar in that mix. And you do get that with them, you do get that with them when you see them live, as I definitely picked off and noticed last night. Uh, let's say hello to Jeff in Pennsylvania who wants to weigh in. Go ahead, Jeff. Hey, Eddie. How's it going, brother? Great, man. Awesome. So I've called you about Ghost multitudes of times already, and, you know, we've had our conversations over, over the couple, past couple of years. But I just have kind of like an A and B part uh, question for you. So you've been pushing for Greta on, you know, pretty decently for the past, uh, ever since you found out about him for the most no, part. No, 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 no. I mean, I've talked <laughs> about them, but to, to say I'm pushing them is a, is not really accurate at all. I've said consistently, well, yeah. the one thing I've said consistently about Greta Van Fleet is I don't know a, because I haven't seen them live, and B, I'm not going to say one way or the other until I hear the record. To me, their next record is going to tell us everything we need to know about Greta Van Fleet. It's either going to be very Zeppelin derivative, more of the same, and like, okay, we get it, it's a one-trick pony, or it's going to be an evolution, and wow, okay, these kids have had a couple years of seasoning of life experience, now they're coming into their own. That's what I'm looking for, that's what I'm hoping for. I I don't know what to say about Greta Van Fleet yet because I've not seen them live and I need to hear that record. Yeah, and listen, I, I'm, I'm a big hope for new bands as well. And, I, you know, I don't want to dislike those guys, but to hear in interviews that they declined that Zeppelin was a massive, massive influence. And I'm looking at this lead singer. He's dressed on stage like he should be the Prince of Wakanda wearing a pair of Birkenstocks. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> you know, like, I don't get it. Just like certain people don't get ghosts, and I, I can understand and respect that. But seeing the leaps and bounds that band has taken within the past eight years that they're about to, you know, headline their first arena tour, you know, they're, they're doing two big shows to start it. But I assume it's going to take off after that. Um, you know, I think says a lot, and they just hit number one in mainstream rock radio with rats. So I just I feel like they're a force to be reckoned with that a lot of people aren't quite understanding yet. But I really think they're going to hit a home run with this. Like this album, I, Jeff, I I couldn't agree with you more that they are absolutely a force to be reckoned with. Whether you like the thing with all three of these bands, and again, this was my just my own little thing thinking about it last night because this is how I operate because. <laughs> I live in a in a music vacuum twenty four seven. I mean, I came home from I came home from that strut show last night, and thank you, Jeff. And I I said, okay. I mean, this to me, walking into that room, walking out of that room, just like I did when I saw him, I was like, this is the band. This could be the band. And then I took a step back, and I'm like, okay. So where are we at? This is this is what. Guys, want, people wonder why I don't sleep. This is honestly what goes through my mind as I lay in bed at night. I'm like, okay, so we got the Struts. We got Greta. We got Ghost. We got three bands right now. Really on the cusp. This is good. And then I start going down this checklist in my mind. Trust me. Melatonin, uh, Ambien, none of it. None of it can shut down my my mind when it starts going with nonsense like this at like two in the morning. You you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> so I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm oh, this will be great to talk about on the air tomorrow. That's my show prep. 2 a.m. in bed, lights out and starting to think with the mind turning. <laughs> uh Ed Ed will tell you. Ed Ed Robinson will wake up to emails from me at like two thirty in the morning. Hey Ed, so tomorrow, 
This You've is... never even questioned me about that, but you just know I'm out of my mind. Oh, because I'm an insomniac, so you know. <laughs> oh, okay. You are too. Okay, good yeah. to know. That's All why right, we you're work. nocturnal we, like me. We work so well together. Oh, okay. Yeah, because yeah. I'll I, I won't text you because I don't want to disturb you, but I'll I'll email Ed and I'll be like, so Ed, I got an idea. Here's what we're doing tomorrow. You know what? But though, anyway, <laughs> if, if you need some help, because when my kid was born, uh, I have a couple of those. They, I kid you not, they're lullaby versions of metal songs. I'll lend oh, you, I got I'll lend you the, the CDs. I got them. I got this unit that makes noise like uh, oh, yeah. the ocean and no, wind. I, and all. I blow right through that too. During the summer, of course, the air conditioner. But other, uh, during the winter, I need a white noise machine. Otherwise, yeah. I can, I cannot sleep in silence. So anyway, I'm th I'm thinking through all this stuff, and then I'm going through this this sort of um, you know mental checklist. And I'm looking at so, and that's that's the three bands that I've. You know, come up with and th so there's no right or wrong answers here my preference again just to restate my favorite of these of of all the emerging rock bands are the struts and rival sons but there's no right or wrong here it's just a question of what's let's hope they all break through because we need it how great would it be how great would it be to have one of these bands pop? And when I mean pop, really blow up. And then all of a sudden, the next one comes through, and we got two, three others coming through the chute. And then all of a sudden, I mean, that's the movement we need happening right now. I'm, I'm just really encouraged because I feel that we are at a time where we could be on the cusp. But I just feel that uh, that that for me, the Struts check all the boxes is the band that has the best chance to do that. But I would I would not disagree with our last caller that you could definitely make the case that Ghost, it, it Ghost is is probably leading the pack. And to me, I've said this many times: the story of Ghost is endlessly fascinating. The fact that this band has been so embraced by rock radio. And have by having the, the, this image, and then so embraced by the metal community, but then making songs that are at times pop, pop rock. It's it's endlessly fascinating to me to watch. Media wise, Ghost. I mean, Ghost is all over the place right now. This guy, Tobias, is everywhere suddenly in, in media doing interviews, telling his story. So it's just fueling that thing even more. They get a lot of radio airplay, Ghost. And they get the radio. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it, it's fascinating, but you look at it, it's a band. Their whole thing is the, the, the look and the nameless ghouls and the whole thing and the stage show. So I, I just think there's a lot of people really fascinated by them, like myself, but who and then we have people like our previous caller who loves them clearly, which is fine. But then there's a lot of people that are endlessly fascinated by them, but aren't quite sure what to make of them. I can tell you when I saw them at Rocklahoma just a, a month or so ago, there are people in that audience that were like all hyped up to see them, but they couldn't tell you a song. I talked to them. They weren't sure what they did. They didn't even know. They just knew they had to see them. So there's that kind of thing going on too that some sometimes just transcends whether you know the the band or the music or anything. To me, that's the big three. There's others. We'll hear from you if there's others, but to me, those are the big three clearly leading the charge right now. And again, let's hope they all break through. And my, my dark horse in the whole thing, like, like I said, is is Rival Sons. But they're, they're clearly not at the level of these three bands yet in terms of popularity. That's all I'm talking about. I'm not talking about who's better. I'm not talking about who's got better songs. I'm talking about in terms of the awareness and popularity and sales and airplay and concert ticket attendance. All of these bands... The other common thread with all three of these bands, they are all selling out when they play shows. Struts are selling out. Last night's room, held, I think, held 1,100, 1,200 people sold out in advance on a Tuesday night in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania.
Greta Van Fleet selling out around the world. Same, relatively same size venues. Ghost, as the previous caller mentioned, with a couple arena shows. So clearly from a draw standpoint, with the image, with the show they're putting on, they've got a leg up in that department slightly. Let's hit a break. We'll come back. We'll continue talking about this. We'll continue taking your calls about your favorite emerging rock acts. Next wave, hopefully, of emerging newer. And again, I hesitate by saying new because the bands we're talking about are not out of the box new, but newer. I guess the newest of them would be of the ones that we're talking about really having some heat on them right now is definitely Greta Van Fleet because they're so young. But most of these guys have seven to ten years in, and we've just been talking about where they're at in their careers and which ones could be the ones. Again, my personal favorite is the is the Struts, but uh, Dylan, who's on our phones, came up with some interesting stats because we were talking about who's drawing the most, who's getting the most airplay. They're all doing well, but if you follow and care about social media stats, which are becoming more and more of a thing, Amongst the bands we've been talking about as the bubbling under bands that could just blow up any second, and we hope do, as far as Twitter followers, which is somewhat of a barometer, not the be-all, end-all, but certainly a barometer of interest and fan following, Ghost is the big winner there with 109,000 followers on Twitter, followed by My Boys the Struts at 67.6 thousand followed by Greta Van Fleet, surprisingly at three, with 56.9 thousand. And uh, my other favorites, Rival Sons, quite far behind at 35,000. So that, that, st- that right there bears out exactly what I've been talking about when you factor in some of the other things, when you're talking about overall awareness, when you're talking about overall reach, whether it's radio, ticket sales, whatever, Ghost with almost double what anybody else has. Ghost getting a ton of airplay. Ghost doing some headline arena shows. The Struts in the two-hole there. Greta in the three-hole. Rival Sons a distant four. Because as I said earlier, as much as I love that band, it's disappointing to me that with all the touring they've done, they don't have a bigger profile here in the U.S. Now, I laugh at all of these bands because I have more than double the Twitter followers of Ghost. So what does that mean, Ed? <laughs> that means the Trunk Nation just laughs at these. No, I'm just kidding, of course. It means, Eddie, you are the true Papa Emeritus. Nah. But no, no, but I mean that, I'm, I'm joking, of course. But what I do have, I have more than double. I have 272,000 Twitter followers. And I thank each and every one of them, Okay. But I can't go sell out an arena. Ghost can at half of what I have. So you have to keep my point in, in, in bringing that up is you have to keep these numbers in perspective, too. It's an interesting barometer on popularity. Well, you but know. it's not the be all end all because there's a even though Ghost has less than half of the amount of people following on Twitter than I do. There's a hell of a lot more people around the globe who know who Ghost are than know who I am. And the big pop so stars it's all have relative millions of followers. So and it also has there. it also has to do with how active they are on social media, what they put out, how well they've cultivated, how long they've been on it. So you have to keep those numbers in perspective, but. Social media and the counts and the numbers are becoming a factor in in how things are done too. I mean, I've I know w- with the following I do have and I've built on Twitter, it's become a thing where people have said, "Hey, can you help me out? Can you pump this out? Can you tweet this out? I would appreciate it." So you have to know how to manage it, and you have to keep it in perspective as well. All right, back to the phones, talking to you guys about the the emerging rock bands that you love, that we're looking for, that we're rooting for to help break down these doors, get rock a, a front seat at the table. The newer bands out there, look who's joining us right now, our uh, our good friend and uh, a man who certainly uh, knows success from all the hit records he's had from Mario Speedwagon, Kevin Cronin, who's listening and wants to chime in on this subject. Kevin, how? are you bud i'm good eddie how are you buddy good good you out on the road where you at 
I'm actually home. I, we're on a little uh, a little eight day break. We're we're touring out there with Chicago this summer, and uh, we're actually headed your way. We're going to be up at, at Jones Beach and and the uh, Garden City. I guess it's not called the Garden City Arts Center anymore, but I, I still call it that. And you should, you yeah, absolutely gonna, should. I'm a Jersey guy. Yeah. It'll always be the Garden State Arts Center, no matter what name they put on it. So I know. Thank you, P- Pine Knob in Detroit. I don't care what cell phone company they, they they stamp on the on the sign it's pine knob i'm sorry you know what i mean but but yeah it's good to good you know i'm you, know, you, you never know where i'm going to be i'm always listening eddie I, I love your show man I'm a, I'm a fan of it and you are keeping rock and roll alive you know doing doing your thing to keep it alive and uh and and we all appreciate it you you, you are you are a beloved uh figure in the in the world of rock bands and i just uh, that's kind of you kevin i appreciate you saying that thanks man it, it's it is the truth, Eddie, and so I just wanted to throw a, a band name. And I know you and I talked about this band, but I, you know I, I don't hear their name come up in the, you know in the conversation as much as I I just I just feel really strongly about these guys. And my, my sons, who who are you know musicians themselves, they always turn me on to new music in the car, and I like some of it. And but this band. Uh, an English band. They're called Nothing But Thieves. Nothing But Thieves. And and my, my boys put that on the car, and I was like, wait a minute, I want to keep playing that. And they 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 played their entire first album all the way through, and there was not a soft spot in the entire record. So I was, and the singer is amazing. They got these two guitar players, twin guitar players that play this cool thing. They got it going on, and I was like. So they came to L.A. They're, they're going to play the El Rey Theater. So my boys and I went down to see if, if they could do it live. Because this singer, he's got a voice that you, it's just, it, it's just unbelievable. And it, we went and saw him live, and they, they, they sold out the El Rey here in L.A., and they freaking kicked ass. And they're, they're a young band out of England, and they're, you know, like like all rock bands right now in the States, you know, you talk about rival sons that they were managed out of our office for for years, and right. they go over they they go overseas and they do great. Uh, nothing but thieves does, you know. They, they do you know twelve thousand people in London. They do nine thousand people in Amsterdam, and they come to the states and they they play the El Rey and the and the Fonda and places like that. But but they are. I, I would just be curious to 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 have your listeners just. Listen to the, there's a track called Amsterdam and it's it's on the the second Nothing But Thieves record and I'm just curious to see how you know Trunk Nation feels about Nothing But Thieves because I just I don't know I just got a feeling that uh, that that they're that, that they're gonna people are gonna discover them and and they they could be in the conversation you know the next time you bring this topic up. Well, you know what, Kevin? I know Ed, my producer, has got a track queued up. Ed, did you have that track, Amsterdam, or what did you have ready? No, I have that track, the one that he just mentioned, Amsterdam. Okay, so here's what we're going to do, Kev. i got to hit a break, and then we'll play a little bit of it going to break right now so everybody can have a listen to it. I wrote it down on my notes here. I'll, I'll search it and look it up and check it out on my own time as well. And um, I appreciate you calling in and giving us a few thoughts. Call any time, man. You're always welcome. I love it, Eddie. I, you know, I, now that I've done it, I was always afraid to do it. I'm always like, oh, I don't want to introduce the show. Eddie's got this flow going. But today I was just like, i got to call. So, all right. No, I'm that's sure. what it's about, show. man. It's inspiring. I mean, and that's awesome of you, just a band that you like, that you want to get the word out. So you got the number. You're welcome anytime. And if I'm in town when you play in Jersey, I'd love to come see you. You got it, Eddie. I love you, brother. You too, Kev. Take care, okay? All right, man. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Kevin Cronin from Mario Speedwagon putting in a word for nothing but thieves, another British band. And I got to be honest, I had not I've not heard of him. I think Kevin, though, when he was on this show, when I did it from L.A., did in fairness to Kevin, did mention that to me. Here's one other thing before we hear a track, though, and go to break and come back with a few more calls before we have to end. Here's another thing. And this factors into my personal Uh, discussions on whether I'm going to how I feel about a band is how many of these bands that we talk about emerging, sounding great, excitement, this and that, 
because this was a big thing I brought up on this show not too long ago, and you guys know it, and it became a big point of discussion, how many of them are actually doing it all real and all live. That's a huge factor for me. Because if I find out a newer band is, like some, are running nothing, but half the stuff is on tracks and vocals are on tracks, major loss of points, major loss of credibility, because it doesn't show that they're that good. Now, let's, real quick, let me run this down. The, the, the three bands we've been focused on here so far, Ghost, Struts, and Rival Sons, let's do the breakdown there. I would imagine, I'm almost certain, even though I haven't seen them live, just because of the type of band they are, that that Greta Van Fleet, I, not not Rival Sons, th- th- that's the next tier. But I know for a fact Rival Sons is all real. I've seen them live. They've got one of the best singers I've ever heard in Jay Buchanan. Uh, Greta Van Fleet, just because of what they do, I'm I'm ninety nine percent certain, even though I haven't seen them live, that they've got to be all real. Ghost, interestingly enough, their leader Tobias said. A lot of what they've been doing up to this point was running tracks and did have all kinds of stuff on tracks, but he has since changed that because it bothered him. He added musicians, and now it's real. Last night, I went into that strut show holding my breath because I was like, please, this band has such great choruses and such big sing-alongs, please, please. Please don't let me see this band. It would be heartbreaking to find out that they had tons of vocals on tracks. And I can exhale and report, and I, <laughs> this is the guy I am. I went backstage after the show, and I asked him point blank, go, you're not running tracks, right? The, to their credit, they did tell me that there are a few things on tracks, because if you listen to the Struts record, there are keyboard things, and there's some little keyboard sounds that they don't have the budget to have a human being play them. They're a four-piece band. So there is some very subtle keyboard sort of sounds that are barely audible. But all of it is, is real in terms of vocals and guitars and all that. So that's fine, as we established when we did the band's Faking It show a couple weeks ago. You got to put a little keyboards because you can't carry a keyboard player. I can live with that. little synth sound, I can live with that. What I'm talking about is when there's nobody near a microphone and huge choruses coming out or guitars coming out, nobody's playing a guitar. So most of these bands are doing it live and real, which is what we want. Big points for that always in my book. Ghost, to their credit, admitted, ah, we have been a track act for the most part, but now we've changed, and we are doing it mostly real. So big points for that. Let's hit a break. This is Nothing But Thieves, as recommended by Kevin Cronin. A little taste of this. We'll come back. We'll hit you. with a. We'll have a few more minutes for a few more calls about the emerging bands you're loving and that we're rooting for here on this Wednesday edition of Trunk Nation on Volume. Up. And um, let's see where we're going to go because we got so many that want to chime in on this, as you would imagine. Say hello to Tim, who's in Cleveland. Hey, Tim, thanks for waiting. You're on the air. Hey, I'm not going to ask how you're doing because I don't want to piss off that one dude that thinks it's a waste of time. So. <laughs> I mean, how, you I'm actually. You, know, you really, if you really want to know how I'm doing, everybody, uh, you want you want to know how I'm doing. I'm going to tell you I'm doing. No, 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 no. I'm okay. going to tell everybody Tim, how I'm doing. Tim, 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 you don't want to know. You don't want to. I'm know. peeling dead okay. skin off of my shoulders and back from a wicked sunburn from vacation that's itching like a mother. Oh. If that's what, if that's it, I'm working from my home studio today. Thank God because I am shirtless, which is horrifying to begin with. And then as I'm shirtless, I'm peeling dead itchy skin off of my back and shoulders as I'm doing a radio show. Thank God there's not a video component today. Eddie, thank God radio is not a visual medium. Tim, thank you for asking. Go ahead. Yeah, um, 100% <laughs> on board. Rival Sons. Uh, Rival Sons are great. They uh, not a derivative, not a derivative band, but I hear elements of so many classic bands. Like, uh, oh, yeah. vocally or musically, I hear maybe some Glenn Hughes, some Eric Burden of the Animals. I even hear a little bit of Motown, and I can't even tell you what song it would remind me of. But, but um, 
And there's definitely the Zeppelin. There's definitely Zeppelin in, in Rival Sons. There's, like you said, some of that early stuff. There's elements of the doors when they get kind of trippy at times. Yeah. There's definitely yeah. all that throwback stuff. They're, they're a phenomenal band. They really are. There's a breakdown that's almost parallel to a Blue Cheer song, but I, I would have to go research that. Also, they're not making waves. I only heard them on New Music Friday, and it blew my mind, the sound, because they were derivative of Bon Scott ACDC. The name is 42 Decibel. They're from Argentina. The dude has the Bon Scott snarl, and I think he even rips the solos, and he, he it's reminiscent to Angus. I mean, it was killer. And then um, the struts, I tried the struts, and... I don't want to alienate myself for all the reasons you say I agree with, but like Queen, I just never, I never got it, man. I don't know what it is. I, there's not have enough. You gone uh, to, have yeah. you gone to see, have you gone, have you seen the struts that's, live? That's what I'm saying. I, 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 opinions, thoughts are subject to change because I have not seen any of these bands live. Right, so, right. Because that, that's a big that's a big barometer, Tim. Like, I, I liked the Struts record, and thanks for the call. I'm up against the end of the show here. But I like the Struts record. But the game changer is when you see, see, there's a big, there's a big intangible with all, with all this. All these bands are having sales and doing well. But the Struts have something that, that the other bands that we're talking about here don't really have. And that is a star front man. This this guy, Luke Spiller, is a star. And I don't mean that in like a negative sense, like he's an ego guy or whatever, but he's he's got the look, he has the command of the audience, the command of the stage, the moves, the the voice, the personality. That is something that cannot be underestimated in this whole thing. And that's another big reason why for me they've got the the nose up, the, the the leg up, even though they might not be statistically there yet to be the band. Who's this, Ed? Is this 42 Decibel? Yeah, this is that 42 Decibel band. They literally sound just like ACDC. All right. Well, listen, thanks to everybody who called in. We'll do this again. Calls in now before the top of the hour when we talk to David Coverdale. He will be joining us at 3 p.m. Eastern time to talk about the new Whitesnake uh, activities, including their brand new single, which was just released today. We'll talk to him shortly. But until then, we'll talk to you at 844-686-5863, 844-6-VOLUME. Let's get to the busy phones right now, and we will begin with Rob, who is in Colorado. Hey, Rob, what's going on? Hey, Eddie. Hey, um, I was just calling about um, your show yesterday when you were giving all that praise to Nikki Six about using backing tracks. No, 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 no. Hold on. Wait right there. I did not give him praise about using back, backing tracks. I told, I said that I am still vehemently against it and don't believe in it. I gave him praise for being honest and admitting they did it. Big difference. Yes. But go ahead. Yes, you are correct. Sorry. But I, my concern with that is I think it would have been better if he would have done that when they were announcing their tour or before they did their final tour. I don't think it's worth giving them praise after they're retired. Well, two things on that. First of all, they did talk about it during their touring. Uh, Mick Mars did. Mick Mars talked about it on that metal show when Motley Crue was still an active band. He talked about it on my show on uh, on Hair Nation when I had him in the studio again while Motley was still touring. It, it when it comes, to, it's interesting because Motley Crue they never they really are unapologetic about it and to their credit which was my point they're open about it and they just say look you know we we're getting we're using it for backing vocals we're using it for certain tones and sounds in the show a lot of people know there's a pretty funny video floating around out there that when Tommy Lee would come out and sing Home Sweet Home, the piano wasn't really mic'd. He was kind of miming the piano because there was this bit uh, on YouTube that I saw a while ago where the piano bit, the intro to Home Sweet Home, started playing before Tommy was even in position at the piano. So I don't agree with any of this. Although, as I've said before, if you only have one track with a keyboard in it in your whole set, 
I'm okay with that. I'm not talking about stuff like that. I'm just talking about when a live show becomes not even a live show anymore. And uh, I don't agree at all. I think rock and roll should be live. That's the whole spirit of rock. That's what it should be and stand for. And and that's the whole beauty, the intangibles, the variables that happen when you're actually playing live. And that's what makes a good night versus a bad night or an okay night. And I, I think it flat out sucks what's going on in this world right now in rock very few people are talking about it although it is becoming way more prominent as you can see by nikki responding to it which let's be honest nikki's response was a response because of what kiss is doing and what kiss has said and also we know that motley is not happy because tommy lee tweeted about it because they feel that kiss with their current tour has ripped off motley stage show that's not a secret tommy lee went public with that so there's definitely some stuff going on here behind the scenes that's starting to leak out and people should speak out as i've said a thousand times speak your mind it's okay but i don't agree with beyond little things little sound effects or a keyboard bit being on a track i just you call me crazy but i think when you pay for a live ticket you should be seeing a live band i agree i like my rock live also but i think they should make these announcements when they announce their tour also to be fair to the fans I agree with you completely about that, Rob. And to that point, some callers have called my show and said, hey, should we, uh, should, should, do we have a case to get our money back if we pay for a live show and find out it wasn't live? I, I don't know. I don't know how that would work. I don't even have to find some sort of, you know, uh, civil suit lawyer or whatever that would be. I, I don't know much about the legal world, but it's a valid point. It's kind of like a bait and switch. It's it's crazy. It's crazy what's going on. But and thank you, Rob, for the call. But I have been on this, and I I, I can't be more clear about this. I have been on this issue in rock. Pull the tapes. Listen for probably about two years now. This is not new for me to be talking about at all. Every day we see new offenders and we talk about it, but, but you see what's happening here. This is really starting to get out there. Now Motley's talking about it. Motley decides they got to come clean about it. They have in the past. Nick, I think Nikki's point in making that statement yesterday is he's like, look, if I'm going to call someone else out, and let's be honest, you don't have to read between the lines, he was calling out Kiss. There's no question about that. And and look, Sebastian Bach, <laughs> a post on Blabbermouth a little while ago, Sebastian claiming that, you know, he went to see Kiss and they're singing their asses. I mean, Sebastian is such a hardcore Kiss fan that even if you show him proof, he'd be in denial about it, which is crazy because when I talked about giving praise to all the rock bands, I sent a tweet about a week ago saying how much I give praise to all the bands that are actually doing it 100% live. Sebastian replied to that tweet and said, hell yeah, you're speaking the truth, Eddie. And then he goes and sees a band that's blatantly lip syncing and defends it when there's proof everywhere. So, you know, there's a lot of people that just don't want to admit what's going on. They just there's such a blind worship that they won't even say it, even if they're presented with blatant proof. And then you got other guys that are like, hey, wait a minute, you're going to call me out? Okay, I'm going to come clean, and now I'm calling you out, which is what's going on with with the whole Motley thing right now. So it's uh, it's it's pretty it's pretty crazy uh, what's happening. But I'm glad. One thing I'm glad about is this is becoming an issue. More people are talking about it. More people are looking into it. More people are uh, more bands that are fully live are taking the credit for it, and the bands that aren't are being forced to kind of come clean about it like Nikki Six just did yesterday. And look, if Motley now ever does anything again, you know what you're getting. The big question I have, and like I said, we're going to do that, something more on this somewhere down the line, but the big question I have is we as fans, and you hear somebody like our previous caller or, or what have you, that say, well, I wish I'd know in advance. If I knew in advance, I would know whether I want to go or not. How many people... When, when, when we are seeing people accepting anything now, lineups with no one, zero original members, multiple versions of the same band, uh, holograms coming down the pike, bands singing to, to tracks, or not even half of the stuff isn't even real that people are hearing, and people go. 
people still go. So the bigger question is, is if all of this comes out, like I said before, in the pop world, this has become normal, standard fare, accepted. It, it, we can't let that get to this place in the rock world. And But if people just accept it and pretend it's not happening or look the other way or, or are just utter in utter denial about it because they don't want to believe that their heroes are doing it, it's gonna. It's just gonna keep snowballing, and everyone will do it because as long as people buy the tickets, it doesn't matter. And the promoters. Let me tell you guys something. Promoters couldn't give two shits. Any concert promoter out there at any level cares about one thing: putting the logo on the ad mat. And do people buy tickets to the show and does it fill the building? They don't care who's in the band. They don't care how many original members. They don't care if it's on tracks. They don't care if it's real. They don't care if the band, good, bad, indifferent. They don't care about anything. Do they sell tickets? Look at the stats. Do they sell tickets? They're in the business to sell tickets. You think they're going to be a line of defense on this? Come on. Uh... Let's see here. How about we say hello to Jay, who's in North Carolina. Hi, Jay. Hey, how you doing? Great show. Good, man. Thank you. Uh, got a question. Uh, I'm just always curious. I mean, I'm a rock and roll fan, and a lot of this music, you know, comes out of the blues. And uh, there's some great guitarists in the blues world, and I'm just curious that why some of them maybe don't get a little more exposure in the crossover, kind of like Stevie Ray Vaughan done. Uh, you know, uh, I'm going to see Joe Bonamassa in about a month, but I mean, nobody tries to kill a guitar as good as he does. You know, but I was just curious about that. Well, I think there's just very few outlets for their music to be exposed, Jay. There aren't a lot of blues radio stations out there. And you really have to make a a hybrid blues rock record to have a chance of getting any rock radio play. And if you were going to get play with that genre of music, it would be a classic rock radio formats, which by and large don't play a lot of new music to begin with. So it's a very, very tough place for these art, those sort of artists to find outlets for exposure for their music. Bon Massa is is a massive talent, massively popular in Europe and England. Super super popular here too as well. Don't get me wrong, but incredible yeah. the venues Joe plays there. There are some great emerging blues rock artists out there: Tyler Bryant and the Shakedown, Jared James Nichols. There's some great young talent coming up. I love that genre of music, like that blues rock stuff. But you got to really be able to seek it out on your own and do the homework to find it because there's just there's so few outlets for new rock music to be played, let alone uh, a sort of offshoot of that. So very, very difficult for those guys to get to get any sort of real mainstream uh, awareness. Gary Clark Jr., you know, another real talented guy, I like what he did. does as well. He's getting a lot of traction right now. Yeah. Well, you can say thanks to Sirius Radio for that. I mean, you know, you think about it. Back in the 60s and 70s, as I grew up, there were no blues channels. I mean, rock and roll channels, country channels and stuff, but... uh. You know, like you said, you really did. You had to search it out. And uh, I reckon now with uh, satellite radio, you know, more exposure, I've come to really like listening to that a whole lot because uh, great music. Yeah, I agree with you. And some great players and some great young emerging players as well. Thank you, Jay, for the call. So I would agree with you completely, but it's never been mainstream. Even thinking back, you know, Kenny Wayne Shepherd, he crossed over, had a song called Blue on Black years ago, and that crossed over into rock. Johnny Lang, who's still out there playing, he was super young when he started. He, he had a song, and it was called Lie to Me. He crossed over into rock. For those guys to get some more mainstream awareness in the rock world, they've got to find a way Way to get crossed into the rock world a little bit and you got some guys that are trying to do it right now jared james nichols uh tyler bryant young emerging artists that i would definitely say keep an eye on that are real good uh, uh jared james nichols is uh he's going out opening for somebody i just who who i just saw he's on a tour he's had some great touring opportunities i just saw him jam with nancy wilson at nam so these are some names to keep an eye open for and uh, some real emerging talents. But that music has always been regulated to the hardcore fans in a certain segment. And they, uh, unless they can find a way to cross into rock. Gary Moore, 
the late Gary Moore. He was a hard rock guy, made blues records, and then crossed into the blues rock world a little bit as well. Had a semi hit with a song called Still Got the Blues. Just, um, you know, just a, it's a tough thing. It's tough for rock. And then when you get a offshoot of rock like that, it's, it's even harder for those guys to find an outlet. Let's say hello to David, who's in Phoenix. Hi, David. Hey, Eddie. Thanks for taking my call, man. First of all, I wanted to uh, congratulate you for being away from home on Valentine's Day and seemingly having a happy wife back at the house. Like you're, <laughs> you, you seem to figure something out that the rest of us haven't, man. So, well, what I figured out is that – what? thank you, David. But what I figured out is that all the bills are paid. <laughs> what they figured hey, out. <laughs> that, it's funny how that works, but you yeah, know, maybe and, you could do a half-hour show on that. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. hilarious. But, you know. <laughs> and a gift showed up <laughs> at the house today, so there's that too. There it is. Hopefully your bags can make it back with you, too. I've been following that whole saga throughout the week as well. So Yeah, yeah. No, we're all good on the bags, man. and uh, I'll be doing a dinner this weekend with the family, and uh, some gifts did arrive at, from my mom and the wife and everybody. So everybody's fine back there, but thank you. Yeah, no worries. We're all cheering for you. Hey, man, so I, uh, very much like you, my first concert, I'm, I just turned 50, so I'm a couple years younger than you, but my first concert was Kiss in 1977, so I was eight years old. Family member brought me. And like you, it changed my life, right? Um, completely got me into rock and roll and really was the catalyst to get me into that. And, and then obviously from there, I became a guitar player myself and have gone down numerous routes of multiple favorite bands and have been going to see concerts ever since and uh, repaid the favor to my son, who I took him to see Kiss and Crew when he was three. It was one of those, I guess I have him for the weekend and I'm babysitting, so he's going, you know, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. He lost his mind, became a huge fan, took him to see Kiss and Def Leppard. So we went last night uh, here in Phoenix, so the end of the road tour Kiss. So you were in my head as I walked into the arena. So I'm thinking about <laughs> all the, the samples and everything. So I'm telling myself to you know, have a good time, go into it. So I went into it, as you said, knowing what I was going to get. Right. What I really didn't expect, and as you know, it's, it's Kiss, so it's a, it's a show. It's I got, hey, David, I got a break, so make your point in 20 seconds because I got to hit this break. Sorry, man. Yeah, man, no worries. So Kiss was the catalyst for me and for a lot of people in my family. So, it, you know, for us, it was a great way to kind of introduce music and huge entertainment to them and then get them into rock. And so I, I knew that they were doing lip syncing. Just wanted your thoughts on because it's a great show. People, if you're into Kiss, go see it know what you're going to get, but really you have an opportunity to, to hopefully turn on some young people to uh, that. All right, David, I got your point, man. I got, I'm sorry I got to hang up on you, dude. I got to go. Make Call me back another time. David Coverdale coming up right after the break. Trump phones right now. You guys are going to take it the rest of the way with anything you want in the world of rock. As usual, our toll-free number is 844-686-5863, 844-6-VOLUME. The uh, lines are jammed, but keep trying. We'll move quick and try to get as many people in as possible between now and 4 Eastern when we wrap it up for a Tuesday. We'll begin on line number one and say hello to Louie, who is in California. Hey, Lou. Hi. Now, I have a comment about the 80s rock outfits. Now, it's fine to look good, but not the cause of their musical talent. I still like how they let their hair grow, if evenly, because men can have long hair, too, and there's an art to it, like paintings and statues. And for outfits, I kind of thought of maybe wearing regular clothes with matching colors with different color details while still wearing accessories like gloves. Lou, 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 Lou. What are you talking about? Uh, well, you know some bands that have existed back in the 80s and come and gone. You know, people like how people mock the bands for the way they look and sure. stuff. Sure, yes, rather yes. Than, uh, rather than commenting about their musical abilities, like their songs specifically. Well, you're right. I, and, and Lou, that's something, and thank you for your call, as always. I... I, I've said that a million times. I mean, there's a lot of marginalization of 80s music because of what those guys look like. The dreaded term hair band, hair metal, that's what it was derived as, as a shot at those guys for being nothing but style over substance. And I've continually maintained that that was just the fashion of the time. So, yeah, a lot of people look silly and... People look silly who weren't in rock bands, too, if you want to look at it through that lens. Every era had a fashion statement. Every era had a fashion sense. That was the fashion of then. Colorful, big hair, the whole thing. A lot of people rocked that look. A lot of people that weren't in bands rocked that look. The mullet, whatever it was. Who cares? Who cares? I, I prefer to look at, you know, look at music with 
or listen to music and just, okay, does it hold up? Do I still like it? Is it still good? Or is it not good? I don't care what the band looks like on the back of the jacket. Sure, it's a sign of the times. It's fun to see. But it shouldn't be something that, that determines and governs the credibility or the viability of the music. But for some reason, for some reason, with that era of music, it, it's continually, the fashion of the time is continually used to marginalize it and make fun of it and goof on it. And I just never understood that. And it's just, I think it's ridiculous. Frank in San Diego. Hi, Frank. Hey, hey Eddie. I just had a quick question. Um, Motley Crue, they're like one of the biggest bands in the history of music. And they're not in the rock world. Whoa, 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 whoa. That might be a little strong. That might be a little strong. Motley Crue were a big band, but one of the biggest bands in the history of music. Frank, that's a little strong. I mean, you know, come on. Like, Dr. The, the first two albums had more hits than the majority of, you know, pop music in the 80s. Whoa, 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 Frank, I love you. I love Motley Crue. But let's let's mm -hmm. be honest here. There were no hits yeah. at all on the first record in terms of hits. In terms of hit singles, there was not one on the first record. Okay, it's true. But on the second and third album, you have to agree with that. Home Sweet Home. Second Home album, Home if you're talking hits, if you're talking like chart position hits, no, big videos and big songs and big rock songs, yeah, bona fides okay, across yeah. the board That's hits. I'd say probably the biggest hit, probably chart position wise, was probably Home Sweet Home for Motley Crue. Probably. But I don't have the numbers in front of me. No, I'm not arguing right. with you that, that Motley Crue are not a big band. They certainly were and are still. But to say one of the biggest bands in the history of rock is a little strong. When you say something like that, you think of the Beatles, you think of the Stones, you think of, I mean, AC and DC, you think of, um, you know, uh, just iconic giant bands. And, and, you know, Motley is just a cut below that in terms of, I'm not talking about their quality or anything about them, but just in terms of where they sit, they're not quite that big. Okay, I, I understand that. But, like, how come they're not in the Rock and Hall of Fame? Whereas, like, someone like, you know, I'm not going to name any names, but you know who I'm talking about. People that don't deserve to be are in. Who are <laughs> well, name names. <laughs> Go ahead, Frank. Uh, let it rip. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... I do. <laughs> Who do you think? Well, well, Frank, I think the answer, look, here, let's get to the real question. How big Motley Crue is or was is, is uh, you know, d d can, can be debated. There's nobody that could argue that they okay, weren't yeah. a big band. They sold a lot of records, very popular band, hit records. But, you know, they had some really stinker records in there, too, throughout their career, like most bands do. Okay, but they right. are a loved band, a celebrated band, uh, they got a lot of traction off of being very public with their story in the dirt. I suspect they'll get a whole nother big hit with this movie coming up. So, yes, no one could argue that they are an important band, an influential band. And I would not argue for a minute that they should absolutely be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Why they have not even been nominated is because what kind of band is Motley Crue, Frank? An amazing band. But what genre like, would you, what I genre, have, clearly yeah, you're a Motley fan, but what genre would you call Motley? A glam band. No, band. no, no. Well, well at times, well, at oh, times. An 80s, band, an 80s band, an 80s band. Well, an 80s band and a hard rock metal band. At time, Motley, you know, it's funny when you look at Motley, they've gone, they've gone Within the confines of the big umbrella of hard rock, Motley Crue's taken a lot of turns in their in their career in terms of what they look like and even at times what they sound like. So on something like Shout at the Devil, that's that's a pretty much a metal record, as is some stuff on Too Fast for Love, which has some sort of glam elements in it as well. And then you get to Theater of Pain, which I don't think, and neither does Motley think, is a very good record because they were loaded out of their heads on drugs at the time. But if you look at what they look like at that time, look at, you want to talk about the look and describing their look, leather and studs, kind of somewhat glammy first record, Shout at the Devil, pure on metal look, metal sound, and then you get to Theater of Pain and Total Sign of the Times, and that's when they're like full-on glammed up and whatever they're doing, and then you get to Girls, 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 and they're like biker dudes. So they they looked and had a lot of different looks in their career, but at the end of the day, Motley Crue is a hard rock slash metal band, and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame hates that stuff. They hate it.
<laughs> and they reluctantly put it in and wait till the last second. So I agree completely with you, Frank, that Motley Crue should be a candidate for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But and I think I think there are people that call this show and hit me with bands like, do you ever think I don't know, they'll say, do you ever think Twisted Sister will go on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Like, what are you smoking? People will call me up and they'll be like, hey, do you ever think Rat will go on the Rock and Roll Fame? Like, what? Now, you can make a case for Rat. Twisted, all these bands I love and they're friends. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, when you look at Twisted Sister, it's it's two songs. It's not going to be, they're not going to be in a conversation for the Hall of Fame. So I laugh because I see these interviews like somebody recently asked Winger, hey, do you think you'll ever go on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Like, what kind of question is that? Why would you even put the band on the spot like that, asking them that question? Of course they're never going in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's idiotic. But a band like Motley Crue, I think absolutely should be. And I do think there will come a day when they will be in. Absolutely. But they have been eligible now for first records, 12, what, 81? Okay. Yeah. 81, 91, 96. Hell, they they've been eligible for about twelve years, so they've been a, they've been a long time snub already. So, overdue. Do I think they'll get there? Yes, maybe. Maybe with this spike, this movie may give them. It might open up the eyes of the Hall of Fame a little bit. But I agree with you; they absolutely should be in, and I do think they will get in. All right, all right. Thank you very much, Eddie. We love Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, man. Appreciate you calling. So Frank's not off base at all about the viability of Motley and the deservingness of Motley going in. But where he's just a, a little strong to say Motley, one of the biggest bands of all time. A little strong. When you think biggest bands of all time, you think Beatles, you think Stones, you think Zeppelin, you think The Who. So that's, that's rarefied air. So we can't, we got to keep it in check a little bit there. Mike in PA. What's going on, Mike? Hi, Eddie. Uh, a few weeks ago, you were talking about uh, Mother Love Bone, how you how they are a, like a transition between the 80s rock and 90s rock bands. Yep. Another band that I think fell into that category were the War Babies, and they pretty much, I only think they released one album. I was just wondering if you remember them and what your thoughts are on them. I remember the name, and I think they were on Columbia, if I'm not mistaken, but I don't remember much more about them. Refresh my memory, Mike. They had a song, I think their closest thing to a hit that they had was, uh, it was called Don't Hang Me Up. Mm. Yeah, I don't remember much about them. I, I remember, I, th I think I want to say early 90s, their record may have come out, late 80s, yeah. early 90s. Yeah, that's about right, like 91 or so. Uh, was there any, was there anybody in that band that went on to do something else? I, I kind of think there was, but I can't remember. The one of the guys was in a band, uh, TKO, before the war, right. movies, which I'm not really familiar with them too much. Right. Ed but, just sent me a note. Yeah, Hang Me Up is the name of the song that was their single. Yeah. Uh, yeah Mike, no, I don't... I wanted I, to get your thought. Yeah, I don't know enough about them. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike, Ed is going to play a little bit of Hang Me Up from War Babies when we go into our next break, so we'll get a little taste of uh, remembering War Babies. But I do remember the name. Thank you, Mike. I do remember positive comments about them at the time and positive reviews, but they clearly never broke through. On the plane last night on my tra latest traveling odyssey, I read... My favorite thing to do is read all my magazines and get caught up on all my rock reading when I'm traveling. And I read the latest Metal Hammer, the latest Classic Rock. And there was a great, I think it was Classic Rock, the 50 greatest AOR albums of all time. AOR stands for either album-oriented rock, which I've always considered it to stand for. They considered it to be adult-oriented rock. But... The the they had some great like sort of deep nugget albums in there if you're into that sort of thing that uh, War Babies wouldn't even be, wouldn't from what I remember about them wouldn't be in that category but they had some deep records in there that jarred my memory about just great very melodic mainstream rock stuff if you're into that the number one the the number one AOR record of all time in their survey was Journey Escape. That was the number one. 
But, you know, Toto 4 is in there, Foreigner 4, the two Boston albums, Third Stage and the first one. But what was interesting, Heart, the, the self-titled one, the comeback record, what was interesting about it was they had, in some instances, interviews now with the artist talking about making those records. And I read the interview with Ann Wilson of Heart talking about the... You know, the record with Never and uh, What About Love and all that, the big comeback record, which I think was like 84. And they they widely have kind of sort of tried to distance themselves from that in recent years and sort of disown themselves from it. They hated the fact that they didn't write most of those songs and what they looked like. And again, back to that fashion sense of the 80s and all that. So for a long time, they, they kind of were negative about that stuff and reluctantly, they'd be reluct reluctant to even play some of it in their live shows. But in this interview with Ann that I read yesterday, she was a little more open about it and understanding about it and said, hey, look, you know, uh, we were in a tough spot. If we didn't have a hit record, we were going to get dropped and we weren't going to have a record deal. And she said that, you know, in retrospect, it saved their asses. They may not have had heart may not even be a band anymore and be relevant today if it wasn't for the fact that they had that success in the 80s. So as much as they were sort of bitter about the fact that for the first time they weren't writing the songs and they were subject to these stylists and put them in outfits they weren't comfortable in. They do now, in retrospect, at least according to this latest article, acknowledge that ah, without that, they were pretty much dead in the water around 81, 82. Even though they made some great records at that time, records I liked a lot, Private Audition, Passion Works, there's some, there's some records in that in that period for Hart, very late 70s, early 80s, with some great songs on it. But they weren't hits. They didn't connect. I love that stuff. I, I'm so geeky. Like, I love the... I love analyzing and looking at and listening to and finding these gems when a band was at their worst in terms of sales and falling apart and replacement members and whatever they're going through. I love looking at those periods and finding the stuff that is really good and things that were kind of overlooked. Like for Heart, they have a song called Cities Burning that was from that period. I think it was on, I forget what, it might have been on Private Audition. I don't remember, but that's a great song. What a great riff that has. On Passion Works, they have a song called How Can I Refuse. Great song. But that was just before they got big again, when they were kind of floundering. I think of Aerosmith. You know, I love the rock and the hard place period, the one period of Aerosmith when they didn't have Joe Perry or Brad Whitford, but they made a really great record. And so did Joe when he went and made Joe Perry Project records. I always find those periods of times in, in bands' histories pretty interesting to check out. Let's get Eric in Atlanta on. Hey, Eric. Hey. Hey. How you doing? Good. You're live on the air. What's going on today? Well, maybe off subject, but maybe right on. I'm going to tell you, John Bonham said specifically to say hello and to, to you and both Ed. Who because did? John Bonham. John Bonham? He be a drummer for Kid. Uh, for, uh, <laughs> I'm aware of who he is, but how did he say hello to us, Eric? Well, I woke up 2.30 Saturday morning, completely restrained in the Marietta, Atlanta, uh, Kendis Stone Hospital. Turned out my wife had to bring me in because I had lung infection. I was completely out of it. Couldn't hold my balance. And it was touch and go. And uh, My wife says she wasn't too worried, but looking back at it, I, sh I, sure, I sure should have been. Well, Eric, I, I I hear where you're going with this story, and uh, I am sorry that at a time like this where I got to cut you off and drop you here, I don't mean no, to do that. No, I just wanted to thank you for taking my call and for uh, being there today. It was a real pleasure to listen to you. 
Eric, thank you, and be well, man. Thank you so much. Right. That means a lot to me, and be well. Take care of yourself, man. I, I hate to have to do that, Eric, but you know i got to hit these breaks on time, especially at the one at the top of the hour. So, Eric, thank you. Take care of yourself. I appreciate those comments and sentiments. I really do. Back with an NBA You buy it. You feel duped when bands come back after you spent your hard-earned money because you thought you were seeing them the last go-around. Anything you want to hit me with, it's all good. 844-686-5863, volume Speaking of Louisiana, Robert in Baton Rouge. Hey, Rob. Hey, Eddie. How are you? Great, buddy. What do you got? Uh, yeah, I was just uh, going to comment about the, uh, the farewell tour. I really think Motley Crue and, and Rush, like you say, won't be coming back. And uh, I don't know if you saw the interview on the Rock and Roll Road Trip with uh, Sammy Hagar, where he interviewed Vince Neil about a week ago. You know, there's a lot of uh, tension there. And he said even uh, Mick Morris lives in Nashville where he lives, and they said they haven't been in touch or even talked. I did see that. That was actually done about a year ago. That's not from the current uh, season of that show. But still, it is it is relevant, Robert. You're right. They talk about the – Vince talks about the fact that he doesn't talk to any of the guys ever since the end. And even though Mick lives in Nashville where Vince also now has a house, it's they, they weren't in communication. I don't know what's changed. I mean, that what may bring them back is this movie. When it comes out, they're going to have – I'm sure they're going to get together and do some sort of release for it. I'm sure they're going to do some sort of premiere where they'll all come together for it. Whether they actually play or not, I have no idea. But, yes, the dynamic in that band has always been strained, and I don't know where it all sits now, but we'll see. I A lot of people think Motley will come back at some point. I put it at 50-50. I'm not so sure. Yeah. I agree with you, though, Robert, on Rush, because Rush is right. just – Neil is done. But from people that I've talked to, Neil doesn't even have drums in his house anymore. He's just done, done, done. Question there becomes: Does Getty and Alex, you know, do they do anything together or separately, and are they also completely done? And I know at the time, if you watch the documentary Time Standstill, they they both expressed an interest to keep doing things, but now it's been a couple of years and we haven't really heard anything beyond very small things. You know, Alex does did some producing and guested on a record. You know, Getty does a lot of traveling and things like that, so so we'll see. But in fairness to Rush, if they did come back, you can't really call them on it because they never said definitively, you know, they never called that last tour a farewell tour. They never used that word. Right. Hey, so you it's get a little different. a hand grenade when you get down to New Orleans. That's it. I kept saying mind eraser. It's called hand grenade. You're right, Robert. I had one, and it, 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 it it's amazing, man. It used to be the drink was the hurricane. That was the big thing. But now it seems like the hand grenade's the new one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It'll get you but right. I, I like the hurricane. I went. Thank you, Robert. I went to Pat O'Brien's. I knocked back a hurricane last time I was there. Because before, I shot an episode of this show that I'm doing for Access all in New Orleans. This season, my first season of this show, which again is going to premiere on July 1st, there's two, there's going to be two of the eight or nine episodes from New Orleans. One is Voodoo Fest and one will be Jazz Fest, which I'm shooting this coming weekend. But yes, the mind eraser. <laughs> it is potent as hell, man. Rick in New York City. Go ahead, Rick. Hey, Eddie. What's up? How you doing? Good, man. Welcome. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh... Um, I really have something different I wanted to talk to you about because I called before you went on this whole thing. So, uh, about, well, go ahead, man. Uh, hit, hit me with it real. Hit me with it real quick, Rick. Go ahead. You've been waiting a long time. All right. I, I uh, uh, going back to uh, the uh, the meet and greets. You know, uh, my girl always comes to concerts to me like she came to see Rush and she came to see Maiden, and she's not really into that stuff, but. You know, so she wanted to go to a concert, and she bought, like, the meet-and-greet package for the band Weezer. So I said, all right, I'll go with you. You go to these concerts to me. And we did the meet-and-greet. I was wearing my that metal shirt. shirt, And the, the guy, the front man from Weezer, came up to me, and he was like, oh, I love that show. I love Eddie Trunk. And and I just thought you would find this entertaining. He was like, you know, I'm really a big metal guy. Me and Eddie have a lot in common. We both worked in uh, record stores when we were younger. Uh, we're both huge Kiss fans. And he goes, I was dying to get my agent to get me on that metal show, but I just figured I wouldn't fit in. <laughs> 
We you talk it was probably Rivers Cuomo, right? Yeah, Rivers Cuomo. And then, you know, that whole thing with the Buddy Holly glasses and everything else, that's pretty much a front. He was in a conversation with me for like 20 minutes. My girl was going out of her mind because she couldn't get a word in with him. She was the one who wanted to talk to him. And he's telling me that, you know, when he moved to California from the East Coast, he was in a band, which he was, wasn't a singer. He was a, 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 one of the dueling guitar players in a Queensryche type of band. And he said well, that he moved to L.A., and, you know, the Power Pop thing came out. They got signed to Geffen, and uh, Rick Ocasek became their producer. But he says, I'm a metal guy at heart. And he goes, I really wanted to be on that metal show. He goes, but I figured the audience wouldn't know me or accept me. But he goes, then I started seeing people, like, in my genre on the show yeah. and people who aren't hard rock and metal on it. He's like, wow, oh, man, I wish I wish I would have did it. <laughs> yeah, so I just figured you'd find that entertaining. Oh, yeah, I'm glad you told me that, Rick. And I'm not surprised because I had heard that about Rivers Cuomo. And I also, I mean, Weezer has a lot of heavy heavy guitar tones in their band and the sound of their yeah, band. I was I was actually at a... The album was self-produced. The second album was self-produced. And it wasn't. And it was a commercial failure at first because it was very dark and heavy. And Rolling Stone called it the second worst album of the year. And then five years, six years later in 2002, they said it was like number 55 of the albums of all time. They changed it to a five-star review. And they said it was one of the most influential albums from that era. And it just goes to show you, he's really a metal guy at heart, and he's and he, he was like talking to me forever. My 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 girl was like kicking me, saying, "Oh, I hate you! I hate you! I hate you!" You found you found a way to get some extra time in a paid meet and greet wearing a that metal show shirt. Got you the yeah, extra time. He was, he was talking to you. He says he's been listening to you, and then why he watches your show all the time. He wanted to be on it. He wanted to talk about Kiss with you. He wanted to well, talk about Alan Smith with you. I'll have him on any time. I mean, I'll have a Rick. I got to run. I'm up against a break. Thank you for that story. I'll I'll have him on any time. I mean, I I I love hearing stuff like that. One of the things we tried to do on that metal show was to get people that were into the music but necessarily didn't ne perform it themselves. We had a singer songwriter on by the name of Matt Nathanson, who's the furthest thing from metal, but he was a huge fan of the show. We had him on. I would add Rivers Cuomo on in a second if somebody reached out to me. And I was at, speaking of festivals, shooting my TV series that's coming up, I was at a festival that Weezer played called Kaboo last year in San Diego, and I watched some of them, and they are very heavy guitar sounds in that band. So I would have them on this show or any time. I'd love to talk music with the guy. I'm going to write that down and try to reach out to him. I don't know how, but I'll see if we can, you know, social media or some... You know, so for whatever outlets, but we'll at least we can make good with it. And, you know, that's the thing. I was at that festival. I would have put him on camera for that show if I would have been able to get to him. But sometimes these guys have go betweens and handlers and they, they don't want them doing things like that. Or you know, you, you got to really get right to the people because sometimes there's some I'm not saying it's the case with Weezer, but sometimes there's some BS sort of stuff that surrounds it and you just can't get to the actual people, you know. So, um, no, I would add the guy on in a second. I had heard he was a rock fan. He name checks Kiss, I think, in, in some of those bands and some of their songs. But that's where we were going with that metal show and the evolution of that show when the channel went down, where we were trying to broaden it and bring in all sorts of artists that just loved rock, and we started doing it, and then, of course, you know, it ended. Well, thanks for that. That's a great. That's a that's a great story. Hey, we got one more break. We got to take care of. We'll come back. We can. You want to keep talking about VIP meet and greets, which people are calling back to a little bit today, which is fine. Or you want to talk about the farewell tour stuff that I just read. Whatever it is, we'll grab your calls to finish up right after this on Trunk Nation. On Twitter with a verified account, so I just sent a tweet and told him to hit me up if it's legit and he wants to come on the show. So I'd love to talk rock with the guy, talk rock with anybody who's truly a rock fan. So I would love to do that. So thanks for the tip there for, I think it was Rick in New York for uh, letting us know. This is Robert in Massachusetts. Hey, Rob. How you doing, Eddie? Uh, status Quo had a top 40 hit back in 1968 called Matchstick Men. Well, I know Ed Robinson just a little while ago played Rockin' All Over the World into the break, which was status quo. I know that song. I don't know if I know Matchstick Man. Yeah, it came. It was sort of like a psychedelic hit in 1968. It went top 40. I don't know how high it went. 
And I saw the Rush tour, and I have a feeling that this tour that Elton John's going to be on will be his last. When and they, I also when they think that, what, go ahead, Robert. Sa- the one, oh, the one with Black Sabbath too. I saw two shows of that two years ago. I don't think they'll be back as a group either. Yeah, you got to think, and thank you, Robert, for the call. You got to think when you get to the level of. Elton John, or I should say the age, quite frankly, of Elton John and the guys in Sabbath, that, yeah, that's it. I mean, Tony Iommi is going to have an ongoing battle the rest of his life with cancer. Thankfully, he's doing well with that. Bill Ward just had another heart. Even though Bill Bill Ward wasn't a part of the farewell tour, he had a heart attack recently. He revealed again. Ozzy struggles vocally. So I, I, yeah, I would think that that's done. And Elton John, the same thing. Now, Elton John's going to take a long time to say goodbye. But again, at his age, when you get these guys in the, in, starting to get in the 70 range, yeah. They're not going to have a choice to not come. I mean, they might want to come back, but they're not going to have a choice. To, they're not going to be able to. Luke in Salt Lake City. Hey, Luke. Hey, Eddie, how's it going? Great. Listen, I, I'm okay with, with, with bands doing the farewell tour as long as it's going to be a farewell tour. But by and large, most bands don't stay away. The money talks and they come back. You know, my wife and I went and saw the crew twice on their farewell tour because they came through Salt Lake City twice. And, you know, how are you not going to go see Motley Crue every chance you get, right? Uh, so I just think they need to just, if they're going to stay away, stay away. Uh, also, real quick, if I could, you had a segment on your show like last week, the week before, about which rock star would you bring back if you could. And I wanted to suggest one that I think would be a, a great guest on your show, and it's a little far left, but he did put it on an album in the 80s, Matt Sam Kennison. Who? Sam Kennison. Sam Kennison? Yep. Are you being serious? Yep. You want Sam Kennison to come on my show? No, 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 no. I'm saying, no, you did the segment about which rock star oh. would you resurrect from the dead. <laughs> I thought you were messing with me, Luke. I'm like, you, you didn't get the no, memo man. that Sam died? <laughs> no, I, I know. Uh, I'm just thinking he would have been a great guest on your show. Right, I got you now. He was a phenomenal comic, but he was a rock star, too. He did put out that album. Right. Although it was kind of a spoof, but it was a good album. Yeah, I did the, the wild thing and all that. I didn't hear the part where you said about this from the segment of when we could bring somebody back. And I'm just like, yeah. wait a minute. You, we, we really, we got somebody that doesn't know Sam Kinison died. It's like, I'd love to have him on, but uh, in the next life, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Trunk, Nation, Trunk Nation Afterlife will do a Sam Kinison interview. No, Absolutely. Luke, good, <laughs> uh, good call on that, man. Thank you. For, Luke, let me ask you something, though. Back to the farewell yeah. thing. You said... You went to Motley twice because it was the farewell, and you had to see Motley twice before it ended. That being yeah. said, and I'm sure you paid good money to go, if they came yeah. back, if they came back and did another tour and said, now nah, we changed our mind, There's this is the real question. How would you feel? Would you feel duped, or would you welcome them back and go? Uh, you know, that's a good question. The short answer uh, we saw them twice, like I said, with Alice Cooper opening up both times. We saw them outdoors and we saw them indoors. The outdoor show, it wasn't very good. Neither band were good. Alice Cooper, I thought, was very very vanilla on stage. He had no energy. And the crew just uh, kind of the same thing. There was no energy. The second time around, we paid a lot more money to get better seats. And it was a hell of a show. I Honestly, I've seen a lot of concerts in my 42 years. And that was one of the best concerts I've ever seen. If they came back, I'd be kind of pissed off because we probably spent $400 on tickets for that second show. And I would be kind of pissed off. But I'm not going to be surprised because I also think about they're notoriously bad with money. They're going to need the money. They're going to get paid an exorbitant amount of money to come back, right? And if it's a chance to see the crew again, I'm going to take it. There you go. That's what I was looking for. Thank you, Luke, for the call. See, that's the thing. Luke admitted I spent a lot of money. Yeah, I'd feel duped, but yeah, I would go. Of course, if you're a fan, you're going to go. These guys know that. They got gotcha. you. They got gotcha. you. <laughs> That's great stuff. Thank you, Luke. <laughs> they know you're going to go. If you think that, ah, like Luke said, <laughs> some of these guys are back with their money. <laughs> I was uh, going back. If you're listening to the show earlier, I was talking about that Jonathan Cain book that I'm reading right now. He was he was uh, 
it, we started making money with Journey. His first big check for the year was like nine hundred and something thousand dollars, so just shy of a million dollars. And then he didn't know what to do. He never had money in his career. And then he went and he he had some an advisor that told him to invest in an office building, and that thing went belly up. And this, you know, that that happens. He went through a bad divorce. He lost like a million dollars in that. When when Jonathan Cain joined the Babies the band with John Waite and all that, when he joined the Babies in his book, the Babies were, after their first album, a million dollars in debt. By the time he, John Waite, the reason why the Babies woke, uh, broke up is because they couldn't get out of debt. Even though they had a couple of hits, they were, uh, <laughs> they were $750,000 in debt still. And John Waite was just, John Waite just left. He's like, I, we're never going to get out from this. Being an opening act, making what we're making, get, having a little bit of album sales, we can't recover from it. Cut the losses, get out of the band. He went. That's when he went solo, and that's when Jonathan Cain went and got the gig in Journey. But yeah, there's stuff that goes on behind the scenes that can fuel this too. But at the end of the day, you say you're going back. You're going back. Uh, we only have limited time here before we have to end. Let's try to get one or two quick ones in. Paul in Santa Cruz. Go ahead, Paul. Hey, hey, what's happening, man? Big fan. Thank you. Just wanted to chime in on these farewell tours. Uh, my first concert ever, 1982, The Who, North American Farewell Tour. And aren't they still on tour? Yeah. <laughs> they are. They just announced dates. Right. That's what I was saying earlier. Their, theirs was 82, and they are still touring. Yeah. Yeah, I still have the shirt. 1982, Farewell North American Tour. <laughs> yeah, that's that's just it. I mean, and and, and, and thank you, Paul. I mean, yeah, the, that's the whole point. The Who the Who might be the one that did it the longest ago, and they're still going, if you don't count Cream, which we ran down before as well. But at the end of the day, if you're going back, they know they've got the option to, 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 to go back. I'm, I'm almost out of time. Frankie in Fort Lauderdale, thoughts on Paul Rogers still singing. Paul Rogers still should be singing because he can sing his ass off still. I got no pro All these guys should go until they drop as long as they can still do it. The problem is the guys that are going up there croaking at half ability and half speed and a shell of themselves doing it. And you're like, you got to be kidding. But you can still do it. If you're Paul Rogers, if you're Glenn Hughes, if you're Sammy Hagar, go do it. All right. Fun show today. If you missed anything, of course, it replays 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern time tonight. If Final hour for this run from Los Angeles, and we will turn it all over to you at 844-686-5863, 844-6-VOLUME, toll-free nationwide telephone number for Trunk Nation as we go free-for-all now for the final hour of the program. Remember, if you missed the L.A. Invasion broadcast, which happened at the Rainbow on Wednesday with Joe Perry and John Five and Gilby Clark and Wendy Dio and uh, great audience, Tune in and uh, listen to it all over again this Saturday and Sunday here on Volume 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 to 7 Pacific with the rebroadcast. And you don't have to wait if you don't want to. All you need to do is go right now to the SiriusXM app or the website, and you can grab it and listen to it on demand. Just search for this channel or my name, and you will certainly find it. You know the deal. The rest of the way, it is yours on the phones right now. On Trunk Nation. And I usually go with whoever's been waiting the longest this time around would be Steve in Fort Worth. Welcome, Steve. You are on the air. How are you today? Good. How you doing, Eddie? Great, man. What's going on? Hey, I just wanted to chime in really quick. I know you had uh, Nita Strauss on your show about uh, a month or so ago. And I uh, just wanted to let you know that uh, she had done a uh, little guitar show, little guitar clinic they call it at guitar center here in uh arlington you know where the cowgirls play mm -hmm. and uh so uh, i just want to you know chime in and say uh you know what a cool person she is i had heard her on your show and i said man if i ever get the chance to see her with you know obviously alice uh you know i'd love to you know get a chance to meet her and she is just the most down-earth person uh 
very she's you know i usually don't look up to celebrities as role models especially for kids but had i had kids especially you know a young daughter learning to play guitar or any instrument for that matter she'd definitely be you know one high up on the list she's so like i said down to earth and just you know really warm and took the time to actually meet her she didn't brush you off or hurry you off she was cool did pictures signed some stuff and uh, just really cool. And then, you know, had the chance to see her the next night. Uh, this was a couple Mondays ago. She was in uh, Dallas, you know, doing a show with Alice the next night. So I got to see her then, too. So. Yeah, she's a wonderful person. I've known her for a long time. She's very uh, appreciative for the fans and the support that she has, and it shows. And uh, look, you know, she is an emerging artist. Thank you, Steve. She's still young, and she's got a, a, a long run ahead of her as far as opportunities and people she may play with and what she's going to do on her own as an artist. And I think she realizes that, and she's really laying a great foundation and a great uh connection with her fans what what inevitably happens with an artist like that and and you know she, she at this stage in her career at her level of exposure and her her level of um awareness with the public she can she can do that she can be like that and i'm not saying she's not genuinely like that she's genuinely a really great person but what happens with people like that as wonderful as they are and as much as they love to connect and engage with fans if if your success reaches the point of really mass awareness that obviously becomes a very very hard thing to do because you just can't simply do it. If you're an up-and-coming artist, you need to kind of be like that. And again, don't take this the wrong way. I'm not saying for a minute n that Nita is not gen gen genuinely a wonderful person. She is. My point is, is it's it's become it's easier to do that when you're at a level of awareness than she uh, she is right now versus if she was Mick Jagger. Or if she was Steven Tyler, or if she was Eddie Van Halen, or, if, you know, the more awareness, the harder it becomes to be able to go to a guitar shop, sit there, connect, engage, talk to a fan, give them five minutes. It's way, way harder, obviously, when you're way, way, way bigger and more popular. So that's the challenge with people who are genuinely in their fiber, great people, and they want to continue having this great bond and connection with their fans but it becomes a point of becoming impossible if you reach the reach a level where there's so many people that are trying to get at you you just simply cannot make that sort of time and commitment for everybody so that's why i say if there is an artist that you are a big fan of that are is in that mode where they're sort of emerging take it in you know get to do the things like our caller just did because once they get more popular they simply cannot do it it's not, you know, some don't want to, quite frankly, but others just can't. You cannot do it. You, you can't sit with 5,000 people and spend time with everyone. It just can't be done. So when you're you're into something or you, you're a fan of something as on its way up, you got to savor those moments, and that's a, that's, that's a great story. Anthony in Jersey. Hey, Ant. Hello, Anthony. Hello, Anthony. Anthony in Jersey. Let's put him on hold. We'll try to come back to him and see if he uh, comes back on the phones. This is Raina, who is in Tampa. Hi, Raina. Hi, Eddie. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Uh, so first, I wanted to touch on the stress. I'm a huge stress fan, and even your point about uh, getting you know big and they can't spend a lot of time. I just saw the stress, and they gave me literally the best night of my life. They're so just. They're so. Uh, in touch with their fans, which is amazing. I actually, I just listened to their new album and uh, put out a review on Facebook, and Luke Spiller actually uh, took the time to read it and like my post, which genuinely shows how much they appreciate the fans, so I really like that. Um, yeah, and I mentioned that, and Raina, that's a great point because, you know, I mentioned when I got on the Struts bandwagon a year or two ago, I mentioned that on the air, on this show, as a matter of fact, because I went to see them a couple times recently in small venues, headlining in clubs, and I mentioned, and I was just like, you know, you may, if you're a fan of a band like this, you may want to get to go see them now because if this goes the way it keeps going, you won't have that opportunity to say you saw them in the clubs, and, you know, there's a lot of bands for me that 
that uh, because yeah, at my age that I remember very vividly seeing before anybody knew who they were, and it's very very special memories. I mean, hell, I being from New Jersey, I saw Bon Jovi in clubs. I saw Bon Jovi open for Thirty Eight Special. I mean, just crazy stuff like that. I saw Skid Row before Sebastian Bach was even in the band playing, you know, little clubs for no people in New Jersey. So when you have those things where you're really there on the ground floor, and 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 you, of course you wish the band to go on to have that big success. But if you can say you were there and you had those memories or experiences, they're, they're really something to cherish. Oh, yeah, for sure. But, okay, so the real reason that I really wanted to call you was I've been trying to get on the show for weeks because I really wanted to thank you. I've been watching that metal show since I was in middle school. Uh, now I'm a freshman in college, and I was just signed on with my campus radio station to get my own rock and roll radio show. Uh, and that was really directly your inspiration on me. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you for being such such a huge influence on my career pursuit. Oh, well, Raina, that's very, very cool of you. I appreciate that, and I, I wish you the best of luck. Is that what you want to do? Do you want to do radio for a career? Um, really, I want to do magazine journalism, but uh, radio has definitely always been an interest of mine, so I like to dabble in that and see where it takes me. Uh, but I think that in terms of music, I like to be able to play the music as well. So to start out, uh, being able to have a radio show on campus is definitely the way to go yeah well my suggestion to you would be have fun with it and see where it takes you but yeah i would absolutely have a like i did is you know it wasn't it wasn't pretty it wasn't a good one but have the have the proverbial backup plan because it's yeah. harder and harder to to break into it and and make something of it these days and and you know be unique that's the best advice i could give you be unique and and you have to these days and thank you rain i gotta run but thank you and best of luck to you okay Thank you. All right. But the best thing I can – people ask me all the time about getting started in radio, and I appreciate the hell out of hearing people from, like, Raina. And, hey, earlier this week I had Dave Mustaine on, and he said I influenced him to start an online radio show. <laughs> he took – that I was an influence on Mustaine, which is just crazy. But the, So we heard from two people, Raina Younger getting started in college, and, and Mustaine, who's, like, my age – who's an icon in metal inspired to do radio because of, of me or, or influenced by. So that's a, that is unbelievably high uh, compliment, and I appreciate it coming from both of them. But I tell younger people all the time who ask me about starting in radio, it's unbelievably difficult. It's, it, was, it was super difficult when I started, which was right out of high school, probably around Raina's age, it sounds like, you know, right coming right out of high school. And I didn't really go to college, but what would have been my first year of college, I actually... Uh, it was actually incredibly difficult then because they were such sought after jobs and it was hard to break in. And the theory was you would have to go to small markets and work your way up and travel and work overnights and all that. So I never did any of that. I took a whole different path, but it's it's a path that would be even it was hard back then. It's even harder now because even though I didn't do the travel and move from city to city bit and I was lucky to stay in the New York, New Jersey area the whole time, I was it was very uh, it's it just, you know, it's just a hard job to get. And the audition processes and then when you get your toe in the door, I mean, I can't tell you how many overnights I did where you'd go in at you know, midnight to 5 or 6 a.m., the graveyard shift, and two people may be listening in the middle of the night for no money, and, and you're on no sleep. But I, I did that for years. And that was traditionally the way it was thought of, that if you want to break into radio, you have to be willing to do that. You have to be willing to go to a small market, work overnight, build your tape, build your name, build your resume, move up to the next size market. That is almost impossible to do now because of technology because if we're talking about music radio a lot of radio stations small medium and some large market their format their daily schedule is not live the the the, the smaller market radio stations none of it's live it's maybe just a piped in service where the program director records tracks in the morning and the rest is a music service o almost every market overnights are not live Midnight to five, midnight to six is pre-recorded. Never was like that back in the day. That was the proving grounds. That's where you started. That's where entry level was. That's where you honed your craft, working the overnight shift, and then hoping to graduate from that. You can't do that anymore. 
Those there are very very few radio stations that have live a live human being overnight. There's a very few that have a live human being seven to midnight. There's some that don't have a live human being at all, and you might got you guys probably could listen to them wherever you live and may not even know that. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors in radio, but when you're trying to get started, having all those off peak time shifts is very very difficult. If they don't exist, where do you get started? And then the the flip to that is you've got so the the upside is you've got so many outlets these days if you want to attempt broadcasting. Podcast, anyone can do it. Online radio show, anyone can do it. Literally anyone can do it. The challenge with that is it's made the market unbelievably convoluted. And there's a ton of people doing those broadcasts, and quite frankly, nobody is listening to them. No, because there's so many. It's like you, if you don't have an audience and a following and a name and a history and a reputation, it's brutal. And the last thing, because I'm asked about this a lot, when people do ask me what they can do to try to make a move in radio, is be unique. Make it that they listen for you. And I say that all the time. It is not a selfish thing. That is not an, it's not an ego thing. It's a survival thing. You know, I love playing music as much as the next guy. I still have a terrestrial radio show and a radio show here on Sirius XM on Mondays that I actually play music in. But I've always been a fan of talk radio, and you have to be able to be willing to do something unique and different where people listen for you. Because if you don't, you are interchangeable and disposable and easily replaced by a computer. That, again, is another byproduct of technology. Back in the day, there were music jocks that made tons of money and opened the mic twice an hour to back sell songs. But the, the thought was everyone's listening for that person, and that person had influence and say over what they were playing. That's all gone. For the most part, that is all gone everywhere. So creativity... And having an audience and a voice and a position on things and being known for something is the most valuable thing you can have in radio. And a lot of it is driven on the talk side. I, I don't think I think it's un it's unbelievably difficult to have a big career in broadcasting if you are not on talk entertainment radio versus music. And that's from a guy who loves music, and I'm doing a show where I talk about music. But if you're just playing music and back-selling records, you're going to have a really hard time getting a name and a following and people really caring unless it's really unique what you're doing. So I tell young people that all the time that are starting out. It's like find a way to be unique and create something where people are listening for you. Otherwise, you're a computer. You're going to record two, three tracks an hour that's going to get dropped between 10 pre-programmed -pro -pre songs and be shuffled into a computer and heard over the next two or three days and be paid usually very little for it. Because if you don't want to do it, they'll find somebody else that can. you got to make it about you. Not in the sense that you're always just talking about you, but about you in the sense that people follow because of you. And I'm lucky because I did a bunch of diverse things to build this. People say to me all the time, hey, man, how do I get to be like you and do your thing? Well, it took me 35 years. <laughs> it didn't happen overnight. Now, that's a, it, it, there's, there's a huge story to that, and I'm not going to get into that now, but you've, you've got to be consistent. You've got to build it. It doesn't happen overnight for most people. So good luck to you, Raina. I wish you nothing but the best, and, uh, and hopefully one day I'll be listening to you on the radio somewhere. Let's say hello to... Um... Let's get one more before we go to the break. Say hi to Steve, who's here in California at the moment. Hi, Steve. What's going on? Uh, not much, sir. I just wanted to thank you for the other night. I appreciate that. I was there at the uh, Sirius, you know, XM thing there at the Rainbow. And oh, okay. You, you, made, you made that happen, dude. I just happened to be there. That was freaking awesome. Just like you said the day after. You were in a geek mode, and I was too, brother. Thank you. <laughs> So wait, so Steve, you went by the rainbow on Wednesday night. You had no idea that this show was happening or that Joe, no, Joe Perry no, or anyone, and you just no. happened to walk in and saw all that? Well, I heard you talking about it, and I happened to be working just down the street. I'm a process server, so I'm driving around serving documents, listening to you every day, brother. Oh, wow. So I was there early. Yeah, when you and John Five walked in, I was the one that whistled and congratulated you guys there. That was oh, cool. I, well, I thank you. I started the entourage. 
<laughs> You're welcome, brother. I, uh, I thanks for coming man. out. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. I appreciate you coming out. I'm glad you had a good time at the Rainbow with us on Wednesday. And we'll yeah. be doing. Thank you, man. And we'll do another one. Uh, we'll do another one. It'll be right around, you know, right around, uh, give or take a couple days, around a month from now. But as soon as I can announce the date and get that out there for you, I certainly will. Hopefully, sooner than later. Let's get a break. We'll come back. We still have till the top of the hour, so plenty of time for more calls as we're in free for all mode on a Friday. If you want, again, if you want to hear the the broadcast from the Rainbow with Joe Perry and everybody else, you can grab it now on demand on the SiriusXM app, and it will replay tomorrow and Sunday here on volume from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time on Trunk Nation. And say hello to Josh, who is in Ohio. What's going on, Josh? Eddie, how are you, buddy? I'm good, man. Can you hear me okay? Yep, I got you. Awesome. Hey, I just wanted to talk about what I feel to be one of the most in misunderstood bands in rock, and that would be Genesis. I um, don't know if you're a fan of them. I don't, I don't know that you've ever heard you talk about them. Um, people generally, when they talk, you know, hear the word Genesis, they think, oh, Phil Collins backing band. Um, certainly, they're certainly one of the best bands in progressive rock. Um, certainly in the 70s, Peter Gabriel, Steve Hackett, one of the greatest underrated guitar players. Um, I have a wonderful, wonderful catalog of music. Um, and if you've never heard of them um, or heard them, they have two wonderful albums that I would love for you to uh, give a listen to, one being Selling England by the Pound, and the other one would be uh, Trick of the Tail. Um, I'm going to hang up and just listen to what you have to say about them. Well, uh, Josh, thank you for your call. I'm, I'm certainly aware of Genesis. Man, I've been in... Uh... In, like I said, in radio forever. So I've played Genesis songs. Lamb Lies Down on Broadway is a big one, too. I I uh, I would be lying if I told you I was a huge fan. You're, you're right in that. It's I'm not a big prog guy. Now, Genesis is a band that is cut in two different ways. Genesis is kind of a little bit like Fleetwood Mac in this regard, where there are two very distinct different versions of Genesis. There's the Peter Gabriel Genesis, very progressive amongst hardcore fans considered like, you know, the real Genesis, what Genesis really was. And then, of course, there's Phil Collins coming out front and a very, very uh, much more commercially polished Genesis, although with certainly still some... Uh some progressive elements but like for instance a song like abacab is a great song that's that's uh, obviously that's a record as well but i love that song so there are moments in genesis's catalog that i certainly like and have listened to and have heard but yes being a fan of more hard rock music it's not something that i listen to on a regular basis or i have in my collection i may probably have a couple records somewhere in my in my cabinet but that's just a product of having worked in a record store for years and probably been given them. And uh, and then, obviously, just being in rock radio my whole life, having played that stuff or had to play that stuff. Because, again, you don't really get to pick what you play on radio most of the time in regular formats. So I, I respect them, and I like, and there's certainly songs in their catalog that I like. But I'd be lying if I said that they were a big band for me or that I knew them extra extraordinarily well. Because, again, I'm just into heavier guitar-based music. That's not to say Hackett's not a great player. He is. He was on the Cruise to the Edge, and I believe he's on the one coming up as well, the uh, Prague Cruise that I broadcast from. And I, a, a press release came out today about Steve Hackett doing some stuff as well. So maybe, uh, maybe we'll wrangle Hackett when we broadcast from Cruise to the Edge. I'm open to talking to these guys, and I'm open to uh, Hackett. Having them on the show, I've just, you know, I'm never, ever going to be a guy that pretends that they like something or tell you I, I love something if I really don't. Doesn't mean I don't respect it. Doesn't mean I won't have them on. Doesn't mean I won't enjoy a conversation with them. I, I, I've interviewed countless artists over the years that I'm not a huge fan of personally of their music and, and vice versa, of course. So I'm open to it and I'm aware of it. And the one thing I don't like about Genesis or Phil Collins is the very overly commercial stuff. Like, like... You know, something like Susudio from Phil Collins. Like, please, not for me. <laughs> not for me. But but it's a huge song, just not for me. Lori on Long Island. Hi, Lori. Hi, Eddie. I wanted to talk to you about Tesla. I know you had them on your radio show yesterday. Brian called in and yesterday. I yep, another one that I forgot to mention we, in our in our big, big, busy week of guests. Yep, Brian was on for a few yesterday. And I saw them last night at the Paramount in Huntington, Long Island, and it was a smaller venue. 
it was almost sold out. There was about 1,500 people. And this was the first time I ever saw Tesla in a smaller venue. Uh, I saw them at the Nassau Coliseum, Jones Beach, where they were the opening act. And people were noisy, milling around, talking. So you really couldn't concentrate on the music. So this was the first time I saw them in a smaller venue. And they were, it was a treat. It was, it was a whole different show. It was intimate. They really cared about the crowd. Um, they sang for about an hour and a half. And what struck me was not only how much they cared about the audience, but how well they took care of themselves in the sense of they didn't, they were, they were pacing themselves. Jeff, Jeff Keith, he, he had a bar stool, so he didn't jump around all the time. He drank water. He was relaxed. I hope to see him in another eight years, and the way he was treating himself and the crowd, he will last till his 40th anniversary. Where yeah, Jeff's, and Jeff's not a kid. I think Jeff is, I think Jeff might be right. 60. You know, he's not, or even maybe 61. He's Jeff, I think, is the oldest guy in that band, as a matter of fact. So, he, yeah, that's important, Laura. You know, I am a huge Tesla fan. For me, for my money, Tesla is one of the best bands to come out of that whole scene uh, in the 80s. And I would have gone to, they played in Jersey. Thank you, Laurie, for the call. I would have gone to the show in Jersey because they, they were, and they're playing in, uh, Brian, when Brian was on yesterday, they're playing in Atlantic City tomorrow. And Brian is doing his art tomorrow, his art exhibit there at the Hard Rock in Atlantic City. So, I doubt I'll get down there tomorrow night. I will be back in Jersey, but that's a two-hour ride. I don't think I'll be down there. But I love those guys. I've loved that band since day one. I will never forget the video from Modern Day Cowboy coming on MTV. And in a sea of, of hairspray and spandex, here comes a band wearing jeans and T-shirts, two guitars just kicking ass, and they still kick ass today. So I love Tesla. I all there I always always love that band and they're still very good and Lori brings up a great point I mean the fact that they're taking care of themselves is important when, when Tesla cuz Tesla broke up for a while and when they got back together again which I think was around 99 or something and they started playing it was the original lineup Tommy was still in the band <laughs> I saw them play the Beacon Theater in New York and I think they headlined the Beacon and they play, I will never forget this, they played with a cooler on stage. They had a huge beer cooler in front of the drum, like right on the stage in front of the drum riser. And that's how much those guys drank. And before that, they did way more than drink. I mean, they'll be the first to tell you in the, in the mid to late 80s, they were pretty notorious with coke and drugs and things like that. But uh, that's, you know, been cleaned up. But they go on and off as far as drinking. But when they were playing, they came back out. They would, it was like a kegger. <laughs> they would have uh, the, the cooler right on the stage. And look, I had a great time hanging out with those guys back in the day and drinking with them. And we'd go on the bus and they'd have a beer that they brought over the border from Canada that had stronger alcohol. We, we had great times. But it you know, reminds me of the same thing with Ace Frehley. I had great times drinking with him back in his drinking days. And I was never a big drinker, but you know, just when in Rome, I would do it with those guys. And I, uh, <laughs> you, you, you kind of, there's a side of you that misses the fun of that. But if you really care about these people and their friends, like, like they are to me, you also are glad that they turned the corner and cleaned up and got sober or got healthy or healthier. Because you know they couldn't be able to do it. And what happened, I remember with Tesla back then, they were trying to relaunch their career, and they were having sloppy shows. And Jeff was losing his voice, and it just wasn't good. And then they cut it all out. They they, they took the all the booze off the stage and, and everything. They stopped drinking completely. Now I think they're somewhere in the middle, but they certainly you know know enough to, to take care of themselves as they get older like everybody does. But that light has to come on for some artists when they get older. And it's tragically for some, it doesn't, but it, it really has to if you want to live and continue to have a, a decent career and still be pretty good at what you do. Hell, look no further than who I had as my guest on Wednesday from the Rainbow here in L.A. I mean, Joe Perry, Aerosmith, Steven Tyler, Brad Whitford, Tom Hamilton, Joey Kramer. Tyler is 71. The other guys in the band not far behind. It's the original five guys, and they're still great. And I, I don't want to talk about, like, cosmetic, who looks good, who doesn't, whatever. 
it's not I'm the last person in the world that's going to be worried about that and telling people about that. I'm talking about their ability to perform and sing and play and keep it all real and live like Aerosmith does. And I talked about that with Joe the other day. But Aerosmith, notorious, notorious drug addicts through most of their career. If if they didn't clean up, there is no way on the planet I would have had Joe Perry on my show on Wednesday <laughs> or had just gone to see Steven Tyler solo sounding incredible. You know what? There's just no way that happens. They probably would not be alive right now. Glenn Hughes, one of the most incredible singers we have today. Still, he'll be the first no, notorious drug addict. Heavy duty, serious stuff, heroin, whatever. If Glenn doesn't change, no way we have him alive today. Ace Freely, 12 years sober. My God, the stories I could tell you about Ace. So the light has to go on for these guys to preserve themselves and their careers. For some, it does. Tragically, for others, it does not. And we either lose them or we see, you know, shells of what they once were. Let's get our final break in right here, Ed, and then we'll have um, almost 20 minutes to go on calls. Let's get one more break out of the way. We'll take care of that right now. We'll come back. We'll finish up. If you got back and forth and work the phones as we go till the top of the hour, as we get ready to wrap up a free for all Friday here on Trunk Nation. Remember, a massive amount of interviews and cool stuff that happened the last four days here on Trunk Nation on volume. Grab it all now on demand on the Sirius XM app. If you missed any of it, we cannot rebroadcast all of it on the weekend. The week Weekend, you'll be getting the L.A. Invasion with Joe Perry and John Five and everybody else. But all the other interviews, including Aldo Nova, who was great on Monday. Dave Mustaine earlier in the week talking about his cruise. Earlier in this show, Mike Inez of Alice in Chains. Any of that stuff, listen to it in its entirety or grab the interviews alone on demand to listen to whenever you want on the Sirius XM app. We go back to the phones and we say hello to, well, right up the street from where I am, James in Burbank. Hi, James. Hey, Eddie. Hey, Eddie. Happy Trunktober, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, James. <laughs> hey, I wanted to, before I ask my question, I wanted to know, um, can I give you my Kiss Rush ACDC and um, uh, list, my top 20 list for all four of them in Aerosmith? No, I don't have the time for that right now. No. You can email them if you want, and I'll read them, but I can't do that on the air. <laughs> of course not. I was just joking. I was going to, yeah, yeah. You had time for all four of my list of all top 20 and all my explanations. Well, there's, why. you know, I appreciate the people that put the effort <laughs> into doing the list, and I know they want to get them out there, but no, I can't do them all right now, but I appreciate no, I was, it. I was kidding. Well, real quick also, that one guy that keeps calling about that Pearl Jam documentary, I find it really disappointing because it's, when it starts out, you know, because everyone knows Eddie Vedder wasn't in the band originally. And then just Cameron Crowe glosses over how he got in the band. They just say, you know, they're writing songs, and then a tape wound up. The, the tape made it down to San Diego to Eddie Vedder. It doesn't say how they met, how they knew of Eddie Vedder, how he got on their radar, how they went from Seattle. It just They just said it, and now he's in the band, and you have no reason why. So I don't know why that guy thinks it's too good. The other parts of the documentary is good, but it gives zero explanation on how they discovered or heard of Eddie Vedder or what his thing was. Hmm. But, um, well, yes, when I watch it for we, myself, I'll, I'll 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 give you my take on it. But yeah, I, I've not still not had a chance to watch it. Okay, yeah. But I was calling to say about those bands that everyone likes. You know, the like Struts, Greta Van Fleet, and Ghost. I mean, you can call me James Stradamus because none of those three are going to make it. Because Ghost just is terrible. Once their stick runs off, I don't think they'll make it. And I'm kind of in Greta Van Fleet. I just I can't even. You've been very nice, Eddie. That's the thing about you. Why everyone? I'm one of the many reasons why people like you because you're very gracious and and you just let bands be kind of who they are. But at Greta Van Fleet is so. I find it offensive as a rock fan that they they're getting away with this scam. But whatever, I'm happy for them. They're kids and they're they're doing their dreams, so good for them. Nothing personal. And then the Struts, I'm surprised you like them because there's nothing original there. So I've watched their live videos and stuff and their energy and stuff, but it seems so sticky. And they don't have any good original songs. Everything that they play sounds like songs that are a little bit different of songs that we grew up with. And it just seems very... Nothing original about any of these bands whatsoever, you know? Mm. Well, valid points, James. Thank you for your call. And, and again, I... You know, as far as being nice, look, if I don't like a band, I'll say it. Everybody knows that. Um, 
I, I be, I'll try to be diplomatic about it, and then if I, you know, really want to let go about, I will. You know, I'll say how I feel. I have no problem saying that, and and God knows, everybody knows, I have no problem saying what I do and don't like, because I encourage everybody to have an open, honest debate and dialogue. So your points are all valid points, and that's how you feel. And I would never tell you you're wrong, because that's how you feel. I'll take them one by one. Ghost, who, by the way, I may have Tobias from Ghost on this show in the studio, potentially, in uh, in in, in uh, maybe a couple of weeks. I'm working that out now. There's a possibility that I might be... No, no it wouldn't be in a couple of weeks. It would actually be... Just checking my dates. It would actually be in December. Uh, they, I'm all, I'm putting I put some stuff in. Their manager is a friend of mine, and I actually saw him last night at the Dio Bowling. And I told you I have an open mind about them. I don't dislike Ghost. I'm not in that mode of like Ghost is the greatest thing in the world, like others feel. I like the fact that they're a rock band that a lot of people are liking and embracing. Although they have a lot of pop elements to them, and they are. I, I, what I find most fascinating about Ghost is how much they are embraced by the metal community when they make music that, in some respects, is a far cry from metal. But I find that fascinating, and I would love to have a conversation with the guy, and that very well may happen. It's uh, Their gears are in motion for that. Even bands that I'm not fully down with, or I want to learn about them. I want to talk to them and see what makes them tick. So that's how I feel there. Greta Van Fleet, it's interesting what's happening with Greta because... Now that their new record is finally out, and I, I'll be honest, I have not had the time to spend a lot of time listening to it. I'm going to try to download it before I get on the plane and listen to that on the plane back tonight as well and take it all in. Because, you know, I can really listen on the plane. You put the noise-canceling headphones on. There's no distractions, whatever. At least that's what I say until I have to buy Wi-Fi and do work. You know how it works. I'll do my best. But Greta... There is a bit of a Greta backlash happening now in the media. So you and, I, and that's inevitable. That's going to happen when a band so young comes out of the gate. And I think like a lot of people, myself included, we we all gave Greta a chance because let's see what they sound like with a fully realized full record after being together for a couple of years. Let's see if they sound a little bit more original. Let's see where they go and take this. And a lot of people from what I'm picking up are like, it's more of the same. It is still heavily mining the Zeppelin world to the point of, you know, some accuse them of plagiarism for it. But I'm now even seeing, like, reports and reviews where they're starting to, you know, take some shots at what they, they, they you know, they're dressing like hippies and they're you know, 17 year eight, 19, 20-year-old kids. So there's going to be that backlash. Whenever something gets that popular that quick, there's going to be people that are going to come from the other side and try to tear it down a little bit. With that band, I remain, again, in the middle. I, I, don't, I don't hear what the hoopla is about, but I don't dislike them. I like what they're doing because it is guitar-based rock and it is doing really well. So I want it to do well, regardless of my personal feelings, because it's good for our music, which is rock. But there's, go there's definitely detractors, and it's crazy because even online, somebody did a negative review of the Greta Van Fleet record, and there was a story about the fact that the review is negative, and their fans are mad at their negative review. It's, it's, look, everyone's talking about them. So that's never anything but good, but that is going to become a more divided camp, as popular as they're getting, because of what they're doing and sounding like. And again, I have yet to see that band live, and I have yet to hear the full record. I hope that I can... I'm at... I'm... Just just off the the course here, I got this the new iPhone like a month ago, and the service sucks. There's something wrong with the antenna in it. I've got Verizon, and I've been doing a little research, but the connection and speeds are shit on this thing. And one of my missions this weekend is to get it sorted out. So I, 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 my point in telling you that is just trying to download some stuff for my flight this weekend where normally it should take a, a minute is just agonizing because there's something wrong with these new iPhones, not the one that came out today, the, the previous one that they banged me for a grand for that is just shit right now. Don't get me started. It's making me nuts all weekend, all week rather. Anyway, so if I can get this thing that I paid $1,000 for to... 
you know, with Verizon's immaculate service that's overpriced to actually work, I'll, I'll be able to listen to both records on the flight home. Finally, the struts. You question the struts. Valid points. Maybe not the most original thing. Here's the difference. Seen the struts live a few times. They're phenomenal live. To me, they have great songs. The songs are catchy. Is it the most original material? No. There's obviously influences and comparisons to essentially a lot of 70s British sort of glam stuff, whether it be Queen, T-Rex, Mott the Hoople, things like that. But I love all that stuff. And to me, what the Struts are doing, it's not nearly as blatant as what Greta Van Fleet is doing channeling another band. The Struts are cherry-picking things from, you know, they're a British band, things they grew up with, things they listened to, but it doesn't, it's not like, holy crap, that's whatever song. Or that's, no, they're put. They're putting their own fresh spin on it. Again, I have not listened to the new record. It just came out today. I will. I'll give you my thoughts about it. I love the previous record. They're great live. And to me, the Struts have an intangible that the other two bands we are talking about does not have. And that is they have a star. The singer in the band, Luke Spiller, is a star personality, front man. That is a huge intangible. I don't see a star in Greta Van Fleet, and Ghost is in the mask, and it's one guy, and it is what it is, and he's changing identities. They have Luke Spiller is and could potentially be a star performer personality in that band. And that is a huge, huge thing that separates them as well. And I'll tell you this, I found this really telling, and I, I should hopefully have a Strut CD for me when I get home. The, the new album that's out today has, I believe, a picture of just Luke on the cover. That's a pretty big move because most bands want to sell and market a full band concept. And the Struts are a band, make no mistake. But when you do that thing where you just put one member on the cover, it always sends a little bit of a different message and a clear message of like, hey, this is the guy we're hanging our hat on. We know he's the star. We know this is how we're going to sell this thing. I'll give you another example of that. Hailstorm, whose new album I love. For the longest time, Hailstorm's management, record label, agents, wanted to make sure Hailstorm was marketed as a band of four people, which it is. But we all know the star frontman personnel, front woman personality in Hailstorm is Lizzie, right? So for a long time, it was, you know, very much pushing that sort of thing. It was like, you know, you got to take everybody in the band. And I love all of them, by the way. But I'm just talking from a marketing standpoint. New Hailstorm album, there's one person on the cover. It's Lizzie. Ultimately, you can try to sell the band concept, and then if the band is cool with it, they quickly realize, hey, you know what? If we can swallow our pride and check our ego, we know our best bet is to hang our hat on the larger-than-life personality, the people everybody wants to talk to and see. And that inevitably becomes the becomes it can become an issue but it becomes the way things are marketed that you want an old example of that to this day the other guys in twisted sister are pissed off that d snyder is the only one pictured on the cover of their biggest album stay hungry to this day they are pissed off about it the photographer who did that album cover my friend mark weiss there's a story behind it. He's told it many times. We've talked about it on the air in the past. But the rest of the guys did not know that they were going to end up using that solo shot of D on the cover of that record. It has created tensions amongst them for over 30 years to exist to this day. So some are cool with it, and some after a while, it wears like the other guys like or girls are like, hey, what about us, you know? Uh, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. But that's my take on what I always refer to as the big three as far as emerging rock bands with Ghost, Greta, and The Struts. And again, for me, the dark horse in that that I love a lot is Rival Sons, which needs to be in that conversation. They're not quite there yet, but a new record coming, and hopefully that changes. Hey, I'm sorry I ran out of time for all you guys that have been waiting on hold. My apologies. And now go for about 10 minutes.
then some music, then bring the monster truck guys in. Uh, so that's uh, that's the immediate schedule. And then later on, like I said, Joe Lynn Turner will join us. Let's see here. We're uh, going to begin and take our first call, uh, our very loyal listener in New Hampshire, Steve. What's up, Steve? Oh, what's going on? How you doing? Good, man. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, – more of a comment than anything, you know. Who, who really knows anything, right? But uh, – yeah, I hear these people, you know, reading all these things about, of course, it's about Guns and Roses, which I'm going to talk about. And, you know, Axel, you know, they, they, he's been, they've rejoined Guns and Roses, Slash and Duff, this and that. You know, I don't think Slash and Duff are subordinate to anybody uh, this time around. I think uh, the contracts have probably been written up. I think he, uh, they have their fair share. And, you know, this is, Axel, these are equal members, one third. I don't think Axel has any upper hand on any of these guys at this point. You know, uh, I just, well, I don't know, Steve. I mean, I, I, you know, Axel just, Axel owns Guns N' Roses. That, Axel owns okay, the name. That's okay, but but I think but I think uh, Axel Rose was looking at is looking at smaller venues in North America in the future. If if you continue on the same old same old. Just well, I don't. Like, well, listen, I don't know. First of all, I don't know who's really talking about the 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 nature of the business deal out there as far as fans because I haven't heard anybody talking about that or really caring. All they care about is. Actually, all they're wanting to know is who's actually in the band besides the three guys that have been announced. Um, but as far as the business deal is concerned, uh, that's obviously not, not going to be revealed and not going to be pro uh, public knowledge. But um, I would think that, yeah, Slash is going to have a pretty darn good close to equal cut. Uh, if well, well, certainly way more than equal cut than uh, many of the people in the band. But I don't know the nature of the business. Clearly, the entire thing is being built around Duff, Axel, and Slash. But again, the key guy in all this is, again, being honest. And I always have to say that because it's just sometimes people just don't want to hear certain things. And But obviously, it's Slash. Slash is the, 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 the key cog in all of this. People tend to forget Duff McKagan played with Guns N' Roses in like 15 shows in their most, in their last lineup. So, yes, the dynamic of him with Slash and Axel is cool, but this is really about Slash coming back into the band. And by all accounts, he's coming into Axel's band because the rest of the band is going to be the guys that were in the last lineup of Guns N' Roses. Richard Fortas, Dizzy Reed, Chris Pittman, Frank Ferrer. Write it down. So, so the, it is Axel's thing. Guns N' Roses has been Axel's thing for a long time. He retains the name, but but Slash is going to, I'm sure his mentality to make a boatload of money, he's going to go play, he's going to go have some fun and see where it goes. And people have asked all the time, you know, that, that, that nobody's talking about, nobody's talking at all, that there's no press being done at all by Guns N' Roses, and there isn't. You, It is weird, I admit that. You would th think there would have been a press conference or whatever, but my take on that is two things. First of all, they're not talking because they don't have answers and don't want to answer questions that they're going to get. Like, who else is in the band? Is this really a band that's going to go forward or just getting together for some shows? Are you ever going to make a new record? Is this all really Guns N' Roses again, or is this just a project and a, and a, and a diversion? But they probably don't even know the answers themselves. They're taking baby steps. And here's the other thing. You need to talk and you need to do press when you need to sell tickets. As long as they're selling tickets at two fifty, five hundred a pop and putting stadiums on sale in Mexico that are and shows are selling and the money's coming in, you don't need to do press. People do press to promote and sell things. If you're selling just fine without it, you don't need to deal with the press. You don't need to answer those questions. So that's what I make of the whole thing. Uh, Tony in uh, North Carolina. Hey, Tony. Oh, no, Kansas, Kansas City. Tony's in Kansas City. My eyes are gone. What's up, Tony? <laughs> hey, man. I'm looking forward to seeing you on the cruise coming up, man. You'll see me on the cruise. If you're in Kansas City, you'll see me hosting UFO at uh, the Voodoo Lounge in Harris on March 9th. Are you looking forward to coming to my hometown or what? I've never been to Kansas City in my life. I've heard that there's great rock fans there. I'm very excited about th that. I'm coming in the night before, hosting UFO on March 9th. The only thing I'm not excited about is that for whatever unknown, insane reason, the airfare from New Jersey to Kansas City is astronomical. 
When I agreed to wow. the gig, I had no idea that a coach ticket was going to cost a thousand dollars for some god unknown reason from Newark to Kansas City, but it does. Whoa! Come on, man. What about Expedia? Uh, trust me, everywhere I look. But that's don't worry about it. I'll be there. What's your question, Tony? I uh, just want to know. It's uh, it's more of a different vibe than this Monsters of Rock cruise coming on. It's very much of a. It's, I think it has a harder edge to it. You know the lineup. Just curious to know what bands are you looking forward to seeing on this year's Monsters of Rock cruise, at least on the uh, Shredders. Well, uh, see, for me, all of these bands I have seen and. S- for for decades and i still see all the time because we all kind of swim in the same circle no pun intended about swimming uh so i see all these guys constantly to be honest with you and that doesn't mean i don't look forward to seeing them but i just do it's uh, uh, when you've been in the business as long as i have and you're out all the time like i have like most of the events concerts festivals 90 percent of the same bands are usually on them all the time so um I'm looking forward to seeing all of them, and that's just that's not the politically correct answer. It's just the fact that all of these guys I see all the time, and they're all friends, and I'm looking forward to seeing what I can see of them. I also get pulled in a lot of directions on these cruises and can't always watch full sets from everybody. And there's so many bands that a lot of things happen at the same time. I, I'm very excited. I, I was most excited about seeing Michael Monroe only because Michael doesn't tour all that often here. But I just saw him in Vegas because he was there last week when I was there. So I'm still looking forward to seeing him. But again, I just saw him. But like Tesla and all these bands, I see them constantly and I love them to death. But there's not the things that I get excited about are the things that you don't see all that often. Michael Monroe would be one example. Steve Vai, I don't see that often, although I just hosted a benefit that Steve Vai played at. So they're all great. And it's a great way to see a lot of great bands all in one place if you don't get out there as often as I do. Uh, let's go to Dallas. Say hi to Danny. Hey, Danny. Hey, Eddie. How are you, sir? Good, man. Hey, um, just wanted to give you a call real quick and let you know last week on Wednesday of last week, I caught Y&T at a club bar restaurant thing here in Dallas. Um, they put on a little over two and a half hour show or actually a little over two hour show. And those guys were just top notch, tight, dead on. They were great. And then Saturday night, I had the opportunity to open for Marty Friedman, who was in Dallas doing his solo stuff. And again, top-notch, great band with him and great sound, very nice guy, and both bands are kicking ass, man. I didn't I didn't know that Marty was still touring in America. I had no idea he was still in the U.S. Yeah. I didn't yeah, know he was, I was – I had no idea he was still out. I saw him uh, play at the Whiskey in L.A., on this tour, and he was great, but I had no idea he was still out there. Yeah, because yeah, you know, he, he lives is. in Japan, so I figured he went. He went back. I didn't know he was still here. Yeah, they said um, I was talking to one of the other openers, and they said that um, I think it was Little Rock actually got canceled. I don't, I don't know why, but that was canceled. But they're heading to Atlanta. They have you know several more dates to go. How was the turnout for the two shows, Danny? Uh, y and T. Honestly, it was a Wednesday night. Place held maybe, <clears throat> and I'm being nice, maybe 400, and there was maybe two, 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 225 there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marty Friedman, that club held 1,000, and there was probably, at the highest point, maybe 600. Right. And that was on a Saturday night. Right. All right, Danny, well, thank you for your review and your thoughts. And, yes, I love y and I mean, they're a great band, but unfortunately, as you just heard, I mean, they don't do huge business. But uh, when you can see them, and if you can see them, they're they're phenomenal. And they are out there playing the clubs. And a lot of these bands, what you're seeing happening and why these bands are on tour is because of the Monsters of Rock Cruise, which goes out um, next week. But bands do their touring so that they kind of end up in Florida, can get on the ship. Some of them get off the ship and then go out on tour. So these guys are, all these bands are out there. And I urge you to see them, whether they be on the cruise or if they're coming to your neighborhood. As I always say, just get online. Find out if there's a date near you. Uh, Robert in New Orleans. Hey, Rob. Hey, Eddie. Hey, man. Uh, 
I just wanted to see if I could get your take on uh, if you checked out the uh, the opening band for Michael Monroe, Hardcore Superstar. I did. I got there where they had about, uh, I caught maybe the last three songs of their set. I was in Vegas for a radio convention, and I had some other commitments, but I did want to see them, and I did make it over there to see about three or four songs before they ended, and I thought they were real good. I met the singer... Uh, towards the end of the night, we talked for a little bit, and I, I definitely would check out some of their music if I can get some CDs or something, because what I saw I liked. I thought they were real good, had a lot of energy, too. Oh, yeah, they're awesome. I actually flew from New Orleans over there to, uh, just, just to see them, you know, because they're one of my favorite bands, and never would have found them without the Internet, so... Yeah, cool, Robert. I, I get your take on that. Yeah, no, I enjoyed what I saw and, and heard. I enjoyed. Uh, thanks for the call. And there were a number of people that I met who... They have a very kind of cult following, people who really love them, and I guess they don't play all that often. They're also going to be playing on the ship. So there's a perfect example of a band that maybe not a lot of people know, but then they'll be on the cruise, so maybe more people will be exposed to them. And I'm looking forward to maybe catching a full set from them as well. But there are a lot of people, there are a number of people that I met at the Vegas show that came from different parts of the country or the world because they were fans of that band and wanted to the opportunity to see them. And according to the singer, their tour with Michael Monroe is a co-headline. So they obviously are starting to build a little bit of a stature. Uh, going to New Mexico, Vince. What's up, Vince? Hey, Eddie. How you doing? Good, man. Hey, I got to see your friends Anthrax last week here in Albuquerque. Uh, they did not. It's long God didn't show up with that night. But I um, just wanted to get your take on the new album coming out from Anthrax. It's amazing. I mean, it's it's a absolutely phenomenal record. And I, when I say stuff like that about Anthrax, as many people know, I have a huge decades long friendship and history with those guys. But I must say, I'm not saying it because of that, I'm saying it because it truly is a great record. Uh, it's it's on par with the last album, Worship Music, which I also thought was one of the best records they ever made in their career. So this yeah, album, this album. album is is as good as that. I'm wrestling with which one I like better. But they're both right up there with among the the best four or five albums they've ever made in their career. Yeah, it was it was a great show too. It's just so neat to see those guys out on stage again and big time Anthrax fans. So thanks, Eddie. Yeah, thanks, Vince. And you know, I gotta say, as uh, as people that don't know, Anthrax just wrapped up their tour and they were opening for Lamb of God. And the people I went to the show with were really kind of blown away by that that Anthrax would be the opening act for Lamb of God. Anthrax considered to be obviously one of the big four thrash bands of all time. And how are they opening for Lamb of God? Well, they just are. Uh, I, I asked some people in the business about it, and it's quite simple. The Lamb of God draws more people. No knock on Lamb. I, I love those guys as people, and, and they're good guys. But even they may be saying, wait, how did this happen? <laughs> but Lamb of God is simply a bigger draw. And that's all that matters. Who draws the most people? And Lamb of God draws more people than Anthrax. So it is not a co-headline. It was not. Anthrax was the opening act. They played almost an hour, but they were the opening act. And it also was a good thing for Anthrax, too, because Lamb of God's fan base is younger, so they got in front of some new fans, and they went down a storm. The minute they started playing, people just went absolutely crazy. So that was it was a good tour for Anthrax, even though I'd prefer to see them do their own headline set. And I did watch Lamb of God, by the way, who were unbelievably heavy and precise and played their asses off. Um, I have mega respect for that band. I just am not a fan of that kind of singing, as as everybody knows. Uh, nothing against Randy, who's a great guy. We've had him here on this show. And he actually did sing a song on the new record and, as opposed to scream it. But I, I, I cannot do the screaming vocal thing. It, it irritates me after a while. So, but, but that does not mean I still don't have the utmost respect for what those guys do. And I did watch them. And it's pretty amazing, the, the base they've built. Seamus in Alabama. Hey, Seamus. Hey, Ed. How you doing? I'm good, my friend. What's going on? Okay, I just got one quick question. Did Ace Freely play on Rock and Roll Hell, or was it Vinnie Vincent? It was Vinnie Vincent or some other ghost guitar player. Ace did not play anything on Creatures of the Night, to my knowledge. Okay, well, this on his new covers record, why would he be you know, doing that tune, you wonder? Well, because uh, you got to remember Ace also years ago did a Kiss song called Hide Your Heart that he had nothing to do with that was written by Paul Stanley and some other people. Uh, Hide Your Heart was on, on Hot in the Shade, and Ace also recorded it on his album, Trouble Walking. Um, I, I think that he, I mean, I just assume, I haven't talked to him about it, but I'm assuming that he just thought it would be a cool song to do. Also, the guy who's now working with Ace, 
as far as on the label side of things, and I'm, I'm getting a weird feedback, Seamus, so I'll, I'll answer and going to hang up on you here. But um, the guy who works with, with Ace on the label side of things is a huge Kiss fan. Uh, the guy who signed Ace and works with him from a label standpoint, huge Kiss fan. Very similar to like when I signed Ace and worked with him from a label standpoint in the 80s. Uh, my friend Ken Gullick, who's doing it now for his current label, is, is a massive KISS fan. So I'm sure a lot of these ideas and suggestions are being brought to him. And if he's doing an all covers record, they probably said, hey, this would be a good song for you. You should try it. And he's heard it and liked it. The one thing you can say about Creatures is his picture's on the cover of the record. <laughs> but he had pretty much nothing to do with the record. So maybe he's like, well, you know, my, my picture's on the cover. I'll do a song from it. I have no idea. Brandon in Colorado. Hey, Brandon. Hey, Ed. How you doing? Good, man. Hey, uh, I was calling. Um, I know uh, I'm a big uh, Corrosion of Conformity fan, and I, I don't hear them get a lot of press on this show or really anywhere else. I know Pepper's back in the band with them. And I was wondering if you've heard anything um, coming out from, from them or, or kind of why, why didn't uh, they make it bigger? Well, they, they they have a new record coming out, and I know Pepper is back in, and I've played stuff. I mean, the album I like the most from them is Deliverance. But, uh, Brandon, it's a question that you can honestly ask about about 10,000 bands. You know, it's yeah. the same story. I mean, everybody has those bands that they love, and they scratch their heads and wonder, why didn't they make it bigger? Why do people not talk more about them? Why do they not get played more? Why aren't they more popular? I mean, Literally, everybody personally has probably a thousand bands you can say that about. COC did pretty well, though. I mean, they're, they're, they've got a following. I mean, they had some success. Are they a major, massive act? No, but they certainly made an impact. But it, it's this, it, it's an age-old question that anybody that has a favorite band they can ask about. I ask it about UFO every day. Somebody called about Y&T earlier. How are they not bigger? They've been around 40 years. You could go on and on and on with this stuff. If you, were, if, if you would be a genius of the music industry if you could figure out why, because then you could make sure it never happened for bands going forward. It's impossible to answer those questions. The stars really have to align for bands to really break through, and it does take more than just talent and good songs. It really does. There's so many intangibles that have to fall into place. More Now more than ever, with everybody's attention diverted by so many different things. A couple more quick calls, and we're going to go to music. And then speaking of new bands that hopefully down the line we won't be saying, why didn't they make it bigger, and they will make it bigger, is a band called Monster Truck that's going to be in here in just a few. Let's go to Pittsburgh, talk to Nick. Hey, Nick, what's up? Hello, Nick. Yes. Hey, you're on the air. Hey, Eddie, how you doing, brother? Good, man. What's going on? Uh, not much. I've been a fan for a long time, so I appreciate you taking my call here. Thanks. Hey, Call hey we're going to be in Pittsburgh, me, Don, and Jim, March 25th at the Altar Bar. Come out and see us. I definitely will. Cool. Hey, you know what? I saw Guns N' Roses uh, on TV a couple of weeks ago, and they stretched every song out to like 10 minutes. It was very theatrical. I wasn't crazy about the energy. The old version of the band, not obviously not what they're doing, not with Slash and Duff back, but you saw the previous no, exactly. version. And that's what I wanted to ask you, if you talk to Steven, because I, I think having the original guys is just key. Uh, I, I do not. Uh, Steven Adler is, is not going to be announced, to my knowledge, as being a part of this uh, at this point. Whether, I don't know, Nick, if that means he will be or can show up in a guest spot, but the odds... And thanks for the call, Nick. The odds of Steven Adler being the drummer for the entire Guns N' Roses tour and their full set are pretty much zero. Because, not to mention, somebody brought this up to me the other day, too, at, in Vegas when I was there at lunch. The assumption is that they're only going to play stuff from Illusion 1 and 2, Appetite, and, of course, GNR Lies, just from that era. So I'm imagining they're not going to slash isn't going to play stuff from Chinese democracy, but who knows? But I doubt it. But Stephen was only on, you know, really, it's just the appetite stuff that Stephen's about. So the way to do it would be have Stephen come out and do a set of appetite songs. 
but there's no way he's playing the full set. And we don't know if he's playing anything or has even been invited. And I've talked to Stephen about it privately. I'm not going to tell you what we've talked about because it's private. When he wants to speak, he'll speak. But needless to say, he's been on this show a thousand times. He wants desperately to be a part of it, and we'll see if he is. But if he is, it's going to be in a guest capacity, I'm sure, just playing some songs. Same with Izzy. The the tour is clearly being built around Slash, Duff, and Axel. That is all who has been officially announced as this. That is all that has been marketed. That is all they are promising you are going to see. So if you're buying tickets, know that before you go in. If you're going there expecting it to be 1987 and see those original five guys for a whole show, you have purchased the wrong ticket. Send me your money instead. It will go to better use. (laughs) There are people out there absolutely dreaming a dream that ain't happening. Not to say it might not happen for a few songs, but that is not what the tour is. Jeff in New York. What's up, Jeff? Hey, Hey. Eddie. Thanks so much for taking my call. Sure, man. Um, I wanted to check with you and get your thoughts on the recent resurgence in vinyl and uh, get your take and see if you've talked to other bands and what their thoughts are on it. Well, it's, um, I think it's a, it's a still a very niche thing, Jeff. I mean, I am a guy who is a huge fan of anybody that owns music in a physical format. CD, yep. vinyl, cassette, 8-track. I don't care what your trip is. Physically owning music is enormously important to me, and I'm a fan of any of that succeeding and going forward. So vinyl, my, my thing is still far and away CDs as my favorite. But vinyl's cool for the packaging. I don't have a turntable. I know people say it sounds better. That's great if that's your scene. But for me, I'm all about CDs. But none of it is going to get to the point where it's going to, like, save the industry. It's still very niche. And by from what I understand, talking to my friends who are into vinyl, they tell me it's way expensive to get new albums on vinyl. Oh, it is, big time. So a lot of them are buying used and old ones and things like that. But it's cool. I get it. I mean, I grew up loving vinyl. I started in radio in 83, so I used to play vinyl on the air. So I get it, but I'm all about CDs. But if you're any way that you're still buying and holding physical music, I am all for. Yeah, I think it's huge. It it really expresses the artwork a lot more than the CDs do. And obviously, MP3s, you don't get anything except for digital, but... Um, yeah, you it know, seems like it's coming back at least a bit. It is. Oh, no, it is. There's definitely a movement. Thanks, Jeff. It is. I mean, I was in a Barnes and Noble. They had a vinyl section. It's good to see. Is it going to be like come back to like where it ever was? Not even close. But it's a cool thing, and I'm all for it. I, personally, I'm not getting into it. Personally, I'm not getting a turntable. Um, personally, I'm not turning over a record. I just, I'm fine with CDs. To me, CD is still the perfect format by far. And and what people forget about CDs, they're still digital. So when I get a CD, the first thing I do is rip it into my iTunes. And then I have the physical thing, and I can put it in my player at home. And I, I it's it's multi-purpose. I think people forget about the great, why, why CDs were so great in the first place. Those reasons still apply. There's a great article in Rolling Stone magazine a week or two ago that I tweeted the link out. And it said, are we trying to bury CDs too quick? And it raised all those points. Like all the same, the sound quality, how well they endure. They're still physical. They're still digital. All the things I just said. So that's what I'm about. And I spoke on this radio panel in Vegas last week. And the, the panel I was on was called The Art of the Interview. And it was about interviewing artists. And I said, they were talking about tools that could be used to do more effective, better interviews. And I said, you know what? Here's another one. All the publicists, all the labels out there, send a CD. Because it's in your face. There's artwork. There's a booklet. There's something to digest, to read, to live with, to learn about. You have notes. You have songwriting credits. Those are all jumping off points for a conversation in an interview. And then later on, there was another panel at this radio convention, and the panel was how to break a band at rock radio. 
And one of the big programming guys that was up there said, hey, whoever was on that panel before about sending CDs still, I'm all about, and you're 100% right. And I was like, yeah, somebody else. Because he brought up the same thing. He goes, if I want to play it, I can rip it into my system, but I want to have it. It's incredible with the music industry going down the tubes that it's to the point where they can't, they don't even want to swing the money for the two bucks it takes to send a CD to someone. Most of them. I'm lucky that most of the people know I'm a CD guy and they still send them to me. And I insist on getting them. But by and large, record labels are sending out these horrendous sounding files, these systems. They want you to go to these sites, log in, password, this code. Forget it. Ain't doing it. Don't have the time. I'm actually playing new music. Send me a CD. And there's other people that feel the same way. And I, I, I'm, I'm standing my ground until they're completely extinct. Hopefully that day doesn't come. Quick couple calls uh, here at the end before we get Monster Truck in. Ricky in West Virginia. What's up, Rick? Hey, um, I was just wondering, Trunk, um, a long time ago, me and uh, Lee Singer Kicks, me and him went to the Ray Track together. Okay. And and he, uh, me and him, me and him had a good time. I even met the band. Okay. I'm a, I'm a kick fan. Okay. Do you have a question? I was, I was asked the question is, uh, why is, uh, um, the white man ain't playing at Shy Acres no more. I'm sorry, Rick. You lost me, man. You're way too inside. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Kicks plays all over the place. Steve Whiteman is the singer in Kicks. I don't know what to tell you. Um, if they're not playing anywhere for some reason, that's because they didn't get an offer or they don't want to play there anymore. Oof. Last call. This is uh, Frank in Pennsylvania. Hey, Frank. Hey, Eddie, how's it going? Good, man. be a tough call to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Kicks, Kicks plays constantly. They're on every cruise that I'm on. They're at every festival I'm on. So I don't know where he's worried about them playing, but they're out there. And they're a great band, but I, he was a little off the, the rails. A little bit. And thank you for bringing the funk and heavy metal junk every week, Mr. Trunk. You definitely brighten up my miserable Monday and make it a fun day on the ride home. Oh, well, thank appreciate you, man. It. appreciate that. Where in PA are you, Frank? Uh, Hershey, PA. You guys need to come out here. We got great theater. We got Giant Center. You guys need to come and bring some, some heavy metal. Fun. Hey, somebody great. books me. I'll be there. So we'll see what happens. All right, we'll see how it goes. So I was going to touch on what you were saying earlier in regards, and you touched on that last week too about um, buying the physical copy. And I was trying to get my son to do that, try and feed into his brain to what happens if Apple goes out of business or your computer breaks. You still have it there, aside from sitting back reading the artwork. I'm a CD guy too, but. You know, there are some benefits to the online, the way people are going. You ever hear of a band called Dorje? They're out of uh, England. They, I have not. Uh, dude started as, like, I messed around with guitar. Dude started as, like, a guitar player. He gave lessons online. Then he started doing demoing for a music shop over there. He's got his own guitar company now. His band launched just straight with social media. Uh, an EP went number one. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, listen. Uh, listen, I don't want to be taken out of context here. There, there's a great benefit to the online stuff. There's a great benefit for when people want me to hear something new, sending me a YouTube link and saying, just click and listen or watch. And that's really helpful because then if I listen and watch that way, my next call is, hey, get me the CD when it comes out. So for a discovery, you're 100% right. But to have a real relationship with the music and really take it in and own it and live with it, to me, I still love having something physical. Yeah, man, it's kind of like the opposite of they, they invite you into your home. You get over, almost an overload as, as far as what they're about, whereas in the past, the bands was all mystery, and you didn't really know what was going on, and you kind yeah. of read between the lines, hopes to catch a glimpse. But it's a different. It would be nice if they can marry the two. But uh, I wanted to ask about, you were talking about Sabbath earlier. Something came out today about Lita Ford, and uh, she's writing some kind of memoir, and she's talking about uh, about uh, Tony Iommi, and he was, uh, abusing her or something like that. Do you read anything like that? Yeah. The, well, listen, you're right, Frank. Fr uh, Lita Ford, and this made a lot of news. And listen, Lita's, thank you, Frank, for the call. Lita's trying to sell a book. She's got an autobiography coming out. And uh, she it, she uh, she did exactly what she was out to do, which is get people talking about her book and spiking interest uh, by putting out teaser clips that talked about her basically having a threesome with Richie Sambora and John Bon Jovi. Uh, this is the shit people love. This is what they eat up. This is what's going to get people interested and excited. 
Uh, that's she said. She talked about that, and she talked about the yes, yeah, she was married to Tony Iommi, and she said Tony physically beat her. Now, this is something I'll be honest with you that has been talked about in the music industry for a long time. This is it, people in the business have been rumbling about that for for decades that that was an abusive relationship. The fact that Lee has gone public with it is pretty interesting. She did not at all go public or talk at all about her relationship with her most recent husband uh, because of, uh, I get probably fear of some sort of suit of some sort, which was, it could be a whole book in and of itself. And I was kind of in and around that because that's when Lita was making her comeback and she was our first guest on that metal show. But she left all that out. But she did talk apparently about Iomi and that she said he did, he did was physically abusive to her. And, and there's no defense for that. But the other thing is, just so it's not taken out of context, she did also say that he was at the height of drug addiction and loaded on coke and this and that. But again, hard to excuse that in any way. It's going to be really interesting to see if Tony makes a statement about this or if he puts out any release about it, because it's a pretty heavy charge. And I would think that Lita and her attorneys and publisher would have to know that the seriousness of that allegation or claim could result in potential lawsuits or something like that if it were untrue. So whether Lita has proof of this or not, whether Tony reacts to it or not, I do not know. I will tell you, though, that, as I said, for decades that has been rumbled about in the business that that relationship back in those days was that bad. But the fact that it's finally come out and Lita's talked about it and put it in print has given it all new birth, and I'm sure Tony is less than thrilled about it, but if it's true, it should come out. And um, I don't know Lita to lie, but again, I wasn't there. But at the end of the day, it is doing exactly what any publisher or person trying to sell a book wants. Getting people talking. I had heard about her thing with you know, Lita has a pretty colorful history, let's just say, with rockers back in the day. And uh, she's good for her. She's letting it, she's she putting it out there like a guy would talk about his conquests. But it's uh, it's definitely got people talking and probably going to result in her having a great first week for her book. And I'm sure we'll be doing something here on the radio when the book comes out. And we'll get more into it. All right. Thank you all for the calls. XM 39. What becomes Trunk Nation? My mix of music and talk about music on Monday, 6 to 10 p.m., 3 to 7 Eastern. So 20 minutes left to go. And what is our final live show? Until March 7th. Next two weeks will be recorded because I'm doing some travel. As I mentioned, I'll be out on the high seas. So if you want to get on the air, 866-315-2663. Anything you want to talk about in the world of rock and metal music, lines are now open. Number is on your radio. Fire away. We'll talk. We'll chat. We'll discuss. We'll debate. I'll do my best to answer questions. Whatever it is you want to do for the last 20 minutes of our last live show for a few weeks. And as usual, 866-315-2663 is the number to call in. And as usual... Learn more about me, my schedule, where I'm going to be. It's all on eddytrunk.com, right on the homepage. Uh, Monsters of Rock Cruise, Labruski Cruise, Queensryche and Dockin, Pompano Beach Amphitheater, February 27th. The airwaves are yours, my friends. And we will begin with Troy, who is listening in Dallas. Hi, Troy. Hi, Ed. How are you doing? Good, man. What's up? Hey, I was uh, calling to see... Uh... If you'd uh, heard anything from Joe or Phil about the uh, residency in, uh, um, for the Viva Pyromania. No, I think that right now the main concern for Def Leppard is that Joe Elliott get his voice back. Yeah. Okay. So I don't, I don't think there's – I haven't heard – I mean, I've heard them talk about that, but I haven't heard anything more concrete about that. Def Leppard has been playing – the one thing I'll say about Leppard is they have been playing a lot over the last four or five years. So – I think they have to be careful of what they do and when they do it and how they do it. And I think this break for Joe Elliott is maybe a good thing. It could be a little bit of a blessing in disguise because they could use the break, I'm sure, and it gives Joe a chance to recover from his voice. And then maybe that's something they do. But right now, I mean, they have a brand new record out. So I think the focus is probably trying to promote that record when they do get back out on the road. 
makes perfect sense. Yeah, but I'd like to see that myself, Troy. And if I hear anything about it, I'll let you know. Thank you for the call. Um, and the new Def Leppard album is is a good record. I really do like a lot of stuff on it. But obviously, this thing with Joe and his voice is a huge concern, and they have to get the rest and get ready. I mean, they had to blow out a bunch of dates just now. They should be on the road still, and they had to cancel those shows. So hopefully he gets gets well and gets back out there. I think that's the number one thing they have to deal with. Let's go to L.A. and say hello to Ollie. What's up, Ollie? Hey, Dylan. I just want to tell you that uh, you're doing some great work, but also the people out here in Los Angeles, uh, they're doing some great work. Uh, Chuck Wright from Quiet Wright and... Adam Mandel over here at uh, Lucky Strike Ultimate Jam Night. It is so fantastic. Finally, music is getting back to where it should be out here in Los Angeles and uh, constantly plugging away. I was wondering, who would you like to see uh, to come up here and jam? Because we tried to have Steve Vai, and uh, it canceled because of the fire marshal. But uh, we would love to have uh, this venue just get as many plugs as possible because it's, it's a great thing we're doing out here. Well, Ollie, I've been there and I'm aware of it. Uh, I think that the the thing is, is that um, I think it's, thank you for the call, Ollie. I think it's a cool spot and it's a really cool thing. It's free, <laughs> which obviously helps. Uh, anytime that anybody does something that's free, uh, nobody likes to pay. Obviously, the downside of that is you can't control capacity and you have that thing that happened with the David Lee Roth uh, issue when the original band was going to come together. But it's hard to say, you know, one of the things that ends up happening with this stuff is that it may be free to get in, but it also is a huge benefit to the venue if you're filling their venue every night, meaning the bar tab and all that. And I, I know there's a lot of people that enjoy doing that jam. And, and if you don't know what our caller was talking about, it's a Wednesday night free jam at Lucky Strike Bowling Alley. Uh, in in LA and it's great I went to it one time but I've talked to some people who I'm going to re will remain nameless and I've talked to them they said well you know it's really nice that they keep wanting to do this but at the same token like somebody's making money here and we ain't getting any of it <laughs> so whenever you do these sort of jam things uh same thing happens with events at NAM and things like that it's it's like for a while it's like yeah it's cool to jam and then it turns into something big and it gets full and the bar tab is ringing and the room is full on a weeknight. And then these some of these bigger name musicians start to say, well, wait a minute, we're bringing people here. And the, even though it's free, there's P and wait, well, what are we, we're, somebody's making money. So that is, becomes, a, can become a thing and it can be, people may stop coming the bigger names because they're drawing people and they want a piece of the pie. Uh, I'm just telling you how it is, and I've heard that from some people. You know, so I more power to it. I love seeing live music and a scene being built up anywhere, but I do know that that becomes a consideration after a while for some of the bigger musicians who you say you're trying to pull into this thing. Sounds Ollie like you have some affiliation with it, and I can tell you that I've heard that personally from a few artists. Uh, let's go to Albert in South Texas. Hi, Al. Eddie, what's up, man? You fucking rule, dude. Love your show. Thank you, man. I appreciate Eddie. that. Yes, sir. Eddie, two quick things, man. Tremonti, um, do you know if he's going to release a single by any chance off that new album, Dust, anytime soon? And Blotch, do you think he'll, he'll uh, put out some new material with his new band? Well, first of all, um, to my knowledge, Mark Tremonti's working on a new Alter Bridge record. I, I know that he had a second, he had a third new album done at the time he did his, his last, his last record, Quarter Eyes. I know there was a whole nother record done. I don't know if that's coming out anytime soon. Is that what you're talking about? It seems like we lost our caller. I don't know. I know Mark and Miles are working on a new Alter Bridge record, so I don't know anything about new Tremonti solo music. I know there's another record done. I don't know if and when he's going to put it out. As far as Blotz doing new music with this new version of Rat that only includes him from the original band, I don't. I doubt that that's in the works. I think there's a lot of other things that you know that they're trying to figure out and and do to go forward and establish that name and establish that band and hopefully rectify any remaining obstacles there may or may not be in him continuing to use the name. I, that's been a messy thing for a long time, but I haven't heard anything more about it uh, and, and what he's planning to do beyond trying to do some live shows. And listen, 
let's be totally honest. How many people are going to want to play and are going to care about new music from Rat with just Bobby Blotzer from the original band? Outside of me, <laughs> I don't know who else would play it or care about it. Because even if it was Rat, actually Rat with all the guys, it would still be a tough sell to get played on the radio. You guys have to understand when you want to hear new music from these bands, that's great. But nobody plays it except me and maybe three other people in the world. They, nobody plays it. Nobody buys it. So a lot of these guys, it's getting harder and harder for them to make sense. The money, the time, the commitment to go into a studio to play a record that when you go out on tour, everyone's just going to yell for the classic stuff. And the minute they say, uh, we have about to play a song from the new record, the beer line and bathroom line fill up. If people, if, if us as fans do not do a better job embracing new music from these artists that we love and there's so much good coming out, earlier tonight I had a new band in here, Monster Truck, making great new music that has an old school vibe. They, they're struggling to get it played. It's brutal. Dave in Canada. Hi, Dave. Hey, Eddie. How are you doing tonight? Good. Uh, another great show tonight. Uh, and, Thank uh, you. See you. Next week on the cruise. Uh, looking forward to that. Oh, cool. Uh, just want to let you know there was a great interview last night on 60 Minutes with a photographer, Danny uh, Clinch. Yes, I saw to... Anderson Cooper tweeting about it, but I have it on my DVR. I haven't watched it yet. Right, right. And there's a, if you did miss it, there's all kinds of uh, resources to catch it again. But uh, I just want to give a shout out to that interview. It was a good interview. You, uh, with two books, know uh, the power of photography and uh, what it helped uh uh, you, you know, you with your books and uh, music and artwork and photography, they all go together. They're very powerful. Hey, Dave, what was the angle with this particular photographer that it made 60 Minutes? Uh, I'm not sure. He, they just claim that he's one of the most popular photographers out there. He does, uh, it's not so much heavy metal or hard rock uh, that he does, but a lot of, you know, Springsteen kind of stuff. He's got some iconic images uh, with uh, Dylan and uh, just been around a long time. They just seem to think that he's one of the top-notch rock photographers out there. Yeah, thank you, Dave, and I'll see you on the cruise. If you're into uh, uh, stories about uh, photographers, there's also a very lengthy documentary about a legendary photographer from here in New York, Bob Gruen. And Bob has done incredibly iconic photos over the years. The, the photo of John Lennon wearing the New York City shirt, uh, the cover of Kiss Dress to Kill with them in the suits, uh, tons of stuff for all sorts of artists. I think he did Bowie, all sorts of stuff. Uh, Blondie, incredible iconic images. And I'll tell you what, a little fun fact here. If you have my second book, Essential Hard Rock and Heavy Metal Volume 2, the photo on the cover of that with the hands in the air, that's Bob Gruen. It was not done specifically for my book, but that photo was licensed from his archives for the cover of my second book. I've met him and I know him, but I but that's that's the origins of that photo. I found out, by the way, I always wondered, you know, the photo of my second book, like what obviously that's a concert like my first book i know that photo is from lemores in brooklyn and it was before an anthrax show and then for volume two it's a different shot different angle hands in the air and i was like i wonder i know bob took it i wonder whose show that was like where was that and it turns out it was a class show the band playing where that crowd shot was was a clash not exactly metal but it's still cool uh matt in massachusetts hey matt oh man i'm hung out to dry here eddie Excuse me, Matt? Uh, my name's Tony. Oh, you got me? Oh, I'm sorry, Tony. It says Matt. Yeah, you're on the air. Oh, thanks, man. It's Tony from uh, Lemmy, British Columbia, Canada. Yeah. Wow, they talking. got all, Emilio's got all the information wrong here. He's got you named Matt, and you got you in Massachusetts. That's <laughs> all right. Thanks for taking my call. Sure, man. go ahead, Tony. It. Go ahead, man. Uh, man, great, great show again tonight. JLT does uh, justice to... Uh, you know, RJD, you know, uh, it, you know, uh, rock legends, truthfully. Uh, anyways, the question is, um, I'm going to do the Maiden show in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, mm -hmm. in April. Um, I know we, you know, you've had questions, because I listen to your show every Monday, about, you know, uh, you know, do you know anything about uh, the set list and shit like that? And we know you don't. Granted. Yeah, I haven't heard um, yet. No. Um, have, is there any more updates? Uh, Bo, is, is Bruce better, getting 
getting better. That's all I was wondering. Honestly, Matt, I have uh, Matt. I keep calling you Matt because that's on the screen. I'm sorry, Tony. Uh, honestly, I have no idea. Uh, there's been no information. I would assume that Maiden and Bruce are on track to do fine because there's been no issues with the shows. The fer- very first shows are getting very close. There's been no problem. As a matter of fact, they've added some tour dates lately, and all the shows are extremely well sold. So I don't think there's going to be any issue. Uh, with Bruce, he seems to be fully on track. But as soon as we get a little bit closer, you know, Iron Maiden's uh, management sent me these really cool Iron Maiden headphones today. I was away for the last week, so I only got home today and didn't get to get fully into my mail. But some really cool headphones. And uh, I'll reach out to them and thank them for those headphones. And maybe we can get a little interview to set up the Maiden tour sometime in the next few weeks uh, when I'm back live here in a few. Uh, let's go to Chattanooga. Say hello to Chris. Hi, Chris. Hey, Chris. Is this Chris? Hey, hey this is Matt. <laughs> Matt from Massachusetts. Uh, well, you, now you, he's got you labeled as Chris in Chattanooga. I think Emilio's oh. smoking crack out there. Yeah, this is Matt. He you got you. Me? He got you flipped. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. All right. I was just um, wondering. Do you think Molly Crew is definitely done with? Yes. All right. And um, I'm like you. I got the CD still, and um, I just got the Nativity in Black. It's being sent to me in the mail, the tribute to our Black Sabbath. Do you know anything about that CD? That's an old – where would you get that, online somewhere, like an auction or something? Amazon. Yeah, th- that was a promotional record, if I, if it's the one I'm thinking of. Or, or, no, actually, that one actually did come out. Yeah, I remember there was a couple Sabbath tributes back in the day. Yeah, there's some cool stuff on there, if I remember. Uh, thanks for the call, um, <laughs> I think it was Matt. <laughs> the line, lines are a little screwed up there. Uh, Tennessee, John. Is this John in Tennessee? Yeah, thanks for taking my call, Eddie. All right, we're back on track. Where The lines are back. Go ahead, John. <laughs> on the Nativity in Black, I actually got both versions of that. I've got the one that came out, and I've also got the one that's got the Old Testament with all the Black yes. Sabbath originals. Yes. And the other one with all the other ones, even the typo negative cover of black cyber with the alternate lyrics on it yes that's what i was thinking of because i have that as well the two disc one yep but anyway i had a business question for you uh, during super bowl weekend hair nation was converted over like a arena anthem you know i, I just kind of wonder i'm sure it has to do with how the contracts are made up but do the fans get revenue from that when like you know the lakers or whoever are playing their songs like I know you were ranting a while back about they always play crazy train all the time at sporting events. I'm just curious about that. And then I got another quick one for you. Well, you know, if if music is played in public places, it should be accounted for to an organization, uh, either ASCAP or BMI. If you go into yeah. certain restaurants, you'll see cert- the ones that report to those organizations. There's a logo. There's usually a sticker on their window, and it shows that whatever music okay. they're playing in the restaurant, they account for that for royalty payment. But let's be honest, there's a lot of them that don't. They'll just put on... Uh, satellite radio or put on a CD or an, uh, an iPod and play that sort of music because they don't want to have to pay. Okay, like even at the sporting events too? or the. I'm not oh. sure. That's a good question. I honestly don't know, John, how it works with sporting events. Uh, uh, I, you may or may not have been aware of this band, late 80s, a band called The Big F out of Los Angeles. Heard of them, but don't remember much about them. Uh, the weird thing about it is supposedly, and I can never get this confirmed, that that is the bass player and the drummer from Berlin. Mm, very possible, man, but I don't know. You're getting into new wave pop territory on me now. Uh, Vince in Colorado. What's up, Vince? Hey, Eddie. How you doing? Good, man. Good. Hey, um, I got a question for you about Guns N' Roses. It, um, do we know that, uh, obviously, Duff and, and Axel and Slash are, are getting together here uh, as Guns N' Roses? Uh, and a lot of us, you know, who saw them way back would love to see the original lineup. Um, and, uh, you know, Stephen and Izzy, uh, I, honestly, I wouldn't be disappointed if it was Gilby and Matt in there but, or any combination of those guys. Uh, any idea on whether any of those four are going to be involved in this or is it going to be the three of them in, in, in a group of hired guns? Uh, for, if uh, if guns it was those? if it was any of those other guys that would have been announced by now. I mean, there's obviously a very clear reason why they are simply only marketing Slash, Duff, and Axel because that is all they're willing to commit to. I can tell you, I can tell you no way, Matt Sorum. Matt Sorum has not been affiliated or involved or asked to be part of this in any way, shape, or form. His name was never 
associated with it. People I've talked right. to since the beginning when this was coming together told me that for whatever reason, Sorum was not going to be included. I don't know if there's bad issues with anybody. Sorum is not right. and has never had his name attached to this. Same with Gilby, although I don't think there's any real issues, but Gilby was never involved. And as far as, no. as, far as Adler and Izzy, I don't think either of them, they don't feel are reliable enough. I would hope that both of them are invited and can do a part of the set. But again, this is going to be Slash, Axel, and Duff playing with the last lineup of Guns N' Roses. Right, it's going right. to be Richard Fortas on guitar, Frank Ferrer on drums, Dizzy Reed, and Pittman on, on keyboards. Essentially, it is Slash joining the last lineup of Guns N' Roses because Duff was in that with subbing, for, filling in for the two guitar players that left. Not filling in, but filling that spot. So right, right. I know everybody has and wishes for this notion of an appetite lineup. It ain't going to happen. It's not happening. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it might not happen at some point for a few songs during the course of a tour. Hey, we'd like to invite up a couple friends. I could see that. But this is not yeah. being built around that at all. Yeah, that's too bad. Yeah, it, well, it is, it is Vince, but here's this thing, and, and, and thank you for the call. It isn't going to prevent most people from going. This is the same scenario as we have with Black Sabbath without Bill Ward, Van Halen without Michael Anthony. It's too bad. You wish it would be the case, but still, the huge majority of people are still going to go. And if you don't like something, but you still pay and go, the people you don't like won because they got your money. So I'm not telling you to go or don't go, but I'm just telling you if you're buying a ticket and tons of people have to see Guns N' Roses and you're thinking you're going to see an appetite reunion for a full show, you wasted your money. You may get it for a song or two. At special shows popping up or even within a set within the set. But that's not what this is. If it was, it would be marketed as such. Thank you guys for all the calls. I will be back again live three weeks. Phone calls. We had a great hour conversation in the first half of the show. And especially for people on the West Coast, maybe just jumping into your cars now. You may have missed it. But it was dominated by debate, discussion, opinion about Kiss going into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame which is something that was that happened just after just before the holidays. And as a result, this is the first live show I've done since that news came out. So we've been spending a lot of time talking about that. And that's fine or if you want to bring up other things, that's fine as well. Of course, everybody knows my feelings about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and how vocal I've been about these bands not being in so much so that it's maybe a year and a half ago that the president of the hall sat right here in the studio and discussed all of it with us. It's nice to see finally some headway being made. Alice Cooper, Rush last year, Kiss this year. The big question is what happens with these inductions now that these bands go in? That's when the drama really starts as far as what the different parties want to happen and then what ultimately ends up happening on that night, in this case in April in Brooklyn, New York. And all the different information and opinions and things that we've heard from Gene, from Ace, from Paul Stanley, which caused a big ruckus on Twitter when he tweeted out that it was unlikely that he would play with the original band and no way was the response when asked about wearing the makeup. Contrary, of course, to what others have said and what Ace mentioned in his interview with me, which again, you can hear now on my site. So everybody's got a view and an opinion on what they think should happen. I think just about universally, there's nobody I've ever talked to, and logically you would think this, that feels that Ace and Peter shouldn't play and shouldn't be there, being that the original four guys are being inducted and they started it. It's just how it goes down. Makeup, no makeup, other members that were in the band, no other members. So it's really interesting stuff. The comments section on my website has been popping for the last couple weeks. And it's all good debate. There's no right or wrong answer. There's no definitive answer. That's the other thing. Nothing is done yet. 
as I said, this is really the beginning of the, the new year for the music industry today. So the conversations and the dialogue and the negotiations, if you will, are really going to start to happen now over the course of the next few weeks and maybe a couple months to figure out what ultimately goes down here. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of conflicting information between now and then. So we can talk about that or anything you want in the world of rock and metal. We'll continue with uh, the calls now for a little bit. We'll go back to some music, and then we'll wrap up with calls as well. Lines are all jammed. Appreciate that. Great to be back live, hanging with you guys as always. And we will now, once again, return to the phones. This guy has been waiting for a very long time. Glad to finally get him on board. It is Joe in Pittsburgh. What's up, Joe? Thanks for waiting. No problem, brother. And um, I just want to say thanks for hanging out with me over at um, Dallas, Texas. And um, I'm looking forward to returning. I'm going to be in New York Sunday. And, I'm gonna, and I got my invites and everything from GothamCasting.com to return to that metal show. Well, great, Joe. We'll see you soon then. And, and I definitely. And um, I'm going to stray off the kiss thing a little bit because um, technically um, it's bullshit, and I'm going to get that out of the way. But have you ever heard of a band called Sister Sin? And if you have, what do you think of them? And I'll take your comments on the radio. Uh, Joe, thanks for the call, and we'll see you soon. And I, I, I've heard of the band, but I wish, God, Joe, you waited so long. I wish I could give you something more than what I'm going to give you, which is basically nothing. Um, I've heard of the band, but outside of that, there's nothing more I can tell you because I just don't know anything more about them. But thank you for waiting. Thank you for listening, and uh, we'll see you soon, Joe. Thank you. Brennan in Bowling Green. Hi, Brennan. Hey, Eddie. How are you, sir? Good. Thank you. All right. Uh, just wanted to make a comment or two about the Rock and Roll Hall of Shame. Please do. Love that. Uh, you know, I've been a Kiss fan since 1975, Chris to kill. I was four years old then, Eddie. I'm 42 years old. We all know that the induction is long overdue. They call a public enemy. <laughs> you know, I, you, you went over that. I don't have to. Over that, well, yeah, how about this one? Thing. How about this one, Brennan? <laughs> and, I mean, you know, I catch shit from this from certain people, but, I mean, how is Nirvana, and and, and I'm not going to tell you Nirvana shouldn't at someday go into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but Nirvana is going in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year as well. First time ever eligible. Kiss, Alice Cooper, wow. Rush waited over 15 years. Nirvana covered a Kiss song early on. Yeah. Kurt was a Kiss that, fan, so so I you know agree. you say influence is, is the number one barometer for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Well, explain how Kiss is just going in after waiting fifteen years in a band that they clearly influenced is going in first time eligible. It just shows I the mean, mentality of the people in charge. Deep Purple should be right there beside of Kiss. Deep Purple should about. have been there before Kiss, Alice Cooper, or exactly. Rush. To be honest with you, they really should have been. Exactly, exactly. I, I agree completely. Uh, we're lucky Kiss got in at all. But they're, you know, the, the, they deserve it. We know it. Ace, Peter, Gene, and Paul are kids to me. We, me and you think a lot alike. They always were. However, you know, the Mach 1, 2, 3 versions of the band, it gets so numerous. You know, like you mentioned, Hart and Deep Purple. It gets confusing. Uh, I was, you know, so much water has been under this bridge with Ace and Peter. Uh, you know, I mean, it, you know, for God's sake, they used to call Peter the Ayatollah Chris Cola back in the day. I mean, you know that. Yeah, well. I mean, I've met Peter, and he's different now than he was then, I'm sure. He's oh, yeah. Over, things are different. Oh, you know, yeah. They'll be lucky to attend. They'll be lucky to be able to speak, much less have a jam with the guys. And, you know, I've mixed feelings about this. I'm, saying, I'm sure you do, too. I love your books. I love Volume 1. I love Volume 2. I like how you stated in the 8th section in Volume 2. You know, I'm not speaking as Eddie. Ace's pal, I'm speaking as Eddie, the Kiss fan. Well, that's that. Me. Well, thank you, Brendan, and that's really what it is. And I appreciate the call. I had to let you go. Your line was a, your phone line was a little noisy there, but you know that's what people kind of people look whether they read the stuff I do, watch, listen, whatever it is. I appreciate, but people look at me in a different way than I feel about myself. And even though, yes, I will admit, Peter Chris is a friend, Ace, I've had a friendship with for over 25 years. I signed him to his first record deal. So I'm not denying any of that. But my position and feeling and speaking about any of these guys and Kiss in general is always from one thing and one thing only, being a Kiss fan long before I knew those guys. It was my first 
record, real record I got in at 12 years old. I sure as hell didn't know any of those guys personally then. So that's my point of reference and my only position and point of reference whenever I talk about KISS. And that's why I feel the way I feel about certain things. There's nothing to do with... I can say that till I'm blue in the face, but people are going to just... It's a convenient thing to say, but history and my track record of support for the band completely blows that out of the water if you really want to look at it. But whatever. People can say what they want to say. And you're right. To a lot of people, Kiss is Ace, Peter, Gene, and Paul. No matter how much time has passed, how many other people have been in that band, how many other ways they try to do it. For me, yes, that's where it all started. But I was a fan of all the other lineups and a fan of many of those records. And I've said a zillion times, the only thing that changed for me was Tommy and Eric not having their own personas. So that's when I checked out. But... That's it. It doesn't. It's nothing to do with those guys in the band. And Ace, Peter, Gene, and Paul are the ones being inducted into the Hall of Fame as it stands now. They were. That is Kiss to the Hall. That is what the Hall is putting in. The difference with Heart, where their original band was inducted. L- let's be honest. Heart, outside of Ann and Nancy Wilson, is a pretty faceless band. And I'm not. That's not a knock on Heart. Because I actually like Hart, and I'm a fan, and I think they were overdue for the Hall as well, and they finally went in. But Hart is completely now looked at as Anna and Nancy Wilson. No, most people couldn't tell you who else is in Hart besides the Wilson sisters. So when they go into the Hall of Fame, it's really just about them. And the Hall inducted the original band, and then the current band played, but... Again, being brutally honest, and I don't mean any disrespect because I love some of the guys that were in heart that made up the band. But nobody, you couldn't pick any of them out of a lineup for the most part. Because that band was completely sold on the Wilson sisters and their faces. And they've been the constants since day one. Kiss is different. Kiss was, in their heyday, a four-wheel machine. That's what made them so unique, one of the many things. they all, all four guys sang. They all had their own personas. They all had their own stage antics. It truly was, you know, they all had individual solo records at the same time. It truly was a band then that all four guys were equally well-known. So it's different. You can't. You can't sweep it under the carpet and play it off like some of these other bands where the the bass player really, nobody really knows them. Now, of course, the hardcore fans do. But you know what I'm saying. It's a different visual. It's a different thing. Rick in Seattle. Go ahead, Rick. Hey, Eddie. Happy New Year. Thanks for taking my call. Same to you, man. Hey, uh, sorry about the Giants, too, by the way. Uh, well, good luck with your Seahawks. I'm assuming you're a fan. No, I'm a Giants fan, actually. In Long Seattle, time. huh? Yeah, I'm the only one with a Giants sticker on my truck. <laughs> well, good for you. I mean, are, do you root for the Seahawks or no? No, I don't. Okay, well. Oh, Giants all the way. I love that. Hopefully next year will be a better year, but, you know. I think so. The way we started 0-6 to at least come out 7-9, and uh, it's not, not so bad. Brutal. But uh, I want to let you know, over the holidays, I got the two Ace Freely reissues on Rock Candy, uh, Second Sighting by Freely's Comet and Trouble Walking by Ace Freely. And the packaging's gorgeous, and it's remastered. and sounds incredible. I just want to know what you thought about those. You know, Rick, I have Trouble Walking, and I was unaware that they did Second Sighting until I got Trouble yeah. Walking and saw it inside the sleeve. Um I don't know why they didn't do the first record, which would have been the one the most people would have wanted, but maybe that's coming or they couldn't license it. Um, but I'm a huge fan of the Rock Candy Records reissues, as, as I spoke about earlier. And thank you for the call, Rick. Uh, I think the liner notes are great. You know, the remastering, it sounds a little bit better, but not dramatically, at least. I can only speak about Trouble Walking. Um, second Sighting in Ace's catalog was a record that if you have it and you look at it, you'll see... I. 
I have, uh, and this just goes to show, again, speaks to my objectivity about things. I'm an executive producer on that record, and I think it's a really, really mediocre to bad record. And I, I worked on it. And the reason why I say that is, I should, I should rephrase that. It's a bad Ace Fraley record, because Ace is barely on it. He was not healthy at that time. And that record was very much dominated by Todd Howard, who was a very talented guy, very good singer and writer and player. But in Ace Frehley's band, people want to hear Ace sing and see Ace play. And he really wasn't all that much of a part of that record. So Trouble Walking, I thought, was much closer to where things were supposed to be. So... That's why I feel that way about that record. It doesn't really isn't really much of an Ace record. There are tracks on that record I don't think Ace even played on, and it's his own band. But that's what was going on back at that time, eighty eight, whatever it was. So I haven't heard that one. I'd be curious to hear it just because I worked on the record and I have to try to get a copy of it. I uh, I'll tell you this: if you have the second signing record, and I hope I'm assuming they did it in the booklet on the new CD. There's a photo at least in the original album and CD, of two sneakers turned opposite directions, two feet with sneakers on, Nike sneakers turned opposite directions. Those are my feet. <laughs> and that's a, 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 a silly story to begin with, but uh, I was in the studio when Ace was doing their record in the days he was there, and we were talking, and I was standing near the console talking to him one day, and I had one foot turned out to the right and one foot forward. And I kind of leaned in to the console to hear him say something, and my foot to the turned out turned back even more. And he totally freaked out. And I didn't even know that this was something that most people couldn't do, but I, I'm able to, I haven't tried it in a long time. But back then, I was able to take one foot and turn it around completely behind me. So I could stand stand forward with one foot facing forward, the other foot facing completely behind me. I could turn my foot all the way around. And he freaked out at that, cackling like a lunatic. And he was always into computer graphics, so back then even. So he took a picture. He made me do it. He took a picture. He ran it through a computer, and that picture is the inner sleeve of second signing. I have done signings where people have asked me to sign sneakers. The picture of my sneakers from second sighting, which is hysterical. And somewhere out there, there's when he, he went on MTV's Headbangers Ball for that record to promote it, and I was standing off camera, and he calls me out and makes me do it on, I did it on MTV with him. To recreate the sleeve. So somewhere that tape is out there from Headbangers Ball around 88. My gosh, the stories. Steve in Los Angeles. What's up, Steve? Hey, Eddie. Thanks for my, taking my call, brother. Sure, man. Hey, uh, just chime in about the Kiss Hall of Fame mess. And hopefully it won't be a mess, but maybe you can clarify some things. Uh, my understanding is Ace and Peter have sold their makeup character rights to Eugene and Paul. Have they, how, how and why did this happen? And have they ever expressed any remorse to you about doing, doing that? Or? Well, it, Peter talks about it a little bit in his most recent book. I don't remember if Ace addressed it in his book. But basically, my understanding is this, uh, that, and you are right, that's why, uh, Gene and Paul own Kiss, they own the band, they own the entity, they own the makeup designs, they own everything. And that's within their right. They were healthy, smart enough to be able to do that and made a deal in order to do that. What a lot of people, I think, forget about with Kiss, and I say this all the time, I get into this with people, email, Twitter, comments on my website, whatever. Depending upon how old you are, you may not quite understand this. We touched on it a little bit earlier. In the late 70s, 79, 80, 81, 82, even into 83, Kiss was dead in the water in the U.S. Dead in the water. Laughing stock. Couldn't get arrested. 
joke band. If you liked them, you were called names and made fun of. I lived through this period. Those were the years I was in high school as a Kiss fan, getting verbally accosted for wearing Kiss shirts. You cannot, unless you lived it and you're around my age, which is 49, you you can't comprehend how hard the backlash was to Kiss. They were, you were, you were just laughed out of the room if you were a Kiss fan in those years. The reason I'm saying this is those are the, that's the time when Ace and Peter left the band. So back then, factor in their own clouded judgment from substances or what have you, bad business advice, and the fact that anybody would have thought that Kiss was so over, it was like a fire sale. And if you have a piece of a business which you perceive to be a dead business with no future and nothing but negativity towards it, considered a joke, a sellout, a kitty band, whatever. That's what Kiss was considered back then. Couldn't get a date. Couldn't couldn't play in the US. Nineteen eighty Kiss released an album called Unmasked, they played one show in America for it. It was at the Palladium in New York. I was there. Palladium is, it no longer exists, but the Palladium hold, held maybe 3,000 people. I mean, that's how bad it was. A year earlier, they did two nights at the Garden. It was over. So, Peter leaves, and then Ace leaves a couple years later, and if you have this entity that can't even get gigs anymore and you think it's over, and someone says to you, hey, I'll, you don't want this, this thing is dead and, you know, we're pretty much, pretty much run its course, but I don't know, sign this and give us, uh, give us a million bucks, we'll give you a million bucks and sign this and we'll just... Take the skeletons of what this band was in case, you know, we want to do anything with it down the line. Now, I'm not saying that's the dialogue of that exactly went on because I was not there. And I'm not telling you that I was there and I'm not telling you that's exactly what happened. But that is what I've been able to gather. And having lived through that time as a fan. So if you're on your way out. Give you an analogy. If you're if you're if you're working for a company that's about to go under and go bankrupt and and can't can't get arrested, nobody wants what they're selling anymore. And you're on your way out and you own a quarter of the company. And on the way out, somebody says, "Hey, listen, man, sign this and sign away your quarter, and here's a million bucks. Have fun, or whatever the figure is. You're going to sign it." Now, if you're really smart and not whacked out of your skull on substances, <laughs> you may say, nah, you know, I'm good. I just came out of eight years of huge success with the band. I got enough dough. I'm going to keep that in my back pocket. Who knows what's going to happen down the line? Or if you think it's really a dead issue, yeah, give me the check. Here, sign. It's all yours. Good luck with it. That's what happened. And who knew 30-some-odd years later, You'd be standing here with this entity and this branding and this logo and this image that has become American and worldwide pop culture that has a tremendous amount of value to it. And give credit where credit is due. The reason that value is there is because Paul and Jean kept it going, resuscitated it, along with a lot of other people that came in that played a huge role. Eric Carr, Vinnie Vincent, Bruce Kulick, Mark St. John, now Tommy and Eric. They've all contributed to this thing to keep it going. But Paul and Gene took it over, took the skeleton of it, kept running it up the flagpole, had some success in the 80s without the makeup, got it back to a certain point. But here's the other thing, and this is undeniable too. 
The band was never bigger than when Ace and Peter came back and the reunion happened in 96. Reunions don't happen unless a reunion is going to generate a ton more business and fan interest, and that's what happened. So long, long-winded explanation, but you, you got to get the time and place of what was going on back then to f- fully appreciate how that deal was probably proposed. And Gene and Paul are certainly not going to give it back after they put 30 years into resuscitating it and doing whatever they want with it, and they paid the freight on it. And if if Peter and Ace weren't responsible enough to budget their money, budget their end of it, and do something with that money, then that's on them. So that's, and then when the reunion happened in 96, I don't know the nature of those business dealings, you know, if, if they got a certain percentage back in some way. They certainly don't have control of it. They get some money from it, from the other guys wearing it. I don't know. But it's all business stuff. Thank you for the call. Chuck in Greensboro. What's up, buddy? Happy New Year. Hey, man. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year, brother. Same to you. Uh, yeah, I wanted, wanted to tell you about, like, uh, four killer things I got for uh, Christmas. But I wanted to tell you, you know, being a, a fan of KISS yourself and a friend of Ace, just caution Ace about letting this thing set him off the deep end with his sobriety. Just just please tell him. To not uh, there's not going to be any issue with that, Chuck. I, I can tell you right now, he's good with that. This is he he's a, he's a change guy. He's going to go there and he's going to make the best of this. However, it roll it runs out. I don't think that's an issue. His his biggest thing his biggest thing is he just signed a new record deal and he's in the studio making a new record. That's what his biggest priority is right now. Yeah. Yep. It's. I mean, it's, I know he's got some time under his belt now. I just you know. You know Seven years. Yeah. Yeah. But um, well, I was going to tell you, I got uh. New Striper, love it. I love the last album, but I love this one even more because it's uh, really back to that classic sound. Got uh, Phoenix Rising, Deep Purple, Mark IV lineup stuff. It was great to see uh, John Lord and Glenn in the interviews uh, and talk about that period. And uh, I got uh, Kiss Invasion, which is not sanctioned by the band, obviously, but uh, documenting Vinny's time in 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 band. It's got uh, the Night Flight video uh, interview unedited and edited and it's got Vinny at a convention so that was a great what is that that's a, that's a dvd yeah dvd i never even heard of that since some sort of bootleg yeah. uh not a it's not a yeah i guess it would be considered a bootleg it's not sanctioned by the band at all yeah. write that on it and everything but uh and then i got uh for uh for my wife for a gift your second book and uh love the uh format and uh just uh all the all the different things in there that you can learn, you know, that you didn't know. And, you know, it's just great format. Well, thanks, Chuck. Yeah, the, the second book is, um, I appreciate it, man. Thank you for calling in. The, uh, the, the My new book, the second book, Volume 2, is a direct sequel to the first book. So if you have the first book, same format, same layout, same sort of just 35 different bands. And a lot of people got that for the holidays, and I appreciate it. It's available out there now. If you want personalized signed copies, you can order them right on my website. Just hit the books tab, and both of those are available. And I will be selling and signing the book at my uh, the upcoming gigs in Jersey and my gig in Houston February 8th at Concert Pub North. That information is on my site as well. Thank you for the call, Chuck. I appreciate it. Washington, D.C. Ernie, go ahead, Ernie. Hey, what's happening, man? How are you? Oh, I'm good. I'm 42 years old, but I was listening to Kiss in the 70s myself. And, um... Um, I want to say I used to go to Hammerjacks in Baltimore as a teenager. I used to go to Jacks. My friend Jay Nedry from the Road Ducks owned that place, but it became Empire. And I wanted to comment on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which to me is nothing but a glorified hard rock cafe. And if I'm not mistaken, a few years back when Axl Rose rejected being in there, he wanted to be paid or whatever. I'm not sure whatever became of that. And I also wanted to say, just to finish the last comment, um, uh, Saxon. You played Saxon. I used to love that song about Kennedy being shot when I was a teenager. And then I saw Wasp open for Black Sabbath in 86 when they had their heads on a stake with Glenn Hughes was singing. Yes. All I wanted to say was hard rock, hard rock is a glorified, hard, I mean, the Hall of Shame is a glorified hard rock cafe, in my opinion. Well, Ernie, thank you. Thank you for the call and thank you for your opinions. Um, here's the thing you got to understand about the Hall of Fame. And, yes, I know I dubbed it the Hall of Shame, and that's how I still feel. But 
you have to understand a couple things. First of all, all the bands that can bash it before they go in, when they get the call, 99% of them still go. Secondly, you say glorified hard rock cafe. I'm sure you're talking to the museum itself in Cleveland. I've never been in there. I don't know, but so be it. Um, I'm sure it is, you know, it's a, it's a merchandising entity, I'm sure. But the awards and the ceremony and the, you know, saying you're in it means more than I think actually the, 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 the physical structure itself. So it's a, it is, it's a different mentality of, of, you know, you want to go in it. And here's the other thing. You, you, Axl Rose didn't want to be paid. Uh, to my knowledge, he didn't ask to be paid or anything like that. He just sniffed out to me at my vantage point. He just sniffed out the fact that they were the hall was instigating a reunion, and he didn't want to do it. Why else would Guns N' Roses go first eligible, first year, first time ballot? They wanted to get those original five guys standing up there together again, and be the catalyst for that reunion. And he wasn't going to go for it. Now, understand this. Axl Rose is still in the Hall of Fame. Just because you don't physically go, it's their Hall of Fame. They can still induct you, and I'm sure he's he's still there. He just chose not to go to the ceremony. That still doesn't mean that doesn't mean you're not inducted. You can I guess you could decline the induction, but the hall could still put up a plaque. You can't stop them from doing that. Jeff in Alabama. Go ahead, Jeff. Hey, I just had a quick question there. Uh, you sound like Hedda Ayers Ball. Are you friends with uh, Ricky Rackman? or Because you know, he'd be a pretty uh, interesting guest on that metal show for an hour, or even on your show if he was ever out in New York for a few hours. I mean, he's got a ton of stories. Uh, I know. Uh, I don't, I wouldn't say I'm friends with him. I certainly know Ricky. Every time I've seen him, we've talked. It's always been very cool. I, he's a nice guy. I've met him a bunch of times, and uh, I certainly like him and know him, but I, it's not like I hang with him. I'm in touch with him on a regular basis. We have a ton of mutual friends. Um, he'd be welcome to come on this radio show anytime he wanted to to talk about his experiences. Uh, as far as the TV show is concerned, that's booked by VH1 Classic. They approve all the guests. They want they want celebrity artists as much as possible and the biggest names they can find. And if they want Ricky, who I know they've still do some work with from time to time, uh, they will no doubt have him, and I will be happy to talk to him. But I don't make that decision as to if he comes on TV. I do make the decisions on the radio side. And if he'd like to come here, my door is always open. But if you ever, so you've never reached, but you've never really called to reach out to him to get on your radio show though, huh? No, but if he wanted to, um, you know, I certainly could, but he certainly would be welcome to any time, Jeff. Same goes for a guy like Adam Curry. You know, Ricky did a great job with Headbangers Ball and as part of that legend and that history, but, you know, people, there were other guys in there. Adam Curry, I think, was the first guy. The difference is I don't think Adam Curry was ever really into the music. I think Ricky was. Last time I saw Ricky, I think, was at a race. I think Ricky, if I'm not mistaken, is really into auto racing. I know he's really into auto racing, and he... I believe he does a radio show about auto racing. I am not a big auto racing guy. But about a year or so ago, I went to my only ever NASCAR race in Vegas. And Ricky was either there broadcasting or somehow, or I saw him after that and we talked for a little bit about it. But great guy. We have a ton of mutual friends. If he's ever in New York, which he, you know, he's not, he doesn't live here, but I'd be more than happy to have him on any time. People have to understand, though, the TV stuff, I get that all the time. I have a say in who comes on. VH1 has final say. Dave in Fontana, California. Hi, Dave. Hey, hey, how you doing, man? Good. Uh, hey, that was a great story about KISS, about the, how their popularity, popularity diminished back in, like, 79, 80. And I find it ironic how uh, the, the band that Gene uh, apparently discovered Halen, uh, kids could have easily been the opening act for from 1980 on. It must have killed his ego. Oh, yeah. I mean, again, it's something that people don't quite understand, Dave, because 
if you're a little younger and maybe you just kind of got into Kiss in the late 80s and then you saw the reunion, you don't know about what went on in those early years. It was bleak. They, they couldn't, you totally. know, there was a couple records they didn't even tour for because nobody would go see them. And then, and then Creatures of the Night, Lick It Up tour, they, were, they, were, they would go into buildings with like Motley Crue opening for them who were a new band yep. at the time, and they'd go into a 10,000-seat arena, and there'd be a 1,000 people there. It was beyond sad. Uh, I was a guy, you know, I've lived in New Jersey, New York market my whole life, okay? I remember, because I was still a Kiss fan through those years, and I remember I was supposed to go see them. The closest they played to New York, their home city, was Worcester, Massachusetts, on the Creatures of the Night wow. tour. And it was a five-hour drive. Me and my friends were planning to go to the there. There was maybe a thousand people in a twelve in a twelve thousand seat arena. And the night before I was supposed to go, I got an appendix attack and got put in the hospital. And never went. And uh, and my friends did go though. And you know, there's a book. I forget the name of it. And it shows the attendance. It shows the date, the venue. And the attendance of every Kiss show that ever happened, and you got to see what was going on back then. It was brutal, and that continued for a number of years. And people just have no acknowledgement of it if you didn't live through that, because you just know what Kiss has become now. I totally remember. I my very first concert ever was Kiss in '79 at the LA Forum, and I think it was two or three nights sold out. Come 1980 on Mask. I don't remember them. I, I, I tried to follow them, and they just fell off the map. They didn't play. They did not do an American show in 1980 outside of one show. I was at it. I believe it was January or maybe July. It was at the now, it's no longer there, but legendary venue, the Palladium in New York, and it was Eric Carr's first show with the band, and that was it for the U.S. for uh, probably a couple years. Uh, they yeah, did do Gilbert. they did do great business in places like Australia and stuff, but America was dead. Right. So, hey, I got two quick questions for you, uh, one regarding Kiss and Ace, uh, one that I've never heard you touch on before, and that is, if Ace had nothing to do with the recording of Creatures of the Night, how is he on the video for I Love It Loud? How did that happen? Because he was contractually still in the band. He was planning on leaving. He was, you know, he was out of the band, but he contractually needed to see through that record. So even though he wasn't involved in the recording of it, he had to participate in the marketing of it. So therefore, he was on the cover and he appeared in that video and then was out the door. He had to fulfill his almost like severance. He had to do that to keep right. up the illusion that he was still in the band. As a matter of fact, they kept up the illusion that Ace was still in the band, even when Vinnie Vincent was in there. They put out press. Kind of like you're doing now. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, again, I'm not, I don't mean to say people will, you know, people who think I have this agenda against Kiss, which is completely no, other. No, I'm just saying there are those that do, and, and it's so completely the opposite. I just speak truthfully, but if you really think about it, Kiss is one of the, has been one of the most deceptive bands of any band in history, uh, to use a kind okay. word. I mean, going back to Destroyer, they've had people play on their records that weren't credited. They've had people play right. in the band that weren't credited. They'd have people in the band as other people. Unlike like a lot of bands, they made live records that we found out weren't live. Um, and, you know, you, you have an album like Creatures of the Night where it has two different covers. One features Ace, one features Bruce Kulick. Neither of them played on the record. Right. <laughs> you right. have you have Dynasty and Unmasked that feature Peter Chris on the jacket. He didn't play drums on either of them. Right. I remember, I remember your interview with Anton Fig. I couldn't believe that story. Yeah, so it's it's just Kiss. I mean, it's just the, the, the history of Kiss. But when the time of Creatures came, they, they had to put out, uh, you know, that, that, that was a huge... They had just lost an original member with Peter Chris leaving. Now, Ace, who was such a loved member of the band, him leaving really could have been the final nail in the coffin. So... They damn well didn't want to not have his picture, at least on the record. They needed to continue the illusion that he was still in the band. So as a result, they put him on the cover, and they put him in the video for I Love It Loud, even though he's not on the record. And then when he left, I used to get the press releases even back then. Vinny came into the band. 
Initially, they they announced Vinny as a temporary fill-in for Ace, that he was only there because Ace was ill or couldn't tour, and he was temporary because they they were struggling so mightily. The last thing they needed people to know is that another original member just left. I remember the story. Ace was in a car accident, quote unquote, or yeah. something along those lines. Well, he may have actually been, but the point is, is that. You know, he was going through a lot of stuff back then. But the point is, Dave, is that they actually perpetuated, and thank you for the call, maybe it was wishful thinking that he was going to come back at some point. I don't know, but they, I remember the press release. I probably have it in my memory box somewhere where they actually put out a press release saying that this is only temporary. Please welcome our guest, fill-in guitar player, Vinnie Vincent. Ace will be back with us. He'll be appearing at select dates. It never happened. He was out the door. But they were struggling so bad then that the last thing they needed to do was tell everybody, oh, by the way, Peter's gone and now Ace is gone. And it really would have looked like a sinking ship. So they put up, you know, they put out this misdirection to keep people thinking. I remember as a kid, oh, Ace is going to come back. This guy is only holding the fort. It's just, the stories are endless, man. It really is fascinating. And I don't, I'm not judging any of this one way or the other. It's fun to talk about. I mean, when you you can talk objectively, and, you know, it's unfortunate because I know this stuff and talk about this stuff honestly and openly. That's why Gina Paul don't do my shows, They'd rather go on a show where they just read the one sheet and don't know anything, and the host says, tell us about the new record. Well, it's the best record we ever made. I produced it. Okay, great, guys. You still wearing the makeup? Big show. Awesome. See you tonight. That's what they want. But I would, you know, you're going to find very few people, and this isn't me just banging my drum. This is the truth. You're going to... There's very few people on this planet that would be able to peel away the layers and get into a real interview with those guys like I could because I lived it. That's how important they were to me on both sides as a fan, and I saw the inside a little bit in the business. So I'd love to have this discussion and objective, real debate about all these things. Their their side of it and their stories would be fascinating. But sometimes when you know too much, you know, that's not me trying to sound like a big shot. It's just the truth. that There's no other logic for it. But they're great stories. It's like, you know, if you get somebody, whether it's me or somebody else, I'm sure there's other people out there that know as much as I do. They just might not have the platform to broadcast it. But if you know these things, it's so much fun to get into and discuss. It's not a, a judgmental thing. It adds a whole nother layer to the to the kiss mystique. It really does. Freedom in Pittsburgh. What's up? Hey Eddie, thanks for taking my call. Sure Big thing. Fan. That's a great name, hey, Freedom. Was, thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, I wanted to first before my question, uh, thank you for the article in uh, the book, the section regarding Cinderella. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got Tom's Tom Keeper's new album, The Way Life Goes. Big Cinderella fan, totally took me back to the days of night songs. Love that album. Um, my question to you was, um, Queensryche, on the uh, current lawsuit between the two bands, Jeff Tate and the current band, do, do you know anything that's going on between them? I've been online, I've been checking on Jeff Tate's site. I haven't really heard anything. I was wondering if you heard anything. No, I heard that things got pushed back. That's the only thing I heard just before the holiday break, and I think I heard a new date for the courts to make the decision. I think I heard the end of this month. So maybe in a few weeks, information will come down on who gets the name. Okay. But I I know it's not been decided yet. Okay. Then I'll just stop. I'll be looking for it. Yeah, I was just one. I'm sure it'll be. I'm sure it'll be news freedom when it comes down. No doubt. I'm sure it'll be. You'll, you'll see and hear and read a lot about it from the different sides of it. Thank you for the call, and thanks for buying my new book as well. 
Let's go to Dave in Maryland. Hi, Dave. You're on the air. Hey, Andy. Thanks for taking my call. Sure, man. Um, just about the Hall of Fame. I think the uh, – I had a chance to visit it last year, and I went right after going to see the Rick Sticks, Rick Nielsen exhibit in Rockford. You know, the Chief Rick Haney. Yeah, Rick, Rick has actually talked to me about that. He was actually going to do an event there that he wanted me to host like a year ago, and then I think it got postponed. But I, I've heard about it, and I'd love to check it out. Well, being being around D.C., we, we see great museums around here, and the Rick Spix thing was uh, on par with anything the Smithsonian has in this area, and it was just it was completely over overwhelmed and overcome by it. But after that, we went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and it just it was a big letdown actually being there. It was kind of dark and kind of unkempt, and um, wh whereas if you go to the Football Hall of Fame, you know there's the bus and there's this kind of this odd silence in the bus room. The, uh, the, plaque, the plaque room in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is just kind of like this, you know, these little plaques on the wall, and it's, it's kind of meaningless, and, and just the visit, it just wasn't a good experience going to the museum itself. I think the, the big allure about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is the induction ceremony and the hype that comes with it. The actual visit to the museum, frankly, I thought the FYE in the museum was the most impressive thing there. Well, yeah. You know, I also heard that, the speaking of my book, that the previous caller said they had, I, I found this interesting. They sell my book there at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which I think is really kind of cool and uh, surprising. But as I said before, the, the people, yeah, yeah, I made this mistake once before, uh, Dave, and I've never been inside the museum. I went to the Hall of Fame in Cleveland. Thank you for the call. Metallica invited me during their induction. And they had a party the night before and then the induction the next day. And I went to all that. But the ceremony was in a different venue. And I never went into the actual museum. But there, there's something I learned that really you have to realize. And, and I made this mistake for a long time. You know, I, I targeted my anger about the Hall of Fame to the Hall of Fame itself, the museum, the people that work there. And they came up to me. Some of them came up to me when Metallica went in at the hotel and introduced themselves and said they were fans of mine. And this makes sense why they sell my books there. <laughs> and they listened to my show, this show. They watched that metal show. Apparently, there's a, even a TV in there that shows that metal show sometimes. And... They are all for this campaign of yelling that I've been doing to get these bands in because they want the business. And they told me, and it's true, they don't vote. They have nothing to do with the bands that go in. So it was really something that I took a lot of heart in when they told me because it is true. Those people are working there, and they're rock fans like me and you. They want these bands in themselves. They just have no control over it at all. And they want to make it as best as it can be, but it's their job. They they don't they don't have a say in who does or doesn't get in. So it was a it was a good conversation. It was good to learn that and kind of see their perspective on it. The museum and the people that work there have nothing to do with the hall and who actually gets in. Lines are totally jammed. This is awesome. It has been fun to be back here with you guys again after a couple weeks for the holidays. Live once again. We spent a lot of time on the phones. I'm enjoying the hell out of this. I am going to play some music, which I haven't done much of tonight, but that's okay. Music is on here for the rest of the week outside of these four hours that I'm on. But we played a few things. I love the debate. I love engaging with people and getting everybody going, hearing from everybody. It's awesome. It is the number one reason I come in here and do this show live. So, here's what I'm going to do. Lines are all jammed now. You can hang if you want, and I'm going to come back to your calls in about 15, 20 minutes. Or you can hang up if you can't hang and try to get through again before we wrap it up. I'm here live for about another 45 minutes. I'm going to play a few things for you. And then the last 20 minutes or so, figure from about 940 Eastern until 10 p.m. Eastern. We will close out the show with yet more of your calls, whether it be about the Hall of Fame or anything you want to talk about. Your uh, your call's going right now. The lines have been jammed. I'm sorry I made you guys wait so long, but uh, I wanted to get my two cents out there and now turn it over to you. 
on our toll-free line. And let's see who's been waiting the longest here. And by the way, you don't have to just, if you want to talk about anything besides the KISS thing, you can. But obviously that is a, uh, a hot topic right now. Ricky in St. Louis starts us off. What's up, Rick? Hey, Eddie. Um, well, I was just wondering because uh, Deer Purple's been nominated the past two years and they still haven't gotten in yet. Um, do you think that they could be nominated next year or nominated at all next? Uh, yes. I think that Mike's personal opinion, Ricky, is that Deep Purple will get into the Hall of Fame sooner than later. They've been nominated and passed over twice. But I can tell you that the biggest reason I think Deep Purple will finally go in is one person, and that's Lars Ulrich. Because Lars, Deep Purple is Lars's all-time favorite band. And Lars is, of course, in the Hall of Fame himself. And he, no doubt, is pushing every way possible internally to get into get them in the Hall. I shouldn't just say Lars, though. Even Gene Simmons said when KISS was announced that he, he brought up Deep Purple. We wouldn't be here without Deep Purple. When Rush went in last year, they said, how has how Deep Purple started it for us? How are they not in? How are we in before them? It speaks to the cluelessness of the process of the Hall of Fame. But I think when you have so many people now in the Hall saying, how the hell is Purple not here? that Purple will go. I wouldn't be surprised if Purple is the token hard rock man for next year. Yeah, I could see that. The bigger question with Deep Purple, as we alluded to earlier, is what the hell, who goes in from Deep Purple? Because there, there were what are widely considered to be four lineups of Deep Purple. Mark, one, two, three, four. And then the current band, which has been going for like 15 years with Steve Morse. There's literally, I'm not even exaggerating, at least probably if you counted everybody, I never did it, but if you counted everybody, you're probably looking at at least 30 people. Probably probably around 30 people that have ever been in Deep Purple from the 60s to now. What do you do there? I mean, it's a busy stage. And the one guy that everybody wants there the most has already said, I'm not coming. He's not coming. <laughs> Richie Blackmore is staying on Long Island in his castle with his young wife playing Renaissance music and said, count me out. And he, of course, is the guy most people want there. North Carolina, this is, is it Christopher? Hello. Christopher. Yeah, is it Christopher? Your, your, your name's cut off on my screen. Yeah, my name's Christopher from North Carolina. Hey, Chris, go ahead. All right. I would love to ask Eddie one simple question. Does he think KISS is more about money or more about music? Well, for me, it's only been about music. The band themselves, I don't know. You'd have to ask them. I mean, from Gene's position with his how how blatant he is about his love of money and marketing, that's a, that's a valid question to him. For me, I never cared about any of the paraphernalia. I grew up with KISS and their music. You, you got your radio up, bud, so I got to turn you down because I'm, I'm hearing myself back and we can't have that. So uh, thanks for the call. Go to Dallas, say hello to Bill. Hi, Bill. Hey, Eddie and Joe. Good, man. Uh, I have an idea for Kiss. They got to be around for 25 years, right, to be nominated? It has to be 25 years since your first record came out. So they, Kiss has been, Kiss's first record came out in 74. And that means that they have been eligible since 1999. All right. Well, I think that Billy Sheehan and Richie Cotton should dress up as uh, Gene and uh, Paul. All right. Bill, get- that, that's just ridiculous, so I'm going to cut you off because it doesn't even make any sense wherever you could possibly go in with something that ridiculous. Uh, Brian on Long Island. Go ahead, Brian. Hey, Eddie, what's up? Hey, man. I thought that as, some, as someone who's seen, the, who loves the original band and has seen the new band, mm-hmm. I will not go see Kiss anymore if they just play with the new band and not Ace and Peter. I think they have a better shot of playing with the original four, saying we're doing this for the fans, 
And then after that, we're going back to what we were doing. I think people will be more spiteful if they just play with the new band at the Hall of Fame. Well, I agree with you in, in this respect, Brian, that they absolutely should play with either in or out of makeup with the original band a couple songs and that was the night and that's it and what listen everybody knows for me for kiss i i i respect everybody's opinion and if you're down with what they do now great and if you're into going right. now great that's your decision for me i stopped i don't go anymore it's not the same band i can't uh, look at it but that's just me but you're right do it that way and this is the band going into the hall. That's great. Hey, look, maybe like Jim just said, with Springsteen's band going in, maybe in in 10 years they put the other guys that weren't in Kiss in. I doubt it will ever happen, but right. maybe that's the night right. that those guys get celebrated. Well, and there should be some acknowledgement. If I was those guys, and I'm not going to tell them how to make their speeches, but you should certainly acknowledge, Gene and Paul can acknowledge everybody that came after Ace and Peter, just like they should acknowledge... You know, Neil Bogart, who, who believed in them and their label, their manager, Bill O'Coin, Sean Delaney. I'm sure those people will get acknowledged. But the night right. is about those four guys. Right. Well, the way I look at it is I live 10 minutes from Jones Beach Amphitheater. I'm not hurting Gene and Paul by not going. On a Saturday night, if Kiss is playing, even if it's not the original members, I'm going to go. <laughs> you know, in the summertime, you know, I'd only be hurting myself by not going. Mm -hmm. You know, so like, people don't, I understand your position. You're closer to it than I am. No, it's but, uh, just my my position about it is driven by one thing, contrary to what everybody thinks. It's driven by one thing: me being a Kiss fan. That's above and beyond anything. I I people don't realize me. I'm a Kiss is like the hugest band for me as a kid. So I I can't look at it for only that reason. Of course, everybody's going to take the convenient thing. Well, he's friends with Ace and Peter. So not the case. I said this a million times. I supported every version of Kiss. Eric Carr was a dear friend of mine. Bruce Kulick, I just talked to the texted yesterday. There's no issues. I respected all those lineups. I can't look at what they do now. But that's just me. If you're cool with it, that's fine. And clearly you are, and I'm glad you have fun when you go. I just choose not to anymore because it's not, it's not, it's, it's just awkward to me. It's funny. You know, Paul Gray from Slipknot died a couple years ago, and they won't put a ninth guy on stage in his mask. Right. They put him behind the stage. They said it's just disrespectful to Paul. And yeah. we're not going to put a guy out there in Paul's mask. And now Joey Jordison is out of Slipknot. You think whoever replaces him, they're going to put Joey's mask on? No. Of course not. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's crazy. But listen, Kiss gets away with a lot that they can get away with. And they have a certain segment of their fan base that will buy hook, line, and sinker everything they sell them. And that's fine. If, if, if you're that person, that's fine. For me... I accepted everything Kiss threw at me for 30 years with no problem until they started doing this. My opinion, and I and again, just my opinion, but what I think, if I was Kiss, what I would do is I would go up there with the original band, I'd play a couple songs, accept the honor, and announce my retirement as Kiss. It'd be like it'd be like a football player winning the Super Bowl and retiring. Yeah, you're 60 something years old. Ten years ago, you said the farewell tour, you didn't think you could keep the energy up. Paul's having problems with his voice. You got two guys dressed as the other two. I mean, enough. What, what are you going to do? You're going to be up there at 70? I mean, listen to any interview Kiss did on the farewell tour, why they were going to call it quits at the time. We don't want to stay too long at the party. We can't keep it up. We're getting too old. Okay. I'm not saying they got to stop making music. They can all do other things. But to me, that would be a great way to put a bow tie on an amazing career. They're not going to do that. There's still there's still stuff out there that they want to do, and that's their prerogative. I'm just saying, as a fan, I think that's a great opportunity, and then you don't have to worry about the fallout. You're not reuniting with anybody. You're saying goodbye. Don, Rhode Island. Go ahead, Don. Ed, uh, long time listener, first time call. How are you, man? Thanks. Good. Here's my position on this. These guys are the core. These guys that had started this band back in the '60s. I mean, they need to be humble. Put your differences aside, put your makeup aside, accept the award. And I don't think they're being humble, Ed. I really don't. Well, when you say they, what, who do you mean? Stop the drama. I mean, there's all this drama going back and forth. This one tweets this, this one tweets that. Step aside, you guys, the four main guys that formed this band 50 years ago. Well, what you're saying, Don, is exactly what Ace said. If you listen to the audio on my site right now, it's free. You can click on it and hear it, or when I'm off the air later, it's exactly what Ace said. 
He just Ace, Ace said he wouldn't even mind if they want to bring Tommy and Eric out for the big jam at the end when all the musicians go. But would out. they be in makeup too? No, and that's what's weird about it because they wear their makeup now. So it's a see. That's, so if they came out at the end for the big jam, yeah. would they be in makeup? So that, would there be two aces and two that's, Peters that's on stage? Ridiculous! You can't. That's what's <laughs> the problem. That's what people understand why it's so wrong with that, that, that that's been going on for so long. Thank you, Don, for the call. You can't. And that's why I think Paul is so adamant. The one thing he said no way to on Twitter was makeup because it that that creates all that. So, yeah, no, you can't. You throw makeup out the window completely then. Now, the Hall of Fame wants makeup. They want Kiss looking like Kiss. But it creates confusion and diversions and different lids coming off of uh, the can of worms. So I, I don't know. I, I, I know how I think it should go down, and a lot of fans feel that way. Here's the other thing. And I've said this a million times, and I'll say it again. I have no issue at all with Tommy Thayer or Eric Singer as people, players, or them even being in KISS. At all. And I have no issue with them having that gig and doing it because, let's face it, if they weren't doing it, Gina Paul would find somebody else to do it. They're getting a nice paycheck. They're in a big band. They're having fun. They are both grew up KISS fans. Tommy was in a KISS tribute band as Ace. No problem with what they're doing. They take their orders from above. Everybody knows that. But if you're those guys, do you even want to stick your nose in this thing? I wouldn't. No. I wouldn't. If I'm not being inducted and being recognized, I mean, okay, yeah, maybe you want to sit there and sit at Gina Paul's table and they yeah, pass the rolls. Yeah, you're getting ready to go. <laughs> you know, whatever. You know. But I don't, I don't want to stick my nose up there. Do you really want to come out on stage the biggest night that KISS fans have waited for 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 25 years or whatever, fifth, however long, 15 years of eligibility, in New York City, Ace Gene, Peter, and Paul's home of New York City. You're going to have people there that are going to be frothing at the mouth to see the original KISS one more time. And you want to walk out there dressed as Ace and Peter to that crowd? Let me ask you something, being a Oof. big Kiss fan. Say the four original guys go to the podium, make the little speeches, and then Ace and Peter don't play, and the new Kiss plays there. Do, does the audience boo? Does the Kiss fans in the audience get so angry that they boo? I don't know if it's, I don't know. I don't know if it's booing to the point that it drowns the band out. Right. But it's not going to be. There's listen. There's going to be a lot of people not happy, and it's. I think that it's going. I think that it would. Listen, Gene and Paul have been masterful at manipulating this thing to get a good portion of their fan base to think that it doesn't matter who's behind that makeup to the point that they eventually want to replace themselves and sell that, and that's what this has all been building to. So you have the most extreme segment of the KISS fan base that just buy everything that these guys say and sell, and they'll be okay with it. You also have a lot of the people that go to their shows now, which are families. Right, they bring their and young they bring kids, their kids, and they don't care. And they don't care. They right. want to see makeup, bombs, fire, and all they know is rock and roll at night. They see confetti, they go home, they're happy. So th those people be fine. But I don't think those are the people that show up and pay whatever they got to pay to go to the Hall of Fame induction. The Hall of Fame induction, especially in New York City, I think is going to be the old guard. People like me grew up with the band, going to see them at the Garden in the 70s. That are going to be like, finally, the guys who started it are getting their due. And then you walk out with two guys dressed as the guys that started it to play. That's why I think it's a lesser blow if they're not, none of them are in makeup. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If, if Tommy and Eric come out and they play with those guys and nobody's in makeup, again, that's why I think Paul was so adamant against the makeup. He knows, he's not a dummy, he knows all the yep. fallout from the various scenarios. So you could sell that a little bit more than trying to say, here's Kiss, dressed like the two guys that just walked off the podium, playing for them. And here's the other question. Do Ace and Peter say, we're not showing up now, if that's what you're going to do? See, they have a say in this, too. That was my point earlier, where 
Kiss is used to running the show and saying, we'll do this, we'll do that. To some degree, they still have the majority of the leverage in this. But the Hall of Fame is running this. So when push comes to shove, the Hall of Fame is got, Gene and Paul are going to win as far as, in other words, if the lines were drawn in Ace and Peter either show or Gene and Paul, the Hall of Fame is going to want, if they had to pick between which side shows up, they're going to pick with Gene and Paul showing up. Yeah. But if this goes down and, and Ace was adamant in the, in the conversation with me, it's got to be done the right way. And this is this is what it's got to be. It's the four guys. It should be the four guys. And they tell them we're not playing with you at all, and we're playing with your replacements, which you can come up. Peter, I think in a minute, would say, see ya. Really? He wouldn't show? He may show. I mean, <laughs> I love, I mean, Peter's like, you know, Peter just wears it on sleeve, man. I mean, he'll just say... You know, Peter's old school Brooklyn. So you think <laughs> there's a good chance that Ace and Peter don't show I then. think anything can happen here. I honestly do. You know, and I don't see Ace showing up and accepting the award and then watching. He went through that in 06 at the VH1 Rock Honors thing. I was with him. I was part of that. Kiss would not let him play with them. And he stood there out of makeup and watched Tommy dressed as him play as him. It was bad for him. It was an awkward, hard thing for him to see and deal with. He played with the tribute band that night. And the only reason why he did that is I talked him into doing that, just so that he could be represented in some way. So there's, honestly, anything can happen here. But also on uh, the interview you did with Ace on your other radio show, he did say that he... he that Paul and Gene called him and they talked and everything was good, right? Didn't he say that in At there? At that time, yeah. Right, so like a couple they, weeks ago. And they said it to Peter, too. And then Paul tweets out this other thing, which right. tells you that he's not on the same page as the other guys. And here's one more thing about Paul's tweets a few people said to me. Oh, it's just misdirection. He wants to throw people off the path. No way. No, no way. No. You don't piss off a million people and create all this to, for misdirection. Misdirection serves no point for anybody. There's no logic to that whatsoever. Paul's not exactly a jokester like that. You know, that he's going to want, you know, he, he I think he just. Uh, you know, if he's going to joke, then he puts a maybe with three question marks. Hmm. Something like that. Like, hey, let me yeah, just keep the no, suspense this going. No, misdirection. This is a no lot of people. Is, this is a lot of people with differing opinions, and they all have to find a way to make something work for them. Um, you good? You want? I, I got my lines are jammed. You gonna hang? Because I'm gonna keep taking calls. I'm gonna hang for a little bit, then I gotta get out. Right, a few more calls. As I told you guys earlier, we're gonna uh, do a lot of calls. People before the break wanted me to do nothing but calls on some shows, and who knows what we're gonna do in this new year? I, I'm gonna play some more music, but there's a lot of phone calls coming in and uh, a lot of people want to get on the air and I'm into this. I love all sides of it. Um, 866-315-2663. Keep trying as the lines open up. We'll do our best to uh, get you in as quick as we can. And as I suspected, Kiss is dominating this conversation. Palm Springs. James, go ahead, James. Hey, guys. Great show. Yeah, question for each of you. Uh, Eddie. One, I mean, before Black Sabbath was in and Kiss, and a lot of these guys have always said, I don't care if we get in. Are you, and are you still there? I hope yeah, I I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Connected. Sorry. Yeah, and, and but why do these bands care? I mean, Kiss was never on the Cone Rolling Stones. Metallica never was until they got big. None of these bands were. So it would be great you could down. We were losing you there, James, but I get the... I'm, I'm sorry, you could burn the alcohol down from the outside by not showing up. I don't know why these bands care. Um, and I wish they wouldn't show up because I would never go there, even if it was in my backyard. Well, that, so that's it. Real quick for, go ahead. No, I had a question for Jim. I heard Jim mention before he was never a Kiss fan growing up, and I always, I never met anybody our age, like forty-five to fifty, that uh, didn't grow up as a kid loving Kiss. And just curious to Jim why he didn't like Kiss growing up. No, and it's then not, if you it's, answer the other question, Eddie, about why, why these bands care so much. It's, right, not, no. it's not that I didn't like them. It's not like I heard them. I go, these guys suck. I just, my, I, t I said earlier, my yeah. older brothers turned me on to, you know, Nugent's, Aerosmith, ACDC, Zeppelin, and Sabbath. They never brought home the Kiss stuff, so I never heard it till I. Saw Started buying my own shit in the, in the mid eight, you know, eighty three, eighty four, and Kiss was already off the makeup and the lick it up era, and I like that era, but I never got into the seventy stuff because I never heard it. And there's tons.
tons of people, by the way, to, to James, just to counter what you said, that are. I mean, I'm 49. My first real rock record was Destroyer in 76. I was 12. OK, so there are but there are a lot of people around my age and Jim's age. Jim's the same age that are were not Kiss fans uh, that, that are Kiss haters. Uh, I would I talk about this thing in my first book. I mean, when I was in high school, I graduated high school in 82. I was in high school from 79 to 82. You can't find a band that was more ridiculed and uncool to like during those years that I was in high school. I literally was like one of only two people in my entire high school that liked Kiss. It was over at that point. That's that's I was made for loving you. That's unmasked. That's disaster zone. I, I had people that, because I had a Kiss bumper sticker when I got my car, that wanted to hit, tried to hit my car. Really? And that's how bad it was, because they wanted to hit the car, because they wanted to dent it, because I had a Kiss bumper sticker on it. I had pe I say this all the time. I would have physically gotten my ass beat every day for wearing a Kiss shirt to high school. And the only reason why I didn't is because I'm 6'2 and whatever. And, and that, that, you know, I was bigger than most of the kids. Right. But if I was not, they would have beat the shit out of me every day. Right now, and we will pick it up uh, with Rocco in Indiana. He's our first caller on this Monday. What's going on, Rocco? How you doing, Eddie? Hey, man. Hey, when I called you uh, a couple of weeks ago, I gave you my top five for last year, top five albums. What you bought to me when I uh, told you that some of those albums were because of you, Sunstorm, you, you indirectly bought to me. Frontier Records is what you bought to me. You got me started with um, Revolution Saints, mm -hmm. and uh, you were talking about it, and I started piecing it all together. Some of the stuff that you bring us on the show comes from Frontier Records. It's a label out of Italy. They take a lot of bands that I didn't even know were still around, uh, bands you never heard of. If everybody goes on YouTube and looks up Frontier Records, they'll find so much stuff on there. It's unbelievable how many bands are coming out of this label that nobody even knows about. Well, Rocco, you don't even know these bands. You, well, you, Rocco, you're right, and that is one of the criticisms of the label is it's too much. Like, the feeling is, is like, okay, maybe put out a good record a month, not a record a day, and it is virtually a record a day. We've talked about this label a lot. People have called in and asked me about it a lot. Thank you, Rocco, for the call. But, yes, it's an interesting story. This is a label that started, a record label that started making inroads into America probably 10 years ago, and they are now at a level of putting out it, it, seemingly a record a day. And from anyone seemingly that ever had a, a record out in the 80s, whether they were successful or not, they are literally pumping out a, an insane amount of music. Some are, think that's great. Some are scratching their head at it. And the problem with it is that it does flood the marketplace. And I do think that there are a lot of things they put out that, quite frankly, just nobody, I, I don't care if it's a good record or not, is going to have any awareness for or know who the bands are. And the development is really difficult, and the opportunity for these bands to tour, which is the only place you have any shot in today's music industry of getting awareness and making money, is very limited simply because the amount of records these bands will sell is also extremely limited. So it's an interesting dynamic. I also mentioned when we talked about it last week, Rocco, that... Being brutally honest, you can't fault the bands because there's nobody else that's giving out record deals to these bands. There's nobody else interested in making new music for these bands. But a lot of it, honestly, as you said yourself, unfortunately flies way under the radar because there's nobody in mainstream radio that's going to touch these bands. There's nobody in 2019 that is going to touch a new album from, uh, say, a band like Trickster who they put out records from, who are dear friends of mine, who I love. But I'm just being honest about the level of the business today. And most of these bands know that. But why not? If somebody's going to give you a couple bucks to make a record, why not do it? And that's sort of what has been going on there. So, yes, there's some good stuff. There's some not so good stuff. And there's some stuff that's kind of hard to figure. But there is a ton of stuff being pumped out from that label on a daily basis. Let's say oh, Louie, who's in California. Hey, Lou. Hi. Now, I'm kind of glad that Maroon 5 didn't play that Sweet Victory song because it, it would seem like a pop song. And speaking of pop songs, I want to talk about covers. Pop covers of rock songs tick me off because they change up the attitude to the vocal style and arrangement. And, well, you're probably familiar with uh, 
uh, Britney Spears' version of I Love Rock and Roll by The Arrows and Miley Cyrus' version of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And I'm not, actually. I don't know those versions of those songs, thankfully, Louie. <laughs> uh, well, uh, well, the reason I don't like pop covers is because they always change up the attitude and meaning of the songs. That, well, you know, I, I kind of like rock because it's, it, you can express your emotions and having stories to tell. Yeah. Well, Lou, Lou, here's what I'd say to you, and thank you for the call. I, I am somebody that believes when it comes to cover tunes, do something different with it or don't do it. So I, I, if a pop act is going to cover a rock or a hard rock song, I, I, I almost think that that's kind of okay because I would like to hear their interpretation of it. If an artist does a cover of somebody else's song, I want to hear what they do to it. I want to hear their stamp on it. I want to hear how they're going to make it different. If you do a note-by-note -note cover of someone else's song, what's the point? You know, what do you bring into the table? What's Why would you ever gravitate towards that versus the original? So I like when people do covers and do take a little liberty with it. Do something a little bit different. Put your spin on it. Make it your own. That, to me, is the interesting thing. If it's the basically the same song with just different people playing it and the singing even sounds the same, it's kind of, I don't know, I just kind of feel like it's like, well, why bother, you know? But that's the trick. There are other people I want to keep it faithful to the original. I just, I don't know what you're, then what you're really bringing to the table with it. 844-686-5863, 844-6-VOLUME. Right here in Tampa. It is the legend Steve from Tampa. <laughs> Killing Steve, me thank you for your email. I uh, I have found a place, obviously, to do the show, but I didn't even think, while I'm stuck in Tampa, I didn't even think of trying to reach out to Steve from Tampa, of all things, until you emailed me. No, and I apologize. I gave you a little bit of my resume and corrected my uh, grammatical error in that last one. Honestly, I, Steve, I just I was in such a scramble to figure out where I was doing the show that I just glossed I through your email and then it hit me. Oh, yes, yeah, Steve from Tampa. But anyway, we got it sorted out. So thank you. So first of all, safe travels. Thanks. And, uh, and hey, thank you for the silver lining. I listen to that at least once or twice a week. Love that. Like, Soul like Soul Asylum. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. And uh, if you get a chance. Please watch the end of the class DVD. There's some poignant moments with Joe Sturmer when he talks about chemistry and bands and stuff, if you get a chance. Yeah, I have not gotten to the end of it. I watched yeah. about half of it when I was telling you after I watched the Pearl yeah. Jam one you sent me, and I got about halfway through, and then my kids interrupted me on other stuff, and I just haven't gotten back to it yet, but I absolutely will do that. You actually have a life. <laughs> so, and I, I, if I, At times. Um, safe, yeah, safe travels and... Um, Real quick, everyone says, real quick. The A uh, couple weeks ago, I feel the same way that you do about Van Halen's 84. Like, they blew up. I'm like, wait, fair warning. I told you guys about this three years ago. And what I've always wanted to say, and I, I talked about this last summer or whatever, when I saw the Foos and the Struts opening for them, I left halfway through the, the Foos at an amphitheater show, actually right by the Hard Rock over here, east of town. And um, the first three Foo Fighter records are awesome. Now, Grohl just screams. He doesn't sing anymore. Stop it, Dave, with the screaming. Everything's kind of in a similar key. Great band. And it's funny because the best drummer in that band sings and the best singer, I think, drums. But I <laughs> dug the first three records and stop with the screaming, Dave. Stop it. He screams all day. But love the show. Thank you for taking my call. Peace. Thank, love you, man. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Steve from right here in Tampa. I'm in Steve's backyard today. Steve making his mm -hmm. points. Silver Lining that he mentioned is the is the, my favorite Soul Asylum record. It's a tremendous record. And Steve was nice enough to have sent me some music docs, the Pearl Jam, uh, uh, Pearl Jam 20 doc and a Clash doc. Pearl Jam I finished. The Clash I'm about halfway through. Steve, uh, his call, unrelated to what Steve was talking about there, something I want to mention that I tweeted about last night during the Super Bowl and I don't know if anyone else picked up on this. And it's really interesting if you want to get into conspiracy theories. There was a TV ad for the Grammys during the Super Bowl last night. 
That's the other thing when you get to the Super Bowl, you get the people, I only watch for the commercials, which makes me nuts as a football fan, and I don't think the commercials are any big deal anymore, quite frankly. thought the best one by far was the one that the NFL did, the 100 NFL players or whatever. But anyway, there was a commercial for the Grammys during the Super Bowl, and we all know how I feel about the Grammys and the Grammys for rock. If you, They went through... I swear to you, and I was not drinking at all last night. They went through the lineup of the Grammys this year. The Grammys on CBS, you know, the whole commercial. And as they ran down the artists, and the only rock one was the Chili Peppers, as they ran them down by name and did cutaways of them playing, in the middle of that rundown, I swear, unless I was hallucinating, there was a shot of Angus Young in sort of, you know, that that Chuck Berry sort of duck walk thing that he does. I swear there was a flash of Angus Young because I was like, you know, watching all the artists fly by as they na- named them, and I swear I saw Angus Young. And not mentioned by name, they never said ACDC, but I swear I saw a cut-in of him. Now, I don't know why that would be. I don't know anybody. I, I tweeted it out last night, and a few other people on Twitter said, yes, I saw it too, so I know I'm not going crazy. And it's either one or two things. Some sort of subliminal message if you will, like meaning maybe we have, we have had nonstop speculation about ACDC and what they may or may not do in 2019. Maybe just go with me here for a second, and I'm not I'm not for a minute saying there's anything to this, but maybe ACDC is going to be a surprise performance or some sort of surprise relaunch or announcement using the Grammys as a platform. Not the last, not the first time we've ever seen that. If you remember when kiss announced their reunion in 96 with the original band, they did it by walking out on the Grammys. Tupac was standing there with them. So the, the Grammys have been used before to relaunch or to send a flare up about an artist coming back or returning or reuniting. Eddie, you're right. I'm looking at it right now. You're right. See, I'm not crazy. I was not drinking. I was not high. No. I was nothing. Twice. I was twice. There is the- shots of Angus Young in there. Yes. Two times in the 30 second promo. I am very proud to say I don't know anybody else who watched that and called that out. So I am calling it out to Trunk Nation that there is indeed an Angus Young sighting in the Grammy commercial, and there is no logic to it at all because they are not announced in any way as being a part of this. So it's one of two things. It's somebody who edited the Grammy promo just taking some liberties. Now, I don't know... Ed, maybe you would know or could look this up. Have mm-hmm. ACDC ever played on the Grammys, performed ever in their history? Well, they're do we showing, know this? They're showing performance video. If, if but it's, do if we it's know it's from the Grammys? These, oh, that i got to research. And, well, we're coming up on a break, so maybe you can peck around a little. And the other thing is this. Have the Grammys in a commercial for that year's Grammys ever shown a video clip and included someone in their promos who isn't part of this year's event. So the only explanation for this otherwise would be, well, they just put a montage of people who have played in the past on the Grammys. But when I saw that commercial fly by, it was specifically about people playing it as they mentioned them by name. The fact that there's a clip or two of Angus Young interspersed in there could be a little subliminal message to ACDC fans to watch the Grammys. Eddie, I'll t- I- I know nothing about this beyond my own speculation and and trying to understand why Angus Young would be in that promo. Eddie, I'll tell you and everyone right now, they played the Grammys back in 2015. So if you want to go on the other side and, and, and think that this is nothing but just somebody having some fun in the editing bay, it could be that. I know I didn't, I don't know if that promo had anyone else in it 
who played in the Grammys that isn't scheduled to play it this year. If Angus Young and ACDC are the only ones in that montage of artists who have who have, were included in the promo but are not announced for this year, then my cons- my theory of this maybe being a relaunch for them at the Grammys holds some weight. If there's three or four other acts they cut in that aren't announced to be a part of the Grammys this year, then it could just be the editor having some fun, looking for some different images to get people excited and move the tempo along. But I that jumped out at me big time, folks. We spend so much time speculating, wondering about ACDC. I've said this, ACDC is a lot like Van Halen. They are stealth. They don't give out any information. They don't do press. They don't do interviews until they have to for something. They just drop on you one day. <laughs> if you're going to relaunch with the original guys... What better way to let the world know than to walk out at the Grammys and play a song? And why on earth else would Angus Young be cut into a Grammy promo and not mentioned? Where they maybe said, hey, let's just have some fun. See how many people pick up on this. Plan it in people's heads because ACDC will do something at the Grammys. Total speculation on my part, but it's based in some sort of logic. Bones, though. As we got another hour to play with, talking anything you want in the world of rock and a lot of interesting things thrown out there. We've talked a little bit about uh, the biggest thing, like I said, for me is what I just hit you with. And I wrote it down in my notes last night, and I'm glad it came to me to bring this up on the air because I absolutely wanted to, about the bizarre, out-of-nowhere appearance of ACDC in the Grammys promo, which hardly, I don't, I've not heard anybody else bring up until I did. It took, and I'm saying that because it just seemingly went by very quickly for a lot of people. A lot of people, you know, watch commercials during the Super Bowl because it's a big deal, but they also get up and walk away, go to the bathroom, get a drink, whatever. Now, Ed mentioned before that, that ACDC played the Grammys in 2015, so they would have had that footage in their bank to cut in. The question is, why cut it in when they are not announced to be a part of this year's ceremony? That's what's interesting. Maybe they are, and no one's talking about it because it's a secret. Maybe it's going to be that big surprise sort of drop that a band like ACDC who operates like that could very well be doing. So we could get a lot of answers on that show. Maybe not. Maybe it's just a coincidence. I don't know. But it just seems really strange. Back to the phones. If you want to speculate on that or anything you want in the world of rock, let's go to Gary in Jersey, who's been waiting a very long time. Gary, thank you for your patience. Go ahead. What's up, Ed? How are you? Good, Gary. I just want to touch base with you, Ed, because two things. I acknowledge this is going to probably be an unpopular phone call, but I acknowledge the contribution and legacy of Ozzy. But two things that irked me about Ozzy the last 20 years, you know, he was always known as the Prince of Darkness, a madman. Then he goes on his reality show, and he basically looks like a, you know, like a leash lapdog on the show. And then secondarily, after hearing your interviews with those three gentlemen that played in his band and how they got screwed, I understand that it's so easy to blame Sharon for everything, but you're married, Eddie, I'm married. And when your wife does something wrong that you don't agree with, you kind of tell her to chill out and do the right thing. And it just seems like he just lets her run roughshod, do whatever the hell she pleases, no matter how much people get hurt. And no one ever calls him out or has him accountable for his actions. They just say, oh, that's Ozzy, or he's like the godfather, and everybody's afraid to question him. So I want to get your thoughts on that. Uh, Gary, I actually agree with you 100%. I mean, you're right. I mean, it's an interesting dynamic because in addition to being his wife, she is also his manager. So it's a two-headed sort of thing. And if you remember in in uh, not very long ago, there were reports that they were going to divorce and it was very public. Yep. You know, they live a very public life. I mean, she has a talk show and she's, you know, has done reality shows and they have a very public life. Their their kids have been put out into the, the business in terms of hosting and, and things like that. There's various TV shows that they all do. So there's a lot that she herself puts out there publicly through her own talk show and what have you. And I think that um, with that, you know, you hear these things, you hear about they're going to divorce this and that. What was interesting is the last time there was talk about them divorcing, 
uh, she came out very strongly and said, that doesn't mean I won't still manage him. So I don't know how the hell that would work because that's a sticky dynamic. It's just like if you form a band with your wife or your girlfriend in it, it never ends well. There's always a contentious ending. Look no further than Richie Sambora and Orianti, who were attached at the hip for a few years, made two records together, wouldn't even do interviews separate, they break up and boom, that whole thing implodes in two seconds. So it's it's a weird dynamic when you're linked in terms of a personal relationship and also a business relationship, but you're 100% right, uh, he, you know, the, the buck should stop with him. He is the artist. He should have the backbone if something's happening he doesn't like to speak up about it. But I, I do think he probably just rolls over. And I, uh, history has shown that. When the bass and drums of the first two Aussie records were replaced inexplicably, Robert Trujillo and Mike Borden re-recorded bass and drums on those first two records and those were those records were uh, t the original versions, which are incredible classics, were put on the back burner. That was one of the most controversial, crazy moves ever. And if you read Ozzy's book, he says he was against it and mad that it happened. So at the end of the day, he is the artist. He should be able to say the buck stops here. No, stop. I don't want that to happen. But you're right. He rolls over, plays dumb, whatever the case may be. And I also agree, ultimately, he is the one that should be blamed. But when you're also married to the manager, it gets to be a little bit stickier because you're, you know, you have a problem with a manager, you fire him. And you, you're the artist. You make the ultimate call. You hire another manager. Well, you can't fire a manager when it's your wife or husband. It, it it really, when I've seen instances like that happen, very rarely does it work without some without some sort of compromise. And it, it, it can become very sticky, and I think that's part of it. Absolutely. I, I just find, Eddie, that, like, and no one in the music industry calls them out. They're almost, like, terrified of them, and it, like, or they don't want to get involved. And I understand it's easy to blame Sharon, and ultimately, you know, she's like the fall guy, good cop, bad cop, but... Being Ozzy, at one point, you know, you were the madman. You're the, you know, the crazy person. You got to stand up and say, people are getting hurt. These are guys that I went to war with. These are guys I played with for years, and I'm just going to screw them over. Not just getting credit, but financially. But I heard your interviews with those three gentlemen, you know, with Jake E. Lee and the other two gentlemen that played bass and drums. I felt terrible for them. Yeah, well, there's a long – thank you, Gary, for the call. There's a long history of that, but there's also – there's also just the fact that if you look through history, how many things after they've happened has Ozzy said he didn't really want to do? Whether it's been reality shows, whether it's been tours, whether it's been whatever. I, I mean, how many times have you heard him say, I just want to go in my room and paint or whatever? So you can, but then, you know, you'll always hear, well, she won't let me or that. I don't, that's their dynamic. I don't know how much of that is real or how much of that is an act. Again, this isn't me stirring the pot. This is, they live their life publicly, whether it be through reality shows or TV shows or talk shows on TV or broadcast. This is what they put out there, and it can be very conflicting sometimes. So I, I don't know what to tell you, but I would agree that the buck should always stop with the artist. In this case, what he's talking about, our caller, is Ozzy, and he ultimately should have these calls. But if he, I don't know Ozzy Osbourne at all. I don't. I've interviewed him one time in my life. And uh but you know, he he should have some backbone to his career to his career. If something's happening, he's the he's where the buck should stop. But it's not that way. And you can't it can't really be that way when the the manager is also a wife or husband. It's just it's just never rarely does that work. Now, you could argue in their case it has worked because he's massively successful. And say what you want about Sharon, but she has clearly steered him and saved him from the abyss 35 40 years ago and clearly steered him into one of the most loved and enduring and successful artists. I mean, the guy is still doing tremendous business out there headlining festivals making ridiculous money. So ultimately, if you're an artist, you want a manager that's going to be able to do that for you. 
But then you also have to see say where's the line drawn, and that's that's always a tough spot. When you just the person is just your manager, you can fight with them, you can argue with them, you can fire them, fire them if ultimately they aren't executing things the way you want. Much harder to do when you're also <laughs> looking at the other things that come with that. If that person happens to also be your wife or or uh, or husband. And, you know, there's there's fascinating instances when you look at that dynamic where the manager is also the, the wife or husband. Another one that comes to mind, Wendy Dio. Wendy Dio managed Ronnie James Dio's entire career from, like, 80, 1980 on, right? And to this day, she still manages that. What's interesting is that a lot of people don't know this. For many, many years, Ronnie and Wendy were no longer together in terms of being married. But Ronnie, till his last breath, loved her and swore by her to continue managing him. But Wendy managed Ronnie for many, many years, still kept his last name, but was not, uh, I don't know, legally married. They were not together in that way at all for many years, but you'd never know it because he still cared about her and he still allowed her to manage him. And that's why she controls everything going forward, because he believed in her in that way after the relationship end of it sort of dissipated. So there's, you know, uh, and it's interesting because we're ta talking about all Sabbath-related people here. Geezer Butler's wife manages him, Gloria, and has quite successfully for a long time and now manages this new band, Deadland Ritual, we just had on. So there's instances where it works. There's instances where it doesn't work at all. And there's instances where the artist might feel somewhat, especially if they don't have a, a strong disposition about things, kind of just in a tough spot, if you will. But the one thing you can't argue, no matter what you want to say uh, about someone like Sharon Osbourne, who, who has no, I don't know that woman at all, but she clearly has issues with me, probably because I have people on who tell their story. So it's the old, you know, shoot the messenger, because I give people like Daisley Kerslake, Jakey e. Lee a platform. Or because I loved Dio. I mean, whatever it may be, I don't even know because I don't know. But I just have to do an honest and objective show from my standpoint, just like she does on her platforms. But I don't know the woman. But the one thing you can't argue, no matter how you feel about her, is that she has masterfully driven this guy's career and maintained a level of success that's pretty remarkable. Whether he's doing it kicking and screaming or not is anyone's guess. Sometimes he, by his own admission, says he's kicking and screaming. But from, purely from a business standpoint, it's still pretty incredible what he has been able to maintain after all these decades, uh, for better or worse. Let's go to Dan, who's in St. Louis, who's also been waiting a very long time. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, Ed, excellent insight. Um, I wanted to know if you knew of Andrew Bennett. He made those 5150 tapes. I am not familiar with him. Okay, he documented the reunion with Sammy back in, I think it was like 02 or something like that, and documented the reunion with uh, David Lee Roth, like in 06, 05, 06, when that happened. And he was on a podcast. I have not just find this podcast. Uh, it's called Dave and Dave, and they interviewed him. They had him on there, and he talked about how he documented all that, and it was Wolfie that wanted David Lee Roth back in the band. And he's got it all on video of Wolfie calling David Lee Roth. And then David Lee Roth calls Eddie. And Eddie's like, why the fuck you calling me? I didn't call you and hangs up on him. And uh, so I just thought, if you get a chance, listen to that podcast or even have the guy on. Um, he did the videotape for, I forget what song that was. Um, but anyhow, I just thought I'd mention it to you and throw that out to you. And uh, the guy's name is uh, Andrew Bennett. He's got a so you're so insight. what you're what you're so Dan. What you're saying is is he has he was making some sort of video of Van Halen at the time, and he has uh, some sort of I guess what is he trying to do? Cut this into some sort of documentary or something? Or well, he, he documented all. Eddie called him in. He knew one of the producers. The producer knew this video guy, and and Eddie wanted to record all the work he was doing. So he calls this guy in. And he's there almost every day for years. 
and then I, you have to, it's a really long story. So I, yeah. But then he, uh, but he's got it all on videotape. But then Van Halen won't let him release it, and there was no like contract or anything. The guy was just coming in and videotaping everything. And they actually used some of the videotape in one of the videos when Sammy first came back. One of the first songs they did with Sammy. It's pretty interesting. But um. All right, yeah, Dan. I'll see what I can find out. I'll see what I can find out about it. I mean, there's so little on Van Halen, like like I've said earlier. And and thank you, Dan, for the, for your call. There's so much. There's so little out there on Van Halen. People are so always just grasping for anything to hear or see or talk about or or what have you. I have a. I know a guy. I don't know if I if I can say publicly who it is yet, or he wants this talked about yet. So I'll I'll keep the particulars out. But but I know a guy who. Uh, told me he just recently came across a treasure trove of old Van Halen concert footage that was uh that he got the rights to that will is going to blow people's minds of pro shot never seen Van Halen old footage like I'm talking first 3 4 albums footage uh which would be like a holy grail for for Van Halen fans if and when this gentleman who I know quite well would like to you know, it starts to release this or what he's going to do with it. Uh, we will, you know, I'll talk more about it. But I, I, I know if that comes down the pike, that could be pretty amazing. But it sounds like this is something that this guy was sort of commissioned to do and is in some legal wrangling about if he can and wants to or will be allowed to put out the footage to people. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that story. Thank you for the call. All right, let's get a break so we stay on schedule. It's Eddie Trunk. This is Trunk Nation talking rock with you, of course, here on Volume Live Every day, 2 to 4 Eastern, the replay, 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern on demand. And like Ed and I are, were just talking about during the break, I mean, a, a promo like that of that magnitude airing in the Super Bowl would have to go through so many people at CBS and so many people with the Grammys to, to clear and approve every shot in it. You got to think that's not an accident. Then again, the Grammys are so clueless when it comes to rock. <laughs> They could have thought the guy in the schoolboy's outfit was like the hottest new pop act. That's a boy band, right? Yeah. That's a new boy band. Look, it's a yeah. schoolboy band. Let's go play. <laughs> Is that the hot new young band? That's that, that those are those guys, right? Cuz they don't they they don't have a clue. I'm convinced of that. But uh assuming that isn't the case, why in a in a incredibly valuable amount of time slot at a promo for a, a major broadcast event is Angus Young seen in a Grammys promo last night during the Super Bowl when there is no involvement for ACDC at least announced. A subliminal message? A screw-up? Or will this be the big... ACDC reveal at the Grammys, and they floated it out there to see if anybody would catch it. And if they did, I'm incredibly proud of my rock credentials that I was able to pick that out in the boar fest that was the Super Bowl. But I jumped right out of the bed. I was like, whoa. I was laying in bed in my hotel room just watching the game by myself, not, not doing anything. Whoa, what's going on here? Was that just Angus? Is ACDC doing something in the Super in the uh, Grammys? Uh, we'll find out soon. Well, let that ferment out there on this Monday in the uh, social media gossip world. Because <laughs> there's not enough to gossip about when it comes to ACDC. Let's go to Oklahoma City. Say hello to Larry. Hey, Larry. How you doing? Hey, I, I agree with you. The, the way it was presented, too, the way that I saw it, it was almost like it was just a split second. It wasn't, like, long enough to see him even do, like, two or three hops. It was, like, just flashed to you, and it's like that. It, 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 was, it had a real sneaky feel to it. I, I don't know if that's the right word to use or not. But yeah, you like wonder. You it, wonder if like so. So let's continue down this hypothetical road here, right? So you right. wonder if if ACDC has a deal to make some big reveal and be a like maybe. 
Who knows? The Grammys will have that big open moment where before even the host comes out, somebody goes on stage and plays and it's like, you know, that right. big reveal. So what if that ends up being, you know, and, and for the Grammys, you know, they're going to make them play You Shook Me All Night Long or something, if that's the case. So what if you have the Grammys open with ACDC, with Brian back on vocals, singing You Shook Me All Night Long, and everybody's like, holy shit, what just happened? And then off of that, the announcement of a record, April's whatever, tribute to Malcolm, blah, 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 blah. I mean, that's a hell of a way. And then you sit back and you look and, like, they may even be able to, you know, at that point, CBS or someone may say, hey, if you look closely at the promo, I don't know. Well, I, the, I, I'm totally, and, totally speculating. But why the hell else would that guy be in there? Well, not only that, but you always use the term move the needle. And, I mean, today's, I mean, you can say what you want. Today's bands don't, and I guess you call them bands, they don't play their own instruments. But today, today's bands don't move the needle like that, like that one Half, or that half second clip probably did a cry. I mean, you're, me and you probably aren't the only ones that that that, that noticed that. You know so what I mean? You, so did you notice it, Larry? Just watching the I game? did. I you did. did. I did. Yeah. Uh, yep. I wonder how many other people did because nobody. I haven't heard anybody else talk about this or even posted on social media until I did. And I'm not saying that to be arrogant or right. cocky. I'm just saying I'm saying it because I think it flew by so many people because a it was so right. quick quick in the clip and b a lot of let's be honest a lot of people do get up and go take a leak or something during the right. the commercials. So they they may not have noticed it. It was a quick promo. Well, in the way that it happened, like I said, it was toward the end of that commercial, and it was it was you know how they do those those dumb subliminal things where they say that this you know where they're almost making fun of subliminal messages. That's what it was like. It was like just a just a shape. I mean, you could barely even figure out what the image was. You know, it was just a it just happened in such a split second. You know, that's why because yeah, for it was me because for me when I see something like that. I'm so desperate to see anything with an electric guitar and rock right. Right. <laughs> that, too. that, that too. I saw. Okay, there's. I think they had a shot of Flea, and okay, I know that's the token rock band for the Grammys this year. Again, I don't know why, because I don't know if the Chili Peppers having anything new. Well, maybe they have something right. new coming, but they don't have anything being honored in any way or, or up for a Grammy, because I don't think they've put anything new out in the last couple of years. But okay, fine, right. there's that. And then I'm like, you know, wait a minute. What is Angus? That was Angus. Is he in the Chili Peppers right. now? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, like it's really, it's really going to be, if, if, if we've sniffed this out on this Monday, um, it's going to be real interesting. And here's the other thing. They can't, I mean, everyone knows how hard it is to keep a secret these days. So as much as they're going to, if this, there is something to what we're talking about, it's going to be very hard for them to keep it completely under wraps, especially now that we on a national radio broadcast has opened up this box to get people asking questions. There will be no doubt some people who work in the business or might be involved in the Grammys. I, mean, oh, yeah. I don't know if you're, if you're in the production end of it, a week out or whatever, there's going to be rehearsals. They have to plan for that. The bro it, It'll leak out. It will leak out. And now more so than ever because we're, we're, we're giving it all this time, but somebody if they cut that into the promo had to know that that was the desired effect that that's what might happen i did have a question for you i uh, i've heard you say a few times that you really weren't into progressive ba bands in your life and you and i are the exact same age i you know i i live vicariously through you at this point because i mean i grew up working in a record store going to concerts selling the tickets the, the, you know the, the whole thing all the way till i was 20 years old or whatever but I've heard you mention that you weren't a big progressive. Were you, were you not into Yes, and were you not into like Saga, and you know bands? Now I never, I never got into Dream Theater. Uh, I never went to that, that down that road. But I mean, just the early prog bands. No, the most, the most prog I would ever be would be obviously Rush, and that that was the you know that's the one band I truly loved, and that was it definitely had obviously progressive influence and prog progressive leanings. But no, and thanks as always, Larry, for calling. Never, never a big prog guy. Yes, I, I, I like some of their stuff. I you know, leave it. Owner of Lonely Heart, obviously the early stuff, the the big stuff. I mean the big hits early on. I get all that. I like it. I like some of it. I mean, who couldn't like Roundabout? I mean, stuff like that. But I would be lying if I told you I was deep into that world. Uh, Saga, their big hit was On the Loose. Interesting that Larry mentioned Saga 
because another guy lined up to be on the show this week is the singer in Saga, Michael Sadler, who I saw and met for the first time in the lobby at the hotel last night. Came up to me and introduced himself to me. It's, and he said, hi. He goes, I'm looking forward to coming on your show. And I, I didn't mean to be a dick, but I was like, okay, you are. And he goes, Michael from Saga. I was like, oh, hey, nice to meet you. Canadian, nicest people in the world, you know. <laughs> Nice to meet you, man. He's the nicest guy. And he goes, yeah, yeah. And he's he's a la he's a late addition. He's he doesn't have his band with him. He's just coming on and doing some stuff as a singer and jumping on and putting sort of like a jam thing together. Seemed like a very nice guy. I remember one or two songs from them. But no, I was never big into progressive stuff. I pre I appreciate it. I appreciate the musicianship, but uh, those are just the broad strokes for me. But I like learning about it. And, of course, Dream Theater, because Portnoy's such a close friend, I've seen live a bunch of times. I've introed a couple times. I, uh, I like a lot of what they've done. There are things they've done where they get off the deep end for me that I don't like. But I do like the heavier stuff that they've done. I love the Train of Thought album and uh, obviously Pull Me Under and those things that they've done. But there's also some stuff on Systematic Chaos. There's stuff along their records that I do like a lot. They have some, you know, straight up four or five minute songs on some of their records. So I've always just gravitated towards that a little bit more. But it doesn't mean I don't respect it. And, I, and as I said before, people are people who are into progressive rock are unbelievably passionate about it. Like I'm doing two cruises this month: Cruise to the Edge, which will start tonight, and the Monsters of Rock cruise at the end of the month. Radically different audiences. Cruise to the edge, you'll have no problem walking up to the bar, getting a beer right away. <laughs> Everybody is focused on the music, taking in every note of every band when they play. Monsters of Rock, it's a friggin' frat party for five days. I'm not saying those people don't enjoy seeing the bands and want to hear and see the bands, but they also want to drink and party just as hard. <laughs> and it is nuts. It is absolutely the gonna it's an endurance test. Whereas Cruise to the Edge, man, those people, they have their dinner. They'll have maybe have you know, a drink, maybe. And they are all about being there all in for their bands when that band plays. They are all about it. One more quick one before the break. This is Mike in Minneapolis. Go ahead, Mike. Hey, Mike. Uh, yes, sorry. <clears throat> You're on the air, buddy. I just want to say I really appreciate your show. And, Thank you, Mike. Uh, miss that metal show very much. Thank you. I still hear that <laughs> daily, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, because I was out in Jersey for a couple of years, and I actually lived in Cherry Hill. So, oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, my question is: Is I know John Five's working on some stuff, and I just wondered when his new album might come out, or if you have any input on that. Well, he's released two singles from it so far, including a new one that came out last week and then one that he did called Zoinks, a song called Zoinks that had a very, very, very elaborate music video, an animated video that had an appearance from an animated Nikki Six in it. And it's really a lot of fun. If you go to YouTube, pull up John Five and Zoinks, Z-O-I-N-K-S, and you'll see it. It's a lot of fun. It's like a 10 minute video. And that is uh, all leaning towards John putting out a new record. The newest single is okay. called Crank It, and Ed's going to give you a little, bit of a, uh, a little bit of that as we go to break. But Crank It is the name of the latest track, and Zoinks was the first track. So there's two songs out right now from the new record, and uh, that'll, the, the full album will come at some point, I'm sure. John is always out there touring with his own band, which is a killer instrumental trio called The Creatures. And also, he has a brand new album done with Rob Zombie, who, of course, he's the guitar player in that band. And the album is done, and John has said that it's the best album Zombie has ever made. And John doesn't usually talk like that unless he really feels that way. So uh, John is busy, as always, with zombie stuff and building his own thing, The Creatures, which will... I think The Creatures are on the Megadeth cruise coming up, up in October. I think they've been... They, they're one of the acts on that. There's so many bands and cruises. I'm trying to keep it all straight. But I'm pretty sure John is on board that uh, with the creatures. But he's busy. Look for his dates online and his music as well. 
both solo and stuff coming with Zombie as well. And here's a little of our buddy John Five and sometimes co-host as we go to break with his latest single, Crank It, and we'll come back and we'll finish up with our final calls from you guys next on Trunk with uh, our last segment here. And we'll start with James, who's in Burbank, who's been waiting for a while. Hey, James, what's going on? Hey, hey, Eddie. James from Burbank. I'm the Buckethead fan. I want to tell you real quick for my question. I know you got a busy schedule, but Buckethead's playing uh, Stone Pony on April 10th and then Sony Hall on April 11th. I'm begging you to go. Please go check it right. out. You've seen a million shows, but you've never seen a Buckethead show. I, I know you'll dig it, Eddie. If I'm in town, I will definitely try to go see him. I would like to. Perfect. Hey, and I wanted to call kind of in defense of Eddie Van Halen. I know, you know, I'm not talking just about the radio silence because they can kind of run their band how they want, but with the Sammy thing, which would obviously be 50 times better than with the Dave tour, it's just that Eddie Van Halen has like that, you know, that Johnny Carson, Frank Sinatra gene where he's super loyal. And once you kind of quote-unquote betray him, you're basically dead to them. And Eddie kind of did that when Van Halen broke up, you know, in 84. A lot of the crew went with Dave, and some of the guys stayed with Van Halen. And now those are, like, people that are still with him. And, you know, Sammy wrote that book, and I'm not saying everything he didn't write in the book wasn't true, and it's probably, you know, how Eddie's behavior and drugs and, and this and that. But, you know, then Sammy goes on all these talk shows and talks about it, and even after the book was out, kept talking about it, about even the reunion tour was terrible. He's playing out of tune, and I know all that's factual. It was on YouTube. But to have your singer keep talking about it and talking about it, I can understand why you would eventually say, hey, I, don't, I got enough money. Why am I going to be friends with this guy? Because what happens if something bad happens again? And then he's not going to – he can't keep his mo- – we're friends. He doesn't need to be telling everybody. Well, you know, about this even, you, well, you, you, know? you know what, James? I have he- I've heard very recently that some of the resentment still towards Sammy Hagar with the Van Halen camp is it's all that, what you're saying. But it's also to do with business. Like – some people have been telling me recently that there's still a lot of um, issues and resentment over the Cabo Wabo deal. And that was stuff that was documented in Sammy's book that they had issues about. But that they're still, they're still feeling that there's some bad business and some unfinished business in terms of money and things. And that there is a money connection to this and that there's been some dealings behind the scenes in terms of on the business level that people may not completely know about, also including the Cabo Wabo thing that the Van Halen camp is not comfortable with the resolution of and that that plays into some of the Sammy issues as well. When you talk about loyalty, I understand your point, but then... Let's not re- forget uh, David Lee Roth toured with Sammy Hagar. They went out together and toured. If all the rumors are true and Michael Anthony ends up coming back, he's been Sammy's right-hand guy. So that would blow the whole loyalty thing out of the water to some degree if that was the only issue. Yeah, but Dave, hasn't, Dave never really talked a bunch of garbage about Van Halen. He never talked bad or t- talked about personal stuff about Ed. Right. I'm not saying you're probably right, right but he just, you know... Right, right. No, interesting points. That. Yeah, interesting points, James. I got to run because I'm short on time. But thanks for your call. I, 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 we, we could do months of shows on Van Halen. <laughs> we really could. Van Halen and ACDC. We could do months of shows just on the dynamics, the business, the personalities, the egos, what is and isn't happening, the speculation, because they don't talk. They don't talk, so we just, as fans, are left with nothing but this sort of speculation. And it's funny, you know, when the Van Halen camp, I can only on this side of what I do present the stories and the side from Sammy and Michael. Because those are the only two people that have been in Van Halen that do press, that do interviews, and come on this show on a regular basis and have for years. It's just like when people talk about all the KISS stuff. I can only present to you Ace and Peter and their sides of things because Gene and Paul don't and won't come on the show. You know, if it comes to Ozzy, I can only present to you what Kerslake, Daisley, Jake say because the others won't come on the show. So when you have one camp that's willing to talk and another that won't talk, you're only going to get one side of that story because, and my door is open to all, but you can only accommodate those that will step in and be a part of it and answer the questions. So 
you might get a slightly slanted story because you're hearing from the people that are telling it. You're not. You can only speculate on the other end of it because they're not talking, or at least you know on whatever platform. In the case of ACDC and especially Van Halen, they don't talk to anybody. <laughs> they're not. It's not me. They don't talk to anybody. It's not, not. There's no issue there. They don't talk until they have to. I've interviewed Angus and Malcolm and Brian many times. I know Brian. He's a wonderful guy. One of my favorite people had him on that metal show. I mean, I know all these guys. I have no, there's no issues. Eddie, I, ha- I interviewed Eddie Van Halen one time in my life. It was for Van Halen 3, and it was on the phone. Met him one time backstage at the Garden for Van Halen 3. Ozzy interviewed one time on the phone. I think I met him one time. Sharon Osbourne I met one time backstage in an OzFest very briefly. It was fine. So you just don't know, you know. I interviewed Gene Simmons countless times back in the day before, uh, you know, <laughs> Paul put the kibosh on that. But, you know, I know all these guys. It's just it's such nonsense. It's such silliness who will and won't talk and whatever. But you can only present the stories from the people that will. And if they don't want to ask the tough questions or they don't, you know, you don't know, I, you have nothing to do but speculate. And the speculation is rampant when it comes to Van Halen. And ACDC, now more than ever, because of Van Halen rumors and because of what I just brought up about the ACDC uh, Grammys promo. Jeff in Oregon. Go ahead, Jeff. Hey, Eddie. How you doing? Thanks for everything you do. Sure, man. Hey, uh, I saw that clip. They ran that commercial twice, and I saw that clip the first time, and I thought I was not seeing what I thought I saw. And then they played it again (laughs) later. And I said something to someone in the room. So I'm glad you brought that up today because it shows that I wasn't just batshit crazy seeing stuff on the TV. But uh, it's it's kind of a mixed blessing you bringing it up because we know how the Grammys are and I've got no real desire to watch them, but now I'm going to have to keep my eyes open. Well, that's what the beauty of having a DVR is for, Jeff, because you can easily right. just hit that DVR, set it for four hours, and you can – and that's – trust me, with the Grammys, I kind of have to watch it because being in the music industry my whole life, I do need want to keep an eye on it, but I will work that fast-forward button like a demon through that thing. For some reason, I thought there was some semblance of, of rock in there. I, I don't I don't remember that song – It's been forever since I heard it, but I don't remember it being that poppy. That was that was pretty much a dance record, which I I don't know. I just remember it being a little bit more of a a rock edge to it. But man, was I wrong! I think there's a guitar solo in there somewhere. Maybe I think the most rock thing about it was her wearing Rachel's chain. Oof! Now I know why you. (laughs) Not going to condone that shirt, but I'm just. All right, let's get back to the phones right now at 844-686-5863, 844-6-VOLUME. we got about 12, 13 minutes left to go before we wrap up for a Thursday, Trunk Nation. Sincere thanks to all of you guys for your calls. You know, when this whole deal started a little over a couple of years ago, my whole goal with this show was to get it to the point where it becomes sports talk for rock fans. And that's exactly where we got it to. Don't have to have an agenda. Don't have to have anything. But you guys, the great listeners, and our passion and love for rock music and see where it takes us. And I love doing this. And, uh, again, we've had great guests. My gosh, the last two weeks stacked with guests. Monday we had uh, Petrucci on. Tomorrow we got David Draymond on. So great balance. All sorts of cool stuff on any given day here on Trunk Nation. Thank you for joining me. And spreading the word live 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern time every single day, Monday through Friday. And the replay every night for those that can't listen in that window, 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern on demand on the Sirius XM app. Which, by the way, I guess has gotten some enhancements lately. Back to the phones and see what we have time for as we wrap up. Let's go to Roger, who's listening to us in Florida today. Welcome, Raj. Hey, Ed. How you doing? Love the show. Got Thank you. For you. I hate to keep bringing up the uh, Grammys, but... Um... I watched it for the first time in like a decade, and I saw the disrespect for rock. I mean, all they cared about was country and hip-hop and pop. 
Um, and they almost like they didn't want rock there. I just I turned it off early. But my question is, have they ever thought about doing just an all rock award show? I know they have one for metal, and I think it's it's kind of the scope's kind of small. They uh, dig a big like a bigger scope, bigger umbrella that has more music that's all rock based. Maybe I mean if you're talking in terms of XM radio, like not only like Ozzy's Boneyard and and, and Octane, but like open it up to like you know all nation XMU. Anything that's rock based, even uh, classic rewind, something like that, but we we'll recognize some old artists. Have they ever talked about doing that? Because I know country does it, and I'm pretty sure hip hop does it. Well, you're right, country. You got the um, the the country awards, C- or the CMT awards, CMA awards, CMA awards. They just happened, actually. And then you're right. The, uh, there's the BET awards. There's a lot of them. And I'd go one further as far as the the joke that is the Grammys when it comes to rock. I mean, it's it is basically now hip hop and pop. I mean, there I think there was one yeah. or two country performances in there, but even country starting to, but country still had some presence in the thing. But really, Roger, yeah. I've been asked a lot about this because I've been such a critic of of those things. There have there, really what it would take for that to get done is is two things: a producer and a production company that feels there would be enough love from the rock community and enough ratings and enough support to put that on the air, and a network that would right. want to air it. You know, the, you're nowhere without a network that wants to air it because these things are expensive yeah. and they cost money to produce. So you really need to, to, to get it to that point. Now, people have tried, and it, it, for whatever reason, it didn't happen. But there have been a lot of rock and metal award shows over the years that have tried, even as far as TV productions, and just didn't stay, didn't last, didn't stick it out for whatever reason. And that doesn't bode well for people wanting to continue to do it. But I think a lot of them weren't done right and didn't have the right people right. and the right formula. And I agree with you, Roger, that to do it right, you can't just be really, really in, in one little niche. You got to have rock, metal, hard rock, you know, you know, alternative rock, whatever you want to call it. Use all the umbrellas, and you could really put together a great show that shows all the, all the worlds that rock encompasses. So that would be a great way to do it because then you could get a broader audience. That's that's exactly what I was just gonna say. You beat me to it. You broaden the audience. You bring awareness to bands that nobody knows about. From you know, you might be a rock fan. You listen to some alternative you like, and vice versa. I happen to like both. But I was like, why not do just an all rock show? And I mean, you could probably look at the numbers at XM, what they all draw, you know, radio wise. But I think there'd be an audience there, and maybe you can get a network to pick it up. I know that's the hard part. But. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Roger, for the call. The problem is, the problem is, is that. All of these award shows, their initial sort of mission statement is that it's very pure and it's about the artistic abilities of these acts and the creativity and what they've written and and all that. At the end of the day, a lot of that becomes BS and goes out the window. Why? Because once you put it on TV, there immediately becomes the need to get ratings, And when you talk about, you know, Roger just said at the end of his call, well, maybe you put some bands nobody knows and you discover that's where it gets really dangerous. Because if you are in need of getting ratings and you put unknown bands or not mainstream big name bands on, I mean, we're all hardcore, I get it, but the general public, that's a tune out. And then you don't get ratings, and then you're off the air in a year or two. See, there's two things here with all these award shows. There's the the aspect of the brilliant, you know, you know, we're celebrating the artistic greatness. Come on. That's only going to take you so far. You've got to put stuff on the broadcast if you want to keep your broadcast partner that people in the mainstream will tune into and see. That's why the Grammys are a pop fest. Because in their minds, they're just looking at the charts. They'll tell you that all these nominees are based on their uh, creativity and their brilliance. Bullshit! 
It's based that they were popular that year and they want to put those guys on TV as much as they can because they need to get the masses watching it. If they put a bunch of people on there just for their songwriting brilliance or their behind-the-scenes work or whatsoever, nobody would watch it. So if you really wanted to do a truly pure award show, you'd have to take the TV component out of it and not televise it. But ultimately, what's going to come into play when you ever you get on TV and you need TV because you need the money, you need the exposure, is the okay, well, who you got? I need names to sell this thing. That's the struggle. That's the that's you know that's the never ending battle there. Now I worked on a show. I want to say it was probably around oh seven, the first one. VH1. Prior to me doing that metal show, I had uh, I had been a host at VH1 Classic for years. VJ interview host guy on, on every genre of music, by the way. I hosted a show called Hanging With. I interviewed every possible person you could imagine, right? And then VH1 came to me, and even back then I was screaming about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And they came to me and they said, hey, we've got this idea. They didn't want to, like, openly shit on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because they kind of had some uh, alliance with them at the time. I think they broadcast the ceremony or something at that time. But they did realize that rock was seriously, especially hard rock, was seriously being overlooked. So they had the idea of doing an annual awards program called VH1 Rock Honors. And they made me a producer on the very first one that happened, which I want to say was 07. And... Instead of giving the honorees a statue, they gave them rings. And the way the show was formatted is they picked, I think it was six bands that were going in and getting the rings and being honored in the VH1 Rock Honors. And before those bands played, they an all-star tribute band that was influenced by them would play. So all solid ideas. And we did it. This happened. For people that didn't see it, this happened. It aired and everything. We did it at the uh, at the Mandalay Bay Event Center in Vegas. And the the first year, in the year I worked on it, the, the initial six bands that were sort of inducted, if you will, was Kiss, long before they actually went into the Hall of Fame. And then the tribute band was led by Rob Zombie, and Ace actually ended up playing in the tribute band, which is a whole other story, which he and I just talked about earlier today, ironically. Priest, I forget who was the tribute to Priest, maybe Godsmack. Def Leppard, I think All American Rejects were the tribute to them. So you see some diversity, some broadened out, you know, older, younger acts. Queen. I forget who played for Queen, but I think at the time Paul Rogers was still the singer. Maybe there were four, maybe there's two others I'm forgetting. So anyway, it was a great event. It went really well. It was it was shot. It aired a bunch of times. And then at the end, backstage, everybody got their rings, and you were in the VH1 Rock Honors. So they had planned on this thing being their rock award show and really becoming branded and, and a big deal. And then the next year, I wasn't involved in it, but they completely changed how they did it. And the the way they did it was different. It was much less bands. I forget what they did. It was like one band and a bunch of tributes. I don't know, but they turned it upside down in terms of the format. So that immediately lost value and traction. And then after that, they never did it again. So there have been things with big money and TV and production value behind it, but it just didn't connect. Whether they didn't get enough of a rating, they didn't get enough people to care, they didn't want to put the money into it, they didn't get enough sponsors, or they made a, a dramatic change in the process from year one to year two, which threw everybody off. I thought the way they did it in year one was a pretty sound thing, and it could have turned into something. But then, of course, VH1 as a whole changed. That's the other problem. 
if you're if the, your event is branded with a TV network and the TV network one day goes from playing a lot of rock and having a lot of rock shows to suddenly having a ton of reality shows that have nothing to do with music, boom, that kills you too. I mean, people remember the days of VH1 having all the great stuff behind the musics and rock show and all these things on it. And I'm not talking about VH1 Classic where I worked. I'm talking about the main channel. That's when they were all invested in rock. Suddenly, the whole format changes of what VH1 is, and I haven't turned it on in years. I don't even know. And you're seeing, you know, love and hip-hop and reality programs. There, there's no platform. They've completely gotten rid of anything to do with rock. So they're not going to do a rock award show anymore. But all the Revolver had a show. Everybody's done these shows, but they just don't resonate and nobody's done it when stuck it out and really built something. And that's what you need to do. You need to have real backing. You got to stay in it for the long haul. And you got to build something so that every year when you do it, it becomes more and more important and gets more and more word of mouth and means more. And we just have not seen that happen yet with Rock. I've had a lot of meetings with people about trying to do it, but just hasn't happened. But I'm, I'm still on it if anybody's open to it. All right, you guys, thank you all for the calls. Kentucky real quick because I want to hear about, uh, he, he says he saw Chris Robinson last night, Eric. Yeah, um, that was one of the most kick-ass shows I have ever been to, man. I mean, Chris Robinson sounded fucking amazing. Like, he sounded almost perfect for the Black Crow stuff. Yeah, this was the show he does. Uh, what is it called? Something as the crow flies or uh, something like it, that? It's as the crow flies and um he played almost everything he played was a black crow's hit song and then he played a couple other like album tracks and then he did some cover versions that were awesome he did uh hush by deep purple and he did uh he did uh rock and roll hoochie coo <laughs> mm -hmm. he did a bunch of he did a bunch of covers that were really good. And the guitar player he has playing for him, I've never heard of this guy before, but Marcus King, he was awesome. He did some really long sort of jam sessions of some of the songs. It was really, really good. And for the price, I mean, nothing against his brother, but, like, if the Black Crows got – back together for a reunion it would probably be an arena show and they would probably charge like a hundred bucks a ticket this show was in a smaller sort of a venue in lexington in kentucky mm -hmm. and the tickets were only like 35 bucks so and did let me ask you this did he do the song a conspiracy um i don't i don't think he did no that's one of my favorite Black Crow songs. That's why I ask. I'd love to, would have yeah. loved to have heard that. Uh, all right, Eric, I appreciate I appreciate the report. As I was saying before the last break, I'm going to be in L.A. doing this show for a week from L.A. the week of May 7th, and I looked through the schedule, and Chris Robinson is playing that week in L.A., and I would absolutely love to uh, to check that show out. He's doing the as the crow flies deal there. So I'm going to try to make it out for that. And I'm going to try to reach out to see if he'd be willing to come and do my show from there the day, be, the day of, of his gig. So fingers crossed, we can try to make that happen. I am just, uh, you know, trying to put some stuff together now to figure out what's going to happen for LA week, but that's somebody that's playing either way. I want to actually get out and see the show. So I'll have a report uh, of my own in, in a couple weeks about it. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Hopefully you'll be hearing Chris on this show as well. Another guy, by the way, was talking about with Lenny Kravitz, who I was surprised to find out used to watch that metal show and was a fan. I know that because Chris was in the lobby of Sirius XM and stopped me and started talking to me about it. So it's just a matter of getting to these people and letting them know that you'd like to have them on your show or making a connection with them, and hopefully we can pick some of them off. So that would be very cool. But uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure Chris Robinson's going to have a great band. And, of course, he sang all those Black Crow songs, so they're going to sound great. Why wouldn't they? I mean, the guy's a pro. All right, we got to get another break in because I ran a little late there in that. Oh, buddy. Hey, guys, what's up? Hey, two quick comments, and then I'll just let you take over. Uh, with M3 this year, fourth year in a row, I actually had more fun than ever, and I thought a couple really special things were when uh, 
obviously they had Cherry come up. I thought that was awesome. Let's see what you thought about that. And also for me, I never had seen Extreme back in the day. How sick is Nuno Betancourt? How sick is Nuno Betancourt, Paul? Yeah, just, just amazing. And then, uh, uh, so, and you, you announced it as the biggest crowd ever. So I was like, take that, Hard Rock Haters on my Facebook. <laughs> you know. um, and, then, and then going back to uh, Rob's comment, I just wanted to add on to that about the mystique of the band and everything. You know, I, I, that really struck a nerve with me because, and not, not to pick on Gene, 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 but just for example, you know, when you had the God of Thunder running around in Putty PJs on the TV show they did, I mean, I, I think that damages the band's mystique doing, doing that sort of thing. That's a so. great That's a great point, Paul. And if I had time, and thank you for the call, I would have loved to have delved more into that with Rob because that was a really good point, and I'm glad you brought it up, that he uh, – he mentioned with social media, reality shows, autobiographies, Priest hardly does any of that stuff. And you're right. The whole mystique of these bands we loved, the, the curtain's been lifted a little too much. And I do think that it taints it. it. It does change it a little bit. And that's a great, very, very good point. Of course, it all started with Ozzy. And when basically Ozzy was portrayed as a puppet for his wife, it was a hugely successful show. But it's kind of hard. You just have to laugh when people call Ozzy the Prince of Darkness. Uh, well, as I said at the time, as I'll always say, uh, I love Ozzy. I mean, you know, a, a huge fan, always have been, always will be. But Ozzy, I don't want to see Ozzy as a man ironing. I want him as Iron Man. Yeah, and you don't want him to see him picking <laughs> up dog shit and being yelled at by his wife. It's just it's just weird. And, and Richie and I talked about that. We went to the bathroom together. I don't want to brag, but... <laughs> on the way back, that's what I was talking to him about because he's a huge Priest fan as well. And you know, when as longtime Priest fans, you always were, would wait for that album, and you would wait. You didn't know what the track list was, and you didn't know what songs they were playing live. And and you can't go on. You couldn't go on YouTube and go, yeah. oh, they sound good. They don't sound good. You just had to enjoy. <laughs> that's our caller waiting to talk. I hit his button. So. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I cut you off, sir. No, no, no. You, but finish your point. Hold on, Hold TC. Point. We'll get right to. The point was you just you waited and waited and you didn't you didn't have any kind of clue what was coming up and you, we've lost that now you know people go on YouTube and they go oh I don't think I like the set list you know and it's like the, the whole experience of going to a concert is the mystery of it yeah. and 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 that's a testament to priests that they've never sort of broken that wall down TC in Los Angeles go ahead man sorry to interrupt no uh, no no worries I Aerosmith at the Whiskey at noon, 1 o'clock, because of your Twitter account. I was looking on EddieTrunk.com. Thank you. Oh, that you went to the press awesome conference show. thing when uh, you, on my Twitter. I, yeah, I tweeted out that they were going to play there. You got in, huh? Oh, my God. We got over there, me and my boss. Uh, we rode our motorcycles from the shop in Chatsworth in the valley. Boogied over the hill, got in. Uh, we didn't have wristbands. Everybody won them on the radio, but the lady told me, just hang out, and uh, by the luck of, you know, Eddie Trunk, we got him. How how long did they play? Uh, it seemed like, to me, about a 40-minute set. I mean, maybe more. Uh, Slash played a couple songs. Uh, they played old stuff. That was really cool. Uh, and you know the one I thing that was, the yeah. one thing though TC that was uh, that, that was kind of weird about that is Brad Whitford wasn't there, right? I know that was yeah they had a guy behind the uh, amps uh, he was playing guitar and keyboards and you know doing a good job but I didn't know I thought maybe because it wasn't really a planned show. Uh, I heard people talking uh, when we were outside by the limos and the lady was talking about how they just barely pulled that off. It was like. Yeah, well, they don't know how they did it. What happened? Uh, thank you for the call, TC. What happened was uh, the guy you're talking about is Russ Irwin, and he's at he does all the Aerosmith shows, and they they introduce him. They're transparent about having a guy helping them out, which I think is awesome. Uh, but Brad apparently was on a family had a family vacation booked, and he has young kids. He had a family vacation booked at the same time that they were doing that press conference and and that jam, and he just decided to stay with his vacation. He was away, and that's why he wasn't at that. But it's so special that Aerosmith is one of the few bands still all original, and it's something that you don't want to see broken. So that's that's very cool that uh, you got a chance. My God, seeing Aerosmith at the Whiskey, that's just insane. Even with one guy down, it's, you know, you can't pass that up. Yeah, and I mean, you, know, you can come to see me, Don, and Jim at the Whiskey on August 22nd. <laughs> we'll all be there. Come on, TC, get on the bike and come see us. <laughs> Let's go to Sean in New Haven. Go ahead, Sean. Hey, great interview, Eddie, with our priest, man. I really Thank you. It, dude. 
Thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, comment on the kind of, I was just uh, wondering, like, a lot of the British fans, they seem like, I'm not to knock the American fans, but they seem like they have that mystique still, a lot of them, and they're still, like, going. Do you have, do you have any, like, comment on that? No, I think, I think, you know, I I think they just have a little, I I think a lot of the British bands have just a little bit of a different sense of, um, I don't know, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, Don, but they just, they, they have a whole different sort of outlook on their their connection with the fans, the way they interact, um, their disposition, their sense of humor, Mm. uh, they just, they just are, are, are a little more close to the vest, I think, and I think they probably look at some of the insanity that goes on in the U.S. with reality shows and, and paparazzis and social well, they media. Have, they have them there, too. Yeah, I'm sure they do, but maybe not so much for the rock world. But like, I, th- I think um, I think wisely that they, they realize that, um, you know, when you have a 40-year career, you want to still be relevant in the modern age. That's why Judas Priest and a lot of bands are still making new music. They want to be relevant in the yeah. modern age, and they don't want to be they don't want to be known for something silly. They want to be known for the music, and and the caller's right. And there's a lot of bands, and he's right. A lot of British bands have stuck to their guns with that stuff. A couple more quick calls before we uh, wrap up for another edition of Trunk Nation. Let's go to Chicago. This is Mark. Mark, you're on the air. Sure, man. Don, you cracked up and Eddie, you rock me up. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, man. <laughs> cool, man. That's cool. cool. Hey, 1983, I seen Crocus uh, doing a head out of open for Death Leopard, Death Leopard Pyromania. Uh, on your other channel right before yours, they mentioned Crocus might be coming to the States. Any truth to that, Eddie? Well, we I had uh, Chris Von Rohr, the band's bassist and founding member, on this show just a few weeks ago, as a matter of fact, Mark. And for those yeah, for those of you guys that don't know, um, you can you can hear my interviews if you missed them, because I know a lot of people don't get to hear the whole four hours and they do not replay this entire show. But what they have been doing is posting my interviews on the Sirius XM app. So if you go to the Sirius XM app, you search Trunk Nation you will see my interviews from the last few weeks archived, and I don't know if the Crocus one is still up there. Uh, The Priest one I just did today will be up there in a matter of 24 hours. They go up in about a 24-hour period after I do them. Uh, The Stephen Piercy, Bobby Blotzer one from last week is probably up there now. So you can go and hear the interviews on demand on the app. The situation with Crocus, as Chris mentioned, and, and we've said many, many times, the band is not based in America. They're based in Switzerland, and there is just simply not enough demand for them to come to America and tour. I mean, you cannot ask a band and expect a band to come from Switzerland with all the expense to basically tour in clubs for 100 people. It just economically does not work. And what Chris was saying when he was on with us last time is that he would love to have the opportunity But until the offers are better and unless there's a spike in interest from promoters in Crocus playing, it makes no financial sense. They lose a ton of money to come here and do a club tour. Uh, It's it's too expensive to tour. You can't do it. And they can't do the weekend flying stuff that most others do because they're in Switzerland. So as much as we're fans of some of these bands, it simply is a case of economics with a lot of them, how much you see them and if they ever come over. But there's no immediate plans at all for Crocus to come here unless something happens and there's much more interest in them to warrant a tour. They put an album out and say, this is probably our fifth best album. No, they don't happen. say that, but there's that's, a way. That's marketing. Come no, I now. understand that, but there's a way to do it where you don't slam what came before it. Just like with Paul's book, when his auto, every bit of interview I read, uh, he talked about all these all these other autobiographies they're all self-serving they're all meaning every every interview he was taking down rock autobiographies in general to sell his own like his book had the cure for cancer in it and it's the same as anybody else's book it's his story can i ask you an honest question yeah did your animosity towards paul leak into your objective opinion no because the truth of the matter is i don't mean that in a bad way no 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 kevin i'm gonna be totally straight with you The truth of the matter is, if you want to know the absolute truth, is the guy has never, in all my years of being a KISS fan, has never been cool to me, ever. 
I mean, way before yeah, we even had any issues. In autobiography, you see where some of that comes from. Yes, and that's exactly my point. There are issues there. And, Kevin, i got to move on, and I thank you for the call. And, I, again, I appreciate all opinions on this. But, yes, as Kevin, you just alluded to, in the autobiography, he alludes to the fact that he's been in therapy since he was nine years old. He's got a lot of sensitivity issues and security issues. He talks about that. It's not me saying it. Read his book. He says it in the book. So, yes, I get where all that comes from. But he has to do his job. I do my job. And I've been a fan of the guys for decades. You know what's amazing to me? And I've said this before, too. Nobody for 30 years, every version of KISS, everything they did, I loved, played, supported. In many cases in their home market, the only one who touched it with a 10-foot pole. Never once is that ever acknowledged by those guys. One thing I don't like, that's it. You're the enemy. That's it. You got to buy. It's the one band you have to buy everything they're selling then, hook, line, and sinker, or, or you're off the ship. Now, going back to Kevin's other point, you, you can debate the abilities of any musician who's been in... There will people tell you that Vinnie Vincent's ten times the musician that anybody who's ever been in KISS was or will be. That Eric Carr's the best drummer that's ever been in KISS. That Eric Singer... All of that's debatable, and that's what fans do, and that's fine. And I'm not here to argue any of that. That's your own opinions and all good. But the whole thing about buying into the, well... There's been different people that have played Batman before. So why is it any different? That stuff is just, man, you're, you're buying what they're selling when you say stuff like that. Because, I, I mean, Kiss was about the music that was created by these guys. The personas were an extension of that. I say this, those people were synonymous. I mean, you know, it's just beating a dead horse. We've said it a million times. If you're down with it, go and enjoy it. And if you're not, don't like I do. Whatever, man. But it's just, it, it makes me, when, when, when I hear people spit back to me the same things that Gina Paul used to sell this in press releases, well, look, that's what they, they're there to do. They're selling what their product is now, and I don't, I get that, but how do you say that? Like, I don't know, was Dimebag Daryl buried with a tattoo of Spaceman on his chest or Ace Fraley? I don't know, which was it? I can tell you damn well right now it was Ace. That was his influence. That's Ace, not the Spaceman. On Kiss Alive... After Ace's guitar solo, Paul doesn't say, Spaceman on lead guitar. No, he says Ace Fraley. The 100,000 years drummer, drum solo, he doesn't say, The Catman on drums. But over time, they had to revise this thing because of what they're about to sell you, which is a kiss with no original members. Get ready for that. And then I want to hear the people call up and say how, how that's cool. And there will be people that say that. It's coming. Andy in Missouri. Go ahead, Andy. Eddie, love your stuff. Thanks for taking my call. Sure, man. I have two things. First, I just I know you're getting barraged with kiss things. I just want to thank No, no, you can call about anything you want. That just happened to be what's coming in right now. Well, I you know, I appreciate what I want to say is thank you. I feel like you were the family's trusted agent in a funeral and you kept us appraised and everything. I think you're coverage of what happened during the show really made it hit home for me. I mean, this is the last time they're ever going to be together. It's like a funeral, and I just want to thank you. You're for... talking about what, with Kiss and, and the Hall of Fame thing? Yes, sir. Well, yeah, yeah and you know what's, what's really a bummer about it is, uh, and if you watch the telecast, they put some of the photos up, I guess, uh, during transitions in the HBO broadcast, but there's those yeah. shots of the four of the original guys standing there. They wouldn't take yeah. they wouldn't take pictures. I mean, they wouldn't take questions at the press conference after the hall, but they would. Right. They took took pictures, and I'm pretty sure. I mean, and I hope it's not the case, but it's probably very much the case 
that the last time anybody will see the four original members of Kiss standing up there side by side again for any re- yeah. for, it, it was was then. I don't I don't see a scenario where those four guys are going to be standing up there again shoulder to shoulder like that again. No, but I just appreciate all the hard work you put in on it and answering all the questions and is I'm sure it's just been draining for you, just like for true fans, it's been draining. Well, thanks, all Andy. I, I appreciate it's you saying. Sad. I appreciate you saying that because that's what gets lost in all this. By some fans, I get painted as this this enemy or shit stir or whatever, and no. it's just so. It's no. they just have no clue of the history when they say that, and you know, people feel the need to take a hard line stance one way or the other. I mean, listen, we're just talking about a rock band that we all loved and what we do and don't like. The problem is so few people in media will talk honestly and objectively about how they feel. So so many people are just so used to having the host uh, take the, uh, you know, hey, that's great, and tell me about your new record, and that's it, and and, and won't get into this stuff. So uh, that's all I try to do. I I enjoy the debate. Well, it is a big effort on your part, and I thank you for that. And I, I do have a question. Mm-hmm. Is Lemmy coming back, and what do I need to do to help? I can donate a kidney. What is it going to take? Well, Andy, I hope it's not at that point, but thank you for the call and the kind words. I, I do not know how Lemmy is doing. Um, I, I mean, there's been some shows, and by all accounts, he's finished the shows. They've been a little shorter than normal. But, you know, Lemmy's like all the rest of our heroes. He's up there. He's had some health scares lately. Uh, we can only hope for the best, but I don't really have any concrete information one way or the other on how his health is. Um, as soon as I do and there's some sort of further announcement, I'll let you know. But I hear, you know, he's okay. Uh, he just can't do things uh, to the level of uh, his previous self. I mean, Lemmy is about 67, 68, but in the way he, the, the years he's the the the, uh, the years he's put on his body, it's more probably going on like 90. You know, I mean, he's lived a hard 68. Brian and Churchill, go ahead, Brian. Hey, Eddie, how you doing? Good, man. I'm just going to talk about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame thing. I'm not going to talk that much about Kiss. Talk about I mean, whatever you want. That's the idea. I, That's I, why I come I, in I, here I and pay $80 <laughs> from Jersey to park and get tolls to talk to you guys. So bring it. What do you got, Brian? Well, I'm just as late down as you that they didn't play. I thought, gee, oh, first of all, Kevin, whoever that was, he needs an ear transplant. Tommy does not blow Ace away. Tommy's playing Ace's licks. Well, that's just that. That's the other thing that nobody understands I mean, is it, it if you works. want if you want further proof of the impersonation. I mean, you have to you dress like someone, you move like someone, you play like somebody. I knew Tommy's playing when he was in the band Black and Blue. He didn't play exactly think, like sure. Ace. He was a great no. player then. But these yeah. guys and Eric Singer can say whatever he wants, but he knows Eric is is a totally. He, he has a different style than Peter Chris. He, but he has to pull back and play in a certain way that fits that mold. So, of course, they have their marching orders, and I don't blame them. But to sit, not see that is crazy to me. And to say, if, if anybody watched as recently as American Idol, that Paul's voice is still there, I, and you're really just buying everything because that's just anybody with an ear could hear there's an issue. I was sitting there thinking they should have put Caleb in the star makeup and had him take Paul's place. Well, I said that too. If listen, if it doesn't, <laughs> if it doesn't matter who's in the band, okay, exactly. which they'll tell you, and it's all about who's still getting it done. Well, that kid sang circles around him that night, so you know what? Put him in the costume. If it doesn't exactly. matter, send him out on tour this summer. But getting back to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame show, and you were there. Uh, they didn't show you on camera on HBO that I've seen. Well, I was in a couple of times. I was. They well, didn't, yeah, no close-ups, but there were long shots if you knew where I was. You, somebody sent me well, a tweet. Yeah, somebody sent me a tweet of a shot off their TV, and you could see me. I'm holding up my phone, shooting the video of Kiss being inducted, which I put on my site a while ago. So I'm in there, but it's very quick. But, 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 and props to Tom for the induction speech. That's the Great. best speech I've ever heard anybody go He nailed it. But, and the, the only thing that rocked to me the whole night was Joan Jett doing the Smells Like Teen Spirit. She was real good. She yes, was, she was. She was that really was, good. That was the best thing of the night. Yeah, as far was, as, as far as 
musical performances, uh, that was the thing that probably I liked the best. I mean, I was there, and it, the night was so long. What people don't know is that thing was like five and a half hours in real time. Oh, God. And the HBO broadcast, I think they cut it to, what, three? 315, I think. Yeah, and they cut a lot of the Springsteen speeches out because that's what ate up so much time in it. Thank you for the call, Brian. I mean, and that is, for people that don't know, I was at Ace's table the whole night. Kiss, first of all, the order they showed the, 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 the thing on on HBO was not the order it happened that night. And secondly, the Springsteen band induction there's like nine guys in that induction and they all spoke and spoke and spoke and spoke and springsteen spoke forever that ate up so much time that the jam because every hall of fame usually ends with this all-star jam at the end the jam was canceled because the venue had a curfew of midnight and it went past the curfew which cost them a lot of money so they called off the jam, and the jam at the end of the night was supposed to be Ace playing Highway to Hell with Nirvana and Tom Morello. Ace had his guitar under our table the entire night, and in the middle of the Marathon Springsteen Band's performance and induction, someone came over said in Ace's ear, it's not going to happen, we're past curfew. So there would have been... Guitar, he had his own character, and so did Vinny. So I agree. I'd be fine with that if that's what they did. But they, they just take their orders from above. They're doing what they're told and what they have to be doing. So you can't blame them for that. And I don't blame them for doing it either because, let's be honest, if they didn't do it, someone else would line up and take the gig. It's a good-paying gig. So it's not oh, yeah. none of it's their fault personally. But it's the fault right. of the guys that run the band saying, this is what we want you to do, and here's what we're doing. Yeah, I got you. Okay, what I really called about is Lizzie Borden. How come everybody in the band has been there for a long time, except they can't keep a guitar player for nothing? <laughs> well, Dario is in uh, is in BLS now. I just saw him at, at Rocklahoma playing for the first time with Black Label Society. He's a great kid, great player. Uh, I, listen, I don't know. I'm not a huge Lizzie Borden fan. I don't know much about what goes on with that band. But I can tell you that uh, that any a band at that level is not going to hold members when a bigger band comes along and wants one of their members. I mean... A band at that level is not playing many shows. They're not playing to many people, if they're playing at all. If there is a musician or two hanging out, we'll bring them up and have some fun with them. But they are not that metal show tapings. They are not musical performances, unless the venue puts a band on or two after us. But we don't have anything to do with that. So uh, we're going to be in Providence this Friday at Lupo's and then at the Comedy Connection Chicopee Mass this Saturday. But since those guys are in the area, we know them all, so I'm sure we'll try to get some people out. I didn't know that. That's good to know, so thank you for the call. Jimmy in Georgia. Jimmy. We just lost Jimmy. He just hung up. John in Connecticut. Go ahead, John. Hi, Eddie. Um, John here in Connecticut. First time calling. Um, Got to say, I love your show and a huge fan of your show, too. Um, my question really is changing subjects is on George Lynch. Um, I've been a huge George Lynch fan growing up, still am. I always thought he was very underrated as a guitar player, and I just want to know if you felt that way, or, and two is, you know, do you ever see him getting back together with the original members of Dawkins? Because they were a good band back in the 80s. Well, I don't, I wouldn't say that I think George Lynch is underrated. I think George Lynch gets a lot of credit as a player. Um, he was a guitar hero of the 80s one of them so i don't i wouldn't go with the underrated thing i think there's a lot of people that rightfully have a lot of respect for george as a player i think one of the problems with george these days he's in so many bands i mean these guys all have so much stuff coming out with different projects and bands and what have you that it's hard to find a singular focus on what they're even doing now I think that's a big problem, not with just him, but a lot of people. For instance, the KXM record, which came out a few months ago, was great, had a great entry on the charts, but 
I mean, it's ba- basically invisible now because there's no live shows and everybody's on to something else. I just got another record that Doug Pinnock did. So there's very little lasting longevity for focus on these things. When you have artists that are putting out a different record with a different band every three months, it's hard, I think, for them to really get traction with anything in particular, any one focused direction. But I think George is a phenomenal player that get usually, I think, certainly gets that respect. Tons of phone calls here, man. This is... Uh, I appreciate everybody calling. I'm just going to grab a couple more quick ones, and then we're going to go back to music for the rest of the hour. I have a lot of things I want to play for you tonight, so we're going to mix it up, as I always do, with music and talk about music on our live get-together on Mondays. I've got, by the way, new Ace Freely music coming up as well. A lot of people ask me about that. If you haven't heard the brand-new song from his upcoming album, we will do that. Let's go to Jersey. Uh, This is... I'm sorry, when I... Click on it, the name disappears. Who's calling? Who is this? Eddie, it's Johnny. How are you? Hey, Johnny. Go ahead. You're on the air, man. Good. How are you? Uh, listen, I want to touch. Up, I want to touch base on the on the Kiss thing. Go ahead. You're a longtime Kiss fan. Uh, I went. I actually went to the show in '77. I was there the night you went there at the Garden, and I agree with you 100 percent about the the whole thing with the with the you know with with Thayer and uh, and and Singer with the costume thing and. And on that, um, I, I just wish it was a shame that they should have played at the uh, at the uh, you know the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It would have been great, and uh, you know the killer pictures you had on there. Yeah, they're, really nice pictures. Well, you mean I'm, I'm, I guess you thanks for the call. I guess you're talking about some of the ones I tweeted out. But yeah, I mean, again, we I understand people are just seeing the Hall of Fame now because it just aired this weekend. But we discussed this so much over the last couple of months, and everybody's got a different take on it. And I think that people really just saw how cool the moment would have been if they just would have picked up guitars and just done one song. But it wasn't going to happen, and it didn't happen. And it's it's pretty much done now. It's just like it's they're in, great. Gene and Paul are going to do their thing. Ace and Peter do what they do, and that's where it goes from here. And you guys are the ones to decide what you do and don't want to see. Teresa in Connecticut. Go ahead, Teresa. Hey, um, I want to talk about Guns N' Roses. Okay. And the Golden God Awards. Sure. How hor- how horrible was that? He he could he couldn't keep his breath, and he couldn't keep in tune. Uh, I mean, he was just, it was horrible. I was kind of surprised when I watched the telecast, Teresa, because I was there, obviously, uh, since I was one of the hosts. And I was standing off to the side of the stage, and i got to be totally honest with you. From where I was standing, and I didn't pay as close attention there live as someone in the audience would have because I was running around working and doing things. But I was very surprised that the telecast came off that way. I agree with you. I was I was pretty much uh, I was disappointed at what that sounded like on TV because... Being there in the audience, to me, where I was off to the side of the stage, I thought they sounded great. And then I heard from people who said when it was streaming, when it streamed live, that they didn't sound good on the stream. And I said, well, that's just got to be the stream. And now, of course, that it's aired on on TV, I understand what people are talking about. It wasn't great. I'm going to be straight with you. I agree with you. Uh, I wouldn't say it was horrible, but I would say that that there was definitely some issues there, especially with how he was singing. I don't know. Know why it was like that? I listen, Joan Jett. She played too, and I watched the same show that she sang on, and she she was awesome. Okay, so I don't know if it was just the streaming because he just—I mean, you could see he just couldn't keep his breath. It's just. It wasn't how the song sounded. Yeah, well, listen, no, I'm not I'm not saying that I'm making any sort of excuse saying that it was just the stream. I'm just saying that I first heard, uh, what I'm saying is that being there, what I heard, the little bit I heard live sounded fine, and then people afterwards said, oh, the stream didn't sound good, and then I saw the show, and that didn't sound so good either. So what I'm saying is, is that what what was broadcast is probably closer to what, you know, I'm there live, five people talking to me at the same time, so I didn't pay that close attention. But if anything, 
after something airs live, you can make it sound better afterwards because you can remix it and touch it up. Um, so I don't know what happened there, but it was. Uh, I agree with you that it was not the best moment. Yeah, there was no remixing that. Yeah, I mean, well, what you can do, Teresa, and thank you for the call, what a lot of artists do is re-record. I mean, it's no secret. I don't think anybody doesn't know this by now, but the huge majority of concert DVDs and live concerts that you see on TV, the vocals, almost in so many cases, the lead vocals are totally re-recorded. The artist goes into a studio, they put the video up on a screen, and then they record a whole nother vocal track. And they sync it to... The, the singer will have the screen up because he'll know when the camera... There's camera shots of him and where he can cheat a little bit. But there are a ton of quote-unquote live concerts and DVDs that you see on TV or maybe own where the entire lead vocals tracks are re-recorded. And I hate that. I'd rather have it be a little off. So for me, I'd much rather hear Guns N' Roses the way I heard them on The Golden Gods, because at least it's real. Otherwise, I'm getting karaoke. But I, I hear what you're saying, and I was I was kind of a little surprised by it as well, because when I was there live, I thought that it was it sounded a lot better than than I thought it, it came off on the TV. Yeah, Joan Jett, uh, quite the renaissance for Joan Jett, huh? I mean, out of nowhere, you got Joan Jett singing with Nirvana. You got Joan Jett getting a lifetime achievement or whatever it was, it's the, the Golden Gods. Joan Jett is having a moment, as they say, and good for her. Thought it was cool that Joan Jett thanked Lita and Sheree Curry, the other runaways at the uh, Golden Gods. Thought it was interesting, back to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame thing with Kiss, that uh, I got to tell you, I, and it hit me when I saw it. You want to talk about however you fall on the whole Kiss world, but Gene, when he was going around the horn saying, Ace, Peter, Gene, Paul, whatever he said about each one when he said Ace Fraley, whose guitar playing is often attempted to be imitated by so many, but never duplicated. I mean, you couldn't make that one up coming out of Gene's mouth with Tommy Fair sitting right there. Ooh, I don't know if he realized the implications in that one. All good stuff. Thank you all for the calls. I apologize if I didn't get to your call. The lines are all jammed. We're going to do it again next hour. I want to play some music for you guys. So we're going to... Starting on line number one in Los Angeles with Doug. Hi, Doug. Hey, Eddie. It's a beautiful day out here in L.A., and uh, <clears throat> I wish I could bring some of that warm weather your way. No, you don't need to now, Doug. It's beautiful here in New York City. I couldn't ask for a better weekend, and today's been great. 80, 85, sunny, no humidity, so we're good here right now, but thank you. Save it for me in, like, February, and I'll take it then. Uh, hey, I just want to pay a couple compliments to you. Obviously, I've noticed that it uh, looks like you've lost a lot of weight. You look amazing. Thank I'm you. Sure it's a great choice that your family's uh, very happy with, and... Uh, Everything's going great for you, but big concern out here. July 8th, we've got the Kiss Def Leppard show at the Great Western Forum, which is hallowed ground. The place isn't even half sold. There are so many wide open seats. What do you think the band may do? Because they also have a show in Irvine. Do you think they may shut one down and, and possibly just run one? How do you know, Doug, about the lack of sales? Um I went on to uh, Ticketmaster, mm -hmm. and they have what they call use your seat, and you can pick out seats in the arena. The upper bowl is, like, completely wide open. It's yeah. absolutely just seat upon seat available for sale. You know, I, of course, if I say stuff like this, people are just going to say to me, oh, this is that's just Eddie because he doesn't like the current kiss. But um, I have heard that from a number of people that there are some definite soft spots on this tour this summer. And the only thing I can say is that I do think that kiss hurt themselves a little bit with all this. I think that 
even some of the most hardcore fans were a little bit turned off by what went on around the Hall of Fame and leading up to it. But I, I don't think that's a huge factor. I think that a lot of it is just the fact that uh, these, there's a lot out there on the road. Um, there's some some people just found out what's going on with Kiss and that the the, the lineup is what it is through all the Hall of Fame stuff. Um, Def Leppard's right. toured. Uh, I mean, Def Leppard is obviously a big part of this as well. They're the co-headline, and they've toured almost every summer for the last seven, eight years, I guess, with one band or the other. So uh, there's a little bit of fatigue there, I think, from the audience, um, and and I think. Going into a place like the Forum, I mean, you know, doing a shed, at, which is an outdoor amphitheater, is a lot different than doing an arena. Doing an indoor arena, right. you've really got to be able to sell tickets. When you do an outdoor shed, you can pad it. There's a lawn. You can do cheaper seats. Uh, it's outdoors. People will walk up more likely if the weather's nice. But when you go inside and do an arena, you really have to have a draw. And Def Leppard's toured a lot, and there's a lot of indifference about what Kiss is doing now, coming off of, especially with coming off of the Hall of Fame thing and, and the, the infighting. So I think there's a lot of issues, and uh, they probably won't be the only tour that's going to go through some of that. Well, and I, and I don't, to answer I your question, to... I don't know, because it, if it's the same promoter, they could cancel one date and push everybody to the other. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, there's still probably some time left to come. The, more, the other question I have for you, Doug, is have you been sure. to the forum since they redid it? Um, yeah, actually, I got to see that Eagle show. Eddie, it's amazing. Actually, I saw the Rolling Stones there uh, when they were on their tour right before the forum. Again, it shut down primarily. And, you know, th there's no better place for a concert. I mean, it's hollowed grounds. You know that. Yeah. You know, when Kiss was there, they did the uh, Alive 2, the Love Gun tour there in 77. I mean, just a bombastic place. Amazing. You can never duplicate it. Just bummed out to see it's, it's half full, but I guess uh, – you know, I agree with you. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I, I want to go on record. I first saw Kiss in 1976, Hartford Civic Center, in February. I was very disappointed with the band's decision to not put personal differences aside and give us fans what we wanted. However, I moved on. But I, I think that you are really ringing the nail true, Eddie, when you say that it has affected the fan base in, in some capacity because I'm not willing to shell out $300 a ticket well, that that's the other that's the other thing, Doug. And thank you for the call, and thanks for listening. The, I've heard, and I don't know what the ticket price is, but I've heard the tickets are really expensive for anything remotely close to the stage. And they're going to say, "Well, you're getting two headlining bands." Well, I, obviously, you're not. I mean, a headlining band doesn't take another headlining band. Bands that are true headlines headline and have an unknown band open for them. Um, so. Yeah, you can spin it that way, but it's an expensive ticket. I think the KISS fan base is a little fractured right now. You're always going to have the hardcore people. I think that Def Leppard's toured a lot uh, lately. They've done, gone out every summer. There's a lot of competition out there. There's more bands on the road than ever. So it's a, it's a combination of a lot of things. So... You know, Def Leppard did those residencies. A lot of people traveled to them. Uh, it's just, I'm sure that some of these shows, by the time the event comes around the night before, the outdoor ones, the weather's nice, people will walk up. You know, there's something that a lot of venues do when a show's not doing well in the business. It's called papering the house. And that's when they dump like a few thousand tickets just for free out to people just because they want it to look good. And they want people drinking beer at ten dollars a beer or twelve dollars a beer, and they make up their money that way. So I, I'm I'm pretty sure that when these shows actually happen, not just that tour, but anyone that might be struggling, by the time the show comes around, they'll find a way to make it look respectable. But what the numbers read is is probably something a little bit different. And it's a it's a byproduct of the touring industry right now. There's so many bands touring and out there competing and charging a lot of money, and everything's tiered. You want the first 10 rows, you're paying this. You want the meet and greet, you're paying that. You want a guitar pick, you're paying that. You want first dibs at the mer I mean, everything's tiered. People are getting tired of it. It's, a, it's, it's just a, a costly proposition. And I'm not just talking about that tour. I'm just talking about in general. That's why I think, you know, one of the bands that played, one of the artists that played Rock, Oklahoma last weekend was Kid Rock, and I didn't get a chance to see him or I never met him. But that's why I think Kid Rock, his stock, whether you like his act or not, is another story. But his stock went up dramatically because of what he did a couple years ago when he made a, 
uh, he went out and 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 took a stance and saying, listen, no tickets going to be over whatever thirty bucks. Working with the venues that no parking is going to be more than ten, no beer is going to be more than five. I mean, that really touched a nerve with people and gave him a lot of goodwill from fans. A lot of bands are going the other way. You want anything close to the stage, you better have 150. You want this, you want that. So it's everybody does their business a different way. The other thing that Doug mentioned real quick about the forum in Los Angeles, for you guys that don't know the story and what we were talking about, the Forum is this legendary, everybody knows the Forum, it's the West Coast version of Madison Square Garden in L.A., and it's this legendary arena that over the years had become pretty run down. And the Staples Center opened, and that's where the sports went, that's where all the big marquee concerts went, that was the new state-of-the-art venue. And the Forum got even more run down, and at, at some point, I think a church group owned it, and they were having church services in there, and monster truck and stuff like that not the band but the, the event so what happened is uh, a different group came in and purchased the form i think james dolan has a piece of it who owns madison square garden and i think irving azoff as well they went in and took over the form purchased it from this group and did a whole makeover to it and it's one of the few arenas in the country that it's specifically designed now for concerts. Acoustically, from viewing angles, everything. So unlike a Staples Center or a Madison Square Garden or one of these other iconic arenas, when you go into it, it could be hockey, it could be basketball, it could be a concert, it could be whatever. The form was redone specifically with nothing but music in mind and concerts and acoustics and i've not been there since they did it i saw a show at the forum just before this happened in the old version of the building i saw the foo fighters there about three four years ago have not seen it since they redid it but i hear everybody wants to play there now because for bands they're going to get a little better deal than what it costs to get staples for the big bands and so it's a little cheaper building to get into, and you are going to get this great sound and viewing experience. But as Doug said, that that show he mentioned is struggling. I mean, it doesn't matter where the building is, it's going to struggle. But I just think it's interesting that they did that with that building. And I'm curious next time I'm out west to to check it out. All right, let's try to get a lot of people in here. I'm sorry we got off on a tangent there, but interesting stuff that Doug brought up. Rusty in Kentucky. Go ahead, Rusty. Hey, what's up, Eddie? Hey, bud. Hey, man. I have a first-time caller here, and I hadn't been listening to it. I just got a serious radio about three weeks ago. Now I get me a six-pack of Michelob and a potato lays and burrito with Monday night and sit out here and listen to you, man. Man, that's nice of you, and that's some good stuff right there. A Michelob and a burrito and some potato chips. I mean, that I'm not even messing with you. That's living, man. A little radio action. That's a good... Let me tell you something, Rusty. Michelob, I don't know what it is in Michelob, but Michelob beer, for some reason, gets me more screwed up than any beer I drink. I don't know if it has that effect on you, Rusty, but from when I was young, a Michelob makes me, like, high or something. I don't know what's in that stuff. No headaches at all the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I said stuff can get me in big trouble, man. I stay away from a Michelob. That'll make me crazy. <laughs> hey, man, I'm just curious. You know, I'm, I'm still listening to cassette tape that tells you what kind of how old I am. But, uh, you know, like Pretty Maids and Crocus, uh, Fastway, Hurricane, where are hunting them guys? Dangerous toys. They, you know, I, I still go to, like, I went and seen Crew and Kiss last year and seen L.A. Guns and the Warrant Without Jane Lane, rest in peace. I just curious what happened to them guys, man. Well, Rusty, they all do various things, and thank you for the call, and enjoy your, your fine cuisine and your Michelob. I wish I was uh, having one right now, but... um I wouldn't be talking straight if I was. <laughs> All these bands that you mentioned, Rusty, when you run down names like that, I got to be, again, I'm, I can only speak honestly and straightly. Those bands didn't have success. They didn't have mainstream hit success. They're not mainstream popular bands. So as a result, some are still together, some aren't, but they can't get gigs. You, you can't tour and you can't 
we talk about this every week. You can't tour and you can't go out and play if promoters don't want to book you and people don't show up to see you. And with so many of these 80s bands or 70s bands or whatever era you're into, if there isn't demand, you don't get gigs. And there just is not enough demand to sustain these bands to come and do dates. It's very expensive to do shows. Even at the bare bones level, it's expensive to do shows. So unless there's enough of an interest to people come out and there's money involved and it's worthwhile, the bands don't play. And all those bands you rattled off, Rusty, are pretty much in that category. As a matter of fact, you, one of the bands Rusty mentioned was Crocus. I hear about that band all the time. If you're listening, and Rusty said he's a new listener, so welcome. He probably wasn't listening, but it might be on the app. I interviewed Chris, the bass player from Crocus, like a month ago on this show. That band's based in Switzerland. He said, hey, I hope people want to see us. Maybe we can get over there to play a show. But there's just not enough interest. Man's not going to come from Switzerland, Switzerland and play for 20 people in a club. It's all economics, my friend. And a lot of these guys, can't, you know, they, there's not enough interest. Plain and simple. Alan in Missouri. Go ahead, Al. Yeah, I was uh, talking to you, I guess, I was the first caller tonight. Okay. It started like kind of the kiss firestorm. All right. Go ahead. But, what do you uh, got? Uh, about Ace and everything and how he's doing well and Peter and all that, you know, you know, like you, I wish they would all get back together. But like you said, it's probably never going to happen. The ship has sailed. That's the, uh, as far as I'm yeah, concerned, Alan. Yeah, it's really sad because kind of living in the past, listen to the old stuff all the time. Well, that's what you have. That's all you've got with a lot of bands, unfortunately, right. but that's, and, that's what it is. And as a kid, you know, I've still got my old Kiss posters and the whole bit. Well, you know, but, dragging all the old stuff out. I hear you, Alan. I mean, a lot of people, uh, you know, time stops for no one, unfortunately. I appreciate the call, and thank you for listening. Let's go to Toronto, say hello to Mark. Hi, Mark. Good evening. What's happening, man? Hey, you know what's funny, Eddie? That guy that called a couple calls ago having a Michelob, I swear to God, I'm having a Michelob Ultra right now. Look at that. We, we Unfortunately, this channel does not take at Well, fortunately for the listeners, but unfortunately the uh, for Michelob, we don't have advertising on this channel. But uh, if we did, maybe we'd get a sponsor. Anyway, I just thought that was... Uh, not Trump Nation, anyway. powered by Michelob. I love it. Anyway, listen, Eddie, I met Jason Bonham uh, a few weeks ago. at uh, He did the Led Zeppelin experience, and it was the full show. Uh, and he's just such an awesome dude, man. I only spoke to him for five minutes, but he, he's very down to earth. And Tony Catania, the guitar player in that band, man, it, like note for note, it, it, 5,000 people rocked that casino. It was amazing. But anyway, I, there's one thing I've always wanted to do on radio, and I know you're passionate about this as well, is talking about live, truly live albums. And I want to really quick give you my top five truly live albums. Queen Live Killers, number five. Rush, All the World's a Stage, number four. Aerosmith, Live Bootleg, number three. Ted Nugent. Double Live Gonzo, number two, and of course, you know me, Deep Purple, Made in Japan. I want to hear what all the other people say. Well, that's thank you, Mark, for the call. I appreciate it. And that's a great list. And you're right, most of those records, as far as I know, are completely live. Bootleg from Aerosmith was made up of radio live recordings. And uh, yeah, I love how raw and real and live that is. Purple, Made in Japan, they're coming out with some of the alternate nights from that recording, actually, any day. Uh, some there's there's different days that were not represented. They did more than one night that was captured on that. So there's something for you, Mark, to check out. I'm sure you knew about that already. And yeah, Jason Bonham, I saw him this Saturday with his new band, California Breed, as I was mentioning earlier, and he is doing really well with this Led Zeppelin Experience show. It's really grown for him and done really well, and he does, he does a great job with it. I also heard something. He's going to get do some stuff with Sammy Hagar coming up. So. 
He's got a lot going on, and I'm happy for him. He's a good guy. The uh, This past Saturday would have been his dad's birthday, so it was an emotional show that he performed. And California Breed did two Zeppelin songs in their set. They did What Is and What Should Never Be and, uh, well, no, What Is it? Yeah, and they did uh, Immigrant Song. And I also Saturday was at a show that Brian Tishy is doing that is unrelated and not sanctioned by the Bonham family, but it was a cool show uh, that uh, Brian does every year around uh, Bonham's birthday called Bonzo Bash, where he gets a bunch of drummers and all, they all jam on Zeppelin tunes. And I saw that at Jer in Jersey before I went to the California Breed Show. And now Brian, who I think may call in tonight, I've got to try to connect with him, but I th Brian is now doing a Randy Rhodes tribute. And that's playing in, in uh, Asbury Park at the Stone Pony in New Jersey tomorrow and Bergen Pack and Englewood on Wednesday, both in New Jersey. And I think there's a date in Pennsylvania, maybe a date in the Boston area as well. So check that out online. A bunch of guitar players doing a Randy Rhodes tribute. So the tribute stuff, you, you know, what ties into the tribute stuff that's interesting, too, is the uh, the whole hologram stuff, the... You know, they had Tupac, the hologram. I don't think we're far away from a tour where you're going to see artists going out on the road who are dead being recreated with a hologram and a live backing band. That's the next thing that's coming down the pike. Lisa in Indiana. Go ahead, Lisa. Yes, uh, I'm a first-time caller, and uh, I've got uh, several things that I'll try to make them quick I'd like to cover. Um, the group Bonham. Who is the lead singer of the early days of Bonham, like the Wait for You period? Yeah, that one. His name is Daniel McMaster, and he passed away a number of years ago. Oh, he did. Yep. Well, I'm, I I must be very, uh, very out of my league then, because I swear to God, I thought for sure that he called Robert Plant and said. Can you do vocals for me? Because he was awesome. Well, yeah, I mean, you're you're going back about 25 years uh, <laughs> that that video and time happened. I mean, that was like late 80s. But yes, that's when Jason was doing a band just called Bonham. And yes, okay. he was very much cut out of the cloth of a young Robert Plant, which obviously made sense for the time. But unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. Okay, I, I'm I'm a Robert Plant fan real big and uh, another thing i wanted to mention is glenn hughes when you told me how old he was i could not believe his vocals to me he is a cross between robert plant and bon scott if there's anything of a hybrid you can make of it well i don't it's know awesome. i don't know about the bon scott thing but i'll tell you lisa he is uh glenn hughes is truly like it's it's crazy and thank you for the call and for listening glenn, glenn hughes is is freakish in his ability to to sing like he does now in his 60s it's remarkable and i just saw it live for myself saturday night uh, it, what this guy can do in the power and range is stunning it's it's crazy. Well, there's so many guys out there that reach a certain period of time. They can't do it anymore. They can't do it nearly as well as they once did. The guy is better than he's ever been. And Lisa touches on something that, you know, struck me when I was watching Glenn, who, as I said, has had a band with Jason Bonham now for a while, both Black Country and now with California Breed. And they did two Zeppelin songs in the set because California Breed is not playing Black Country communion songs. So they have to. They only have one record, so they have to fill it out with some covers. They did Deep Purple Burn. Uh, they did two Zeppelin songs. Something else that I'm forgetting. But anyway, the point is, when I listen to Glenn sing Zeppelin songs, first thing that came into my mind is, Jimmy Page should be calling this guy. I mean, there's your guy. If now the bass would have to come out of his hands because John Paul Jones would have to play bass, but there's your guy and 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 Glenn Hughes was friends with John Bonham and grew up with him. They were buddies, and he knows the Zeppelin guys. I mean, Glenn Hughes was around back in the early seventies doing music, and when I heard him sing the Zeppelin stuff with California Breed, and there's Jason Bonham on drums, I'm like, wow. I wonder if anybody had the idea, plug in Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones into this, and you've got 
got a pretty slamming Zeppelin show. I don't know, it just hit me when I was watching it. Danny in Dallas. Go ahead, Danny. Edward the Great, how are you, sir? I'm good. Thank you, sir. Um, Real quick, I saw the Winery Dogs last weekend here in Dallas, and a couple of things I'd like to touch on. One, it's phenomenal, phenomenal show. I bought the Live in Japan second show DVD. I got it on import when it was released. And it's where they are now compared to then. Way better. Night and day. Yeah, I was not. I was not, and as close as I am to that band. And again, I'm just objective and honest. I was not. I was not impressed with the live thing they put out from Japan. I didn't think they should have put it out after I saw it. Not that it's bad, but they're so beyond that now. It was their second ever show in their history, so it's a little bit much to document that for right. eternity. I would have waited a little bit, but it's not that it's bad. It's just so they're so much better now. They, uh, man, they, they were just completely insane that night. Um, great crowd, great reaction. Where did they play in Dallas? A uh, place called Granada Theater. It holds about a thousand people, and it was it was close to capacity. It wasn't completely sold out, but it was close. Yeah, you know what's funny? I was right. I was not too far away in Oklahoma for uh, Rocklahoma, and I was texting those guys because I, I was there in Oklahoma the day before without much going on, and I was like, "You guys are so close." And they were, I think, they were in San Antonio that night. And we're, I was trying to figure out something to get to them and, and get to a show, but and then they were pissed yeah. off because they were like, "We should have been on Rocklahoma," and I'm like, "Well, I don't have anything to do with that." But uh, anyway, we were we were in the proximity, but we didn't connect uh, at least in person. Well, two things, um, funny you say that, but two things. Um, one, I have seen, I've seen Mike Portnoy with Dream Theater, uh, I don't know how many times, traveled all over to see him and everything, and I honestly have to say he seems the happiest that he's ever been playing in this band. It yeah. was just a perception from the crowd. Yeah, no, he's having a blast, no, no question. All three of them are, for sure. Yes, they are. And another thing. Um, really cool. Lights went out, and they had the you know little curtain drawn and everything, and it started to come up, playing intro music, and then all of a sudden we hear, "Ladies and gentlemen," and me and my buddy looked at each other and went, "That's Eddie Trump." It was really cool to hear your voice at that show. Oh, uh, they're using it. I didn't know if they were using that. They asked me to record uh, an intro for them, which they said they were going to play at the start of every show. And they, I, they were, I recorded it, and they wanted me to uh, to redo it. Thank you, Danny, for the call. And I wasn't sure if they were using it because they wanted me to redo it a slightly different way. Um, but, yeah, it's me introducing them uh, at every show, obviously, via recording. So that's that's very cool. I didn't know that they were actually using it. But my connection with the winery dogs has been well documented because those guys have been nice enough to mention it in almost all the interviews they do. But it was it was my idea uh, to to get Richie into that band and for that band to kind of come together like it did. And I'm so happy for their success. And I'm just a fan. I don't work for them. I have no piece of the band at all. But they're all friends. And I'm a huge fan of all of theirs. And they've always said we. We wish you could come on the road with us and intro us every night because you're like the fourth winery dog. And I said to Portnoy, I said, well, I'd love to run away from home and do that, but I've got bills to pay. Um, unless they're paying a lot to just go out and intro them every night, but that money's not quite there yet. <laughs> so they asked me to record something for them, and I didn't, I didn't know they were using it, but I'm glad to hear that they are. So I'm there in spirit every night, which is very cool of them, and thank you for, for letting me know that, Danny. I'm going to hit them up for residuals now. Uh, it's too funny. Yeah, I wish I could have gotten there to see them. I've, uh, I'm due for a fix to, to see, see those guys, but they're still out there, and I'm hearing from people every day how much they're loving the band, and that's very cool. Let's go to Pennsylvania. Say hello to Frank. Hey, Frank. The money's not quite there. Hey, Eddie, what's going on, man? Hey, man, turn your radio down. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love your show, man. Thank you. Thank you. What do you got? Awesome. Yeah, I, I, two questions. Uh, Pantera. I heard that they were a glam band prior to being being Pantera, but uh, I heard they were Pantera 
called then, and then I heard also other names that they were called. No, they were called Pantera, but they had three, four records before Cowboys from Hell. And, I, I mean, I guess you could say glam. They looked very 80s. I mean, spandex and big hair and all that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's been well documented, and those records exist. Yeah, so more or less my question is, uh, I heard they did a, a cover for uh, Cinderella Shake Me. That I didn't know. I mean, they yeah, may have they may have covered line. it. They may have covered it in in the clubs, but I don't know if they've ever recorded it. Really? Not not that I not that I know of. But Frank, your phone I can still hear myself in the background, and that's messing you and me up. So thank you for the call. But yes, it's it's been well known that the records exist. Pantera had a whole different identity, but they were still a rock band. I mean, when people say they were a glam band, they just looked like any band from the late 80s would look at the time. They weren't the band that they later became. They evolved into the whole Cowboys from Hell thing and that look and sound and got much more aggressive with their look and their sound. I often said this, and I, I just did an interview with someone the other day, and I brought it up. I think that one of the greatest things that happened for Pantera were those those early records were not successful. Because if the early records were successful, then Pantera would have been lumped in with every other band from the 80s and never had a shot in the 90s. But because those records were on indie labels and they were not successful, to most people, Cowboys from Hell was the first Pantera record. And instead of becoming... 80s cast-offs, they instead became the total opposite, the flag bearers for metal in the 90s. It's interesting when you think about it. But if they would have been successful in the 80s, they would have been crushed like everybody else. So the best thing that happened for them was the lack of success when they first got together with those first few records. Ton of calls here coming in. I'm going to take calls to the top of the hour. Another 11 minutes, then play some more music, and then wrap it up, as we always do, uh, with a few more calls uh, at around 940 Eastern. So two more rounds. Uh, calls for the next 10 will go as quick as possible. New and classic music till around 940 Eastern, and then we wrap up again on the phones with you guys. It's been a fun show. Very rare to have no in-studio guests, but I wanted to get to some music and some conversation with you guys, and that's exactly what we're doing. Our live get-together on Mondays on Sirius XM 39, what becomes Trunk Nation, 6 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Live music and talk. That rocks. North Carolina. Keith, go ahead, Keith. So, Eddie, I'm a huge KISS fan of, of the original group, and um, I decided to buy the latest album. I think it's called Monsters. And when I listen to this album, I know that these guys are performing and looking like the original Peter Chris and Ace Frehley, but I really think that Gene and Paul or whoever's making these decisions are doing a disservice to themselves because what you have is this way the guy plays the lead guitar is like a caricature of Ace Frilly, but it has no heart and it has no soul because the way Ace played was very simple but he really brought a lot of soul to the sound and when I listen to these licks, I don't feel anything I can groove with and I'm thinking this sounds like a character of the way the man plays it so it doesn't have anything, any teeth to it what do you think about that? Well, I, I agree, Keith Totally. I mean, I've talked about this nonstop for a long time now. And beyond the beyond the other thing about the whole situation with Kiss is a lot's made of the, the visual that they're wearing the costumes, the makeup of, of Ace and Peter. But beyond that, you, you use the word disservice, and I agree 100%. Tommy and Eric are their own musicians. They both have histories as musicians before Kiss. Eric Singer's played with a ton of people. Tommy Thayer was, had four albums on Geffen Records with Black and Blue. So, but they're clearly being told they have to play and within the confines of the people that they are. And again, I'm sorry, you can... People can slam me all the time, whatever they want about using this word, but there's no other word that sums it up, impersonating. So when you, I'm sorry, but when you're dressing, moving, acting, playing, looking, 
like somebody, that's impersonating somebody. There's, that's not, there's no other word for it. And as we talked about earlier, it's not their fault. That is the orders from above. But it is very limiting, I would think, to them as musicians. Because Eric Singer has a style way beyond what he has to play when he's in that role of Peter Chris. Tommy has a, a real almost southern rock sort of style to his playing. You're not going to get much of that with him in the persona of Ace slash Spaceman. Because, again, as our listener said, and he's right, he's got to conform to that sort of vibe. So it's it's a it's limiting all the way around. It's limiting because you're you have to look like someone, but you they're clearly having to play in that style, and that comes from Paul, who produces the records. You have to. They have to. Now imagine if they didn't wear makeup and they just went and they could be the musicians that they are and put their own style on the records. Then you'd have something pretty interesting, I would think. But that is not what the mandate is. Rich in Jersey. Go ahead, Rich. You're on the air. Hey, Eddie. How you doing? Good, man. Good. Uh, it's great to talk to you. First time caller. Thank uh, you. Just want to say thanks for everything. Uh, it's, you know, your voice for us uh, for, all these, for all these years and everything you've done. Love everything you do. Agree with you at least 99% of the time. They may do once in a while, but overall. That's okay. That's what makes it fun, man. It's like all the debate. and the, nobody. You don't have to agree, but I appreciate what you're saying, Rich. But it's all. I love the differing opinions. I love having the discussion. To me, it's it's healthy. So it's all good. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I love, like you say, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I'm a huge Kiss fan. I uh, couldn't agree, like you say, I love the, the Ace, the new Ace song that you played. As soon as it starts off, listen to, you know, you know it's Ace right off the bat. Yeah. It's a great song. Um, again, like the one gentleman said, when it comes to a live albums, Kiss Alive, uh, there's nothing, no other album that got me more interested in heavy metal, rock and roll than that album. You know, that, that sucked me right in. You and many um, others. Yeah, I know. Uh, and I agree with you on the same thing. Saxon, couldn't agree with you more when you said that. That was right off the bat. Another band I think was very underrated. Um, but, I, again, uh, what I was reading, I was calling a big band that you're a fan of, I've been a huge fan of. And maybe what you said before is maybe the reason we're not seeing anything from them, maybe because there's a lack of interest or maybe not nobody backing them. Uh, the band Angel, have you heard anything on them at all? There's nothing going on, Rich. I mean, that, it's a band that comes up and people ask me about quite often. I did a whole section on them in my second book that came out last year, and I got a lot of reaction to including Angel in volume two of my, my books. Positive reaction, tons of positive reaction. And I always say the same thing. Angel is a band people either loved or never heard of. And unfortunately, there's many more that never heard of them because they never had a hit. And they the, the, the real version of the band broke up around 1980. But it, it could just ties into everything else we've talked about with any band that was never truly, really successful. I mean, how do you put a tour together? How do you finance it? How do you go out on the road? Angel had a huge stage show. So nobody's paying for that. There's no money for that. There's no, they couldn't pull enough people. There wouldn't be enough interest. Uh, it's just it's a catch-22. You can't go out and play unless you know you're going to get an offer from a promoter that's going to cover your nut and also maybe make you a few bucks. And when you have bands that didn't, that were not successful 20, 30, 40 years ago, where are the people coming from in 2014? So that's that's the problem. Uh, the guys, some of the guys are still around. Frank Domino is uh, lives in Vegas. He has a band with Oz Fox called Vinyl Tattoo. As a matter of fact, uh, myself, Don, and Jim are doing our, our live show at Vamped in Vegas on August 21st, and I found out that Frank is going to be one of the bands playing that night around our set, so I'm psyched for that. And Frank can still sing great. Uh, Greg Jeffrey is in the casino business now. So it's just... If there was real demand for it, maybe a one-off show, who knows, but it's just hard. But the, if you were listening, that the Kiss Def Leppard tour is uh, struggling and that the show at the Forum is half sold. Well, if you got two bands with that name value, regardless of what you think of either band, you've got two of those logos on a ticket, and that's 
soft. <laughs> you know, outside of maybe putting some people in a club, what's Angel going to do? Not easy. I say all the time, that other word, music, business, the other word is huge. Sometimes huger than the first word in that equation. John in Tennessee. Go ahead, John. Yeah, uh, I got a comment, then, but before I got a question. Uh, that uh, drummer, Brian Tishy, did he used to be in uh, Mr. Crowley, the tribute band? I don't know. He was in White Snake most recently, though. Yeah, this was back when he when you first started talking about him. I think I saw him one time in Knoxville. Great player, great player. Uh, killer. But uh, here's my comment. Uh, maybe you ought to start pitching to Peter and Ace and uh, the Kulik brothers and uh, uh, Vincent that maybe they ought to get them a singer and all of them go out together <laughs> and uh, record an album, you know, with all original stuff and go out under a different name and put it back into their face. It's... I mean, <laughs> John, it's a nice idea. I'm going to cut you off right there, though, because it's never going to happen in a million years. First of all, find Vinnie Vincent. He lives in Tennessee where you're calling from. Maybe you'll find him because he's gone underground and no one's seen or heard from him in about 20 years. Secondly, what a lot of people just don't understand is that these guys don't all hang out together. They don't, they're not... Ace just finished a solo record and has a solo deal. This has his own band. He's not going to go put a band together with Bruce Kulick. It's just not going to happen. Bruce Kulick plays in Grand Funk. He has a nice gig. He's been happy. He's not going to go do that. Peter Chris doesn't even really play much anymore. He's 68 years old. Drumming is physical. It's hard. He doesn't want to go tour in, in a situation like that. I mean, there's... Everybody can have these sort of <laughs> fantasies, but it's just not reality. That's not how any of these guys think, and it's just it's just not happening. Thank you for the call. Let's go to Seattle. Hi, Eric. You're on the air. Eddie Trunk. Oh, for a man with no faith. If I had a religion, you would be my religion. Oh, thank you, man. I'm gonna. I may have to start a church, the church of the <laughs> church of something. I don't know what, but thank you. Yeah, I, I'd be front pew. I, I appreciate. I, I, I had a, I had a uh, just to wrap up in a nutshell. Uh, my all time favorite band, Tesla. Mm -hmm. uh, they got a new album coming out uh, the sixth of this month. Um, I wanted to, I want to know just in a nutshell what's your view on them around all, all, all the way around this and what do you think of the new uh, new guitarist uh, and uh, on this whole uh, on this whole uh, uh, touring thing with these uh, uh, these bands I yeah. I uh, I actually have the new Tesla record sitting right here uh, I don't know if I can pl I've been playing the track so divine which is the single I don't know if I can play anything else from it yet they haven't given okay. me the green light but I've had it for a while and I really as far as what I think of Tesla I've said it many many times I they were of of the bands, the hard rock bands to come out of the eighties, Tesla was my Tesla and Skid Row. I thought were the two best. Um, I think they had the two best. They they had great material, great bands, great live, great dual guitar playing, great music that still holds up so well today. And Tesla's still making great records. Uh, this new album sounds really good. I liked the last one. Bust a Nut was a super underrated record, I thought. And uh, they Tesla does things very smart. You know, they, they actually have a little bit better of a draw than a lot of other bands that had their level of success because they don't over tour. They make they don't come around too much where they burn everybody out. Uh, that's it's they, they just do they do things in a in a in a, in a really good way. They don't. They're just a band. They always were just a, a jeans and T-shirt band with two guitars that comes out and just has fun and blazes and they're they're great they're great people they're a great band they've got great records that have held up for a long time they're just the real deal what you see is what you get and uh i've loved them since day one and i still do and they're one of the better bands they're still four-fifths of the original lineup you asked me what i thought of the new guitar player dave has been there for a long time i'll be honest with you i love tommy and i miss tommy uh tommy had his demons and his issues but i think if tommy's not there you couldn't find a better guy to fill that spot than Dave Root has. So 
And there's, by the way, if you're a fan of Tesla and, and Dave's, there's more of Dave on this new record. There's some cool harmony guitar stuff and things like that. So I didn't know the record was a week away from coming out. Maybe I can play different songs from it. I don't know, but I don't want to. These guys gave me the record a long time ago, so I don't want to undercut whatever their, their timing is on stuff. But it's a solid record. It's called Simplicity. I'll play So Divine, a track from it, which I know I can play before we go back to the phones again in about uh, 40 minutes from now. Thank you for the call. And if I do start that church, I'll, I'll be sure to make sure you're first in line for the, uh, the collection basket. <laughs> I'm just kidding, buddy. Thank you. Appreciate the support. Man, these lines are completely jammed here. Um, and I promised I was going to go back to music at this point, and that's what I'm going to do. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to I'm going to play some music till around uh, for about the next half hour or so. Let's play some of the stuff we've been talking about, and some other things I want to share with you musically. And again, if you're a new listener, by now you figured out that this is both a talk show and a music show. That's why I call it music and talk that rocks. So with that in mind. Let's play you some music and a few more requests. And then around 9.30 Eastern, around that time, we'll open the phones to you guys again. And for the last 20 minutes or so, as we always do, we'll be yours to finish up the show. Follow on Twitter, at Eddie Trunk, Facebook slash Eddie Trunk, Instagram, Eddie Trunk Official, EddieTrunk.com, the official online home. All the appearances I have coming up right on the homepage Trunk Nation shirts, hats in the merch store on my site. Been great going out there to some shows and seeing people rocking the Eddie Trunk Trunk Nation shirts. I really appreciate you guys representing like that. You can buy them right on my site in the merch store or at my appearances. And again, appearances coming up. This Friday, I'll be in Lupo's or at Lupo's, Providence, Rhode Island. These are with Don and Jim, live stand-up shows, Lupo's Friday, Comedy Connection, Chicopee Mass this Saturday. I'll be hosting Rockasha and Waukesha, Wisconsin, June 21st. Be hosting D. Snyder, Vince Neal, Tom Kiefer, Grand Victoria Casino, Elgin, Illinois, June 22nd. Doing a book signing July 16th, Retroactive, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, 5 to 7 p.m. July 16th. Both books available for sale on site. August 2nd, myself, Don, and Jim, Wilbur Theater, Boston. I'll be hosting Rock in the Rivers, Three Forks, Montana, August 8th and 9th. Me, Don, and Jim at Vamped in Vegas, August 21. The Whiskey, August 22nd in Hollywood, California. And August 23rd, Ramona Main Stage, Ramona, California. And confirmed July 25 and 26, myself, Don, and Jim, Thunder Valley Casino, Lincoln, California. Anthrax, Living Color, Corey Taylor among the artists performing with us. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Everything on the homepage of my site, additions, subtractions, renovations, all there for you when you stop by on eddytrunk.com. Wrap it up at 866-315-2663 for a few minutes here until the top of the hour when we end for the week. Real quick, tons of tweets, requests, and people asking me about a new season of That Metal Show, and I have to answer the same way as I always do. We do not know when. We never know when. We're talking to Fred about his... TV show that he's working on, and it's the same deal in TV land. I mean, you finish a season, you wait for the word that you're going to get to do more. And that's what we're doing, and the network decides when, where, and if. And that's totally the norm. People get panicky when I talk like that because they, they think that that means something's wrong, but it's not. It's the way it has been in the history of the show every time we finish a season. I wish, like you, that we were on more consistently, more regularly with new shows. I have nothing to do with it. I have no control over it. All the things that the viewers want are the same things that I want. But I don't own VH1 Classic, unfortunately. So I wait like you guys and hope for new ones soon. But I, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be till the fall. But as soon as I have information, I will post and share on the outlets I just told you about. And talk about it here as well. All right, your turn to finish up the show. Last 15 minutes are yours. Lines are jammed. We'll move quickly. Get as many calls in as we can to uh, finish up tonight's edition 
of Trunk Nation. James in Pennsylvania. Go ahead, James. Hey, Eddie, how you doing? I'm good, thanks. Okay, uh, I love your show, and I'm a huge Kiss fan. My question to you is, when Eric Carr first joined the band, after Peter left, um, they played the Palladium in New York City. Do you know if that was ever taped or recorded or anything? I was there. I was there, too. I was there. I was, uh, I think it was in... Was it in, was it in January? Yeah. I think the 25th of January, if I'm not mistaken, 1980. As a matter of fact, if you have my first book, the the uh, the pages that open the first section on Kiss, there's a, a full shot across two pages of, of Gene, Ace, and Paul with Eric Carr playing, and that is from that show. That's from the Palladium in 1980. Yeah. Uh, I don't... I don't think it was ever filmed. I, I I wouldn't know. I think if it was filmed in any way, it probably would have come out by now, but I don't think it was. Right. I have a very special moment to tell you about. I met Eric Carr in the Brooklyn Zoo in Sheepshead Bay when I was about 13 years old, and he was just a wonderful, wonderful guy. He was the best. He really was, James. Thank you for the call. He was a dear friend. That first book that I did, I, I dedicated to him and Dio because there were two people that I uh, I, I was so, so so close with beyond the music industry that we were friends, we hung out, there was a real connection, and they were real people. And that's why when uh, my first book came out a couple years ago, Ronnie had just passed away, so that was very fresh. But Eric Carr had been gone 15 years, but I still wanted to dedicate the book to him because he was one of the few guys that I had that sort of connection with, and I, I do miss all the time still after nearly 20 years since he passed. But a great, great guy. Thank you for the call. Dave in Baltimore. Go ahead, Dave. Hey, Eddie, how you doing? I just wanted to call and say your your hit on Kiss is dead on, 100%. I, I respect your opinion 100%. And a caller called in earlier asking about Lemmy. Uh, Jim Florentine, you cohort from that metal show and his metal midget show on uh, the Boneyard, said he did an interview with Mickey D and said that Lemmy's doing better than ever. And uh, his shows lately have been great. A little shorter, but he's dead on and doing really great. So it's great to hear that he's doing great. I just thought I'd share that because you always say we should utilize the Internet and other Internets to find out how bands are doing. And I just wanted to share that and uh, say thanks for everything you do. And Well, uh, thank I'll you, Dave. That. I appreciate that very much, and that's great news. The only thing I would caution about with that, and I'm not saying for a minute that Mickey didn't say that to Jim, but unfortunately the truth of the matter is, and I, I am not for a minute saying this is the case with Lemmy because I just do not know. But I do know that history has proven, especially when talking about Dio, who I just mentioned, when any, whenever anybody of any notoriety, celebrity, what have you, is ill or battling an illness, they never... Nobody ever from their camp, their PR, their management, bandmates, anybody will ever put out anything but positive vibes and answers to that question. How is the person doing? For a lot of reasons. It's private, number one. Number two, they don't want anything but positive vibes circulating out there. And in a lot of cases, the person that's ill doesn't even speak of it and doesn't want it spoken of. I'll give you another example. We were talking throughout the show about Glenn Hughes, who I'm close with, and the life Glenn has led and how great of a singer Glenn Hughes is. Glenn Hughes just revealed like a week ago and just talked about in detail for the first time on my terrestrial radio show last weekend Friday, this past Friday, that he had open heart surgery and almost died, like super close to dying, but never revealed it until just now. So my only point about saying that, and God knows I hope that's the case, and God knows I hope Lemmy's with us for a long time to come, but it's very hard Ever, in any level of the media, and my experience has been this consistently, when you try to find out how is somebody doing, how is somebody really doing, you're never going to get the real answer. Because they're always going to say, great, no problem. 
because they don't want it out there any other way. So it's just hard to sometimes get the real deal. Not saying for a minute Lemmy's not okay, but I'm just saying you can't really get a straight answer on anybody ever. Glenn Hughes was in the hospital, open heart, and his friends, most of his friends didn't even know that was going on. Because guys and their public just tend to keep a lot of stuff under wraps like that. Uh, this is Brett in California. Hi, Brett. Hey, Eddie. How you doing? I'm good. Hey, um, I would just, I know you went to the Jimmy Page or the Led Zeppelin uh, listening party yep. a while ago. Uh, it was, was a few weeks ago, about three weeks ago, actually. Yeah, yeah. And, and you talked to Jimmy about maybe coming on the metal show. I mean, what kind of uh, input did you get from him on that? <laughs> well, here's <laughs> the deal. Um, I went to this listening event. Zeppelin's remasters are coming out. Yeah. And they played some of the tracks, and Jimmy Page was there, and he did take questions. There was only about 35, 40 people at the entire thing. So it was a really cool afternoon. And, I mean, listen, to sit in a room with 35 people and hear Jimmy Page play Led Zeppelin, I mean, that's just crazy. Um, I didn't talk to Jimmy directly about coming on that metal show. Oh. I talked to the person who works with him very closely. And I've been talking about it for a long time. There are, some artists have a problem with the word metal. They don't yeah. want an association with metal. And he is a guy, and there are some artists that are scared off by that. Their, their impression is that it's just going to be Neanderthal stuff, and it's going to be, you know, cliche metal bullshit stuff. Jimmy has never seen the show. So he doesn't know what we really do. He also doesn't know that we've had people that we, regardless of the name, which a lot of people would be surprised to know, I fought against that name when the show was put, first put together for this exact reason. But regardless of the name, people realize that this, that, that metal show is rock, hard rock metal. And we've yep. had Paul Rogers on, we've had Brian May on, we've had Leslie West on, we've had Mick Jones, a foreigner, we've had Sticks. We have those artists with the metal artists, and that's what I tried to explain to this person who works with Jimmy. So he had said to me, it's not out of the question, just get me some tapes so I can show him so he realizes that it's really just a talk show called that, and that, you know, he's not going to be sitting on there with some death metal band he knows nothing about. So I yeah, think that's so what we need to work we have a good I think we have a good chance. Then. I think there's a chance. Yeah. yeah, I think there's a chance, but I, I think, uh, Brett, that before I can even talk about, and thank you for your call, booking guests, whoever it is, I need to know when and where we're doing the show next. I mean, I get tweeted constantly, and hey, you got to have this person on. I can't start to look at people we're going to have on until I have a schedule, and I don't have a schedule even yet. But when the fall rolls around, which is when we're supposed to do it again, the next wave of Zeppelin remasters should be coming out. And if the stars align and I can get some footage in front of Jimmy to show him what we really do, then I, I think there's a pretty good chance. Rob in Florida. Go ahead, Rob. Eddie, I just want to ask, what exactly is it that makes Eddie Trunk so awesome? Oh, stop it now. Thank you, Rob, but I appreciate that. But I, I couldn't answer that, but I appreciate the well, sentiment. Well, you know where that um, I Actually, Eddie, really, really wanted to say is I know you always say that you don't have anything to do with um, Trunk Nation or Hair Nation or the other channels on. TV. No, no, I have everything. I have everything to do with the four hours that I'm on from 6 to 10 Eastern right, on Monday. Right. Outside of that, I have absolutely nothing to do with this entire service. Not just this channel, anything on this entire platform. Well, I, I was just going to say that I think you maybe you have a little more influence than you realize. I mean, I, uh, you are, are the vast majority of the reason why I subscribed to the service after my free trial ran out. And you are 100% of the reason that I subscribed to the Internet radio portion so I can get you on my phone and on the Internet. Um, and, you know, I just I just want you to know, I, I think maybe you have a little more pull or you could have a little more pull than you. Rob, unfortunately, unfortunately, I know for a fact that I don't hear um, and I, I can't I'm not going to get into the ins and outs of my situation here. But to be totally as, as transparent as I can, um, there's so much more I'd love to do and want to do. Uh, but uh, I'm I am. I, 
I, I have so many things I'd love to say, but it's very, very difficult for me to even, quite honestly, uh, come in and do this show live on Mondays with what I'm given to work with, if that kind of makes any sense. Um, Katie, right. who just left here, who handles the phones, uh, I think I'm pretty much the only one who does a live show with calls that their phone screener works for free. Okay, so I, I'm, it's as bare bones as it gets. Okay. And I have tried for 12 years to try to better this situation here and have not had much success. But, Rob, I can tell you, and I just have to move along because I'm running out of time, and I can't thank you enough for your, your support and your kind words. But I can tell you the reason why I do this show is because of people like you. And it's probably the only reason why I've done it for as long as I have and continue to. Because wherever I go in the country, I hear from people who feel that passionately about it. And that's the reason why I come in. Uh, I'm not asking anybody to feel sympathy for me, but, I mean, listen, I, I live an hour from New York City. It can cost 100 bucks alone when you factor in gas tolls and parking to come in. There's tons of pe 99% of stuff is recorded. And people do it from their homes and stuff. I actually believe in coming in and doing a live show, talking with you guys, connecting with you guys, giving stuff away, taking your requests. That's what I love to do. So I love to do it, and I'm so grateful because it blows me away these little four hours a week that I have. How many of you guys love it, have the service because of it, said what you just said. But there are a lot of obstacles here for me. Um, to, to keep this thing going, and I'm doing my best with what I have to work with. Um, and I have sometimes technical issues as well, like my phone's just locked up and I can't pick up any more calls. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of nuts, but I'm so grateful for the support and the audience that I do have that cares about live, interactive, real, unfiltered radio based on music. And uh, I believe that that is extremely important to do. You know, you could easily record tracks and send them in and just have some music, but I like doing this. You know, I was listening to Howard Stern this morning, and he was talking about a radio station in New York that uh, the DJs were all fired, and they changed the format, and they told the DJs to never give their last names on the radio because they were irrelevant and didn't mean anything. That's where, unfortunately, radio has gone, unless you carve something out that people listen for you. It's not a case of ego. It's a case of survival. I talk about it all the time. You could easily, literally mail in radio shows these days. But if you don't do something unique and creative and different that people listen because it's you, you will be replaced by a computer. It is happening and has happened every day. And I've said this before on terrestrial radio. You guys, your local FM radio station, tons of what you think are your local afternoon DJ is recorded. Could be the same guy on 20 stations and you just don't know it. So it's, it's as a guy that's been in radio 30 years, I can see where this is going and I think that it's unfortunate. And I just try to keep it as different and fresh and interactive as possible because that's the only thing that's kind of computer proof. Otherwise, uh, it's it's really tough. But it's very tough for me here <laughs> sometimes for a lot of reasons, and uh, this is not a money play at all because this, this is just about me and my love of doing it and you guys and all the support you show me, and that's why this show, even for the four hours it's on, exists. And I have asked and tried for over a decade to uh, have a bigger footprint and do more and grow this, and uh, I'll be... Brutally honest, it's incredibly frustrating to look around and see opportunities and things that are afforded to others that uh, after 30 years in radio, I can't get somebody to answer my phones paid. And I can barely get paid, but it's what I love doing, and I, I love the hell out of the fact that you guys care so much. Like our caller said, reason he keeps the service, the people I hear that sit in their cars because they want to hear the interview or hear what somebody's going to say, that to me is what radio is about. So thank you all for that. And with that, I'm just about out of time. Thanks to Fred Corey for checking in. Uh, speaking of drummers, don't forget my buddy Brian Tishy is doing the uh, Randy Rhodes Remembered uh, series of shows, about four or five of them. So be sure to check them out. The dates are on eddytrunk.com. Get a couple in right now. 
and 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 try to just uh, say hello to a couple people before we have to end for a Wednesday. Rick in New York, go ahead, Rick. Hey Ed, uh, I'm really excited. I got two things I want to discuss here really quick. I'm excited about the top twenty Van Halen next week, but I'm really looking forward to an ACDC top twenty. And let me explain to you why. Number one, I'm far more of a fan of the Bon Scott era of ACDC. But Back in Black is my favorite ACDC album, if that makes sense. It does. And I could actually put every song on Back in Black on my top 20. And if you listen to classic rock radio, I think every song on Back in Black has been in rotation in some point in time. That's one of those albums, start to finish, it's there's, there's not a clunker on it. So hopefully you'll get to do an ACDC one, and an, a Maiden one would be great too. But uh, another thing I wanted to ask you, uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I felt really bad for Dire Strait. I mean, come on. Like, no one even inducted them, like, said anything. And usually if their band is not going to play, some other musicians will go up afterwards. I don't know if they did it and they just didn't show it on the broadcast. Like, I Yeah, you're right. I, Rick, I didn't even... I didn't think of that, Rick. I think you're right. There was nobody that spoke for them, did they? No those one spoke those guys just stood up no there. Mu- you know, no musicians came up and even played any of the songs. And I don't even think the three guys that were there were even part. I don't even know how many of them were original members. Because I'm not that big of a fan of them. But right. <laughs> I, I, felt real, I felt really bad for them. I was Eddie. like, wow. Eddie. Well, hold on, Rick. Ed's got some insights I, here. Hold on, Rick. I believe they are the first. They're the first inductees in Rock and Roll Hall of Fame history to not have another artist induct them. And what was the reason for that, though? That I, I have no idea. I, I mean, there's no have, way you. There's no way they couldn't find some. Maybe they couldn't agree on someone to do that it. Could be it. But shit, they could have found any radio guy that would have went up there oh, and done it if they just I needed somebody to go do it. I mean, hell, you you look at the Moody Blues. Ann Wilson volunteered. Yeah. I don't know, Rick. That's a good had, point. And they could have had another, you know, young band come up and play Sultans of Swing or, you know, something like that. They, I just felt like there was just like an oversight there. And one question, who played bass in place of uh, Benjamin Orr for the cars? Oh, uh, it was the guy from Weezer. Yeah, they mentioned oh, that. Was, they, I, yeah, they mentioned that in their induction. So. That makes a lot of sense because I know Rick Ocasek was their uh, producer on their three biggest uh, charting yeah, albums. Uh, so. Scott, yeah, Scott Schreiner of Weezer. Hey, Rick, thanks. I got to go, man. But that's a great point. I didn't think of that. But it's not unprecedented for bands not to play or to have anybody play in tribute to them because the same thing happened with Kiss. Now, Tom Morello inducted Kiss, but Kiss just stood up there, did their thing, and they not only did they not play because they couldn't get it together because Gene and Paul wouldn't let Ace and Peter play, but they also did a uh, good point. They didn't have another band play in tribute to them, which, like, when Van Halen and Eddie and and Alex didn't show up, Velvet Revolver played the tribute to Van Halen, if I remember. So you're right, but it's not unprecedented to not have any music at all live performed by the band or a tribute to. What is, though, strange, which I did not realize until he pointed it out, is they literally had nobody even go up and say a few words about them, which is really strange. And I don't know what the reason for that would be, because you literally could get... I mean, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame always wants a big celebrity name doing that, or some sort of real cred name. But still, just for the sake of doing it, you could easily have found somebody who could have went up there and said something for five minutes. I don't know what that was about. That's a great point. I I do not know. And again, I, and I talked extensively a few days ago about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because I had finally watched the broadcast. But the big shock to me, too, one of the big shocks was Bon Jovi having playing with Richie Sambora and playing a song and Richie playing a song from the band's new album that he had nothing to do with and really going for it and singing the harmony with John like it was living on a prayer that he wrote with him. That was unbelievable to me. That was a huge thing for Richie to do. Kudos to him for doing that. 
and a ballsy thing for John to say, yeah, we know you're not in the band anymore, but we got a new record out, and you're playing this song with us from it. That was the song when we were us, right? Yeah. That's amazing, man. That was an amazing... I don't think... I think that escaped a lot of people, the the enormity of that. It's, it's a big statement on both of their parts to, as a unity thing. They did... Mario. Four, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. What were you going to say? No, I was just going to say they did four songs, Bon Jovi. You Give Love a Bad Name, It's My Life, the new one, When We Were Us, and Living on a Prayer. And they did not televise It's My Life. Instead, they televised When We Were Us, which, of course, Sambora was part of It's My Life. So that another was a big statement. I mean, that's John being the shrewd guy he is and the consummate businessman promotional guy saying to the Hall of Fame, hey, we're not going to be looked at as just a retro band. We're playing a new song and you're going to televise it from our new record because I can guarantee you the Hall of Fame would have much rather shown another hit so or at least a, a more classic song. So that was a huge thing on a lot of levels that I think escaped a lot of people. Mario, go ahead, man. Yeah, Eddie, great to, great to hear you. A um, couple things real quick. I wanted to call last week when you were talking about the, the classic artists and where they don't play new songs, and then you're talking about holograms, and I want to give you a quick uh, axiom from Irving Azoff in the music industry, and it is the people don't know what they like. They like what they know in the music industry, and that's why the holograms might work and why people want to go see bands like Bon Jovi and sing all the songs. You're talking about documentaries. I'm going to recommend Planned one to you by Mike Myers, who produced it. It's called Supermensch. It's about Shep Gordon, and I'm sure oh, you I've know seen who it. Shep Gordon is. Okay. Sure, and I've All seen right. I've oh. seen the documentary. As a matter of fact, Mario, there was a documentary done a, a just before Supermensch, and thank you for the call about Alice Cooper. I think it was called Super Duper Alice Cooper. And that was almost done all in like uh, drawings and cartoons and narration. I didn't care for that that much. I would have, I, I think there's still a great Alice Cooper doc to be done. However, Supermensch, which was about Alice Cooper's manager, as you rightly say, Shep Gordon and the people that he also managed and influenced is tremendously well done. And I, I think that's actually a better doc than the one that was done on Alice that came out just a few months before. Not, to, not that the Alice one was bad. It's just very different. They took a different approach to doing it. But the, the one on his manager, Super, Supermensch, is also very, very good. I would, uh, I would, agree, I would agree with you on that. Uh, let's say hello to my, uh, Mitchell, who's in Indiana. Mitchell, what's going on? Hey, Eddie, how are you doing today? Good, Mitch. I got about a minute, so go ahead, man. Hey, I just I wanted to ask you if you'd heard of Ace's new song, Bronx Boy, and what you thought about it. I did. I heard when it first came out. I think it's okay. I mean, I, I I love Ace. You know, he's a dear friend. I love everything he does. I think it's okay. I it's not rip it out. <laughs> you know, it's not it's not um, it's not shock me. But it's 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 good. I mean, right. I'm not I, I'm not gonna go crazy over it. I'm not gonna kill it. I just think it's good. It's the spirit of Ace. It's what he does, and I look forward to hearing what the full record sounds like, including a couple songs he co-wrote with Gene. Yeah, I'm I'm excited about. Do you, do you know when that record is uh, set to release? I don't. I was supposed to see Ace personally last week when i was in maryland a week or so ago for m3 where he played i i i was uh i was out of m3 a little earlier than expected during that weekend so i didn't get a chance to see him although i was back at the hotel and i was going to go see him but he was uh, he was taking a nap i didn't get a chance to talk to him so we text here and there and i know he's been working very hard on the record finishing it up i believe it'll be out by the end of this year but i haven't heard an exact date hey sorry if i didn't get to your calls you guys your calls and we will begin on line number one in Kentucky with Eric as our first caller. Welcome, Eric. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of things about Chris Cornell. Um, first off, I mean, I don't want to tell you my whole life story, but I, I grew up in the 90s. I sort of missed the early 90s music scene, but since I was a teenager, is when I got into that type of music, and Chris Cornell was always, like, my singer. That was the one singer I looked up to the most. And I've seen him countless times with, you know, solo, with Soundgarden. I got to see the Temple of the Dog reunion a couple years ago. 
And um, I actually get to meet Chris Cornell, too. I don't know if he really did very many of those VIP meet and greet type deals, but I actually won a contest off his website a couple of years ago and got to go backstage and meet him before one of his acoustic shows in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And um, like I said, I don't know if he charged for those type of things, so I don't know how he would act in that type of a situation. But out of all, like I've done more meet and greets with different bands since then, but that one was the most like intimate, like we actually get to me and like two or three other people who won the contest off his website. We got to go in his dressing room backstage before the show. And he spent a good 10, 15 minutes sitting there talking to us. I mean, it was like you actually got to sit down and talk to the guy. So and, Eric, you didn't, this was not a paid thing. This was a contest that you won, right? Yeah. Yeah. I won a yeah. contest for, for, uh, it had to do with his new album he put out in 2015. Yeah, but, that's a big um, that's a big distinction, you know, because if you do a, if if you do paid meet and greets, obviously people are paying, and there's a lot of people, and if they they usually cut those at 50 or 100 or whatever it is, so you're going to get moved through quicker. Sometimes you don't allow you're not allowed to take your own photo. Sometimes they'll take it and you download it off a site. It's all about getting people in and getting out. But when you're doing something like what you're talking about, which was you won a contest and you had a chance to really spend some time, I would imagine that would have been a much cooler experience. Yeah, and he was just, I mean, like I said, it was only 10 or 15 minutes, So, but I, I got to sit there and talk to him about Temple of the Dog, and this is going back like 2015, so it was a year before any of the Temple of the Dog reunion stuff was announced, and I was asking him at the time, because I'd never heard him sing one of the songs off the Temple of the Dog record called Times of Trouble. That's always been one of my favorite uh, songs that he did. And I asked him, I was like, are you ever going to sing that again? And he he sat there right next to me and he was like, you know, um, I probably will pretty soon. But he didn't mention what it was for or anything. But he actually said to me, you know, that song is not exactly that easy to sing is why I don't mm. sing it that often. Because he would hit some crazy notes in that song. So, but yeah. Well, Eric, I appreciate it. I got a bunch of calls, and I, I wanted to give you a few minutes there to remember Chris, and I'm glad that he meant so much to you and you had a great experience with him. Um, but I just got to move on because I got so many people waiting to get on. But I, I appreciate a few minutes, man, and thank you for uh, for sharing your story. Thanks. I appreciate it. All right, Eric, take care. Let's go to uh, Tom, who's in Pennsylvania. Hey, Tom, what's going on? Hey, Eddie, can you hear me all right? I got you, bud. I'm only asking if you're going to fan blown on me, and sometimes that sounds like you're underwater. No, you're good. Go ahead, man. All right. Uh, I'm looking over this Billboard Music Awards on online, her website, and once yeah. again, it looks like they're ignoring our music rock. You want to read some down? Tom, Tom, let me ask Tom, let me ask you this. Would you like my blood pressure to remain in normal <laughs> levels or would you like to read me some of the bands and uh and some of the acts? Well, according to your fans, they love hear it when you go crazy, but they, they do. Not, it's okay. Well, is there let me ask you this, Tom, is there any semblance sniff of an electric guitar anywhere in the roster? Anything remotely resembling rock music? Oh, does uh where the hell is it? I'm looking at the site now. I have the nominees here, Eddie. Ed, yeah, Ed, Ed, Tom, I'm going to let you go because I do hear your fan. Thank you, but I'm glad you're staying cool. And I'm glad you. I'm glad, as they say, you called in to poke the bear, as my producer on VH1 Classic for that metal show used to say. <laughs> Ed, go ahead and uh, let me know. Is there anything close to rock? Well, they have a top rock artist category, Eddie. Would you like to know the nominees? Yes, and I'd like to know who's performing because you figure a two or three I mean, hour show, well. Billboard Music Awards, rock is part of music, so somebody's got to be playing. Well, I'll look that up in a sec, but let me just Please. tell you the nominees for top rock artist uh, are Imagine Dragons, Linkin Park, Portugal the Man. That's one, Portugal the Man. Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers and Twenty One Pilots. God, I hate that Jesus fucking group. God Almighty. Now, two and here we, wait, wait, wait. Let, let's be honest. Why is Tom let's, Petty there? Yeah, right. Yeah. What? Why is Lincoln Park there? 
Is it been a year since their last record? Well, you know where I'm going uh, with obviously, this. Obviously, great. Of course, I know where you're going. <laughs> They're dead. How fucking predictable! You fucking clueless idiots. Like you'd ever honor those bands before if tragically they didn't have members that were dead. God, are you predictable? Ugh. Let's put them in because they had guys that died and maybe we'll get cool tributes. Fucking idiots. Just not a clue in life. Yeah, I really wonder if anybody over there spent the time to listen to the Linkin Park record. And realized it was a huge departure for Linkin Park and hugely polarizing even to their fans. But let's make it a top record because the singer is di died. Oh, God, I hate that mentality. And did Tom Petty put anything out? What is he on there for? Did he release a record I don't know about? In the last year? Well, I don't know the criteria for the award, the accolade. Is it they just... don't know the criteria. <laughs> they don't know. They're throwing darts at a board. Oh, God. For once, can we get a real show that truly knows and celebrates rock music? I'm going to go take a deep breath. I'll be back with another hour of Trunk Nation next on volume. He's been waiting for a long time. Thank you, Trey, for waiting through my nonsense. Go ahead, man. It's all good. Did you do the podcast, man? It's real shit, dude. The divorce sucks. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, quick question. Uh, I mean, I had a song, If He Turned, You Should Fail. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I heard that um, Bruce and Dickinson apparently wanted to make it for a song, but Steve Harris liked the song and wanted to use Fire Maiden, Maiden, but. Is there a chance to think um, that a uh, Bruce could make it into a solo album? I kind of like he did when, what that song, Bring Your Daughter to his, Bring Your Daughter to the song? Yeah, well, Trey, Bruce Dickinson had, and thank you for the call, had a lot of solo records. I don't know how many people people realize how many r solo records Bruce Dickinson did. He did more than just that, that one album, which was Tattooed Millionaire and Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter and all that. So he's done a number of them, probably four or five at least. Chemical Wedding was one that comes to mind. So I'm sure that at some point he may do another solo record again. Uh, right now, I mean, his love, Bruce Dickinson's true passion is aviation. I mean, he is so in, and and he flies... I think a lot of people know this, but he it's not like he's flying little props. He's flying major jumbo jets. He is an accomplished pilot, and he loves doing it. He actually works for a commercial airlines sometimes just because he loves flying so much. So that's his big passion, and, of course, Iron Maiden and when they're active. So I don't know how much time he would have to do a solo record, but I wouldn't rule out him ever doing another one. And, of course, he wrote a book like a year ago. He was on this show talking about it. And when Bruce wrote his book talking about old school, who is he just telling this to? I think it was Mark Tremonti when he was in the other day that uh, Br Bruce wrote his book with pen and paper. Like he actually wrote not on a computer. He wrote it, hand wrote it on every page on paper. And then I had to give it to somebody else to transcribe and put onto into a computer. Michelle in New Hampshire. Hi, Michelle. Hey, Eddie. Thanks uh, for taking my call. Sure. Um, totally. Uh, okay. So, Going back to what you mentioned on creating some sort of an app or place to go on your phone where you could look up current band members uh, when you're going to a show, um, I've said this for so long. I was so excited when you brought that up because, you know, M M3, for example, sometimes you just don't know unless – you know, you're like me and all the rest of the geeks out there that listen to you constantly, you know, you're kind of made aware. But, like, why couldn't we do something where maybe inside of the XM radio, the Sirius XM radio app, you know, when a band is being played, um, you can click on the actual album cover and it would give you a little information that would come up that would say current band members, blah, 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 you know, past band members or something like that. 
I mean, it's not a bad idea, but it's not really relevant because a lot of what you're going to hear on on Sirius XM when you get whatever information you get on the songs on your radios or your app or whatever, it's going to be about that particular record. So if you're hearing a record from 30 years ago, it's probably going to be relevant to that record, and that would list the lineup. You know, I was thinking of it more as a useful tool, like every time a band goes out on tour, you just add that band in or you just have the information there. I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, that would up. I, I, I'm sure Sirius XM could do that if the what if they'd want to dedicate the the uh, man or women power to making something like that happen. I don't know. I just think that it, it's it's probably not the right platform for it. You want it something to be more relevant to the touring. You want it to be more anchored with touring. Like the the ones who should do it. Michelle are the companies that are selling the tickets, but they don't yeah. want to do that because they don't want most people to know that some of these bands are twenty percent original. They don't. They just want to sell the logos. The promoters, by and large, the promoters and the the, the companies that are trying to sell tickets, they don't. They're selling the name. They don't want you knowing too much <laughs> more information because that might turn you off from buying the ticket. Yeah, this is true. There's also another app called Bands in Town that mm -hmm. is about, you know, the touring and whatnot, and I definitely use it. Um, and that that's also another, couldn't there be a section, you know, couldn't it be presented to the people who make that app, you know, where you would be able to click on the band and it would give you that. There would be like a section of that app that could give you the lineup. I mean, we spend countless hours on the way to M3 or Adams or whatever, looking it up on our phones, trying to figure it out, and there's just nothing. You're absolutely right. We need something like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't know. I've seen the bands in town. I've seen it tagged. I've seen it on social media and stuff. How does it actually work? Do you put in, you enter in like a band that you like, and then you get notified if they're in their in your area? Is that what that is? Yeah, it is. You can do that. Um, now, I haven't used the app too much. I use the website, actually, because it just seems sometimes can be a little more user-friendly. But, yeah, you put in the band that you like, and then you can arrange your settings uh, for notifications where you can get an email when the band is actually going to be in your area. And then you can also get bands that are similar to that band if, you know, in the same genre or, you know, whatnot. Um, it's really helpful because it's help in this busy time. There's too many places to look and there's so right. much going on that to get that email and you'd be like, oh, band's in town. And it gives you a briefing, you know, right in the subject line of the email. So you're like, oh, you know, you know to look for it. It's really pretty cool. But it does not tell you what the current lineup of the band is, right? I don't think so. I don't think it does. See, and the problem for that also, and thank you, Michelle, for the call. I got to move on, but um, thanks for calling and listening. The, the, the problem with that it is in order to make it, and what Michelle is referencing, if you didn't hear the show from a few days ago, is I was just talking about the idea of this idea I had of doing some sort of app where, because so many people don't know what they're buying, they're buying names of bands, but they don't know how much of the band is actually the band anymore. Some of them don't care, quite frankly, but some do and don't find out until after they bought the ticket. So I was thinking it would be great if there was this app where you could just click and like, okay, Poison. Oh, wow, they're all original. Cheap Trick. Oh, wow, there's three of the four original guys are still there. Queensryche. Oh, wow, two original guys are touring right now because Scott Rockenfield hasn't been playing. You know, just and, – and I'm not saying one is wrong or right or, or you should or shouldn't go to the shows for those bands. I'm just saying that at least when you buy your ticket and spend your hard-earned money, you are an educated – consumer so you know what you're getting and you can before you buy know if it's a version of the band you want to see or it has the members in it that you're a fan of so often people get to the shows and they don't even realize it so that was my idea but you're, you're going for that to work it's going to have to be a completely independent company that runs the app in other words if i was ever to launch an app like that it would have to be done completely independent from ticketing services, publicity people, booking agents, concert promoters, because by and large, the bulk of them either do not want you to know or don't know themselves who is or isn't in these bands as far as key members. Their, their job is to sell you tickets and get you to the shows. Once you're there, oh, wow, that guy's not playing in the band right now. Big deal. I don't care, or I'm furious and I want my money back, or I wouldn't have bought a ticket in the first place if I would have known that. So that's 
And, and it would list the current members. It would list how long they've been in. It would list their history. It would list next to it if they were an original member, a founding member, how many of those were in each band. I think it would be kind of cool. It would be useful. Again, it would have to be done independent of the ticketing outlets because they, most of them don't want, they're looking for people that don't know or care because they're just wanting you to buy the ticket. Chaz in Jersey. Go ahead, Chaz. Well, the last caller talked about my last uh, issue, but I want to welcome to you to the Jersey Shore. I know Jen and the kids will probably be there more than you. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to ask For you sure. a quick kiss. I want to ask you a kiss trivia question, and maybe ask Ed a quick rush trivia question. Are you ready? All right, Chaz. Let's try it. All right. For example, I'm gonna, I want the opening track and the ending track. So, like for "Rock and Roll Over," it's "I Want You," and it ends with "Making Love." I'm gonna right. throw "Animalize" at you. I've had enough. Is the right? opening track. And I'm not yep. going to cheat and look. The last song, I believe, is While the City Sleeps. No, it's Murder in High Heels. Oh, <laughs> I got 50%, Chaz. You know, I think one of the tr a little trivia thing about um, Murder in High Heels is I think Bruce Kulick might play the lead guitar solo on that, even though he wasn't in the band yet. I will yeah, make you're... it up on Lick It Up. Make it up. Let's lick it up. Lick It Up is Exciter to start, and I believe the last track is And On The Eighth Day. Yes. Let me do, let me uh, do one to Ed Robinson. All right, Ed. He, Chaz wants to give you a rush quiz. Go ahead. Uh-huh. All right. Fly, fly By Night. Opening track, ending track. Oh. Opening track should be... Um, hang on. Opening track, Fly By Even Night. Even I know that. Ah. Should be No Hesitation. Ah. See, Ed's, Ed's younger than me. I know. And I, I listen to most of the stuff off of the computer. I'm going to help him out. It's Anthem. It is. I had the okay, song. Anthem is the first one. And the last track also was a Lincoln Park song, but not the same song. What is it, Eddie? Ed. <sighs> Mr. Or Rush, gonna, look uh, at him. Oh my goodness! Oh wait a sec! Even you said so wait, yeah, idiot that I am. In the end, yes. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thanks, Chaz. Take care. In the end, is I love that Rush song. I love the version from All the World's a Stage. That's a great song. By the way, if I may redeem myself, my favorite version of Anthem is also from All the World's a Stage. By the way, Anthrax did a great version of Anthem on their somewhat recent ep called anthems which was all covers so there you go james in indiana hey james hey uh, we got to put a cap on the billboard before you pop it out better <laughs> I'm, I'm past it don't bring it up again james we moved on oh, seriously. okay real quick i was wanting to tell you buddy invites me over to the house for dinner says get a little buzz on please kind of i said okay what's for dinner we'll have some spaghetti and meatballs i said that sounds great i get over there I bite into this meatball. I'm chewing. I'm chewing. I'm chewing. What the fuck am I eating here? It's a bull ball. Oh, yeah, Where I'm was this? Me. Where was this? This is some, some fucking garden, but my so-called buddy invites me over for dinner. And I'm in Indiana, so it's they're big here. You know, it's Oh, family. my God. James, did you I'm heave? You're fucking chewing on this thing and chewing and chewing. I'm like, what is this? And it's a friggin' bull ball. I hacked and I hacked and I hacked. Oh, hey, James, do you still talk to that guy? Hey, I'm never talking to the motherfucker again. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, and let me tell you something, your boy Jesse James Dupree is all about him. So next time you give him a shout out, ask me. He about eats him? Button. Yeah, he loves him. Oh, man, he's such a redneck. Amazing. <laughs> All right. Hey, I love you guys, man. See ya. Thank you, James. Have a good weekend, man. James went for spaghetti and meatballs and found out it was a a bull ball, ball or as Ed mentioned earlier, a Rocky Mountain Oyster. Man, I am glad, Ed. Wait, wait, was it Rocky Mountain Oyster, Ed? Rocky Mountain Oysters. I'm glad you told me that because I have to keep my eyes wide open when I do go to Wyoming for that TV shoot. My goodness. 
Man, we this is why I love talking to the callers because we got Rush trivia, we got Kiss trivia, we learned from Ed about Rocky Mountain oysters, we heard from our guy just there who had spaghetti meatballs and found out it was a bull ball. Um, we got all kinds of stuff going on today. I went crazy about the Billboard Awards, which I never knew was going to happen. It's my favorite shows, man. It is a well-rounded program. That's it. Let the, let the audience steer the ship and let's have some fun. You know, I think his name was James, the previous caller. I, I have a thing. I will not eat dinner at people's houses. <laughs> I refuse. And I've been like that my entire life. Like, I'll eat at my mom's house or my aunt's house, but I will not eat dinner. Like, if people do a dinner party or something at their house, I will not eat ever. Unless it's catered. And it's, I know it's from an outside company. Now, that people may think that's crazy and weird, and I, okay, maybe it is. But two reasons why. The story that guy just said, you never know what the hell's in there. Even though if it's a good friend or something, you know it should be okay, and the cleanliness, cleanliness factor should be there. But the other reason is, this has always, like, flipped me out. What if I don't like what they made? What if I don't like? The taste of it, there's no more embarrassing rough spot than to push the plate away and say, I don't care for your cooking. It is a blanket policy of me, of mine, that I will never eat at other people's houses. I will, I never will. I just don't do it. Whenever I go with my friends, let's go to dinner. Then no problem, go to a restaurant. Let's all get together and go. I don't care if it's you know, Wendy's or if it's a high-end joint. Whatever you want to do, it's fine. Let's go out to eat. No problem. Nobody's got to do dishes. Nobody's got to worry about anybody being offended. Nobody's got to worry about somebody getting served balls for meatballs for spaghetti. My mom's house, my aunt, great Italian cooks, no problem. Of course, I grew up with that food. And if it's not good, I can say it to my mom and she'll throw a dish towel at me and get up and it's okay. Still can get into the house. That's 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 my own little thing, little tip to everybody. If you don't want to have instances like that, all right. Final break. Thirty minutes to come. Stephen California wants to ask me about my Def Leppard experience yesterday. A couple more things on Chris Cornell. Whatever else you guys want to hit me with, we'll get into it in the final thirty on this Friday free for all Friday on Trunk Nation continues after this. Hope you guys uh, have a great weekend. We got a few more minutes left to go on the show. And let's pick up the conversation right now with Tim in Canada. Go ahead, Tim. What's going on, man? Hey, Eddie. You got you to gotta relax, man. Don't let them people bug you. You got to come up here to Niagara Falls, Canada, and have a beer with me. You remind right. me of me. You remind <laughs> me of myself. I get wound up over shit like that, too. But anyway, I'm a great big Van Halen fan, just like you. I love it. Only the David Lee Rock years. I wanted to say that. And also, I seen uh, Soundgarden in 2011 in uh, Toronto um, at the Molson Amphitheater. Shitty sound, unfortunately. It was totally distorted. Uh, couldn't make out any of the tunes, but it was great to see the band. And uh, Chris had his little boy on the side of the stage and uh, brought him out. And he looked like, oh, the kid was awesome. I, I just wanted to share that with you. I thought that was great. They had the little boy come out, and he was playing the drums, the like air drums to the to Matt Cameron. There, it was it was uh, awesome, but the sound was shit. So uh, anyway, that's that's what I wanted to say. All right, Tim. Well, thank you for that. And if you're a big Van Halen fan, like you said, make sure you listen Wednesday to the list, and then come up and uh, call in with your own list on Thursday if you can get through. Oh yeah, I seen. Also, I seen him in 1980. That was my first concert. I seen him in Buffalo at the Buffalo Auditorium. I uh, blew my uh, high school, uh, what do you call it there, uh, when I was finished high school in grade 12. I, didn't, I just went to that. That's an awesome band, man. But uh, thanks a lot, Eddie. Uh, All right, Tim. I love your show. Love your show. I'll get out of here now and let you continue on. I listen to you every day, man. I love you. Take care. Thank you, right? Tim. Thank you very much, man. Much appreciated. Thank you very much for the kind words and for listening. Talk to Robert in Alabama. Hey, Robert, what's going on? 
Hey, Eddie, I was wondering if you could come in and uh, pipe Harry Richardson left Firehouse. And also, I want to make the comment, just think of all the accolades and things the industry is going to give you when you do kick the bucket, how much everybody's going <laughs> to love you then. Well, Robert, if I was ever going to get any accolades, it would be nice to get them while I was still alive. But um, and hopefully we're all hopefully I'm just, jo- you know, I'm trying to joke and just have fun about what I was talking about. Let's let's hope that it's a long time before that happens. But um, I appreciate that. And as far as Perry Richardson, you know, he's in Striper now. Did you know that? Yeah, I did. I just have searched on this. I can't find a reason why he left Firehouse. I, I did not know. Seen- uh, Robert, your phone died on us, but you got your point out at least before it did. I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer for that, but I do know that he is currently playing bass in Striper, who I'll be hosting May 30th at the Ideal Ballroom in Tulsa and looking forward to seeing them for the first time with Perry as their bass player. 844-686-5863, 844-6-VOLUME is the toll-free nationwide telephone number, talking anything you want in the world of rock. Let's say hi to AJ, who is in New Mexico. Hi, AJ. Hey, Eddie. Hey, um, got a question. What's your take on Glenn Campbell not being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? I mean, he's been snubbed for years. The man played on pretty much all the studio sessions for the Beach Boys. Is that not rock and roll? Has uh, Has he ever been on the ballot? That's what I'm saying. I don't think he's ever been on the ballot. I've never seen it from my research. Yeah, I've never even heard his name come up. And you're right. I mean, again, if they're good, the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is going to be broad and they're going to get into, you know, stuff just a little left of center of rock. As you said, the Beach Boys thing, but Glenn Campbell more you know, known as a country artist for the most part, most of his career. But still, I made this point the other day. If you're going to put hip hop in there, then why aren't you not putting a lot of different country in there? So you're you're right, and and to my knowledge, AJ, I don't think he's ever even been on a ballot. So that that's a kind yeah, of I, that's a that's a snub. Not enough people have brought up or talked about. Right. I mean, it, they posthumously add everybody else in after they pass away. You figured they would have done it to Glenn for everything that he has contributed, and everybody that's ever wanted to play with him. Yeah, that was a great documentary. If you've had a chance, um, if you've had a chance to check out the documentary, thank you, AJ. I saw it's online. It was also on CNN. I, I, I saw it. They ran it for a little bit as well. Of the Glenn Campbell doc, definitely something very cool to check out if you get an opportunity to do so. It's uh, you know, really well done about Glenn's battles and Alzheimer's and all that. Nathan in Arizona. Hi, Nathan. How you doing, Eddie? I love your show. I listen to it every. I drive a truck. I wanted to find out, do you know where if Ron Keel's actually still touring? I mean, back in the day, I liked the old small gigs and stuff like that. And I mean, I, I mean, I like the big concerts and stuff, but I like going to those smaller gigs because it was more intimate. But I haven't heard anything from him or nothing like that. So, oh, and one other thing I wanted to ask you, if you remember a band named Gagahotic. They were out of, no. the, they were, they were out of, um, the San Bernardino, Canada, or in the Ontario, Chino area. No, never heard of the band, Nathan. But as far as Ron Keel, you know, as, as I've talked about a lot of times, bands at that level, and I love Ron, and it's not a diss on Ron, but it's a very difficult thing for them to tour. Most of them do not tour. Touring is way too expensive. Touring, you need to get certain amount of guarantees to offset your expenses. It's very, very hard. Most bands... Uh, do what's called fly dates where they go in and fly in on a weekend so touring no still playing live yes Ron Keel does still play live uh, with his own thing and maybe once or twice a year a show with Keel they've played on the Monsters of Rock cruise but bands like that and and thank you Nathan for the call I mean they're, they're not they can't sustain touring there's just not enough audience it's as fans it's very easy for us to say this band should go on tour. Are they touring, touring? A lot of guys at that level cannot and do not tour. It's not financially sound for them. We've talked about this before. So what they'll do is the weekend fly date. They'll fly on a Thursday night. They'll use rented gear. They'll play a Friday and a Saturday, two cities, maybe an hour and a half apart, and they fly home on Sunday. 
They don't carry a big crew. There's no bus rental. There's no vans. There's no nothing. Most of the time, promoter throws in hotel rooms. You get in, you get out. That is the way a lot of touring is done for a lot of artists today. The idea of going on the road and playing 60, 80, 100 shows nonstop, city to city, is really reserved for those that either are very young and don't mind roughing it out there in vans and not getting beds and not sleeping, or that have resources and have money and have good draws and good guarantees, and they can travel the right way and offset that expense. It's a big problem, though, because a lot of fans don't realize these bands are doing it. It goes back to that app we talked about, the the previous caller, Michelle, about bands in town. Sometimes it's hard to find out if these guys are even coming through your your area because it's not a tour. So, yes, Ron does some stuff and occasionally a Keel show at a special event, but that's about it as far as what he's doing. He's been doing radio in South Dakota, and his wife has been ill, and he's been doing some fundraising stuff for his wife who was battling cancer. But Ron's a great guy. Keel was a great band back in the day. And I used to go see them quite a bit back in the early 80s. Mark Ferrari, their guitar, one of their guitar players, he, he got out of the performing end of the business, even though he's still in the band when they play. And Mark has a very successful music publishing company that he started a number of years ago. So he's been, much, much of his work has been behind the scenes, and he sold that publishing company and really did great with it. We had Mark on. I think from the last Monsters of Rock cruise talking about that and and how he did that and what his company actually is. Let's talk to Ryan in Nevada. Hi, Ryan. Hey, Eddie. Hey, man. uh, The the Van Halen list uh, for next week. I was you were saying that you didn't want to. You weren't going to include any live versions. Were um, you did include live versions on the Kiss list? So I was wondering why, because my pick. Number 20 was going to be the live version of Summer Nights, which to me is way better than the studio version. So I was um, wondering if You're right. Was- no, no, you can do that if you want. I, get, I guess what I was mean, what I kind of meant was like, I think it's on Live Without a Net. There's a live version of Won't Get Fooled Again, which is a cover song, which I, I guess if you wanted to include it, you could. So, yeah, you, if you want to include Live, you can. That, that's my bad. You're right. That's totally fine, Ryan. Okay, great. I just wanted to make sure before I put my list together. Yeah, I personally I personally don't think that there is, for me, personally, I don't think there's anything I would go with live over studio. I don't think Van Halen ever made a truly great live record. I mean, that live from Tokyo thing a few years ago was just not good. Those vocals were, were rough to listen to. And the um, at least they kept it real and left it like that. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. And Live Without a Net, I think that's what it was called. I know that's what the DVD was called, or the, the VHS when it came out. But the live record with Sammy Hagar, Sammy admitted on this show more than one time, and not that it's out of the norm because it's the case with so many live records we find out, but that whole record was re-recorded. Because Sammy said that what happened was that Eddie Van Halen went in and just, this is how it starts. I just want to touch up a few things and clean up a few things. And then he ended up replaying everything. And then it got out of sequence with the rest of the band. It was like out of step with the rest of the band. And there was a video of that concert back in the day of all those VHS concerts. And it got out of sync with the video portion of it. So a snowball effect happened, and eventually everyone had to go in and re-record their parts. So the Van Halen live record with Sammy, the entire thing was re-recorded. The only thing live on there is probably the applause track because it was like they just started picking at some stuff, and it set everything off and became a problem. So, I, I you know... That and the one with Roth, there, there's never been a definitive official Van Halen live record, as far as I'm concerned, that's been truly great. This is Matt in Nebraska. Hi, Matt. You're on Trunk Nation. What's up? Hey, Eddie. Thanks for taking my call, man. Sure, man. Yeah. Um, this is about Van Halen again. Um And my comment is basically, you know, to start with, I'm like you. I think the first four Van Halen albums are pretty much unassailable. You know, they're they're on Mount Rushmore, and you can't touch those. But 
I also want to give a shout out to an album that that gets a, probably some unfair criticism in my book anyway probably that's probably just for for me personally um and that is an album that turns 30 this month and it's OU812 now mm-hmm. i know that there's a lot of people who really they don't care for this album either because they don't particularly like Sammy Hagar or you know i've heard criticisms that the that the mix is kind of out of balance and there's not enough bass but for me personally i've always loved this album even though I, I fully admit that the David Lee Roth era is, is, is an unassailable classic and will always be the definitive version of Van Halen, even for me, I, for some reason, I just love OU812. And, you know, I, I just I have always liked the more mature approach to the songwriting. Uh, the ballads on the, the album aren't bad in my, in my book. And Eddie just pulls out some crazy guitar sounds on this album. I mean, I just, I I really love the guitar on this album. And I think it gets overlooked and oftentimes unfairly by the Van Halen fan base. And that was my comment. And I just kind of wanted to give it a shout out because it does turn 30 this month. And it remains one of my favorite Van Halen albums. You're right. It's 88. The record came out and I'm looking down the track listing now because you're, it's not, it is definitely not a go-to Van Halen record for me either because I remember hearing it and I think more from a production standpoint, it just kind of threw me. It was kind of like, you know, mine, all mine is kind of like a, a gurgly sort of thing. It's not really very guitar based, to open the record when it's love. I love because I, I, I love power ballads and I love great vocals. And Sammy just sings his ass off on that. The song Cabo Wabo. I always kind of liked feel so good is real poppy. Finish what you started. Of course was a pretty big hit black and blue. I liked, I think black and blue was like the first single from the record. If I'm not mistaken, back when it, was, it came yeah. out. So I like yep. Black and Blue, Sucker in a Three Piece. Ah, eh, not so much. Not a great song in my opinion. Uh, it has its moments. I mean, I've been. I, it's been a long time since I sat and listened to the record in sequence, top to bottom. It's not a Van Halen record. I usually do that with Matt, but it's got its moments. But I, I like Fifty One Fifty a whole lot better, and I also like For Unlawful Carnal Knowledge a lot. As as my two my two favorite Hagar Van Halen records would be those two. Although there's some other, I think balance is really underrated. So well, yeah, really... man, just, and yeah, I, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, um, I'll just I'll just be quick here because I know you got other folks that want to get on, but um, for some reason, you know, I a lot of folks, you know, they they either hold up the the David Lee Roth years or the Sammy Hagar years as their, you know, it's it's kind of like that that's the the line of demarcation. But for me. You know, my Van Halen is the first 10 years of Van Halen with the asterisk of a different kind of truth, because I think that's a great album, too. But for me, it's not Dave or Sammy. It's the first 10 years, 78 through through 88. I don't like uh, carnal knowledge, and I don't like balance for some reason. I just don't really care for those albums, and I guess we all – that's the beauty of Van Halen, you know, with our fan base is just so fractured in all these different directions that it's a great <laughs> band to love, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, anyway, well, that, was my, th- that was my comment, man. So Yeah, well, thanks, Matt, and, and that's why it's going to make these this top 20 so interesting to see what everybody comes up with, and thank you. I'll take the lead on that on Wednesday and premiere my top 20, and then, again, Thursday, and I got a feeling we'll spill into Friday where we'll get reaction from you guys on the Van Halen top 20 and hear your lists. But that's what's going to be so fascinating about it. Van Halen is a band that so many people love, but love different eras of it, love different periods of it. And I've gotten a lot of pushback from people when I've said how I feel that the first four albums are the the, the most definitive great records, like Untouchable. And sometimes people have said to me, well, wait a minute, what's wrong with Diver Down? What's wrong with 1984 if you're talking about the Roth years? The answer is nothing. However, to me, they're not as good because Diver Down is a 28-minute record, which is more than like half covers. And if you read Noel Monk's book, it was a record that wasn't even supposed to come out. It was a throwout. And then all of a sudden, when Pretty Woman became a hit, they had to deal with it, but they never expect anything to happen. So that's why I write that one off. And 1984... 
I just had this real, like, knee-jerk reaction to hearing Jump as the lead single. Van Halen was such a guitar-centric heavy band at one point, and hearing Jump and that big wash of keyboards, and I'm like, whoa, what's happening to this band? And, okay, so Jump was a, a sign of, like, going in another direction, which I wasn't necessarily so down with, even though that became a huge hit. And, of course, Panama, Hot for Teacher, huge hits, huge MTV songs, maybe a little overplayed. I'll Wait, very keyboardy. Girl Gone Bad, House of Pain, I like. Drop Dead Legs, I like. Top Jimmy, kind of like, you know, one of those quirky Dave moments. So it's not a record. 1984, although it's heralded as one of the great Van Halen records, for me, outside of some certain spots, it's not. By the way, Eddie... It's, to me, the first four, top to bottom, untouchable. And then from there, it wavers. I'll Wait, written with Michael McDonald. Who I believe sings on it as well. I got burned on that once on a stump the trunk. I'll never forget that. So, hey, listen, I don't want to show too much. <laughs> I don't want to reveal my hand too much because I do have my list sitting here in front of me, which, again, is at 25 songs. I need to edit it down to 20. And you'll hear, you know, giving you a little insight to where I'm thinking, of course, you'll, you, that'll be reflected in my top 20, I'm sure, when that show premieres this coming Wednesday. Maybe time to get one or two more in here before we have to wrap up for the week. This is Josh, who's in Ohio. Hey, Josh. Hey, Eddie. Uh, big Aerosmith fan. And uh, you always talk about the documentaries. I always thought one of the coolest documentaries would be the non-hit years, basically 1980 to the beginning of Permanent Vacation on Aerosmith. That would be an excellent documentary to see how the band fractures and kind of just give the history of that time period. Yeah, I, th I think it's a very fascinating time period, Josh. I'm someone I really like when I see bands when they're in flux and these great bands that are trying to, like, you know, floundering a little bit. And that's what was going on with Aerosmith at that time. And I think what, what's really fascinating with Aerosmith's story at that time is the fact that out of that period came some really good records. Like, I love Night in the Ruts. I love Rock in a Hard Place. And I even love Done with Mirrors. And then if you look at those the time that Joe Perry was out of the band, that first Joe Perry Project album, Let the Music Do the Talking, is a killer record killer record so yeah. it's fascinating these guys have all these these issues but somehow they still made i think good records there's not a documentary about it but there's some video leaked a while ago on youtube that i saw of steven tyler whacked out of his skull and i think they were writing rock in a hard place i don't know if that's on youtube or what but it, it could be the basis for some sort of documentary if there's more stuff like that out there thanks josh sorry to cut you off but we're running out of time sorry if i didn't get to your call it's on the phones we'll go back to music new and classic and then we'll wrap it up with the last 20 minutes or so of the show just before 10 eastern with uh some more of your phone calls as we always do to finish up the show katie's got a bunch of people screened out you guys are uh, jamming the lines ready to get on the air so let us begin in toronto and say hello to mark hey mark how are you hey buddy how are you man very good thanks good been a been a while uh how's your summer going good hectic as all hell but not complaining because it's all work and it's all busy and it's uh well work i'm not digging ditches but you know a lot of running around so it's uh it's all good no complaints bud Good for you, man. You know, this is one of those summers where the bands, you know, everybody we want to see seems to be out there. And I, I was telling Katie on the phone, uh, I found, I, I've known about this place for several years now. It's right on the Canadian uh, U.S. border. It's a little town called Lewiston, New York. And they have a park there called, it's called Art Park. And Every Tuesday night in the summer, they run these shows, and these shows are gigantic. I'm, we saw Boston there a few weeks ago. Megadeth was there. We're going to see Hart. Sammy's playing tomorrow night, and Styx is there in a few weeks. And the list goes on and on. And nobody seems to know about this park, you know, right at the border. 
but they draw 15, 10, 15, 20,000 people. And here's the killer, Eddie. We, we always talk and complain about ticket prices, this, that, and the other. You bring a lawn chair or a folding chair that, of course, has a beer cup holder. You get in the door from, for 12 bucks to 17 bucks. And if you want to sit front stage, $27. When have you ever heard that? Well, it sounds interesting, Mark. I mean, that's a that sounds like a, a pretty great deal. I don't know the dynamics of that. And thanks for calling, Mark, with that information. I mean, sometimes events like that, they could be subsidized by the state or the area in some ways. I mean, because depending upon the show and how much. Now, listen, I'm not I'm not here to diss the bands that you just named, but you're also not getting the big bills up there it sounds like i mean you're getting shows that are like mid-level shows you're not getting the upper echelon big 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 money shows so there's that and also it could be a subsidized situation where there's some sort of uh, deal with the the state and taxpayer money to fund a local arts or whatever there, there's a lot of sort of loopholes that can happen but regardless the bottom line is that you're getting some great shows there at a at a fair price which is extremely and sadly very 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 rare but i gotta tell you i mean everybody in the world is out on tour <laughs> if it's not in america it's outside of the u.s because we talked about it a million times Nobody is selling records on any sort of real level, meaning no money is being made from selling music, meaning that the only way these guys can survive is going on the road. The downside of that is there's so many shows that a lot of bands are having trouble selling tickets because the, the, the economy can't support the cost of going to so many shows. So you, you just can't go to everything every night. It's It's difficult. There's some people that try, but you can go broke, too. <laughs> so, good you found that spot, Mark. Enjoy. Jason in Missouri. Hi, Jason. Hi. How are you doing, Eddie? Good. Thank you. First of all, I want to say thank you for doing your show, because it's the only way people like me in a small town can hear all the news and info what's going on. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I just recently went and seen Alice Cooper and Motley Crue in concert, and uh, the the band that stowed the show was their opening act called the Raskins. Have you ever heard of them before? Heard of them, but I'm not a, I'm not familiar with their music. Okay, I just didn't know if you heard of them or what you thought. But they was just refreshing live. They were the best out of the three. It was I didn't that totally surprised me. What had you ever heard of them before you went in, Jason? I never even heard of them before I went in. Well, that's great. You had no knowledge of them whatsoever, and you just were, no were kind of really yeah. turned on about them. That's really cool to hear. What kind of band are they? Yeah. What do they sound like? They, it, you kind of like if you take Cinderella, like Tom Keith or you were just talking to, and mix them with kind of like a rat. That's kind of what they sound like. Interesting. Kind of like two bands weird to put together, but that's what they reminded me the most of. Well, Jason, thanks for the call, and I'm I'm glad you uh, discovered some new music there. That's kind of the whole reason why bands take that third slot on those shed tours, hoping that someone like Jason will go in and see them and become a fan. That's the idea. So I'm glad that you did. The downside of those third build situations is that, unlike people like Jason, most people when those pants are playing are in the parking lot drinking beer. And there's not a lot of people that see them. So the few that do go in there that early and do see them, that band has to really do their best to make their mark and try to make playing those shows and doing those tours worthwhile. So that's that's good that this band, the Raskins, was able to accomplish that because that is not an easy slot. That third slot on a uh, on a tour is never a great slot. Yes, it's great because you can say, "Well, we're opening for Motley Crue and Alice Cooper," and you can say, "Yes, we're opening for Kiss and Def Leppard." We're opening. Yes, you are opening for them, but the reality is very few people, unfortunately, are seeing you because nobody goes in there that early. <laughs> so it's it's just the reality. It's always been like that. And I'll tell you what, a lot of those bands in those third build situations, too, not every, but a lot of those situations are what they call buy-ons. And those bands are on there because they paid to play. 
That happens a lot. I'm not saying that's the case with the band Jason was talking about, but that is something that does happen. It is quite common in that slot in the business. Steven in Texas. Hi, Steven. You're on the air. Hey, Eddie. Hey. Uh, big Judas Priest fan. Love the new album. I want to get your take on it, but I got to give you grief, man. The song was called Crossfire, not Crossfade. Was it really? Did I say it wrong? Hold on. I got the CD right here. Did I say Crossfade? Yes, sir. All right. Well, you got me. It's You are right. I'm holding the CD. It is Crossfire. <laughs> did I type it in? Did the, did the display say it, it wrong, too? It sure did. All right. Well, that's my bad. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> that's all right, man. Love your show. Thank you. Good, <laughs> good catch, Stephen. I appreciate it. Later, man. Take care. <laughs> Guys are watching every move. Uh, but he is exactly 100% right, so good catch. Let's go to Oklahoma. Hi, Adam. How are you? Hello, Eddie. How you doing? Good, thanks. Man, it was a good show the other night. Tom Kiefer, man. That's awesome, man. Where did you see Tom at? I seen him at Rock, Oklahoma. Oh, I thought you said the other night. You meant you heard Tom here tonight. Oh, no, yeah, I heard him on your show tonight, bud. Yeah, yeah. thank you, man. Hey, hey, man, I love your show, Eddie. You know I'm a fan. Uh, uh, my my question is for you, and I not have nothing to do with Eddie's hair metal, but, but Pink Floyd, I heard a rumor that they are making a new album. Is that true? Anything with David Gilmore, Roger Waters? No, 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 no. Before you get excited, Adam, no. Uh, <laughs> Roger Waters and, Pink, and, and David Gilmore are not together. Uh, uh, that's yeah, not no, probably not going to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not the case at all. Uh, I'm not a huge Floyd fan, so I'm I'm I don't know a ton about it. Thank you for the call, Adam. The the what I do know is apparently it's outtakes or stuff they didn't use for the Division Bell record, and it's it's some old stuff that was laying around that didn't make that record that I think is being re-recorded or resuscitated in some way. But I do not believe it's an all-new record of all-new original material, and I certainly know that Roger Waters is not involved in it. Josh in Syracuse. Hey, Josh. Hey, Eddie. Uh, 16 years old. I just went to dog camp um, in Big Indian, New York. Just wanted to say thanks a lot for whatever contribution you had to setting up the winery dogs. I went there, and those guys are one of the some of the most down-to-earth people I've met. I've Jam with Mike Ford and all he played with Richie Cotson. It was awesome. Just wanted to say thanks. Wow, that's very cool of you, Josh. Uh, it was kind of like a, it was it a camp to kind of uh, instruct people on how to play and, and like a musician's camp. Was that the idea behind it? Yes. Uh, Mike Bennett and Dylan Wilson from Richie's camp, they all had classes. Um, Mike, Billy, and Richie all had master classes. The Wire Dogs played twice. Richie had a solo show and... Dylan Wilson, Mike Bennett, and Dave Wood all had like a jazz trio that played one night, and it was just master classes. And John Moy from Disturb was also there too, uh, and taught and was a counselor. Wow, that's very cool. Well, thank you, Josh, for the call. I appreciate that. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you're talking about unbelievable musicians there across the board, so you you better be a hell of a player to have been in that sort of uh, environment for sure. But thank you. You know, it's it's uh, really nice to hear from people who. I can't tell you how many tweets and calls and people like our caller just there uh, that bring up the winery dogs to me and, and say, hey, thanks. And it really means a lot to me, uh, again, as I was referencing earlier, to be able to turn people on to new music uh, is is and help help bands and help stuff that I believe in and see it go and get popular is the greatest reward I have in what I do. And in the case of the Winery Dogs, as our caller referenced, that was a band that I I had the idea of uh, Richie joining that band. And I was a big fan of Richie's work, and I plugged them into that thing, and they've gone off and done tremendous things together. And they, they've been very cool in all the interviews to mention uh, me as the reason how they got together. So I really appreciate that, and that's trickled down to the fans, and it's great to hear from you guys. Uh, saying that as well. Really, really good stuff. I'm going to be seeing them this Friday in Boston. Been a little while since I saw them and hung with them, so I'm looking forward to to hanging and uh, and catching that show at the Wilbur Theater. And then, like I said, myself, Don, and Jim are doing our own show at the Wilbur Theater in Boston this Saturday. So if you're in the area, please come say hello. 
couple more quick calls, then we're going to go back to music, and then we'll do some more calls to round out the show a little bit before we end, just before 10 o'clock Eastern. It's Eddie Trunk live on Sirius XM 39. Arizona, Leslie, you're on the air. Hi. Yeah, Eddie, I was. Uh, I got a couple questions for you. Well, a couple albums I want, want your opinion on. Uh, I got some old vinyls. Um, I, I collected from overseas when I was over in Germany in the Army. Um, okay. I got uh, the Led, uh, the the Leonard Skinner album where they're at the, the the fire. The album cover had the fire on there, and uh, guys were standing in the fire. Um, do you? What do you think about that album? That was a, I thought that was a pretty damn good album, but it didn't sell. It didn't stay on the shelves very long, did it? Well, the the cover was banned because he, obviously those guys died in a, in, in a plane crash, so they didn't want that photo of them with the flames around them. So they not banned, but they just altered the cover out of respect to what happened. Yeah, well, got that album cover. Do you think that's going to be a collector's item anytime soon? I don't know, Leslie. I got to tell you, I am the last guy in the world you should ask about what's collectible and what's valuable and what's not. I'm awful when it comes to that. Uh, I'm not a collector in that sense. I don't buy and resell stuff. I never collected autographs. I never collected, you know, I'm not one of these guys that goes to trade shows and knows about that. I, I never got into music really for that with that in mind, so it doesn't really phase me. I just don't know. It, it very well could be. Like, I know, for instance, I have the first Kiss record that doesn't have Kiss and Time on it, and that is collectible. How much it's worth, I don't know. But I never really planned to sell it anyway. So there are quirky things like that, like the Skinner record you had, same sort of deal. But what they're worth, and it's the same old story. It's worth whatever you can find somebody to pay you for it. If you're interested in selling it, and of course the best place probably to to figure that out would be eBay. So good luck if you plan on selling it. But but to to for me to tell you what things are worth and what the value is would be pointless because I just have no idea. I don't kind of operate in that world at all. Thank you all for the phone calls. Much appreciated. We are coming up on our fourth and final hour of Eddie Trunk Live here on Trunk Nation. Talk about in the world of rock, and we begin. I guess we'll just go right from line number one. That's probably the easiest way to do it. And we'll say hello to John, who is in Ohio. And uh, my phone is not answering, John. Hold on a second. You need me to do it? Yeah, I'm going to log out and log back in. Ed, it's not letting me answer. So pick up John in Ohio, please. He's on the air. Hey, John, what's going on, man? How are you doing, Eddie? Hey, bud. It's good. good to talk to you. I uh, wanted to talk a couple things really quick. First, the uh, Hall of Fame nomination uh, process, in my opinion, obviously is so corrupt that I, it just doesn't even compare to anything. And my second uh, thing I wanted to say, uh, do you feel that maybe Ace dumping his uh, old band is maybe perhaps in preparation for him opening up on the Kiss Farewell Tour? With that, uh, n- no, no. Uh, first of all, I'll take, I'll take. Well, we'll go one, one thing, one step at a time here, John. And and uh, thanks for the call, man. It looks like my phones are working here now, Ed. So we're good. But uh, I, I, the Hall of Fame, corrupt wouldn't be the word as far as the nominating committee. I don't think there's corruption. I think they're they're pretty transparent about it. That it's just. You know, that group of people in that room that make the decisions clearly are not fans of a lot of commercially successful rock music and certainly not fans of hard rock and metal. And that room for a long time is made up of people in the industry who look down their nose at that sort of music. They think it's beneath them. They think it's just not as relevant or 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 creative or great or artistic as the music that they Love. It's just, you know, it's it's just the makeup of that room. It's just the mentality that permeates from the top down there. And that's why you see so many great bands that were snubbed for so long, uh, having to wait to get in and uh, other bands being passed over. But it's not it's not corrupt. It's actually pretty transparent. It's it's a room of people and they're just they just don't think the way the regular rock fan thinks. They just you know, they, they have a 
<clears throat> I guess the word you could look for, say about it is sort of an elitist view of of uh, of of some of this music. And I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, they just look. We know. Let Let's put it in this perspective, okay? We know if you are a rock, hard rock, metal fan, you know how people have always looked at you sideways about that. You know that we've always been a giant cult, more or less, right? And whether it's your parents, your teachers, whatever, oh, you like that kind of stuff. That's the attitude. It's not an appreciation for the musicianship, the songs. It's just this blanket thing. And I'll be honest with you, it's one of the reasons why I hate and have always railed against the stereotypes that come with hard rock and metal music. I've always hated them because <clears throat> I think that's what those stereotypes is what continues to fuel that that thinking and that marginalization of this music. And that the stereotype that everybody has to act, you know, that, that any metal fan is this, you know, hell raising, beer drinking, lunatic guy, you know, throwing the horn hands constantly, screaming with bulging veins in their neck, you know, always, you know, yelling and, you know, over the top and always dressed a certain way and tattoos and piercings. You know, to some people that's considered like a metal lifestyle or whatever. And if that's your trip, great. But there's a lot of people that feel it's kind of like a uniform and they perpetuate those stereotypes. And I think that marginalizes the music tremendously. And that's why I've, you, you'll never see me like that or hear me like that. You never hear me cursing every other word. You never hear me screaming. I'm not saying I'm better than anybody else. I just don't believe in falling into the cliches that come with that music. And I think a lot of people do. And I think it just breeds this sort of feeling like, oh, they're just a bunch of knuckleheads. They're just a bunch of empty-headed idiots that like that stuff. I've always hated that. Over my years, in my 35 years of doing this, I have found hard rock and metal fans in every walk of life. Doctors, surgeons, professional athletes, uh, lawyers. Uh, you know, I can't tell you, I'm on planes constantly, how many airline pilots will stop me and say, hey, listen to your podcast, or I love the thing you did with uh, K.K. Downing, or whatever it is. So it's so much broader than it's given credit for, but the, the stereotypes play into keeping it in this way of looking like a marginalized thing. Uh, as far as Ace and him changing his band, I don't think it has anything to do with anything to do with Kiss. I think what it has to do with is the fact that I think Gene got in his ear. Uh, there's a video. I think I mentioned this yesterday. There's a video of uh, Gene and Ace together very recently in Australia. Gene is doing his vault thing. He takes shots at Richie Scarlett. Gene does to Ace and the audience saying Richie's over the top, he jumps in front of you, he should be calmed down. And if you watch that video, Ace says, I'm addressing that, I'm addressing that, I'm addressing that, during the video. So back then, you can tell him traveling with Ace, he, uh, uh, Ace traveling with Gene, jamming with Gene's solo band, and then Gene getting in his ear, who I think he sees as a, a, a little bit of a mentor again or something, and and probably saying, you know, okay, I, yeah, you know what, Gene, you're right. I'm going to take your band. And 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 I think it's as simple as that. And I, as I said the other day, I'm not trying to uh, play both sides here, but the three guys that were in Ace's band, Scott Coogan, Chris Wise, and Richie Scarlett, great people. I've known them forever, and they're great musicians. I said this yesterday. Scott's a phenomenal singer. If you saw Ace and you watched his drummer sing stuff like, like Love Gun, sings, his, sings like a bird. Chris Wise just got the gig in the bass, as the bass player in Hollywood Vampires. He used to play in the cult. And I'm not sure what Richie's going to do, but Richie had a, a solo thing going. And by the way, uh, somebody, uh, a friend of mine told me this morning that Richie Scarlett, who has been Ace's longtime rhythm guitar player, guitar player, he plays some lead too, and so, sometime lead vocalist, that his wife passed away. So condolences to Richie. What an awful week. He, he's lost his gig and he's lost his wife, who I understand she was, uh, she, she was battling ALS, and I knew, her, I knew his wife, Joanne. So condolences to uh, Richie Scarlett and uh, his family. That is just awful, awful news. Uh, I'm sure he'll bounce back musically, though, and, and figure out something to do. The incoming guys in Ace's band, as I mentioned, we covered this the other day. They're, they're from Nashville. 
They have a cover band called The Rock and Roll Residency that is phenomenal. I hang with them. I watch them play on many of the cruises that I host. And they, you know, that's the band Gene was using. They're all big Kiss fans. They're pros. They can play anything. And, you know, I'm sure, like I said, through Gene, he made these connections and decided it was time to get a, you know, get some fresh blood. I did hear from Scott Coogan about it. I uh, got an email for a text from him last night. Obviously, he's not all that happy about it, but he said, it's okay, it's fine. It's time to move on. All these guys are hired guns. They're going to, you know, it's, they're going to get, most of these bands are built that way. They're going to get changed out. It's going to happen. I'm not saying it's cool. It sucks, but it's, it's just kind of, you know, how it works. Eric in Dallas. Hi, Eric. Hey, Eddie, long time listener. Thank you. Hey, I, uh, I loved your Rush uh, Top 20, but I would have put Subdivisions and Limelight on there. But anyways, I was calling about the new Lizzie Borden CD. Do you, are you a fan of Lizzie Borden? Or have you heard the new CD? I was never a huge fan. I don't dislike them. I was just, I couldn't, I couldn't, I'm kind of indifferent to them. Uh, I have heard the record. There's some good stuff on the record. I like it, but I, I couldn't say... I couldn't sit here and tell you honestly, Eric, that I was a huge fan of his uh, of all his work and know it inside out. Uh, I just uh, I thought it was real catchy, and for being away for so many years, it just was a great breath of fresh air to have a have some new music for him. And before you hang up on me, go Cowboys. <laughs> well, Eric, you know what? It makes sense for you to say that because you're in Dallas, so you should be a Cowboys <laughs> fan. So I, I get that. What I have a problem nope. with is the people that don't even live anywhere near Texas and wear all the garb, and they couldn't even tell you who they're playing that weekend. No, we're not doing that much better than the the Giants. Are, exactly. Right? Exactly. This division's still wide open. Thank you, Eric, for the call. No, I know Lizzie. I, he lives in Vegas now. I've hung out with him a couple times. I, 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 I you know, I knew some of the earlier stuff. It, it, again, as I've said so many times, it, he hadn't made a record in like 12, 15 years. Uh, theatrical artist. Um, incredibly difficult for those guys to, as I said, if you did not have major success 30 years ago and you're trying to, to, to sell new music now, it's just unbelievably difficult. And unbelievably difficult to find an audience and get enough people to, to go play shows. It's just impossible. You got bands out there that had three, four huge hits 30 years ago, and they're, they're, they're drawing 52 people a night. Steve in Tampa. I'm still looking for it, Steve. What's that? I'm still trying to get Pearl Jam 20. No, no. I looked today on Amazon. I was actually going to buy it for you. And it looks like <laughs> Amazon Prime, I was going to buy you a Festivus gift. It looks like on Amazon Prime you can get it. Oh, to stream? It looks like that, yeah. You know, well, look, hey, Steve, that's great information because, and I, and I'm, this is God's honest truth. Every night I, when I have time to sit down to watch a rock doc, I think of Steve in Tampa. I'm like, i got to find Pearl Jam 20. My wife has, has me subscribed to, like, everything from Hulu to this to that. I mean, I, I'm paying fees every month like you can't believe on all these services and every friggin' cable channel imaginable. But, but, um, so, th so last night I'm flying and I'm freaking out because the Giants are on. And I had a caller yesterday that told me that on some airline Wi-Fi you can stream Amazon Video, and they air they air the national football games on there. Son of a bitch, don't you know? Before I left the house yesterday, I put the app on my phone because of course I didn't even know, but I'm paying for Amazon Prime Video. And my wife gives me the code. I put it on the phone. Last night, I buy the Wi-Fi on the plane, and I watched the game. It got through on the, on the plane Wi-Fi. So I have, for the first time now, on my devices, the Prime app, and I will absolutely, when I get off the air, search for that. And if it's there, I will absolutely watch it, maybe even on the flight home on Sunday. Yeah, of course, it's better on a big screen. But hey. Yeah, or, or then I'll wait when I get home. But yeah, you're right. No. And, you know, I was going to just buy the basic. I wasn't going to get the, the Blu-ray. But... Uh... No, don't buy anything. Hey, I got you. it. I got it. Thank you. Because you'll never find it. I have stuff I can't find. But um, uh, a couple things real quick. Thank you for the Soul Asylum recommendation. I have those songs from the Silver Lining. I have those tunes going through my head. I listen to that CD probably three, four times a week. Um, 
your story about the ENG shoot, I don't know if you remember, I, I'm kind of in the business and lucky enough to still be there. But I, we used to do a bunch of stuff at golf resorts. But that whole thing, uh, I empathize. And I'm not talent, but the crew's waiting. And if the talent doesn't get there, oh, my goodness. Yeah, not good. Um, oh, you're talking about yeah. what? last The drama oh, last yeah, week yeah. trying to get yeah. – oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> I know. I, so I've been – again, we used to do a lot of stuff in golf courses in Florida. Uh, early in the morning, and some courses would roll out the red car- carpet, and some courses were like, oh, here's a room, and do your thing. But, uh, hey, if you have an extra Aerosmith Live bootleg poster, you can always send that to me. But, uh, hey, um, hey, you ca- once called me a legend. And, and then the other thing about what you said earlier, the 70s, the R&B channel uh, uh, isn't called Afro 70s, and the 50s channel isn't called Grease or Rock. I'm to- I'm totally there with you. They just downgrade it. Can we have one guitar on these rock shows? Remember when Guns N' Roses? I know you got a lot of uh, calls. Peace, man. Safe travels. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Steve. Steve literally had was said he must have been going down a checklist of stuff on his mind all week. <laughs> he ju- he jumped around like I know. I know everything Steve was referencing and talking about in that phone call because I do this show. So I know every single thing I said and did in this past four days on this channel. I don't expect, although I appreciate audience, the audiences that listen every single day to, to the show. It's only a two-hour show, so hopefully you can do it. But Steve literally, like, <laughs> he, was, he was talking about it. one story. He was, like, all over the place. I don't even – that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the takeaways from it for me are that Steve wants me to find him an Aerosmith bootleg poster, which I don't think I have an extra, but I'll look. And um, he was kind enough to almost buy me Pearl Jam 20, which he's on a mission for me to see. But don't buy it, Steve, because he's now giving me the tip that it's finally shown up on a streaming service. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> All right, let's get a break in. Eddie Trunk, that's what that, is, that personifies, that embodies Free for All Friday in one phone call, folks. Uh, just a lot to get on it, get out in in a, in a short period of time, and get his thoughts about a, a lot of things he heard about this week on this show. We'll come right back and with more of your calls, more of a Free for All Friday on Trunk Nation. Coming right back. Okay. Remember, in case you uh, you weren't listening yesterday or earlier today. Next Trunk Nation L.A. Invasion, October 24th, which is a week from Wednesday at the Rainbow, as usual, in Los Angeles, live 6 to 8 p.m. Pacific. If you're in L.A., come down and watch. If you aren't, just listen. That day will be the live broadcast of the show. And uh, again, it doesn't cost you anything to get in. We have a great time there at the Rainbow in L.A. Back to the phones. Dave in Canada, Alberta, to be exact. Welcome, Dave. Hey, Eddie, how's it going? Great, buddy. What do you got? Well, I want to propose an idea to you because much like you, I get angry every year I hear about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and what they've done. And I, they almost make me feel bad because I don't bow and worship to the likes of Jim Morrison and the Doors and all the people they seem to think are great. And I think it's time that Eddie Trunk starts his own Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And the way it would work is... People write to you, like handwritten letters, nominating bands for six months, and they get posted, and people can vote on who gets into this Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The only way that somebody in the existing Rock and Roll Hall of Fame gets in is if it's by a re- nominated by recorded artists, and then people in the Hall of Fame can then, you know, uh, put influences in. Because what we have now is just garbage with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Well, Dave, here's the thing that I'll say about that. First of all, as far as if you're going to do a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the artists that are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame currently, I mean, let's be honest, there's a huge amount of them that you'd be foolish to do a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and not include. I mean, who's going to not have uh, the Beatles, the Stones, the Who, uh, you know, Zeppelin? I mean, countless, countless bands. Uh, Thanks, Dave, for the call. I'll do my best to comment here. Uh, there, there's countless, let, let's be clear, there are countless deserving, worthy bands in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. 
the the issue comes in in terms of the process, how long they've waited, how they've been treated, who still isn't, who is going in over others, the eternal debate about why is there R and B and uh, hip hop acts included when you know other genres of music are not in something called the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So there's a million twists and turns to all this, but you can't say that. If you're doing a true rock and roll hall of fame, there's no way you could say that that there's not a you know seventy percent off the top of my head probably of people currently in it that you wouldn't want to have in yours. That'd be foolish to not think that. So they, there's a lot right about the rock and roll hall of fame. There's a lot that still isn't is, is wrong and disrespectful to our kind of music. I uh, and that's what I've made my soapbox about for twenty years about this thing. But you can't deny. There are unbelievably legendary, deserving, worthy bands that are in that. The, the, the thing that I'm hit with and have been hit with for years, since I've been such a vocal critic of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for so long, and this has been a big platform of mine, TV and radio, for years. You guys may remember my what, what people felt were epic rants about it on that metal show and various other things that I've done. And again, I'll say this, I do not do it for effect, I, and I do give credit where credit is due, as I just did. But I've always gotten that, the response to that from people all the time is, well, you, you should start a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You should start a real Rock Hall of Fame. And I got to tell you, over the years, I have had meetings and discussions about doing exactly that. One of the things that I've always felt very strongly about with that, though, is this. I don't want to do that unless it's real, it has backing behind it, it has true, something really substantive behind it. Meaning, I don't want to say, I don't want to come on the radio one day and say to you guys, hey, guess what? Here's the deal, guys. I'm starting the Real Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And it's going to be, you know, and we're going to start it and the voting starts next week and I'm going to get a, a ballroom somewhere in a hotel or a VFW hall and we're going to, you know, I'm going to make up awards and I'm going to hope people show up and then we'll, we'll put it on YouTube. I don't want to do all that. I don't want to. Do, it's ridiculous to me. I want to do it that it's real, that it lives somewhere. I have a whole concept, by the way. And I had meaning. Hell. Three, four, three, four years ago, I had meetings with the way high ups at the Hard Rock in Vegas, the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Vegas, because that's where I'd like to do if I ever did it. That's where I'd like to do it, because not only do I love Vegas, but Vegas is a city that is, you know, so many people travel through every week. But I had real meetings with people. And for whatever reason, it just never takes the step. But to effectively do it, I need a real corporate partner like a place where I'm sitting right near right here, a hard rock, something with real money, real resources, buildings, structures. I got the concept. I got the idea. I'm not going to give it out over the air because I don't want anybody else taking it. But if somebody ever really wanted to do this, I'd be down for it. I can tell you that a couple of years ago, Corey Taylor reached out to me and, and he said, hey, I've got this idea. We're going to do a, a Rock Hall of Fame. You got it. We're going to do this and we're going to have meetings and my managers involved. It all, it all dissipated. It just never – all these people have these ideas, myself included, but unless you've got some real backing behind it and you've got a real muscle and real corporate backing and a, a branding and money to play with and a physical structure for it to live, it's, it's – yeah, I don't want to do something just to say I did it and it's cheesy and doesn't live up to what, you know, what it should be. So that's how I've always felt about it. Will, will the day come that there's an opportunity? I hope so. I got a hell of an idea if, if the opportunity presents itself. Another hour of your calls as we continue on a free-for-all Friday here on Trunk Nation. Stick around. Coming, guys. Tremendous. Appreciate you all listening. Thank you for the support. As I mentioned, two years of volume, the two-year anniversary of this show and this channel just coming Wednesday. And it's just uh, remarkable what we've built here with Trunk Nation and our our get together every day for a couple of hours talking rock with you as we build our uh, our rock army, if you will. And I appreciate that like crazy. You guys listening, getting involved, calling. Uh, do my best to get to as many of you as possible today as we uh, have another hour to play with here 
on Trunk Nation here on Sirius XM 106. Back in the New York City studios on Monday and live shows Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday next week, including a Wednesday, the celebration of the second year anniversary of this channel by giving you a free-for-all Wednesday. You know on this show where basically you guys can call anytime. We do free-for-all all all the time, but uh, we're going we're to do that across the board. California, thank you, Trey, for calling. What's on your mind today? Hey, how's it going, Eddie? Good, Trey. What do you got? Last week I went and saw Journey Def Leppard at the Gold Blood Center in Sacramento, and my first time seeing Def Leppard, and they played first, and Joe had voice, man. So it still sounds really good at his age. And um, a Journey played Blatz. I saw that's my second time seeing him, and they played amazing as well. I was glad they played Stone Alive because that guitar solo was amazing. Yeah. So you enjoyed it. It was a good show. You you were happy with oh, both yeah. performances from both bands. Yeah. It, it, it looked like no nobody left early, too. It looked like it was sold out, and uh, every seat was pretty much filled. Yeah, I would think, and thanks, Trey, for that report. I would think that in a, in a case like, I don't think Journey Leopard on that tour, I don't think at all that that's a tour where one, nobody's staying for both bands. We, we had a lot of calls from people in the last few weeks about the Priest Deep Purple tour and how that seemed to be a very divided audience. And there were only, there were, you know, half the people were there for, well, should say like a third of the people were there just for Priest, a third of the people were there just for Purple and left, you know, when, when, when Priest, when Purple went on. And then the other third, the, the middle third, watching both bands, that it was fairly divided. But I don't, I, that's not the case at all with Leopard uh, Journey. I think one of the things that made that so successful is it, it, two huge bands with huge amounts of hits and whose fan bases would enjoy the, the, Yeah, I'm sure that there were people certainly slanted one way towards the other, but nobody I don't think is leaving that when the other band goes on. Now, maybe 5%. Thank you, Trey, for the report. This is Brian in Florida. Hi, Brian. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you should start it but I told you before, and I'll, I told you before, and I'll tell you again: hard rock and metal desperately needs its own hall of fame, uh, especially if, like, like, uh, like, like, um, you, you, what, like, uh, what you, what you once said about Slayer, how how they will never get inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, Hard rock, I, 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 hard rock and metal. Uh, it's about fucking time that hard rock and metal get the re- respect that they deserve. And so, fuck the Rock Wall Hall of Fame and fuck Howard Stern. <laughs> I used to. Whoa, 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 whoa! What's your problem with Howard? Where did he come into this? I used to love him, but he. he <laughs> He refused to vote for Judas Priest in the Rock oh. Hall of Fame, so he can suck Wait, did he say that? Dick. Wait, did did Howard say that? I didn't know if Howard had a vote, but I don't know if Howard said that. Brian, I got to run. Thank you for your call. I mean, I appreciate your passion. I, I whether Howard voted for Priest or not, I'm not. I would never say that because that's his opinion. But uh, what I was the, the reference to Howard Stern with Priest, as I which which came up a few times, was the fact that they they had a debate on the Howard show with his staff because a lot of people on his staff do have a vote like I do for the Hall of Fame. And Gary Delabate and John Hine and those folks did not believe Priest should be in and did not vote for them. They said that openly on the show. And Richard Christie on that show, who is a big metal fan, pushed back, as did Sal Governale. And they tried to pull me into it to be on their side to fight against those guys. And they even talked to me about going on there and making the case for Priest, which, of course, they said I would, but I never got the phone call to actually do it. So that's what that was all about. Howard himself, I have no idea if he has a vote or cares one way or the other. <laughs> Just, you know, so you, you can, you know, you can be angry at those guys if they don't want to vote, but that's their decision. But again, I can't. Let me let me explain something too. Here's the here's here's what supports my point, by the way, about not wanting to do some half ass bullshit Hall of Fame. Guess what? There have been rock hard rock and metal award shows 
and Hall of Fames. There have been. They exist. Do you know about them? Probably not. Why are you got why is everyone calling me and telling me to do one? Because the people who have done them so far and have tried to do them or are trying to do them have not gotten any real traction in the mainstream with it. Because maybe it's just not fully realized. That's what I mean by having the proper backing. You got to have real muscle. It, you got to have a real corporate partner. I've always said and again, it's ironic that today I'm doing this show from a Hard Rock, and I have a great relationship with the Hard Rock chain. They're always so good to me around the country, really. I've done so many different things at various Hard Rocks. My buddy, who my buddy John Pasquale, who runs entertainment for the one in Times Square, I mean, I've done a million events there with him over the years. I haven't done much there recently with him, but just because of my schedule, but I've done tons of stuff with him in Times Square. That my 25th and my 30th anniversary party for my terrestrial show, one of which Priest played a private show for me, was there. Uh, here I am at the Hard Rock in Tulsa. I'm always at uh, doing stuff with, with Hard Rocks. They're great facilities. They're great, and it's a natural extension of what I do. It's a rock app, a rock setting. I mean, last night I'm walking through this casino. I mean, they're playing, uh, they're playing Iron Maiden Number the Beast video. I mean, this is like home to me. This is amazing, right? So that, to me... That would be the perfect dance partner for something like uh, my idea. Because look at the name of the place, Hard Rock. And they've got facilities and places all over the globe, casinos, hotels, resorts, restaurants. I mean, the, the, the opportunities are limitless on what could be done. And as I told you a few years ago, I, I never really talked about this, but I had uh, pretty in-depth meetings with the Hard Rock in Vegas, which, by the way, the for not to get all technical here, but the, the Hard Rocks, and I do a ton with the Hard Rock in Hollywood. As a matter of fact, there's a Alice in Chains show there and a Manson show there, the 28th and the 30th of this month in Florida that I'm, I'm uh, involved with. So all, I'm, now it's just all coming to me, all these Hard Rocks I work with, right? But not to get all technical, but the Hard Rock around the world is owned by the Seminoles. Except for the Hard Rock in Vegas. The one in Vegas, the Hotel Casino, is not owned by the Seminoles. It's owned by a private company. It's, it was cut out of the original deal to the, to the Seminoles. This, this, where I'm sit, standing right now at the Hard Rock in Tulsa, this was originally called the Cherokee Casino and became a branded only Hard Rock and now actually is been folded into the Hard Rock chain. So those things all come into play, too, because everybody's got to be on board on doing something like that. But it to me, the no brainer of no brainers would be aligned with a with a Hard Rock and you could do something really huge. The the tie ins, the cross to really make a Hall of Fame connect with with people and to there's so trust me i don't want to give it all out on the air but there's so many ideas i have in in how it could work but they have to want to do it and honestly i mean when i had those meetings that there was like you know some people were into it some people are yeah there's already a rock and roll hall of fame i don't want to fight that but that's what it's going to take but it, it it proves my point about why anybody doing a doing some sort of other competing rock hall of fame it proves my point about why i wouldn't do it unless it was really done right with real resources behind it because i could give you three four five examples of people who are doing it or are trying to do it and nobody knows about it so what good is it <laughs> it clearly didn't you know satisfy people it clearly didn't have a long reverberation. It clearly didn't have big meaning. VH1 even tried to do it, folks. I worked on the show. It was called Rock Honors. It happened two years and died. It was a TV show. Instead of a statue or whatever they give you or a, you know, or a, a trophy, they gave rings. It aired. VH1 Rock Honors. Look it up. Kiss, Def Leppard, Judas Priest, Queen. I was one of the producers on it. They pulled the plug after the second year. So it's not that easy. It's not just, and I'm not going to start it and do it out of my basement. I want it to be real. Otherwise, it's not worth anything. 
Rhonda in Tulsa. Hi, Rhonda. Hi, Eddie. Welcome back. Always great to be here. Why is it so cold all of a sudden, Rhonda? (laughs) I don't know, but it's a nice break from our normal weather. I know. When I checked into the hotel last night, the guy working the the desk, I said, you know, I was here a week ago. I said it was like 80. I said, it's like 40 out there. And he just looked up at me and goes, I'm not complaining. (laughs) (laughs) None of us are. Hey, I had a question for you or just to get your opinion. Um, As far as all the meet and greets, the paid meet and greets and, you know, bands, presence on social media do you, in your opinion do you think that's killed the rock star image or the stigma of a rock star i kind of think a little bit yeah no i would agree with you i think that's a very valid point ronda i'd give you that for sure the mystique definitely is gone if you know what somebody had for breakfast every day and where they are every minute and what they're doing for sure now who now let's think about this who are some of the artists that still have that sort of mystique somebody like axel rose for sure right and he's a guy that doesn't true. do any of that. That is true. I so it's a good that... point. And, and, you know, he yeah, he, so he doesn't do paid meet and greets. And he there is some social media. A lot of Axel's social media sometimes is, you know, politically driven stuff or things like that that I've noticed he, tw- he tweets some things. But outside of that, yeah, there's a few guys that still keep that sort of mystique up. Marilyn Manson would be another one that comes to mind. Uh, Van Halen for sure because they don't talk to anybody about anything and nobody knows what the hell is going on. Same with ACDC. So those artists are still looked at, all of them, as big, big, big rock stars because there's so little information about them. Yeah, I I agree with that, especially the Van Halen one. I'm a hardcore Van Halen fan. And uh, Ross, not Hagar. But I just know that, I mean, it's nice for a fan that they're more accessible to the fans. And it makes them more real. But I just think it takes that edge off. In the 80s, I was married to a 60s rock star. And when the resurgence of 60s music happened, uh, we toured. And it was great and played with a lot of big bands. And about the closest a fan could get was, you know, if they were lucky to get some glossies, we'd go out to the gate and sign them or that type of thing. And you kept that mystique, and people were just dying to get backstage type thing. So I just see that, especially social media, I think that's really taken away from, like, wow, I wonder what they're like in their real life. (laughs) Yeah, I I mean, I I think there's definitely ways that you want to manage that and handle that. And and, uh, I think, and, and thank you, Rhonda, for the call. And since you're here in Tulsa, come on out to the IDL if you're around tonight and check out Tom Kiefer. It'll be a great show tonight. Maybe we'll see you there. But your point, Rhonda's points are very, very well uh, spot on. Social media is, an, there, there are people that manage it and do it very well. There are people that clearly have other people doing it for them. You know, if you look at Ozzy's Twitter or whatever, you know, that's not Ozzy. But then there's people that handle it really well, like Slash. Slash does his own social media. He does his own Twitter. I mean, I, you know, I talk to him about it. I know him. And if you watch his tweets, I mean, for the most part, it's... After every show, hey, thank you, Cleveland. You guys were great tonight. Or, you know, a couple things about nothing like, you know, hey, I picked my kids up and I blew a tire or something like that. Some, you know, some some do the opposite. Every single thing, every breath they take, every meal they eat, every food they put up there. I mean, I don't know what's right or wrong. Slash posts a lot of things like on his Instagram of, um, A lot of like crazy drawings and he's into like horror stuff and uh, cartoons and stuff like that. So he'll just always post a lot of that sort of thing. And then you got these guys like, you know, to me, if you follow Axl Rose on, on Twitter, I think it's clearly him tweeting. I don't think anybody else is tweeting and it's very limited. There's not a lot up there and a lot of it is politically driven stuff. But, um, there's some people that handle it really well. And then there's some people that are over the top with it, and some people find a balance. For me, as I've said many times, Twitter was always the one that I do the most, I'm most active with, I enjoy the most. I find, to me, I've got about 265,000 Twitter followers, and I, I really appreciate that. It's an incredible number for me. But to me, I look at it just as a catalyst to keeping in touch with those people, giving them a glimpse into my world, and most importantly, 
letting them know what I'm doing on any given day. I mean, every single day before I come on to do this radio show, there's a tweet. Hey, just a reminder, 2 p.m. Eastern time, about to go live. Come on over to 106. And then, of course, you know, every once in a while, I'll get on there and engage with some people and, and answer and stuff. I'll post some stuff on Instagram. I know Instagram is like the, the hot thing, but that's always got to be a photo. And I, every once in a while, I'll put some stuff up over there. But I do it all myself. And, and Facebook completely got away from me a long time ago where the, the, the private side and the public side sort of merged. So there's this fan side of my Facebook thing that I post things on, but I don't interact or talk to people on Facebook. I'm very, that's probably where I'm the least, but it can be all consuming, man. If you don't find a way to manage it and find your time for it, it can be all consuming. So I just try to balance it. I don't ever really put a lot of personal things on there outside of me, like loving the giants and, you know, get into it on there every once in a while on football. But I know that 99% of the people that follow me there are there to want to know about my travels, my exploits and my, uh, my music stuff, my opinions on things, records, suggestions, what I'm doing with my various jobs and that's what I try to keep it to. Very rarely will you see me put a, a photo of pancakes up or or even even family stuff. I try to keep that off of there, too, because it's I know most people over there are there for, uh, you know, I mean, there's some exceptions, but every once in a while, my kids will come to me and say, hey, dad, can you? But very, very rarely. I try to keep, you know, keep that sort of stuff, stuff separate because I know most people want, you know, they want the music stuff from me there. And, and that's what it's about. But everybody has a different way to handle it. But Rhonda's point is really well taken. I mean, if, if you think about it, we were, you know, there used to be a huge mystique over seeing someone or meeting someone or the opportunity to meet someone. Now it's like, if you got the cash, <laughs> you got a chance to meet them because there's pretty much not, there's really very few artists who are not doing paid meet and greets. Very few. It is pretty much the norm. And that in and of itself is pretty interesting when you think about it. But uh, I, I'm trying to think. It's probably a handful that don't do it, but by and large, most of them do. Why? Because it's a nice chunk of extra money. They're making extra money. Where they're, they're losing money on, on record sales. We're going to make up money because we're going to go on the road. And you can buy everything. I just read something online. There was a package offered for a band. You could stand on the side of the stage. You could stand on the stage during the sound check. You could go into the photo pit. You could get the microphone. The guy sang it. I forget what band it was. But literally everything is for sale. Forget about just a picture and something signed. Everything is for sale. Is it right or is it wrong? I don't know. It's your, your perspective on that. But it's all about, at the end of the day, making money. And that's what these guys go on the road to do. And if, if that they're going to find other ways to supplement their income, most are going to do it. There's very few that will not. When Motley Crue was touring, Tommy Lee refused to do paid meet and greets. So if you bought the Motley Crue meet and greet, it said right on there, you will not be seeing Tommy. Kind of respect Tommy's decision there. He wasn't feeling it. He didn't want to do it. It wasn't for him. He didn't think it was right. I mean, it's leaving a lot of money on the table. But I, I respect where he was coming from on that. And and because here's the thing, too. And I used to get into this with Ace Frehley when he first started doing paid meet and greets. And I did a bunch of stuff years ago with Ace, signing shows, private signings, all that. If you're charging somebody to take a photo with them or to sign something with them for them, and you're, you're taking their cash, you got to do be in the right headspace to do it, meaning you got to act like you want to be there doing that. You got to act like you care. You, know? <laughs> you got to give that person their moment. Even if it's 60 seconds, you better be engaged. You better be into it. You know how many times people would say, oh, the guy just looked down. He didn't look up at me. He didn't make eye contact with me. I may hear that from people constantly about these meet and greets. You're going to take somebody's hard-earned money to take a photo with them or to sign something, you got to give them their moment. You got to, even though you're hating life and the reality is 90% of those guys would rather be somewhere else any given moment than there. You better 
fake it and become the greatest actor at, at all to give that person the moment they paid for. And if you're willing to do that, but you know, you know how many times you get called, I get calls from people like, yeah, I felt like, I, t well, I had this on the air and it made big news when I said this, which is ridiculous because it's like, it's exactly what it is. We were like, you know, I felt like I got treated like cattle. They just moved me on. There's a bad guy. You, you know, don't look, don't take a picture, don't shake hands. I mean, you can go on and on about all the rules with this stuff. What's right and what's wrong. I just believe that if you're going to do it, you better be fully engaged in doing it and you owe it to that fan if you're going to take money from them to at least give them their time. Hell, when I used to do it with Don and Jim, when we were doing that metal show uh, club dates live, we would do like 20, 30 people because it helped us offset our expenses. You know, we made a little extra money. Same reason why. And, and we used to have to have the, the security. We'd spend so much time back there talking to these people and telling them to sit down. And we used to actually have the security guys would have to come in and say, hey, guys, you got to start the show soon. Can we clear this room? Because we were, who the hell were we? We were happy. If somebody was willing to spend an extra 20 bucks to come back and take a photo with us, it helped us out a little bit, and we wanted to make sure they left happy. But some of these guys, they won't even look up and make eye contact with you and, uh, you know, here, get the hell out of here. You can't do that if you're going to charge. Let's hit a break. We'll come back. we got time for more calls. Good good, just good uh, thing to jump off of and talk about, Rhonda. That's why I love doing these, these free-for-alls because you never know what's going to get me going. It doesn't take much. <laughs> stream of consciousness stuff uh we'll come right back and we'll Southern california this is brent who is in southern california welcome brent what's going on hi thanks for taking my call again um sure. a couple things really quick first thing um your next top 20 it's got to be iron maiden man it's got to be iron maiden i've already got that's on the iron list maiden. yeah th absolutely that i don't know if it'll be next but we will definitely do that and that's going to be a good one because that's exactly what i'm talking about big catalog super passionate fans uh yeah that's me i've already got mine done in anticipation of how hard it was going to be um so I've been working on it over the past two months. And, <laughs> Got to jump and start on it. <laughs> it's done. We uh, should do now, Priest at some point, too, I would think. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that, too. And Metallica. Um, and Metallica. Mm -hmm. We got time. Yeah, we got now, time, yeah. Now, these music award shows, um, man, you know what? I, I think that these the, the major networks just don't want to – cater to that demographic because i think they're trying to pull the millennials who really don't watch network tv they usually do a lot of streaming and um but i think they're missing out because look in the past 10 years i found myself working with just hundreds of these millennial uh, age kids and they're um, a lot of them are closet metalheads they all listen to classic rock and metal and like at work right now we have a jukebox and these kids are constantly putting on classic rock like zeppelin and um and others onto the jukebox and they're even starting to get into um greta van fleet that that band's blowing up big with the kids i work with so right. i think they would be surprised if one of the major networks um you know advertised it and put out like a, a rock award show or just a rock show and then advertise it heavily and said oh we're also going to stream it on hulu and youtube red and all these other shows I think they would see some ratings out of it, so I, I think they're missing out. And also, Eddie, with all the contacts that you have in the industry, you've got to know somebody or know somebody who knows somebody who maybe produces the AMAs, who maybe you can get some answers from them like, hey, what's going on? You know what I mean? I think – well, Brent, I think what goes on – and you, you, have very, you made some really good points there, Brent, and thank you for the call. You, you're you're – 100% right, where younger people are absolutely becoming fans of classic rock. Why? Because their parents have turned them on to it. And just like anything, you know, they've gotten into their parents' record collections. They grew up listening to it. They, my son is 11, and he likes Queen because he heard me playing Queen, and he gravitated towards Queen. So that's really young, of course, but you know what I'm saying? Certainly 20s, 30s, they are into a lot of that stuff. So your point is very well taken on that. Your, your point about the distribution methods is also spot on. Younger people do not even have cable TV. They don't have cable services. 
they they stream like you said and uh you know work off of apps and and what have you i mentioned this uh, this this past summer was the first summer that i've owned a a small house at the jersey shore and i wasn't going to put a cable tv in there even though i i am somebody who's totally still a tv guy you know i i like having my dvr i like clicking through the channels i have I have traditional, uh, I have Verizon's TV service, so I get, and I get every channel they offer. I like that. I can afford to do it. I like it. I know younger people can't afford it, or they don't want all that stuff, or they don't watch TV at all. But I bought this TV that was a Roku built-in TV for my beach house, because, you know, we're not going to be there for months at a time. Why am I going to pay for cable TV? And it came with all these apps on it. Half the stuff I could watch for free through streaming not to pay for the wi-fi but i could watch for free but the reason why i could watch it for free too was because i already was paying for it somewhere else meaning every time i tried to log into one of the services whether it was a network or whatever i would need to put the password for what i for the service i had at my main house to prove to them that i was paying for it somewhere but all of these people are working all these loopholes and I, I would think these shows like the AMAs and all that have to be available on some sort of streaming platform. Like I said, last night I watched my Giants get decimated on Amazon Prime on my phone on the app pulling the Wi-Fi on the plane. And the, when the Wi-Fi on the plane said it doesn't support streaming, but somehow I was able to get it through. So... There are all these alternative different ways to do it. And as far as what's going on and why we don't see rock on these shows, for as much as the recent MTV Video Music Awards was also a utter abomination for a rock fan, at least they threw you Aerosmith at the end. I mean, that really made up for a world of otherwise horrendousness, horrificness in that show. But, man, that was like, you know, you got that four, three, four minutes of Aerosmith at the end. That was tremendous. But it's still tanked. I think what happens with these shows and why they don't put rock is I think that, yes, they are going younger and they want younger. I get, I've said it a million times, I get I'm not the desired demographic for those shows. I I'm fully am aware of that. But there are younger rock bands like a Greta Van Fleet that are appealing to younger people. Those guys in Greta Van Fleet are 20 years old. So why not? And But I think the way, the reason why they shun rock so much is because rock is not currently on the charts in terms of sales and airplay we're in a pop dominated airplay world pop is the mainstream mass appeal music of the day and that encompasses some hip-hop and r&b stuff as well and i think these people who produce these shows are so driven by the current hot young pop celebrity and all the trappings and paparazzi and fashion and dance moves that come with that as a visual for TV that they completely write off any viability of having some rock acts spread in because they just it just doesn't fit what they envision it should be. It doesn't fit what you know, they get wrapped up in the top 40 culture and rock does not occupy space right now in that world. But if they looked a little more broadly, they'd realize that the biggest, still the biggest thing that people pay tickets for to go see is rock. All these festivals, all this stuff. So they're seeing it through a very narrow lens. And I agree completely with, with Brent that, uh, that those are all issues. But I don't think it's any sort of inherent bias. I just think they're just not that educated about it. You can't, you, they don't, they don't take, that's what makes me so crazy. You don't want to do rock, don't do it. If you put on a TV show and you called it the Pop Music Awards, I wouldn't, A, I wouldn't be watching, and B, I wouldn't care if you didn't have rock in it. But when you're going to call yourself the American Music Awards, and you're going to label your categories rock, and then not nominate one rock act in those categories... And then give the rock duo award to a a, a, a rap hip hop act, whatever it was. That's that's just offensive. Now I'm getting crazy again. 
At the end of the day, they don't know any better. They're just looking at charts and top 40 and hearing from pop program directors. They don't allow the other voices in to create real balance because they don't want it. They just want the starlets, pop starlets of the moment. Oh, I got to stop. Dennis in Boston. Hey, Dennis. Hey, Eddie. How's it going? Good, man. What's uh, going on? Real, qu- man. Uh, real quickly, just a couple quick things. Um, the, you, I loved your Rush um, Top 20. I didn't submit one, but uh, there was one on your website that was pretty close to what mine would have been. Uh, they're my favorite band, but I, I well, hear it that, again. Uh, awesome. Hear it again. Just a quick programming note: next Thursday, the Rush Top Twenty re-airs. Next Friday, the Reaction Show re-airs. So Thursday, Friday next week, you've got the whole. You get every, anybody that missed any of it, relive the whole Rush Mania next week, Thursday, Friday. I felt that uh, Headlong Flight didn't get enough uh, love, though. You're uh, right. I like that track, and I saw that come up on a few uh, lists, and I'd agree with you on that one. Uh, and that, that, to the main basis of my call, I called a couple of weeks ago when you were talking about um, some uh, 80 stuff, and um, someone called and said that they, Gary Sharon worked at the record store, because you're talking about record stores, at the, in their local mall. I lived, I grew up in that town. It was at the Music World and um, Meadow Glen Mall. Just a little background, because I know you love music history, about extreme that you find interesting. Um, they were a real big club band in the Boston area, and they were called The Dream, and the Broadway play at the same name bought the name off them. That's this, so they are big enough that they incorporated the name, and that's when they changed the name to Extreme, and uh, my neighbor was the original bassist in the band, and he was, like, getting frustrated with them just being a local Boston club band as big as, big as they were, and he, he quit right before they got big and they literally blew up like within within a year after him quitting and he's in that uh mother don't go i uh, want to go to school uh video oh yeah yeah wow so you it's saw so him nice. back in you saw extreme back in the earliest days when they were doing the clubs through boston yeah and they were called the dream back then and they were big they were a big band they were a big band back then locally and like he literally quit and within a year they were like you know backing up david lee roth on national tours yeah, I, I remember uh, for sure, uh, Dennis, thank you for the call. I remember for sure, you know, being in Jersey, I would hear from people about this band Extreme and how, you know, the, the unbelievable club shows they were doing. And obviously a lot about Nuno because of the, you know, he, he's the new Eddie Van Halen sort of stuff. And obviously, you know, they would go on, ironically, to have a huge hit with an acoustic ballad become their biggest song. But still a great band today, by the way. And Gary, as Ed mentioned earlier, and I mentioned yesterday as well, Gary Sharon is singing in Joe Perry's solo band. They have some dates coming up. And Extreme still together, still playing shows. And Nuno lives in L.A. He was nice enough to uh, invite me recently to his Halloween party, which I could have almost went to, but with all my travel, I didn't want to take any extra time on the West Coast. So, um but he he's he's got you know he does a big Halloween party out there every year in, in L.A. But and Nuno's going to be on Generation X, which is Steve Vai, Zach, Ingve, Tosin Abasi, and Nuno, which went out a few years ago when we had Vai on with us during the last L.A. Invasion show. We talked a little bit about that, and that's a really cool show. There's a date in early December at the Hard Rock in Hollywood that are going to be hosting on that, and uh, that's definitely something you should check out. As a matter of fact, that date which is, it's on my website, I believe it's December 3rd, is a Monday. And if all goes well, a little bit down the line, but if all goes well, I'll be able to do this show from that show and have Steve, Nuno, Zach, Tosin, and Ingve on, potentially. It's being talked about. So that could be a really, really cool show because they play that Monday night. So it works out on a weekday and all that. I'll know more about that when we get a little bit closer. Let's get our last break in. We'll come back with our remaining minutes. I'll get as many calls in as we can here. I shop this week with a few calls. We have a few minutes left to go before we have to wrap up. So let's go and talk to Stort, who's in Michigan. He's been waiting a while. Go ahead, Stort. Hey, guys. How are you doing? So um, I did all my errands while I was on hold, so thank you very much for letting me do that. I am um, calling about the Lindsey Buckingham versus Fleetwood Mac situation. Now, yeah. 
Fleetwood Mac announced over six months ago that Neil Finn and Mike Campbell were replacing Lindsay in hopes that they were probably going out on tour. Why didn't Lindsay file an injunction to stop the tour before tickets even went on sale or before the show started to make sure he gets whatever he wants to get or what he thinks he deserves to get? Why wait until now when it's already into the tour? Um, I don't know. Stuart, right. I don't know. Good question. I don't know. I mean, I, it could be, I don't know, maybe it could be stuff like things happen where you just kind of let it go and then all of a sudden people get in your ear and they say, hey, you know, you got a case here or you should do this. I don't know. You would think Lindsay and his handlers or his lawyers and with the resources he has would know that and know his situation and know his rights. But I, I don't know. That that would be a question for him. I mean, he maybe took some time to process it. Maybe he wanted to wait and see exactly what they did and how extensive it was, uh, how well he, it was going to do. Maybe he wanted to see if it was going to tank. You know, there's a lot of these guys that are under the impression that they can't do it without me. Nobody's going to care. Fans aren't going to go. And as history has shown, most fans don't know who's even in these bands anymore and go to anything as long as the name is on it. So there could have been some of that too. All right. And then I've got, you know, I know it's like a week or two late, but my two top, top two rush, Rush Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and Rush Limbaugh. Hate his politics. <laughs> fits the category. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. <laughs> His two favorite rushes, Rush Limbaugh and Rush Hashanah. Oh, boy. That was another thing we did back at VH1 Classic. Well, I, was talking, I was talking earlier about my earlier career in TV, pre that metal show and all the great stuff I did at VH1 Classic. But, yes, there was a time where the producers for a couple of years put together a day on, on the Jewish holiday, Rosh Hashanah, and called it Rush Hashanah. And uh, I think they played all Rush videos the entire day or something I like remember that. that. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Uh, maybe we'll get uh, one or two more quick ones here before we have to end. Mark in California. Go ahead, Mark. Hey, Eddie. Uh, I just wanted to get a quick take on what you were thinking about uh, what the rat issues are on the road right now with Steven without getting the personal things. It's kind of a bummer for me because I grew up on the strip with rat and docking and poison and you know, to, to, for what they went through to get the name back, it, it just it, it's just a bummer. It's just it's depressing. I've talked about it a lot in the last couple of weeks. It is depressing. It is disturbing. It is sad. Uh, Piercy, by his own admission, went on that stage on said he was taking painkillers for his knee and he was drinking and just a, a lethal combination as history has shown, especially with a guy who has had well-documented issues with sobriety and was supposed to be sober. And then for it to happen again? And uh, I tell you, I can't, Mark, I couldn't, that initial video of him sitting and slurring and holding onto the drums to stay upright even while seated, I couldn't watch all the way through it. I stopped it a, a couple minutes in. I couldn't look at it. I know the guy. I like the guy. He's a friend. It's scary to me. It's sad. And the inner circle there, you got to hope he's getting a hold on him, getting him some help. I mean, to happen repeated times. Uh, whether it's management, agent, Juan, who's the only other original member in the band. And then you're right, uh, on the bigger picture of things, and, and thank you, Mark, the bigger scope of things, you've got to, and I said this too, I love that band, but the, the history of drama and dysfunction, it, there's no words for it. I mean, Rat should be revered like we love a lot of the big bands that came out of the 80s. They should be, you know, if they could have kept it together, something like, you know, at least closer to Motley level or Def Leppard level or, um, you know, maybe not Bon Jovi level, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, they, they should have been Bon Jovi open for Rat at one point. But but just when you look at the arc and the history, so many great songs, so many great moments on in, in videos, and then so, so much dysfunction and lawsuits and lineup changes and the tragic death of Robin Crosby, which was, you know, all of his excesses. 
And then Warren in, Warren out. Blotzer has the name. Blotzer loses the name. Now Steven. And I mean, it's just, it's craziness. And at the core, such a good band. So many great songs. They did all of that work to get to a certain point, And then that imploded again. And now we don't even know what's going on right now. It's very, very, very sad. And on a personal level, it's upsetting because I love the band and I love the guys personally. And you just hope. Even if they don't play anymore, you just hope they can figure this out. But they are playing. There's dates, I think, this weekend. So, in the calls, and I will try to go a little more quickly than I normally do. I'll try not to get off on tangents. Can't promise, but I'll try so we can get as many calls in as we can because I know you guys are uh, chomping at the bit to get on the air. So let's get it going right away. And we will kick it off with Ricky, who is in North Carolina, to get us started. Hey, Rick. Hey, Eddie. Um, two quick things, and then the comment I called about. Um, I heard you talking about Corn and Limp Biscuit yesterday, and Corn is not new metal. They came out in around 94, so they predate new metal, and they actually got Limp Biscuit a record deal, not the other way around. Oh, well, did I have that wrong? Did I say Limp Biscuit got Corn the deal? Yeah. I mean, oh, okay, I my bad. I just... <laughs> right, yeah, my bad. And, uh, I got that reversed. And then Metallica actually put out a video for every one of the songs that came out with uh, Hardwired, too, when it came out. That's from today's show. Did they do a video for every song from Hardwired? They sure did. Had a different person direct each one, or maybe one person directed two videos or something, but for the most part, it's a different person doing that. That's a double That's a double record, so that's a lot of songs, and there's some long songs on there, too. I didn't realize that. I remember they did a bunch of them. I didn't, I didn't know they did one for every one, though, Ricky. Yeah, I think it's everyone. I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I watched them all when it first came out. But just uh, it, it, this Allison, it, this, but yeah, but real quick, this Allison Chains thing, which we were talking about a few minutes ago, that that is, it's it's more like a movie. So it's going to be like a. There's two songs out now. It's going to, as opposed to individual standalone videos, they're all going to sort of tie together and make a movie, apparently. That's where they're going with that. So interesting what people are doing with video these days. Of course, uh, MTV long gone in terms of being a factor in showing videos, but because of YouTube and online stuff, people are coming up with some creative ways to to showcase their music. What else did you want to say, yeah, Ricky? That's going to be pretty good. Oh, uh, I, I emailed you about it, and I don't know if you ever saw it or not, but uh, Dave Mustaine on, I think it was Twitter, a lady had written him and said, hey, this is my son. He's a guitar player. If you have time, could you critique him or whatever? And Dave was like, yeah. And it started out at first with like some general, like, actual critiques of he's pretty good, maybe get him another amp, that kind of stuff. But then at the end, what, and I've called you about this before, what really drove me nuts is like what he really could use is some good lessons. And if you want him to have some good lessons, you should pay for him to come to the Hendrix experience if we play Ireland and pay, you know, some money for my guitar lessons. Now, they're pricey. But worth it. And it, it bugs me to no end because I remember when these guys were gods, man. You couldn't, like, if you were lucky enough to bump into one of them in a lobby or out in the middle of somewhere, you know, you were fortunate. And now it's like they'll sell you any damn thing. And it's like they've lost all their pride. There's no mystique to them anymore. There's, there's no, that's one thing I love about James Hetfield is he doesn't really care about the meet and greet thing. He, you can't really pay to meet James Hetfield. It just, it drives me nuts that all of the rock godliness is gone. Yeah, well, that's an interesting point. I didn't know. Thank you, Ricky, for the call. I didn't know that Mustaine even gave lessons on the road. I didn't know he did that. I know that Chris Broderick, the former guitar player from Megadeth, does give lessons. There's a lot of guys that do. I did not know that was something Mustaine was offering. But I've, I've said it many times on this show. Everything is for sale, folks. Everything. Right or wrong, everything is for sale. For most bands. And, and you know, the Doyle from the Misfits, touched off a whole thing a couple weeks ago when he said the truth. You know, in certain, certain circles, it's unfor unfortunately, you can't give your opinion or speak the honest truth because people will blast you because we live in a hypersensitive, pounce society, which I can't stand, but that's a whole other story. Anyway, Doyle said... Uh, you know, about he'd much rather be doing something else after a show than meeting and greeting with people he doesn't know for money. But he has to do it because he needs the money because nobody buys music anymore. And there were a lot of people that came out and, and slammed him for that. But it touched off an interesting debate online about people and their thoughts about paid meet and greets and whether they 
how they feel about them, whether they should do them or not, what you know, who does do them, who doesn't do them. The vast majority of people do them. Now, interestingly enough, there was a quote in there from Dave Menachetti of Y&T, who is tonight playing in Newton, New Jersey at a theater. And I don't know, I guess Dave doesn't do the meet and greet thing anymore, but or never did. But his point was like, look, when I'm going to do a meet and greet, I'll go out to my merch and I'll sit at the merch booth and I'll meet and greet whoever wants to meet and greet me and not charge for it because I don't feel right about charging for it. But to no coincidence, he's in front of his merch. So you hope that the person plunks down 30 bucks and buys a T-shirt at least because you're not paying for the meet and greet. Now, in all honesty, though, Y&T operates at a much smaller level than a band like Megadeth would in terms of draw and all that. That's the other thing is, is that the bands, you know, the bigger bands are going to get the, get more money. The smaller bands are going to either get no money or a lot less money. It, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, look, I, I wish for the days when there was a little more mystique and, I've said it so many times where you bought your ticket and you went and you watched the show and you left. I mean, it wasn't like which package, which VIP, which tier, which fake laminate that really doesn't do anything are you getting, which access to the merch first are you getting, you're getting the sound check, you're not getting. I mean, it's crazy, but it's a byproduct of what's happened in the music industry. But I'll say this. I also think there's a lot of people that say a lot of this meet and greet stuff and charging for everything and offering everything for sale has been driven by the lack of sales and making money from records. And yeah, that may have played a role, but let's be honest in a capitalist world and in a world, in a world where just about everybody would love to make more money than less. All it takes is one person to break the seal about doing this stuff and everyone will do it. So, or most everyone. So my point is, even if record sales were still pretty brisk and people made money more the close to or near the same amount of money they used to make selling music, I still think this would be happening. Because who wouldn't want to still maximize profits on the road? And I've said so many times, if you have a problem with any of it, just don't buy it. Nobody's got a gun in your head to buy the stuff. Jason in Kentucky. Hi, Jason. Hey, Eddie. What's up? Hey, I have a I have a comment and a question. The comment is: you mentioned several weeks ago you signed a uh, non disclosure that you wouldn't talk about the Dirt movie. Just want to let you know that Howard on the air said that he watched the Dirt and that he liked it. Want to get your thoughts on that? And my question is do you remember a period where Metal Edge and Circus Magazine and all the metal magazines in the 80s, uh, there was a period where they were only taking pictures of Vince, Nikki, and Tommy. Uh, Mick was not in the picture. Do you know why that was? It was for a brief period. It was, I think it was between Theater of Pain and Girls, maybe, or right after Girls. Um but there was a period where, where Mick wasn't appearing in the photos. Just wondering if you know anything about that. No, I never heard anything about that. I, I asked Mick once if he was ever close to leaving the band because he's the only guy besides Nikki who, who never left Motley Crue. And I asked him if he was ever close to leaving, and he said he was. He told me in an interview that the closest he came, that he was very close to leaving, I think he said around the time of Generation Swine that that was the record he was about to check out on and then he just decided to to stick it out but no i would i would say if it was around that time frame maybe that's because he had thought about leaving the band but i i do not i'm not aware of that at all as far as the nda about the motley movie and and thank you jason i don't know you know i'll tell you what rolling stone a few days ago on the tw on their twitter feed posted a pretty in-depth thing about some of the scenes in the Motley movie. So I don't know what's going on with the you can't talk about it thing. It seems like that's kind of going by the wayside. And since the movie is now, what, two weeks from coming out exactly, right? At two weeks from today, the movie posts on Netflix. 
the, the I guess with interviews and stuff, pe- more people are seeing it in the press, and some people are just not abiding by the agreement to not talk about it or to disclose anything, or unless they're getting waivers. I don't know. I just know that I saw it, and it, and this that was part of the deal. And until someone says to me, "Yeah, it's okay to talk about it," I'm not going to. Because honestly, you're gonna you guys were were gonna want to talk about it after you see it. So we we'll talk about it till we're blue in the face when everybody else gets a chance to see it anyway. I'm not worried about you know breaking anything in it. I don't think it's even that sort of vibe. I just think they want the bulk of the press. But I did notice. I don't know. I didn't hear how much Howard said about it, but I did notice that this Rolling Stone piece did talk about the opening scene in the movie, and it did talk about it's now coming out that there's a David Lee Roth character in the movie. So there's a lot of this isn't stuff coming from me. There's a lot of stuff out there right now that is uh, is coming out about this film, which two weeks out, it's going to happen. So we'll just we'll see how it all plays out. All right, let's get a break, and we'll come back. More of your calls as we continue on a free-for-all Friday next. Back into it on the busy phones. Picking it up with Steve, who is in Florida. Welcome, Steve. Hey, Steve in Tampa. How you been, how you been Ed? Steve in Tampa. What's going on, buddy? Not much. Uh, a couple points. I'm so aggravated myself. I didn't pitch in on your Aerosmith Top 20, but Combination would have been number one, and Bolivian Ragamuffin would have been in there somewhere. And... Do you think the muzzle that Dave Roth uh, wears is adorned with Eddie Van Halen stripes? Um, <laughs> I so, think yeah, that I Dave. That I too. think I think Dave. I think Dave just wants to make sure he doesn't blow his gig. You know, we all know that Eddie runs the show and the brothers run the show, and I think that Dave just, you know, he wants to make sure that if it does come back around, it is him doing the singing. And I think in the meantime, he's just doing everything he can to. To, to keep himself busy and see where it goes. Yeah, no, I'm just taking a stupid shot at him. Um, and I did hear some of that. The best was when he tells the kid when he's an EMT, don't worry, it'll be all right, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, they asked him if, if while he was an EMT, if anyone ever recognized that it yeah, was him. Because, yeah. here, because here's the thing. Uh, I thought about that, too. David Lee Roth looks so much not like what people think David Lee Roth looked like i mean he doesn't look anything like what the 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 common image of in our head of 30 35 years ago of of van halen he looks nothing like that the guy's still in remarkable shape but he doesn't have his hair anymore he's he's completely look different looking guy and yeah he i i suspect a guy like david lee roth in in today these days could have a a great level of anonymity walking around the streets. I guarantee you in listening to that, in, that interview and hearing all the things and places that Roth has been, whether he was an EMT or whether he was taking dance lessons or whatever the hell the different things he's doing, he would he could virtually be pretty anonymous because not a lot of people, unless you're a hardcore fan, I would think would pick him out. Yeah. And obviously he's super smart, but you had a uh, caller the other day mention Driving and Crying. And, and before I forget, and I'm, I'm going into this, Driving and Crying, they do have a documentary out. I've never seen the, seen the movie, but I've seen them more than any other band down here. They toured a lot in the Southeast. And coming up in college radio, they were came out of that thing. You mentioned Fly Me Courageous. That was probably not their best moment. A lot of heavy choruses on that record. But there is a movie on them, Scarred But Smarter, Life and Times. It's on Google Play. I just looked it up. And also um, – He's a great songwriter, and I mentioned that when I called Dave Perner. I wanted to get on your producer for Access's uh, radar. There's a thing called Gasparilla Music, Gasparilla Music Fest, which is happening this weekend. Of course, Driving and Crying is playing here tomorrow night, not at that show, which is weird. Um, but Gasparilla Music Fest, Gary Clark Jr. and Black Rebel Motorcycle Club are headlining it this weekend. So maybe next year you guys can look at that. Yeah, well, thanks, Steve. The thing with the – thanks for the call, man. The things, The thing for the TV show – is this it covers music festivals but the thing that attracts the producer of that show trunk fest to the festivals it picks is nothing to do with who's playing it's everything to do with the setting and the theme so what gets access and my producers excited about covering a festival is if there is some the, the ancillary things that go on around the music 
Because the show is really, if you've seen it, more of a travel sort of show. Uh, they put me in these interesting situations, trying foods, games, rides, talking to some of the artists, of course. But it's really about the setting. So, you know, we go to New Orleans twice because it's New Orleans and all the stuff that they have to offer there. And going to these places like upstate New York and Mountain Jam or going to uh, – I'm going to Wyoming next week. You know, I don't even – honestly, this is this is the truth. I'm shooting – something at a music festival in Wyoming next week in Jackson Hole, I have no idea what the festival is even called. I have no idea who's even playing it. Because when I, you know, and I'll find out, of course, I just know I have to go there and shoot. But they lay out the things. Hey, here's what we want to cover. Okay, there's this tram. There's this ski thing. There's this food thing. Oh, and you're going to talk to this artist playing the festival, and you're going to talk to the guy that's running the festival. It's about that. That's why I just shot on the Monsters of Rock Cruise. What's the setting? What's the theme? A music cruise, the ship. So that's really the driver. If it's just a festival with a couple bands playing in a field and they've got, you know, make, making cotton candy and uh, hot dogs in the corner on a couple food trucks, that's not going to get them excited. They're looking for themes. They're looking for storylines. They're looking for the buzzword of buzzwords in live music these days, the experience. What is the experience? So those are the things I, I, you know, I just found out we might shoot something. There's a music festival at a jail. There it is. Cool setting. Let's go do it. Nuno Betancourt on the Monsters of Rock Cruise was showing me, and I don't know where he's at with this. He's trying, I think he's originally from Portugal or something. And he's trying, he's behind trying to put on a music festival in the mouth of a volcano. (laughs) It's like. I know, he showed me a picture. It's like a dormant volcano or something. I don't know. Or maybe it's not. I don't know. But in, on, the, on the the outskirts of a volcano. My, my producer lit right up when he saw that photo. All right. So get ready for Trunk Fest coming from the mouth of a spewing volcano. Scott in Missouri. Go ahead, Scott. Hey, Eddie. How you doing? Good, man. Hey, I was wanting to know, have you ever heard of a band called Goodbye June? I have not. You need to check these guys out. I'm 50 years old. I grew up in Sacramento. I grew up in Tesla. Watched them come up before they were City Kid and the whole nine yards. And These guys are basically like that. They're, they're a solid, real hard, heavy rock band. Uh, they come out of Nashville. Uh, they can play anything from, like, you know, pound in your face to, you know, like a love song type of era, you know, or whatever you want to call it. Um, have Ed cue you up a song called Oh No or uh, Man of the Moment when you guys go to break. You'll dig this stuff. It's killer. How long have they been around, Scott? Uh, I think I've seen their they've got two albums out. And 2016 was their first album. I, I found them uh, slipping through channels one night about, oh, three or four months ago come across the audience channel and they have they were doing a little live little six song set and man i mean from right then i was like holy crap it, 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 they got a lot of old stuff they bring back to the table and, and a lot of and a lot of new stuff but a lot of old stuff you'll you'll hear a lot of different uh genres in their, in their set it's really killer all right, Scott, I got to run. Thanks for the tip, man. Uh, Ed says he'll look for Goodbye June in th- about anything you want in the world of rock. That's what we do on most Fridays. That's what we do most days here on Trunk Nation on volume. I am thrilled that it's taken a little while, but we've certainly in the last six months or so gotten to that point where everybody realizes now that every day anybody can call in with anything in the world of rock, and that's what I love doing. So it's great to have this daily platform Appreciate all the calls, appreciate all the support, and you guys getting involved. Let's get back to the busy phones right now. Pick it up with Sean, who's in Kansas City. Welcome, Sean. Hey, Eddie, good to talk to you first time in 2019. Thank you, Sean. Hey, uh, I got a review of KISS show and the Metallica show, both in Kansas City. KISS played on the 27th of February. Uh, It wasn't labeled as a sold-out show, but... Uh, you, you, you'd hard pressed to find an empty seat anywhere. Um, I, I pay particular attention to watch lip syncing or any kind of track. I'm sure they did use it. They put on a hell of a show. It was a really fun show. They played over two hours. Um, 
it was awesome. There was a couple of scratchy points in Paul's voice when he was talking and singing, so that made it a little bit more realistic for me as far as that goes. Uh, mm-hmm. I really think you ought to check it out. I know your theory, I know I know your story about why you won't and all that good stuff. Uh, I was just real impressed with it. I saw people from all ages, from as young as seven, eight years old to as old as close to seventy. I mean, I, I'm your age, so yeah, I've seen all walks of life. It was a really, 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 really good time. Uh, and on the Metallica front, they played one week later here. They just played March 6th there. They set a record at the Sprint Center in Kansas City of over 19,634 uh, attendants at that place. Phenomenal show. I mean, those guys, uh, if you haven't seen them, someone need, you need to go see these guys. It, it absolutely will not be a dull moment. And I heard a, a caller the other day talking about, oh, they play – all these songs from Hardwire, and that's kind of worn out. They played two songs. They opened up with Hardwire, and they went to Malt and went straight in their old stuff. I mean, that's that's all they played. It was all it was all good. Um, I'm not a big fan of Jim Burr. I mean, there's guys sitting around me. I was on the floor down there. They were like, "Man, get off the stage, dude." I don't I don't know, but uh, it was a great. Yeah, it's show. a tough it's a tough spot for Brewer, man. I mean, I don't. I mean, I you know he's going out there and people just you know frothing at the mouth to want to see Metallica and you know he's got to get out there and on his own or with the DJ or whatever he's doing basically you know, find a way to, right. to entertain people people won't looking for a band I mean I've heard very mixed things and I don't I don't necessarily think it's you know it's necessarily Jim's fault per se but I think it's just a tough spot thank you Sean for the call and the report and thanks for calling in the on the kiss front I'm not going to rehash it a thousand times Sean went he had a great time that's all that matters my thing beyond the fact of how much of it is real and how much of it isn't, it maintains the same issue. I am not and will not go and watch people impersonating Ace and Peter. That and that is what they are doing. There's no other way to spin it. It's not their fault. That's the the hand they've been dealt. They do a fine job of it. No, no indictment on them as people or players or performers, but I am not going to look at that. And you know what? I'm not the only one that feels that way. Interestingly enough, I saw – an interview or a comment or a quote from Tommy Thayer who meant who th- that was brought up and he said how it's still difficult for a lot of people and he still understands it's difficult for a lot of people. And I give him a lot of credit for saying that because he understands why it's difficult for people to look at him as Ace Freely because he was the hugest Kiss fan in the world before he got the gig. He was in a Kiss tribute band as Ace Freely. There's no higher fan thing than that. So I cannot and never will stress enough, even though it doesn't reverberate with some people, and again, none of the positives ever make the headlines, of course, but I I have zero issue personally with Tommy or Eric doing that job. I understand if they didn't do it, someone else would do it. And they're great at it. And, of course, they put their own uh, spin on the playing. And I'm, I've never said any of that. But I will also say this. If those guys didn't have that gig themselves, especially Eric Singer, he'd probably be the first person criticizing it. I'm not going to look at a guy dressed as Peter Chris at a piano singing Beth. My God, the way I know Eric and, and having talked to him, he's very outspoken about his things privately. <laughs> so you know, I'm just that. That's that's my issue as a as a Kiss fan. If they weren't in that guys, if they were their own people, you know, somebody sent me. I forget who sent me this. A really cool. I, I may tweet it out if I saved it. A really cool artist rendering of the Love Gun cover, and on the on one end is Eric Carr the late, great Eric Carr, in his makeup of the Fox, and on the other end, Vinnie Vincent, in his makeup, the the Ankh Warrior. So it's a photo of six members of the six members of KISS in their respective personas, right? It's really cool. It's really well done. I don't know who painted it. It painted the extra guys in there, but they did a phenomenal job. And I was looking, I was like, wow, that's so cool. And then I stopped for a second and I looked. And I was like, wait a minute. Is the Ace and Peter Ace and Peter or Tommy and Eric? So I looked a little closer and it appears to be Ace and Peter. 
Yeah, because in the makeup, it's kind of hard to tell. But you can tell the differences in the shape of their face. So I'm looking at the, the, the thing, and I'm like, okay, so it's the original Love Gun cover with Eric and Vinny on the end. Now, who gets shortchanged in that? Tommy and Eric. Why? What are you going to do? Paint a seventh and eighth person in Ace and Peter makeup, but just slightly different. I mean, what are you going to do? Now, obviously, who cares about being shortchanged in some fan done thing on the Internet? But you get my point. If they were their own people, and again, it's not their fault that they're not, but if they were their own personas like Eric was and Vinny was, there could have been eight people in that celebratory poster. Oh, and there's that guy and that guy. I mean, it's kind of, it just is what it is. It's ridiculous. But most people don't know or care, and that's fine, too, if you're in that camp. But that's my underlying issue for 18 years, and that's why I'm not going to look at that. As for Metallica, I am dying to see a Metallica show. As I'm talking to you, I am scrolling through the remaining dates right now on their website, and it looks like I'm not going to because they're playing in Michigan. Let's see here. Metallica tomorrow night is in Kentucky, in Louisville. And then on uh, Sunday night, they are playing, wait, tomorrow night, tomorrow's Saturday. Okay, Saturday. Then Monday night, they're playing in Indianapolis. And then Wednesday night, they're playing in Grand Rapids. And then they're playing in Portugal. (laughs) On May 1st, it looks like they're taking about five, six weeks off. So unless I'm going out of the country or booking a last-minute flight to Indianapolis, Grand Rapids, or going to Louisville tomorrow, which I got family plans, but that wouldn't have been the worst thing, I'm unfortunately not going to catch the Metallica Arena run unless I'm scrolling down through their dates, Norway, Belgium, England, Netherlands, Czech Republic, Estonia, Poland, Australia, yeah. The last date listed here is Halloween in Auckland, New Zealand. By the way, I do know the U.S. ambassador, Mr. Scott Brown, to New Zealand. He's offered for me to come over and stay with him. A bit of a flight. It's only about 25 hours in the air. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that might be a bit of, bit, bit of a, a road trip there. Yeah, Eddie, did you see who they're playing with, though? Where? New Z- Ghost, right? No, Slipknot. Oh. Yeah, but I'm not a big Slipknot fan at all. So that's not that, that that's not that exciting to me. And I mean that with all respect to Corey and the guys who I love personally. But I, I just like I was talking to Mark Morton from Lamb of God on here yesterday, I, I'm way more, I, I can't do the ex- extreme vocal thing. There are a few Slipknot songs that I like. But I love Corey in Stone Sour where he sings and it's more of a melodic vibe than Slipknot. Slipknot is an amazing show. Slipknot is incredible energy. I respect the hell out of what they do, but it's it's a little a, a little over the line in terms of the extreme sound for my personal tastes. But d- doesn't mean I don't respect the hell out of what they do or what Corey does. But I'm more in the Stone Sour side as far as personal listening. And I have seen Slipknot live, and it's it's amazing what they do. It really is. But I, I like things a little more with a, a melody and a little bit more of a tune. So yeah, I'd love to see Metallica, and I can't believe the this entire arena run that they did did not come through this area unless I was out of town when it did and forgot about it or didn't know it. But it did not come through New York, New Jersey. Yeah, but there's a reason. That was by design, though. Because they did probably the stadium to kick off this yeah, tour, they wanted which to, I was they, at. They wanted to visit markets they didn't hit with the stadium tour. But they could have easily come back and done a couple arena nights here in this area. Maybe they will. Maybe towards the end of the year they will after they do all this European stuff. They've been out for a long time. But you can see what they do by design. They take a month off. They'll take a couple weeks off. They don't stay consistently. And they do do that intentionally because they uh, – you know, they, they, they're they worried about their family time and their, their own sanity. They don't want to get out on the road and implode again. Trey in California. Hey, buddy, go ahead. You're on the air. Thanks for waiting. Hey, Eddie. You're right. After hearing you read Bruce Dickinson's statement, they don't give a shit about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 
I wouldn't either. You know, they're fucking showing up Barclays Center and everything. I think they added a second night. But um, the, the reason I called is uh, I want to get your thought about what do you think is – what is your personal favorite Iron Maiden album from the 2000s era? Easy one for me, Trey. Brave New World, the first album with Bruce That's coming back that came out in 2000. Yeah. yeah, Brave New World all the way. I think Brave New World is yeah. a phenomenal Iron Maiden album. I love Blood Ghost Brothers. And Ghost yeah. and Navigator, the title track, Brave New World, Wicker Man. There's some great stuff There's on that, that record. Three of the mirrors is real good, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I would go Brave New World all the way. I, I like... Uh, yeah, I like that record a lot. So that that would be my pick. And I also thank you, Trey. I also have a a uh, great memories of that time because Dickinson came back, Adrian Smith came back, and I was hired to go to England to do a national radio special to commemorate Iron Maiden's return with Dickinson and Adrian Smith. So I was flown to England. I spent a couple of days at the Iron Maiden headquarters. We had some beers. We I watched them rehearse. I did uh, radio interviews with all the guys. It was an hour-long special. It aired on like 100 stations in America. I still have the CD of it somewhere. So it was a great time. It's a great memory. I remember it was, I think, Princess Di had died like just a little bit before that. Because I remember we I went over with um with a guy named Stash who was the other guy that they hired to do it. He was a DJ in Baltimore at the time, and the two of us went over there together. And I still see him from time to time. And we went over and and visited the a couple department stores. I remember we went, were like walking around London, and it was just great memories. But above and beyond that, the record itself it just I love Blood Brothers. I love Brave New World, the title track. I love Wicker Man. Ghost and Navigator, great song. So, yeah, definitely, definitely Brave New World all the way. And, look, the Hall of Fame thing, Maiden, as you said, Maiden are selling out Barclay Center one or two nights <laughs> on their own <laughs> and with no problem. They don't need the validation of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but it is utterly absurd that they've not even been on a ballot. Just disgraceful. But I'm, I'm going to – it's a Friday. I'm going to try to go into the weekend in a good mood. So I'm going to hold off from there. Anthony in New York, hang out. What's up, Eddie? How you doing? Happy Friday. You too, man. Hey, I had a quick question about the cruises. I know, like, for the kid, like, I just wonder for the Kiss cruise and, like, for the bands that play, like, the bigger name bands that play in the cruises, I was always wondering, like, this, like is Paul and Gene, like, I know they're probably not hanging out the whole time on the cruise. Like, do they normally, like, when the ship docks, do they normally get off? Or, like, how does, like, the bigger bands, do they just stay on there the whole time? Or do they just hang out? Or normally, like, do they just get the hell out of there, like, once the ship docks and they just go and do their own thing? <laughs> well, I can't speak on the Kiss Cruise because I've never been on it. And they'd probably throw me off of it if I was. <laughs> but but I, I, uh, I, I, I know those guys all stay on it for the entire five days or whatever it is. And the way it works is that, no, they, you're right. They do not mingle. You will not see, I'm sure you will not see them in line at the buffet on that particular cruise because it is all geared towards them. You'll see them at the structured times that are announced on the schedule. They're doing a, a Q&A. They're doing a performance at a certain time. And that's when you will see them on the stage. But, no, you won't pull up a, a bar stool and say, hey, what's going on? Can I buy you a beer? They're just that not not with them, from what I understand, right. from all the people that have gone. And cruise ships, if you've ever been on one, Anthony, I mean, they're enormous. And they have these areas that are private. There is usually a private dining room sectioned off. Uh, in, on, on something like a Kiss Cruise, Paul and Gene will have the two biggest mega suites on there where they can entertain people if they want and have people come up into their area. I'm sure there's security outside the door and outside the hallway leading into their cabins. So they will have that all buttoned up, as would be the case with any of the cruises built around one particular artist like a Kiss Cruise would be. The other artists that would might play a Kiss Cruise, they'll be wandering around, I'm sure, no problem. On a cruise like what I host, Monsters of Rock, where there are a bunch of bands on it, I'd say 90% of the bands are out and about and walking around, no problem. A few of the guys may be a little reserved. Like, for instance, Tom Kiefer, he was out there watching Richie Kotzen and some other acts. He's, he's out there a little bit, but Tom also doesn't want to be caught up 
talking to people for two, three hours every step he takes because he's worried about resting his voice and needs to stay and, and take care of that. So for various reasons, some of these guys are not just out, you know, always out there. Tesla, who headlines the Monsters of Rock Cruise, they're out everywhere. And Jeff Keith will be okay. in the front row just like having the... So it's really case by case, but the big cruises built on one particular artist, those guys, you, you're not going to see them really out and about unless it's a structured situation. Okay, thanks, Ed. I always wondered about that. Have a great weekend. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Ant. You too. Or, of course, unless you pay. Because <laughs> it's just like at a concert, if you're going to go see a KISS concert, you're not going to run into one of those guys getting a hot dog, just like any band, not just KISS, at the vending stand. But if you buy the $10,000 VIP meet and greet, yeah, you're going to get your two minutes to get a photo backstage. Cruise is the same principle. I'm sure they sell some sort of private meet and greet package, but you're not just going to get it. But you'd be surprised in certain cruise situations how many of these guys do get out and mingle in, in like the like a Monsters of Rock cruise. Like talking about Iron Maiden, not this year, but last year, Steve Harris's band British Lion was on the Monsters of Rock cruise. I saw Steve Harris in line at the buffet waiting on food with everyone else. And there were some people that saw it was him, and some people actually didn't even recognize him or bother him. See, if you put, if you walk around with two or three goons around you and, you know, call a lot of attention to yourself, that hurts blending in. If you just throw a baseball cap on and it's a big ship and you're walking around, you you could you could fly under the radar a little bit from getting overly bothered. And then there's some guys that love it, that go out there and they'll hang and they'll take photos and they'll talk to everybody. So it's it's case by case. The the progressive rock cruise that I broadcast from this year, Cruise to the Edge, that's built around yes. So you're not going to see Steve Howe, who's in his 70s at this point, walking around through the ship. But if you go to the show, you're going to see him up there playing. And if you, I'm sure if there's some high end VIP, you could probably get a photo with him and do a meet and greet. But it's not, you're not going to, you know, be fighting Steve Howe for the last hamburger bun at the buffet. <laughs> it's just not going to, it's just, they're, they're not there. They're not doing that. They're in their, their zone, in their world, in their area of the ship. But I did see somebody. Go back and forth with the tongs for Steve Harris getting a hamburger bun. <laughs> and he's one of the, you know, one of the biggest bands in the world. So it is really very much case by case. The last thing I'll say on it is Bon Jovi announced a cruise or announced some involvement in yeah, I think there is a bon there's one coming up. I think there's a Bon Jovi cruise happening or it happened already. And I noticed in the fine print. From the way, and I'm, I don't know this for a fact, but it looked very much like Bon Jovi was John himself was going to only be on the ship for like two of the five days. The wording was kind of like that, where he would like, you know, say the ship leaves on a Sunday, and then the Bon Jovi performance happens on like a Monday. And then the rest of the week, there was a lot of other stuff that didn't guarantee you that John was even going to be on the ship. Because what could happen is the cruise makes its first stop and he flies out from Jamaica or wherever they are. And then you fill out the week with Bon Jovi-related activities and performances. Because some people just, I love being on a cruise ship, but mo some people, there are a few people that just don't. They're just, it's not their thing. They don't like it. Maybe they're seasick or whatever it is. I personally love it and never had a problem with it. So sometimes these artists want to just kind of do what they have to do and get off. I can't understand doing that because I enjoy the experience. As a matter of fact, I'm about to book a crew a vacation next week. I actually did just lock it in where I'm going on. I just got off a cruise. I just got off two cruises in February, right? Monsters of Rock and Cruise to the Edge. And as I've said many times, although I'm not digging ditches on those cruises, it is work. I got to do radio. I got to do this. I got to do that. It's a music environment. I've got, I'm in a lot of directions. 
So my kids have a week off for spring break in April. I, I'm going to use my first vacation week, and I'm going to go on a cruise with my family, which will be radically different than the cruises we talk about on this show because that's a vacation cruise. So I'm actually greatly looking forward to turning the phone off for a week and just disappearing on that ship where it's not about anything else but just relaxing and eating and family time or whatever. So cruises are very, very different depending upon what they are and the environment. If you've ever been on one, you know that. The type of ship, the size of the ship, where you're going, all that sort of stuff. But the music cruises, which there are many, all are sort of structured in different ways. Uh, the reality, though, if it's, a, if it's you know, seeing the quote-unquote headliner poolside, you know, sharing the suntan lotion with them is, is pretty remote in most cases. Let's get a break. We'll come back. More of your calls next on Trunk Nation. With Johnny, who's listening in New York. He's our next caller. Welcome, Johnny. What's going on? Hey, how you doing, Eddie? Hey, man. What do you got uh, today? Well, all this talking about Asian stuff. I mean, did you happen to see where uh, the turn of the comics playing uh, the pre-party at the Kiss Cruise and Ace is um, going to do the encore with them? Yeah, it should be a pretty uh, weird dynamic. Wait a minute. There's already another. They're already a kiss cruise just happened. Next, You're yeah. telling me there's already yeah. a next one announced, and the pre party is already announced, like for October. Yeah, yeah, the pre party's announced. Yep. I, I was unaware of it. Ace is playing the pre party. Yeah, he's playing the pre party, and uh, Return of the Comets playing, and he's doing the encore with them, and then he's doing his own set. Okay, yeah, I was unaware uh, of all that. I haven't, I haven't kept an eye out on that, but okay. Well, that should be a strange dynamic, uh, considering what happened last year. I was also wondering. Yeah, I, I didn't think Kiss, I didn't think Ace was going to be doing anything w with or around a Kiss Cruise again, so I, I was unaware of that. But okay, I'm not saying it's not true. Right. I just didn't. I just haven't heard anything about it. Yeah, and uh, also, I just wondered, have you uh, heard Richie's uh, Scarlet's new single? Or I have not. Or, uh, no, I have okay. not. I didn't know that he put something new out. Yeah, yeah. No, it's pretty good. Well, yeah, All I right. thought the dynamic, even, even between Ace and Richie, should be a little strange. Yeah, I, I Johnny, I don't know, really. Uh, thank you for the call, man. I honestly don't know. I, I don't know where things are at with them. I know that, uh, you know, after Richie was dismissed from the band, Ace kind of, uh, you know, told me he made the piece and talked to him. I've spoken to Richie since all that went down. Um, you know, Richie went through a real tough time there, losing the gig in Ace's band and then his wife passing away. So I wish him nothing but the best. And I was unaware he had new music, but I will check it out. Thank you for the call. Say hello to Jeff, who's in California. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Eddie, how you doing? Great, man. What do you got, got today? Yeah, I got you. Hey, good. Two quick questions for you. Uh, one question is, do you know, is Ace Vaughn Johnson playing on the recording of the new L.A. Guns record? And my he second is not. question is, he's not. So he is he's not. touring with them. He Well, he joined uh, the band too late, from my understanding, to actually play on the record. As a matter of fact, I just got a CD of the new L.A. Guns record, which uh, I was listening to and is real good. The last, the previous record was great as well. And it has a picture of Ace in it. Uh, we're right. talking about a different Ace now, a guy, a guy named Ace Don Johnson who plays in Faster Pussycat and also has joined L.A. Guns. But he, it has a picture of Ace in it, but it does not list him in the credits as being actually a part of the band or playing. It lists the lineup of the band and doesn't list them, although it shows his photo. So um, oh. he's definitely not on the record as far as playing. His picture is on the inside sleeve, but in the rundown of the band, it's not listed either. So I think just the time he got in and the fact that he didn't contribute to the record is probably sort of in an, right. a little bit of an in-between zone at the moment. Okay. Hey, second part of this is I know you know the guys in Faster Pussy Cat, and I've met them. Uh, I actually talked to Danny Nordahl last year at the Whiskey, and he told me that the new Faster Pussy Cat record was done, and it was just a matter of time before it comes out, and it was going to be really good, and he was really excited. Do you know anything? Can you disclose anything about when that might actually happen? Because I'm a real fan, and I'm waiting, and I, I can't wait for that new record. Well, they are a great, fun rock and roll band for sure, Jeff. I'm with you there. But as far as new music is concerned, I would be really surprised if that was the case. Danny could have been 
I, I don't know. Danny could have been busting balls a little bit there. I don't know. He can be quite a ball breaker and just throw some stuff out there to get people talking. I, so I, I don't know that it's true that they've completed the record. In, I, have, I have no knowledge of that at all. I just I think they would have told me if they did because I do know and talk to all those guys, and they're all friends, and I was just with them on the cruise. So I think if there was a record imminently coming, they would have told me and wanted to line something up to promote it and talk about it. But to my knowledge, that is not the case. If it is, though, we'll certainly cover it. Jeff in Virginia. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Eddie. Thank you. Hey, Eddie. Thank, thank you for uh, taking my call. It's a pleasure. It's an honor. Sure, man. Uh, huge fan. Anyway, I probably got a really silly question, but I've tried several times to get through. Um, I'm a huge Wasp fan. And, you know, I've tried to look up things on the Internet, on, but I, was, I, I just thought I'd go just – you know, straight to the master. Why is it that they never, ever tour here in the States anymore? It seems like they always gravitate toward, uh, you know, playing dates in Europe. And, you know, that, that they're on my bucket list if if I'm going to have one per se, you know. And I've just always... The reason, the reason why, Jeff, is business. Blackie and Wasp get way bigger offers and play way bigger gigs and have way better opportunities in venues and money and people in Europe than they do in America. It's as simple as that. He's not going to play America in shitty clubs where he can't put the show in. You know, there was a time where Blackie was performing with this giant mic stand that was on a... Um, a spring it was a wild looking thing it was like a spring-loaded mic stand that he almost rode the the mic stand sort of like a motorcycle while he performed and last time he toured america he they he was booked in venues so small that the mic stand wouldn't clear the ceiling he couldn't even bring the mic stand in so when you're in a band and you have the opportunity to make a lot more money play way nicer venues and pull a lot more people Versus, you know, even though you live in America, playing tiny clubs and dealing with that, you're just not going to do it. And at this point in his life, he's had some medical issues, some health issues. He's yeah, just he's that. not yeah. going to he's not going to go into these clubs and do that. And he's opted not to. So that's exactly the reason why. Yeah, because, I mean, it seems like my other question right quick is like, you know, as you can tell, I'm here in the South. And it's like, you know, I've got tickets for the Zombie Manson show. And it seems like not just them, but like John Five on his Creature show. You know, John Five, great guy. You know, I know he's been on your show plenty of times. And it's like the la on his Creature tour, he has skipped the South like twice. And, I mean, you know, I and it's hard. I get tired of driving, you know, four and five hours to see good bands when they used to hit Charlotte, you know. And pretty much the only thing we have going for us now is that, what used to be the Carolina Rebellion, the epicenter, you know, but I mean, I just, I can't stand three days of that. I don't know, you know, if it was <laughs> the right people, maybe, you know, but I mean, I, I could kick myself in the ass now for not going with the death of Keith Flint, but anyway. Um, well, Jeff, I, I, so I hear, here's the best, thank you, Jeff, and, and you know, it's possible it's possible that Blackie and, and Wasp could do something in America. Like four or five years ago, they played M3. Why? Well, that's an amphitheater with like 25 bands over a weekend, and it's a big stage, and there was a decent offer, and he played. If he gets an offer to play in a setting that he wants to and he finds appropriate and suitable to what he wants to do, he'll do it. But it's not he's not at this point in his life going to go tour and play in small clubs and deal with all that. It's just not where he is at this point in his life. He, you know, Blackie's a pretty demanding guy. He, he wants things to be a certain way or he's just not going to do it. So that's why a lot of what he does has happened outside of America and continues to be the case. Uh, by the way, Epicenter, if you do attend that, myself, Don, and Jim are hosting the Village Stage, which is the after concert stage. We're going to be doing a sort of a stand up act out there, uh, both Saturday, Friday, and Saturday nights for Epicenter. So I'll be there for the first time ever in uh, what was Carolina Rebellion and is now dubbed Epicenter, coming up very soon, as a matter of fact. So, and I hear you, you know, I hear you, some of these things. Too many bands, too many days. It's a bit of an endurance test. I get it. Trust me, I get it. I do think some of it becomes overkill at some points, but I don't book them. 
And I would say to you, then just time your your time there and your appearance there and the, the amount of time you're putting into some of this stuff to be as um, productive as it can be as far as who you want to see. And the last thing I would tell our caller is this, and I hear this so often from so many people who, you know, one, of the, one of the cool things about, one of the many cool things about Sirius XM Radio is that it is truly national, meaning anyone in America can hear it if they have it. So you will have people from big cities like L.A. and New York, and you will have people from, you know, like Jeff in Virginia there, or smaller cities than that, for sure, who call in and listen. So you get a real cross-section of what people are thinking in other parts of the country, and of course Canada as well. And there has always been this thing with people who live in certain cities or markets or states that don't get a lot of bands coming through there that have to drive and they feel like it's the artist that doesn't want to come there. Why doesn't this artist want to come play here? And I've talked about this before over the years on my shows. The reality is this, you guys, the artists in almost every instance, do not care where they play. They are not discriminating against your town or your city in any way. It is very simple that an artist, almost any artist will go play anywhere if the money they are asking for to play is being met, which means in your city there needs to be a promoter and a venue that feels that that artist will draw enough people in that market to justify paying the guarantee that they want to play there. The dates are booked by the artist agent, and all artists have booking agents. They solicit the dates. They call the cities and the venues. Here's what we want to play. What nights are open? Okay, here's the routing. Okay, we'll do it for that. We won't do it for that. And then, of course, the manager for the artist, or if the artist doesn't have a manager, they look over the dates, they approve the offers, and that's how a tour happens. But if, if there's a city that does not have a promoter in it or a venue in it that feels that an artist who you want to see will draw enough people for it to be profitable, they don't book the date because most people don't want to lose money. Now, one of the things that I see happening on a daily basis is a lot of promoters, even in big cities, who don't have a clue or they just need to fill a room and they don't care that an artist isn't going to draw, and they book the show anyway. And then they have 100 tickets sold in a 1,000 capacity room, and unless they paper the hell out of it, which means give the tickets away, it looks really bad. Most promoters want to avoid that happening. So they don't take the date because they don't want to lose money if they don't feel there's enough support in that market for that artist to sell. But more and more I see <laughs> a show tonight. There's a lot of shows that I can tell every day where these shows are struggling greatly and I scratch my head. I look at, I see you guys, I get emails every single day of shows being booked in venues that I, I look at and I was, I'm like, who thought this was going to draw? And sure enough, and this is these are established promoters and venues. I don't know if they've got kids doing it. They don't know. They don't care. And sure enough, 99% of the time when I say that, a week or two outside of that show, I'll get another email and it'll say, hey, having a lot of problems with this one. Can you promote this? Can you dump tickets? Can you do this? It happens every day. So the idea is to try to avoid all of that stuff for the benefit of everybody and do smart bookings. And sometimes in certain cities, there's just not enough of a demand for these artists to offer them a date. It's just the way the business works, but it's it's getting really weird out there where I'm seeing bands that have no business being in certain venues and getting dates there, and I don't know what the logic is, and it happens everywhere, not just even in my world of rock. Yesterday, 
at the local community theater near my where I live in New Jersey. There was a, some sort of orchestra show, and my daughter's into classical music. And they had initially started out char- trying to charge, I don't know, 30 bucks a pop to go to this orchestra show. Very reasonable price. And I guess nobody bought tickets because they then went to the schools in the area and had the schools pump out a mass email and say, hey, uh, free tickets, just click here. And my wife clicked off for four tickets and went and took my daughter to the show yesterday. Totally free. And she pointed something out to me on the printout of the tickets. You know, you see coding and stuff. It said paper 19. So that's the term for dumping tickets. Papering a show is when you just give tickets away, and it happens at every level, level, from clubs to arenas to stadiums, when you just give people away to put fannies in the seats and fill the building. It actually said on the tickets that paper. Now, most people, unless you're in the industry, you don't know that term. So it wouldn't mean anything to the regular person. But that's the term in the industry for dumping tickets to a dead show, papering it. It actually said it right on the ticket to this show. So the idea is, the but the, but the, the end of the story here is that there are a lot of people, and I hear from them all the time, being on Sirius XM live six times a week, I get so many calls from people in the smaller markets of this country who, oh, this band will never come here. They're, it's not the band. They'd love to come play in your city. But they need to know that their nut is going to be met in terms of the money they want to put the show on. And there's got to be a promoter there that's willing to take the risk and say, yeah, I think that in Virginia, this band will do enough people and we have a proper venue for them and I'm going to book the date. Nobody wants to lose money, which the promoter's on the hook for and have to be you know, papering the shit out of shows. And no band wants to go play to an empty venue. But see, when a band is booked, if they're promised ten grand to play that night, if ten people show up, they still get their ten grand. It's the promoter that gets killed. And a smart promoter knows what a real value of a band is and knows not to book them. But I'm seeing a lot of people out there that it's looking like don't really know what they're doing because man, I get I get emails every day and I just look, I'm like, that band in that venue? Really? Mm, I don't see that, but somebody got duped. Let's get a break. We'll finish up with our last round of calls right after this on Todd in Minneapolis. Hey, Todd. Hey, Yo, yes, Todd. Sir. Hey, man, go ahead. You're on the air. Eddie. Yes, sir. Hey, I wanted to um, thanks for taking my call. And I'm going to Metallica, and I got an extra ticket Monday night if you want to come to Indianapolis. <laughs> I'll be working, Todd. I'll be here at Sirius XM doing two shows on Monday, but I appreciate the offer. Right on. Hey, I was a big uh, Vivian Campbell uh, fan from uh, the 80s, and I was looking into his last in line project that he has coming out. And um, he has a meet and greet for $99, which I thought was awesome. And... He has on stage jam with him for for two or three songs. It says for four hundred. So I thought that was pretty cool of him to do that. This is with Last in Line, obviously not Def Leppard. Right, right with the Last in Line project. Okay. Yeah. So, no, not, not surprising. Uh, I mean, a lot of these guys, like well, like I said, they are all there's something for sale at every show, no matter whether it's a jam, a guitar lesson, buying the mic, buying the guitar strap. If you go into the deep resource resources or recesses, thank you, Todd, for the call. Sounds like Todd had his radio up and was getting a little delay there. But uh, you go there, you know, there's there's all these things that are available at various different price points. Uh, I needed to mention this, and I forgot. Nikki Six will be talking to Nick Carter on feedback on Monday morning on, uh, on their show about the Motley Crue biopic. See, I don't know how this all works. <laughs> I have no clarity on this because if the people are doing interviews with people in Motley Crue now, are, can you say you saw the movie? Can you talk about specifics in the movie? 
Did they not also have to sign the non-disclosure? Is the non-disclosure thing over now? <laughs> Very confusing. But check out, see see what happens with Nick and Nikki on uh, on Monday and what they can and can't disclose. I'm playing by the rules, dummy me. Let's say hello to Chris in Colorado. Hi, Chris. Hey, Eddie, how you doing? Good, man. What do you got? I heard you. I've heard you mention this band, but I'm wondering if you actually seen them live. I know they're on Rocklahoma. It's a band out of Edmonton, Kentucky. They're called Blackstone Cherry. And um, what's odd about them is they're one of those bands, again, in the States that do small 200-seat clubs, and then they go to Europe, and they can sell at arenas. And their drummer, John Fred Young, he's just phenomenal. And it's kind of baffling that they're not bigger in the United States. I agree, Chris. I'm aware of who they are. I've seen them. I like them. I saw them on their very first tour. Their very first tour, they opened for Buck Cherry. The bill was Buck Cherry and Blackstone Cherry. And they were like kids. I think their parents were even on the road with them at the time. And you're 100% right. In the in England and throughout the UK, they have really gravitated towards American sort of riff rock or southern-influenced rock. Blackstone Cherry, very popular there. Rival Sons, very popular there. Way more so than here in America. Although all of those bands certainly making a lot of inroads here in the U.S. as well. But definitely in England, I think Blackstone Cherry plays arenas in England when I saw some of the British rock magazines, right? Yeah, that's correct. They do. And they're just live. They're incredible. We've got five or six records out. Um, They're uh, they're related to a couple of the guys in the Kentucky Headhunters. Uh, Mm -hmm. The drummer's dad is a guitar player and then his uncle, too. So it's uh, pretty neat to see them live, and I recommend it for sure to watch them on their set when you uh, MC the uh, Rocklahoma. Yeah, you know, I saw they're playing a headline show in Dallas. There's a chance I may need to go to Dallas, and it w- and if I go, it's going to be around this Rival Sun show that's happening there. And I think they're playing the next night or two with Tyler Bryant and the Shakedown. Thank you, Chris. Another young, up-and-coming sort of bluesy rocker that's definitely worth keeping an eye on. Uh, Jared James Nichols, another one. He's currently opening for John 5. There's a ton of these guys out there on the scene. Really good stuff, and I really hope it breaks through. But I noticed, I was looking at routing and some scheduling for some stuff coming that I may have to do coming up, that when I, I may go to Dallas, and when I was there, if I go, when I'm there, there was a show a night or two later with Blackstone Cherry and Tyler Bryant. I was like, I should see if I could tie something in with that and stick around. So these guys are all out there playing, and it's amazing because a band like Blackstone Cherry in America, they're playing clubs or you know small theaters, and then you look at their tour in England, and they're an American band, and they're in arenas. They're in arenas. Same with Alter Bridge, arenas in England. It's just so weird how stuff connects bigger in other places. Rival Sons connected way bigger in England for a long time than in America. I was happy to see Rival Sons now coming back to the U.S. after touring there, and I was looking at their route last night and their website, and a handful of their shows are advanced sellouts here in America. So that was really good to see, really happy to see that. Let's get uh, Greg in Rhode Island on real quick. Go ahead, Greg. i got about 60 seconds. Hey, Ed. How you doing? I uh, went to see Three Days Grace and Disturbed at Mohegan Sun. Three Days Grace opened up. They packed the place. I, I would never saw an opening band with so many people. There was about eight or 9,000 for Three Days Grace. Um, like the new singer, but I like the old one better, uh, Adam Guntier from St. Asonia. <clears throat> um, and Disturbed were great, too. Draymond was in great voice. However, I think I noticed that they tracked the keyboards. I don't know for sure, but I think um, I didn't see a keyboard player out there, and there were some keyboards in their music in the background. So I'm I'm pretty sure they tracked the keyboards. But other than that, it was a great show. Draymond had a great voice, and the band was awesome. But I did not see a keyboard player on stage. So. Yeah, well, that doesn't – I've mentioned that before, and thank you, Greg, for the call. That does not bother me. I, If you've got a song or two with keys in it, I don't expect you'd have to carry a keyboard player. I do, I'm not overly bothered by that when I talk about the tracks thing. 
The problem is when it's a bunch of instruments and a bunch of vocals and lead vocals and tons of backing vocals, that's that's where the problems come in for me. I don't mind a song or two if it's just a keyboard lick. All right, thank you all for the call. Sorry if I didn't get to yours. I'll be back live.